Good morning and welcome. Happy St. Patrick's Day and happy start of the 2023 FIA World Endurance Championship season. We're in Sebring in Florida and one of the all-time great racetracks is the start of our eight race campaign across the globe. We will feature races in North America here at Sebring before heading to Portimao, Portugal, and then to Spa-Francorchamps. The centenary Le Mans 24 hours is in the middle of June. Then we head to Monza before rounding out the season in the east. Well, hello, everybody. Martin Haven, Graham Goodwin here, Anthony Davidson and Louise Beckett down on the grid at the moment in between all of our drivers as we get ready to welcome in to herald the dawn of what I have no doubt will be a glorious era of sports car racing as somebody who lived through the Group C era, uh, which is uh, a real touchstone for many sports car racing fans. Graham, I think it's going to be at least as good in the seasons that we have here and coming ahead of us. Yeah, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, I'm beyond excited. Um, I'm sure all these drivers we're watching come to the grid, Lila Wadu there, Ben Keating behind. Christian Reed starts his 79th consecutive uh, WEC. There's, uh, there is Roger the captain, Penske Roger Penske. The yeah, 86 year old arch enthusiast, Roger Penske. And our playground is the Sebring International Raceway, a former B-17 stepping off base uh, to send bombers over to uh, Europe. It features predominantly bumps and lots of them. It is brutal. They always like to say here, compared to the 24 hours of Le Mans, half as long, twice as hard. Turn one is always a focus of attention. Turn seven as well. It's a, a great opportunity to make a pass, but also to set yourself up for the second part of the lap. And then at the end of the long Ullman straight going past, our World Endurance Championship hits into turn 17, the final corner on the racetrack, Sunset Bend, as vicious bumps as you will find anywhere outside of the World Rally Championship, and the setting sun at the end of the race will add an extra drama to that 17th and final corner. Yeah, and uh, all of those corners have claimed victims uh, so far this weekend. We'll get to yeah. those. Uh, that's uh, where our 2022 winners, they are in the history books now, but history being rewritten uh, yesterday, and we'll get to that uh, later on in the programme, Martin. Storylines galore, deeper uh, list of storylines, and even the number of cars uh, on that grid. Pierre Fion and Wolfgang Gullrich. Yep, president of the uh, ACO, Pierre Fion, and with... IMSA, the ACO, have worked so hard to get this top-tier strategy uh, of hypercars together, and it is really working well. There is the boss of Peugeot, the Stellantis group. And on the left there, Richard Mill, the head of the World Endurance Championship. Chip Ganassi among the great and the good in the sunshine here. Well, Ferraris are racing around the world this weekend. However, right now, all eyes are on this man, Antonio Fuoco. You put the number 50 Ferrari hypercar on pole on its debut. You cannot ask better than that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think today we did an amazing job. Uh, we scored our first pole position after 15 years, so it's something amazing. Today we have a really long race ahead. Uh, we know that our ability here it will be the key, so we try to do our best. Uh, it will be quite difficult, but uh, we see what we can do. But let's just take a moment, take a look at this. That number 50 Ferrari ahead of the Toyotas. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, as I said also yesterday, the guy uh, here and also back in Maranello did an amazing job through, through these months. Uh, we are, everyone, super happy about the result, but uh, we know that uh, we need to push also for, uh, for the race. So it's a good start but uh, we will see at the end of the race. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, amazing qualifying result for Ferrari. Spoke to Antonetto Coletta, the man behind this project. Seven months it's been since that car uh, hit the ground for the very first time. What an astonishing effort from everybody at Maranello. And look, whatever happens in the race, and it is a very difficult race, and it's not one that Ferrari have done since the 1960s or 70s. Whatever happens here, the car has started its journey really well. Day one in WEC, 
first pole position. Audi have done that, nobody else has done that on their first day in the top tier of sports car racing. As he said, it sounded like 15 years, which would be a long enough period. It's actually 50 years this year, 1973, was the last time Ferrari raced at the top class in sports car racing. At, the, at, at that stage, Ferenzo, as you've seen in the film Ford versus Ferrari, endurance racing, sports car racing, world championship was at least as important as Formula One because sports cars were what they sold. Still do, obviously. There Here's what everybody, I mean, well, that's, can you imagine? Yeah, that is that is the centenary trophy for the Le Mans 24 hours. It's been on a world tour. I keep bumping into it, not literally. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> it seems to be in lots of different places I've been to around the world, uh, across Asia, North America, and of course in Europe. Uh, we wake our way up here, um, what is a very significant grid, and for a number of reasons, not just because of the pace we've seen from these cars, but this is the start of the end of GTE. It and is. it's going to be a glorious final, yeah. uh, final tour around the world for these fabulous GT race cars before the new LM GT3 class kicks in. And of course, that shot just reminds us that it's not just the top tier that Ferrari are represented, they have cars in the GT category as well. And when GT3 arrives from next season on, then, you know, Ferrari, Lamborghini, Mercedes, Audi, or a whole host of GT names that we have not had in the championship before will be able to come in. And so, yeah, there's there's a, an awful lot going on. Spoke to Amadel Harty this morning, very relaxed, very happy, not raced here at Sebring before. Knows the Aston Martin well, knows Tom Ferrier's TF Sport team very well indeed. They've worked together a lot. But to come here for the first time and be in the top three, great, great qualifying effort from Ahmed. It was, and very proudly carrying the Amani flag here, as he does around the world, uh, a real ambassador for his nation in world motorsport and a first time in the World Championship for Amani. But in second place was a Corvette Racing C8R. Now, it is run by the Pratt & Miller Corvette Racing Team. It is not a factory entry this season. In the GT Yam class, it is being run for Ben Keating and his crew. And again, Ben Keating, serial pole position botherer in GT Yam, came within an ace of taking pole for the first time out in another brand new GT car for him. One minor correction, not Pratt & Miller anymore. It's now Pratt Miller. Yeah. It is now Pratt Miller, but uh, Rebecca Jones there. The yeah, PR, PR for Porsche Penske Racing in the World Endurance Championship. This is what it's about. The camaraderie <laughs> up and down this grid and up and down this paddock has been great to see again, despite the increased pressures that always come when factory money hits the floor. Now, how does John eric Van know Roger Penske? Well, he knows Roger through Jay Penske's Dragon Motorsport team and Formula E. There are all sorts of connections, oh, you know, for going back from when some of these were kids in carts, I mean, eight or nine years old, to, to junior single-seaters and all sorts of other championships. And here is our pole sitter in the GT Am class, Sara Bovi, again claiming pole position for the Iron Dames, but again in a different car there in a Porsche. Let's catch up again with Louise Beckett. Robert Kibitza, it's great to have you back, but with a different team. However, the LMP2 category is just as fierce. Yeah, I mean, back to Orland Team WRT. Uh, so back where we race together with WRT in 21. Of course, at that point, we were racing LMS plus Le Mans. This year, WEC, so happy to be here in Sebring. Uh, back to, let's say, uh, origin, when my uh, adventure in endurance racing started. Back with Louis, and uh, additionally with a new teammate, Rui. Louis Rui is uh, difficult. Uh, but yeah, I'm happy to be here, honestly, looking forward. Of course, first one, starting the race, starting the season, so may, we have to make sure uh, we keep it tight and clean, and uh, let's see. Thanks very much. Yeah, there's been all sorts of reshuffling around in LMP2. Uh, it is a, another very deep grid, 12 cars, and yeah. the vast majority in two car teams as well. And you'll have to bear with us as we adapt to new drivers in different cars with remarkably <laughs> similar <laughs> colour schemes. I'm sure there's going to be some, some moments to come. Yeah, there will, definitely. And, and he's just saying, Louis and Rui, his two teammates, you know, <laughs> Huey, Louis and Rui. Fifth in LMP2, and this is, a, this is a car we'll only see twice this season, the number 48, here in Portimao. Uh, because after that, if things go to plan, Hertz Team Jota will debut their fabulous-looking uh, Porsche 963, the first of the privately-owned 
uh, hypercars that will be joining the FI World Endurance Championship, not the last. Uh, the great news about this hypercar uh, grid is that we are going to see more depth through this year, more still at Le Mans, and more again when we get into 2024. This is, it, it's the third year, it feels like the start of something special, it, and it's yeah, going to get more special. It, it's, it's really got critical mass this year, hasn't it? You know, it's 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 con going to continue to grow, but now we've really got a, a solid group of manufacturers. We've got half a dozen different makes in the top class, well, and, we saw, and that's great. We saw one of the uh, soon to be ad uh, added uh, makes there. Alpine will be with us in Hypercar next year. Correct. They take a sabbatical from the top class. Here's the third place car in LMP2, the number 31 WRT Orica. Yeah, a couple of times Robin Fryens had the fastest lap. In the end, that was good enough for third fastest. Sean Galeo will start that car. And it was familiar names at the top of the pile in LMP2. By the way, in terms of newness, new rule for this season is no tyre ovens, no tyre warmers, no preheating of the tyres. And as a result of that, this race, and I'm predicting now every race this season, will start with two formation laps, possibly with the exception yes. of Le Mans, to allow the drivers to get heat into the tyres and pressure into the tyres before we... Uh, cry havoc and release the dogs of war down into turn one because otherwise it could be uh, really quite tricky so there will be a second formation lap and uh, that will uh, that will actually be the start of the race official the first uh, formation lap has been accounted for but the clock will start um, it is a time certain race no longer than eight hours or 1000 miles whichever comes first so far the clock has won over uh, the pedometer, I suppose, the uh, odometer. Um, so we will wait and see what happens there. But there will be two formation laps to start the race. They are finally clearing the grid, and here is the anthem. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we at the twilight's last gleam, whose bright stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet Well done, good lady, and uh, the fly past here at Sebring from the US Coast Guard, the Lockheed Martin Hercules, I think based down at Clearwater. And, uh, beautiful start to this. Always, We're always made welcome here at Sebring. It is great to be back for Super Sebring. We'll say C-130 because there are only Hercules in the Royal Air Force. Uh, so uh, no, it is it is great to be back. And, and, and again, it's, it's that joy of racing in North America, there's just a, there's just that extra little bit of atmosphere and glitz and and actually, do you know what? Again, walking around this morning in the in the uh, driver's autograph session, lots and lots of fans down there, yep. lots and lots of autograph cars being signed and collected. Just everybody going, oh, what? I, there's just such a lovely atmosphere, and that little bit of, it's not quite party, but there's just something special. 
to get the season touch paper lit. Now, it's a really nice way to start. It's a great place to start. It's, it is a party. There's grown men dressed as cows. Of course it's a party. <laughs> it's fantastic. And months. Yeah. Uh, it's great. Villeneuve Corner. Unofficial. Unofficial. And not because he's crashed there yet. I, no. I think there's just a, a little fan club there. I think, yeah, it was harsh. But 10th yeah. <laughs> on the 11 car hypercar grid is the Glickenhaus Racing, the 708 car, Roman Demar, Ryan Briscoe and Olivier Pla. And it will be uh, Ryan Briscoe, Indy 500 winner, of course, back uh, way back when, that uh, will get this race underway for the returning Glickenhaus squad. Yep. And they've been struggling a little for pace here. 93 is the first of all, well, the second of the two Peugeots. Ninth there, Paul de Resta, Nicole Jansen, and Jean Eric Verne. And it will be the Scott, Paul de Resta, that starts the race in the 93. The extraordinary 9x8. If you do get a look at the rear end here, you'll notice just a bit of a change to the aero there. That uh, gurney that extended all the way across the back of the engine cover now has cutouts. Yeah, and, and they're sort of higher little monkey seat winglets almost uh, over the rear at the back of the rear wheel arches so that's been a change so they've they played jokers based on what they learned last year to be allowed to change the homologation of the car a little to massage the, the reason that this car gets away without having a rear wing like everybody else does like you see on a formula one car or any of the other prototypes here indeed any of the gt cars is that it makes its downforce a different way predominantly with underfloor with ground effects now that's not going to help too much when the bumps are continually bouncing you away from that perfect ride height but when we get back to places more conducive to its performance and you think spa particularly and and hopefully of course they'll be desperately hoping it works well at le mans then it should come a little bit more into its own first view of the porsche 963 why 963 it's not the successor to their lmp1 hybrid no, it's a successor to their last great sports car of the Group C era, the 962. And I, and I just love that somebody's gone, yeah, 962, yeah, 963, let's go with that. Why not? Absolutely. I mean, they're all type numbers. I don't suppose they've saved it for any particular reason, but uh, the Porsches will be starting in sixth and seventh places behind the Cadillac and behind two Ferraris and two Toyotas. So great to have this full season entry from Cadillac Racing as well. El Bamba and Alex Lynn uh, in the car as well. And Bambi back in the World Endurance Championship. He's feeling very keen, as is Alex Lynn, to, to really get this back underway and to show what the Cadillac can do. And actually, probably qualifying wasn't its strongest suit. This car should be good to go the distance, they hope. and. Uh, with a bit of luck, should be in amongst them, swinging at the top of the pile. Every single one of these hypercar teams, not necessarily the cars, but the teams, as you get the fourth place car on the first look uncovered of the 499P on this grid, has at least one FIA world champion on their squad. Every <laughs> single one of them. The depth of talent I here. I seen that. Yeah, but well, it's across hypercar, Formula One, the case of Jacques Villeneuve, and of course the GTE class, which awards a Drivers' World Championship, uh, plus Jose Maria Lopez with touring cars, too, of course. One of the, I think, only three drivers ever to score World Championships in two different codes. Yeah. The depth of talent in the hypercar class, and beyond that as well, LMP2, we'll get to talk about, and GTE, some amazing names, some amazing talent, some amazing emerging talent you're going to be hearing a lot more about through this 2023 season. Um, boy, are we ready to go racing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, born ready, but but really, yeah, pant-wettingly exciting to go racing. Uh, so, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, you saw getting into the 51 car he shares, shares with James Collado. Of course, they were last year's GT Pro World Champions, the last ever World Champions. Antonio Giovinazzi added to that crew. Third fastest, the number seven Toyota outpaced by their teammates in qualifying number seven car. Uh, Mike Conway, Kamu Kobayashi, Jose Maria Lopez unchanged. And on the front row of the grid, Toyota number eight, the sister car, the reigning world champions, Sebastian Bremi and Brendan Hartley, who did the qualifying run with Rio Hirakawa, who joined the squad last season. And they are our world champions and Le Mans winners of last year. Toyota, of course, with the target on their back. They are the benchmark in Hypercar. They've been here since day one of Hypercar. Before that, they kept the LMP1 flame burning right to the bitter end. 
but they did not take pole position. That man did, and Antonio Fuoco was, rightly so, hugely emotional. Seven months from first tests of the engine and the chassis, the wheels down, hitting the road. Uh, it's been a long, very, very busy and really intensely pressured build-up, as I'm sure it has been for Porsche and for everybody else, but uh, Ferrari claiming pole position courtesy of Antonio Fuoco and uh, Antonio with Miguel Molina in the 52 car last year, runners-up in the World Championship in GTE Pro. They're joined by Nick Nielsen, one of the rising stars in the Ferrari program, and uh, they will lead the field away. They start their first ever race at the top class in, their, in any of their lifetimes. Absolutely. On pole position. Yeah, Antonio Fuoco, I was talking to his boss, Antonio Coletta, after that stellar qualifying performance last night, and uh, he is predicting great things for this young man. Reminding me, by the way, that his Formula 2 days, his teammate, Leclerc. Yeah, one Charles Leclerc. Yes, and, exactly uh, right. Uh, and, and, and there's an awful lot of drivers in this field who have really good junior single-seater experience. And his wasn't so much junior. It went all the way up to Formula 2. So, you know, he didn't get the break into Formula 1 like Charles Leclerc, but he has got an awful lot of potential. And who knows? One of them might end up, maybe even both of them, who well, knows, might end up being world champions this year. But you'd have to say that there's... Uh, you know, if your story is going to start, they've st certainly started well. And having that F word, having Ferrari in the championship cannot be overstated. Uh, this is not to downplay anybody else or what anybody else does. We talked about it yesterday. If you go to any street in any town in any country and ask them to name a racing car, you can guarantee that one of the first three words will be Ferrari, and that's what they are bringing here, as well as performance, as well as the team. They are bringing fans, or they will bring fans, who have no idea what sports car racing is, and for us and the championship, that's brilliant. And for Ferrari and for Italy, not only the things we've already <laughs> mentioned here, yes. as you look through the starting grid, um, they've got Italian drivers in this team, and yes. Formula One does not at the moment. Yeah. So Ferrari, Toyota, Toyota, Ferrari. And there were two real different categories here. The Cadillac was about a second behind, with the Porsches not too far behind them. And then the pair of Peugeots, they sort of went in almost two by two. Uh, Ferrari taking pole broke that up a little bit. Then the Glickenhaus and the new Floyd Van Wall. Then on LMP2 pole, Oli Jarvis takes the 23 United car ahead of Jota and WRT. So the three behemoths of this category in the top three positions. Two cars this year for the uh, uh, signature team for, uh, Alpine. for Alpine. Again, keeping the fire burning until they come back with their hypercar next season. The second car didn't qualify quite as strongly. Just ahead of Sara Bovi, Ben Keating, Michael Dynan starting the uh, TF Sport Aston Martin from third in GTE Am. So looking further down our GTE grid, slightly disappointed Paul Dallalana, just ahead of the D station, Aston Martin. Happy birthday, Thomas Floor, who celebrates his birthday One today. Board on the grid. Under one minute to start the formation lap. Drivers may start their engines. Please clear the grid immediately. Please clear the grid immediately. And remember, um, if you were looking in in the earlier broadcasts uh, for FP3, which will be carrying, by the way, live and free on YouTube throughout this season, and for qualifying, we have lost one car uh, with an unfortunate instant free practice that uh, cost the entry for the number 88. Uh, Proton 30 basic car. seconds on the grid, under 30 seconds to start the first of two formation laps. And by the way, if you are watching us currently, either via the WC app or on Eurosport, if you have friends or family or relatives or even... 15 seconds. Even social media colleagues in Brazil, we have news this morning that the race will be carried live and free on YouTube in Brazil with Portuguese commentary, so they don't even have to listen to our old nonsense. No. So, uh, bom dia. Green flag for the start of the, form of the first of two formation laps. We have the flag for the start of two formation laps. 
for those of you who are younger than me and Graham, uh, Lynn St. James, one of the great American racing names. She's a sports car racer, a single-seater racer. She's raced at Le Mans. She's led an all-female team at Le Mans back in the 80s and 90s. She's raced the Indy 500. Linton James, a great, great racing name from the USA. Really nice to see her as the flag marshal here, waving the field away. That flag, of course, delivered by the parachutist we saw a little earlier down at Sunset Corner. That's James, one of the absolute badasses of yeah. the, her era. Absolutely fantastic to see her here. Yeah. Her, her, and, her and Shirley Muldowney are really breaking new ground in North America at a time where none of that happened. Um, so, yeah, two formation laps. The first formation lap has been accounted for, and uh, Eduardo Freitas was telling us a little earlier, two formation laps have been asked for, have been requested by the drivers, and that is to allow them to get heat into the tyres. For those of you that weren't with us right at the very beginning, there are no more tyre ovens, no more tyre warmers, and the tyres can't even be left out in the sunshine here to pre-warm them, so they are stone cold, ambient air temperature, or a little below because they're in the shade. So two formation laps, and that will allow the drivers to build a little heat into the tyre by running the tyre on the road, but also through the brakes and so on. So it gives them an opportunity not to have stone cold tyres going down into turn one for the first time. And that is uh, devoutly to be wished. We are ready uh, nearly to go racing here in the pit lane. Louise Beckett, we will hear from her during the course of the race, catching up with all the news in the booth. Greg Goodwin, myself, Martin Haven, and hot foot and literally not, not perspiring because he's such a fit young man still. Anthony Davidson and uh, Ferrari leading the field away. What, what's the atmosphere like on the grid? Everybody relaxed or starting to get a bit nervy? Honestly, Martin, it had nothing to do with the golf buggy at all. Comments like that <laughs> from, the, from the grid. Um, look, it's nervous times for all of them, I'm sure. Uh, they're going into the unknown, really, in this race. Uh, they might have gathered as much information as they could have done from testing regarding their own performance. But in terms of the other team's performances, they're still going into this one. Look, hottest conditions so far, uh, this week at least. And uh, they're, they're going through this long 1,000 mile race, weaving around, as you can see, desperately trying to get tire temperature. You mentioned that already, Martin. No tire warmers this year. How is it going to unfold during the pit stops with slower cars on warmer tires when they're out of sync with the faster cars? And we've heard that the Ferrari is better on a colder track, that's probably why they're in pole position against the Toyota. What's going to happen in the hotter conditions, the hottest we've had so far? Three word phrase that we may hear a lot of here, and especially for the rest of the season, cold tyre graining. And that's when you come out and just work the tyre, front or rear, too much, and it starts to scrub instead of building speed. And once you've done that, it will never come back. Lower Rotrop Klaus ahead of Corvette Racing, Cadillac Racing, Camaro GT4 program, and a whole host of others, Graham. Anything else, yes, indeed. Just to remind you, if you're watching uh, with a live timing screen, you get that free through the FIWC website, of course. Uh, the clock has started. It started at the start of the second formation lap. 260 laps or eight hours is the distance for this race. Blisteringly warm again this morning. The fans will be, well, I'm sure, staying, staying. Can we, can, can we still use hydrated if it's not water? Is it, yeah, I think sure so. as heck isn't for most people here. No, it is but hydration. A real, but a real party atmosphere around the grounds here at Sebring International Raceways. It always is one of the truly great race meetings. Lights are off on the safety car. This is the final formation lap. Pedro Cochero leading the field around. And the Ferrari of Antonio Fuoco at the head of the field. Second and final formation lap, race one of the FIA World Endurance Championship, the 1,000 miles of Sebring. Antonio Fuoco's number 50 Ferrari leads the field from the world champions, Toyota car number eight, 
followed by car number seven, and then the second Ferrari in fourth place. But what about the LMP2 cars on colder tyres? Are they going to have a chance to try and claw their way through? We're not going to see an LMP2 car lead like we did in Bahrain, where we only had three or four of uh, the hypercars at the front of the field, because now we've got a, a, a depth in numbers, 11 hypercars here from half a dozen different manufacturers. And Ant, for those who are starting the race, who are now trying to close up in formation in two by two order, it's gonna be pretty tough. It will be. Uh, look, 34% of the grid have never raced here in Seabrook before. <laughs> 34%. And uh, we're the biggest field in hypercar that we've seen. So, you know, I, I can't wait to see the action today as one of the Peugeots already down in pit lane, number 94. So I, saw, I thought I saw him peeling off to the left-hand side. Right, we will send Louise scurrying. First scurry of the day, and they haven't even gone green. That's just, that's brutal. So one of the Peugeots in the pit lane. Brendan Hartley's had shaved his beard off overnight. It's weight Literally saving. overnight. Weight saving. He, he means business today, he clearly. He proper pirate beard. I mean, no Nicky team, let's be honest. But right, one Peugeot in the pit lane. Everybody else is ready to go. 35 cars will take the flag here at Sebring. How many will still be going when we finish in darkness in eight hours' time is anybody's guess. Safety car pulls off. Antonio Fuoco pacing the field. And as we get this generation of hypercars underway here at Sebring. Let's just enjoy this noise. Little dice for third between the Toyota and the Ferrari of Alessandro and Pierre Guidi were on board in the number seven Toyota, but Alessandro being a little brave on the tyres there. Yeah, Mike Conway in the number seven Toyota. He's been around this circuit many, many times in the IMSA category as well, and a great move down the inside into turn five. But Pierre Guidi gave him the room. Cadillac on Porsche. Porsche moves up ahead of the caddy, so that's Lawrence Vantor getting his nose in front of the blue Cadillac of Alex Lynn. Brief yellow to turn one, Claudio Schiavone seems to have trouble there as the Peugeot pulls out from that uh, pit stop right at the start of the race. So good, they're not going to go a lap down immediately, yeah. so uh, they'll obviously be waiting for an early uh, safety car or full course yellow in this race. I don't think we're going to go green all the way. Race start will be looked at by uh, race control, but it didn't look like there was an awful lot. Mind you, we were eyes only on the hypercar field, and there are two other classes, LMP2, United, the pole sitters, the number 23 car, and that is still narrowly in front of the WRT car, GGM. So this might be what we're looking at. There's Claudio Schiavone, turn one. Obviously didn't get enough temperature in the tyres. He's away though, and running. Change of position at the back of the hypercar grid. Uh, Oli Jarvis closing in on the Clicken House, which has been taken for position by the number four car. Yeah, there's a bit of concern with the LMP2 drivers at the start of this race, thinking that they're going to be held up by the Clicken House and uh, oh, the 94 still doesn't look like he's up to full That's racing speed. That's really not going. But quickly. they were concerned that the uh, yeah the the by Collis car, the van wall was going to be holding them up as well. That yeah. doesn't seem to be the case so far. No, it looks like, they've, well, Tom Dillman's got ahead of Ryan Briscoe. Let's hear from Louise Beckett in the pit lane as I press the magic button for the first time ever. <laughs> Just making it down to uh, the Peugeot 94. It's a gearbox issue. It's stuck in first gear. It's left the pit lane, however, they've just taken the dollies and ran out the back, so I have a feeling that car is actually going out into the box. It is going extremely slowly, Louise. Uh, the magic button, by the way, we now have a separate distinct button to put Louise on air, uh, so that's fantastic. OK, Toyota then chasing as Antonio Fuoco leads Sebastian Wemmy and Mike Conway. Alessandro Pierre Guidi in fourth place, up to fifth, Lawrence Vantor, who was very punchy before the start of the race at the uh, autograph session. Alex Lynn down to six ahead of Michael Christensen, Paul De Resta, and then here is the battle at the front of the GG Anfield. The pole sitter is Sarah Bovey in that uh, pink car with the Porsche, uh, Ben Keating, 
just behind her. And again, we talked about the potential of these two being the, the battle for pole, as it turned out to be. They were many times last year, but both of them in different cars, Graham Goodwin, from the ones they raced last season. They are, and it's the four drivers that really gave us a grandstand uh, finish to the qualifying session in GTM that are battling nose to tail in that class, but it's all at the moment about the 50 car. He's going away, but Sepp Wabey's going with him yeah. here. Well, again, it's the feel, Anthony, that the, that the tire is no longer sort of squishy and and, and under, under pressured. Now you, you've got. Now you can feel it really digging into the tire and that or concrete, and that's when you 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 feel comfortable to really start to lean on it. But again, you know, Buemi closes up in certain areas, and Fuoco goes away immediately again in 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 others. So we're seeing very different ways of squaring the circle, having that effect immediately. Let's hear from the Peugeot team. Box, 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 Loic straight to the tent. Bad news. Yeah, that is Loic Duval coming back into the pit lane. Didn't look he, like he had many gears, even if it was more than one, it wasn't enough. And so into the tent meet, behind the wall, that is a long-term fix. Now, we should see the car again, Ant, because they've got to get some miles on their on their cars. Yeah, they really do that, but we shouldn't be expecting this from Peugeot. You know, they were they joined this championship towards the tail end of last year, and they should have ironed out all these problems. That's why they did it. And meanwhile, you've got other teams like Porsche, Ferrari, Cadillac. Up there. One of the Porsches in front of the Cadillac, by the way, he's just slipped by Luke, uh, Laurent Van Tour. So good, good move by him to get past Alex Lynn. But yeah, the 94 Peugeot, disappointment already. And it's pretty much a carbon copy of what we were seeing to, you know, all last year with them. Yeah, that gearbox has been a bit of an Achilles heel. I mean, the, their unique way of going about delivering their, the aero grip that they need, that is required, not just to go racing, but is required by the regulations. Oh, lead change. Ben Keating's gone by through Sara Bovi. Uh, and it, up to third place is the 54 Ferrari, Lewis Perez, uh, 683 rather, Lewis Perez Compact's got ahead of Michael Diner. Uh, so Mike Dynan knows this track well. He's raced in the IMSA series, doesn't know the car, doesn't know the team. But uh, just had a chat with him this morning. He was uh, really looking forward to this. And here's the move from Ben Keating. Yeah, this is how it happened. Down the inside into turn four. That was nicely done there. Yeah, and uh, I mean, look, it's strange because he didn't quite have the pace of Sarah Bovi in qualifying, but yet in the race pace, it looks like maybe that car's being slightly kinder on its tyres, or... Uh, I mean, he clearly had multiple goes at it yesterday, and, I mean, Sarah Bovi drove the lap of her life, I yep. felt, at yep. the end of qualifying to claim pole position, but doesn't seem to have the pace at this point in the race. Top four, four mistake. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, but uh, Van Tor there, there's Sarah Bovi side by side and taking the lead back again <laughs> on the run down to turn one. <laughs> Must have been a mistake from Keating. He was yeah. starting to pull away. What happened? in that final corner. Oh, oh, oh. That's Costantini, and it's a big one. All right. We've seen turn one, very yeah. slippery already. We saw a spin earlier on. He's going to be OK because it was a slow-paced thing, but never nice to see a car right. go upside down like so that into the barriers. that will be, at the very least, a full-course yellow. It's not the remotest chance that's going to be so solved under local. So we go safety car immediately, and... Uh, Constantini had just moved up into third place at the expense of uh, Michael Dynan. Let's have a look at this. So offline, on the bump. yeah, on the on the grout, on the gr um, the dusty part of the track, and yeah, the tyre barrier has done its job well. But the problem with the tyre barrier is obviously it rebounds the energy, and that sent the car just over gently. But look, these cars are, are strong, they're safe, and. Uh, We've seen uh, worse incidents so far. This is riding on board. Yeah, he just he carried a bit too much speed onto the uh, dusty part of the track. We have an issue at the exit of T1. We have an issue at the exit of T1. Everyone to bear totally to the left at T1. Everyone to bear totally to the left at T1. Master of understatement, said what afraid to sir. No, no, no point adding drama to the crisis. Oh, no, but Absolutely. He, he's, I, I, you know, that's one of the, it's one of the things that is so important in a race director is not to have a panic when everybody else is having a bit of a flap. Uh, we saw it in, in IMSA qualifying for the Sebring 12 hours, which is tomorrow. 
big shunt there from one of the Penske Porsches that brought out the red flags. Uh, all GT cars be advised, we have an incident at the exit of T1. All cars to bear totally to the left. Let's close those gaps between the, G the GTs after T1. After T1, let's close the gaps between the GTs and the P2s, but do T1 with extreme caution. T1 is to be done with extreme caution. So, Lewis Perez Compact from third place, the Argentine driver, a real veteran of so many different motorsport disciplines, rallying, racing, just a fraction late. I call that as Costa I do apologise, it was indeed Lewis Perez Compact. Epic in qualifying yesterday, but a uh, mistake there. Well, he's I, fine. I think it was the uh, the race going on in front of him between Sarah Bovia and Ben Keating changing positions. I think he was trying to get involved as well, but just guarded by the, the crossing of lines between those two cars. I think just he's just lost his concentration momentarily, got on the wrong part of the racetrack, and there was no coming back from that. Right, he's shaking his head, but he looks to be okay. Medical crews are with him, the doctor's there. I'll just give him uh, a checkup. You know, there is a concussion protocol in the FIA's rule books, and so he will be uh, taken to medical center and examined, but... But you can see how deep the tie barrier is yeah. there, Martin. I mean, I've been into a one myself. And uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, although it looks horrific when you see a car go over, I can see that the tie barrier completely did its job. And, it was a slow thing. I mean, it's a dusty part of the track as well. On the outside, there's sand. And and that's why, unfortunately, you know, I think it's a necessary evil to have huge runoff areas on modern racetracks of tarmac because it stops the cars just bouncing over. Yeah. It was the grass, it was the dust, and the combination of the tyre barrier turning the car over upside yeah. down. Yeah, the turn one corner workers, they've seen this before. And they were stepping <laughs> stepping well away uh, as that car came around on that line. They've seen it twice already this morning, and uh, we're only two laps into our race, so this is the first race of the day, but they've had uh, a couple of cars off there and qualifying already. And it and it's a real shame, you know, you start the season with so much hope and anticipation, and, you know, they're not five minutes, ten minutes into to, into their race, and, and it, it, it's over and the car's wrecked. And Slowest track on the calendar. Only 48% of it's taken full throttle in these cars. And, you know, this is a circuit. It's an old school track. You can see it. It ain't pretty. <laughs> and it's going to bite you if you get it wrong. Yeah. And they say respect the bumps. It's not just the bumps. You have to respect every inch of this racetrack. Now, the way that Perez Compact spun is he went in sort of backwards, but on the driver's side, but the safety cell has held up. Down in the pit lane is Louise Beckett. She is with the 83 Ferrari Cruise, Liu Wudu. Lilu, watching uh, your one of your drivers go through something like that is not good to see, but the main thing is, driver's okay, is that correct? Yeah, it's not the, the good thing, but uh, Louise is okay, and uh, it is the most important thing. What do you think happened? I don't know, he lost the car in uh, T1 and uh, after he, he took the wall. Um. So he, there was no reports of anything wrong with the car, it's purely losing it? I don't know for the moment, but uh, we will see after, uh, after if Louise uh, told something. Okay, well, as we say, good news, he's okay. Thank you. Thank you, you. Angie Davidson, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's always tough when one of your teammates, whether you're sharing the car or sharing the garage, wisdom goes off, but the, the only thing that anybody's concerned at that stage is with the driver. The car's just a tin can, or yeah. right, an expensive tin can, but it's a tin can. But, you know, and also, Louise, obviously, she asked the right question, but a driver's never going to throw their driver under it, you know, it's yeah. t their teammate. It, you have to protect and stay united. Mate, with you your did teammates. it almost every time. No, <laughs> no, away from the camera maybe, but uh, yeah, not. Uh, you, you can't come on camera and blame your teammate um, completely. I can say that, yes, it was completely driver error, but you can never expect the driver to come out and blame their teammate to say it was driver error. So sadly, we're not going to get to see either Alessio Rivera or indeed young Lido Wadu uh, switches over from the Richard Mill Racing LMP2 efforts last season to GTM in this final year for the class. I've been hearing great things about her form in testing, so sadly that's going to have to wait until Portimao uh, for the earliest opportunity to get to see that in live racing. A very early bath, I'm afraid, then for the number 83 car. Safety car remains out there. 
clock, or rather the uh, race counter says 262 laps to go at this point. Remember, it's either time or distance, and that will be determined rather closer uh, to the end of the race. Antonio Fuoco leads the race. Sebastian Puemi, Mike Conway, Alessandro Piergridi and Lawrence Fantor. There is the stricken Peugeot. 16 minutes in with three cars down. One didn't make it into qualifying. The 88 Proton Porsche. That was written off in a 226 kilometre an hour shunt. Into a concrete wall. Yeah, so that wiped the front off the car. We talked to Christian Reed about it yesterday. He said, no, that car's destroyed. It'll never race again. New shell. Yeah, new shell, just like, yeah, yeah, new shell. Uh, the Peugeot out even, even before the start of the race. I well, mean, came, came into the pit lane uh, on the end of the formation lap with, with a gearbox issue. So that's a problem. And then well, the Ferrari, were, yeah. I said they were looking for an early safety car after that visit to the pit stop so early on. Yeah, not but, that um, early. Could, not you, <laughs> could you go? Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, in the end, it doesn't matter. They've had a problem. They had a problem they had last year. They're going to have to fix the gearbox. Yeah. They need testing miles. They've got to get that car to work and to be reliable. We are under safety car. Seven laps into the 1,000 miles of Sebring. Race one of the FIA World Endurance Championship in the cap. Carlos Tavares, former race driver and now head of the Stellantis group. The what now? Uh, that is the group that is uh, at least part of its responsibility is the owner of uh, Automobile Peugeot. And he is overseeing there, well, not overseeing, but looking over repairs ongoing for the 94 car. And this must be one of the frustrations, Graham, for the, for the engineers and for the drivers is that one will run perfectly and the other one will be a problem child. And it's never the same car that, that is. And, and it, so, you know, why? Why has one got a broken gearbox on the formation lap and the other one seemingly perfectly okay? It's just the racing gods decide, don't <laughs> they? But, uh, the, the, the key here is we're going to see this throughout this season. With this rapid growth of hypercar, we've already seen the pace these cars run, uh, can run, and it's very good pace indeed. But little doubt in my mind that it's going to be that combination of that absolute pace, but critically, it's going to be about reliability as well. Can they run to that pace for a full race distance? The ones that can will be the ones that we're screaming about when we get to Bahrain at the end of the season. Well, we, we talked about this yesterday in qualifying when Ferrari went to the top of the pile and grabbed pole position on their debut. Give me a fast car, I'll make it reliable. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be as hard to make a fast car reliable as it is to make a dog slow car reliable, but you know it's fast. And, and so, again, you know... It does matter whether they win the race or if they don't. Of course it matters. It matters desperately to the Ferrari team and to all the people back at Maranello who are, are probably just watching this going, OK, great. But the, the, the long and short of it is it's a quick car. And once it's reliable, then they've got something on their side. Let's catch up with Persia. Mirko Jensen, it's great to see you back here with Peugeot in WEC. Uh, obviously, you're the 93 car driver, but um, do you know any details about the 94? I don't know what's uh, going on in the 94. I see they tried to fix something on the rear of the car. That's all I know. Uh, I mean, our focus is on our car, uh, but I see the crew is busy there. So obviously sad to see uh, one car out already uh, at the beginning of the race. But for you, the 93 is running well? It's running okay at the moment. Uh, we're dealing with some of the same things as the practice. Um, but yeah, I think we, we just try to uh, have a good race today, try to get all eight hours through and gather a lot of data and, and do the best we can. How do you think the Peugeots are dealing with the bumps here in Sebring and, this, and the circuit in, in general? I think the bumps are uh, making it harder for us than, than it would be on other tracks. So I, I hope to see a, a big step for Portimao. I believe a big step for Portimao. Um, but, you know, that's also why it's great racing here. We learn more about our car and then we can improve for the future. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's got to be said when you've got a driver saying that uh, they're hoping to go the full distance and look at uh, data rather than points. That's not a man that's showing confidence. But I think he's right, man. They've tested tested a lot at Portimao. I think we're going to see a very different race when we get there. Um, they're certainly not anywhere close to the ultimate pace here, though. Well, like I said, slowest racetrack on the calendar here. Uh, it's unique. It's got a concrete surface in, well, for most parts of the track. Um, there's never been resurfaced. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's such a challenge for the cars and the drivers. We're just looking at a restart, uh, the replay here off the start. Everyone was...
you know, pretty pretty uh, well behaved, under control, but I think they have to be these days without those tyre warmers. We saw one pass here from Conway just slipping through in the inside of the Ferrari 51. But uh, yeah, I, I just generally all of the drivers having to just take it a bit easy apart from this car there spinning round um, goes to show the problem they were all facing. And I think that's why the majority of them were really just a bit too, well, not too tentative, but definitely more tentative than you'd see in previous years gone by. And actually that spin there for Claudio Schiavone, he was he was pretty much the last car on the grid at that stage. And yeah. so, and so, you know, if, if that had been the battle for the lead in GTM, there could have been a dozen cars off there because there's somebody going sideways across the pack. And here is why we're on the safety car. In third place, Argentine Luis Perez Compank running out a road on the exit of turn one, chasing the lead battle between Sara Bovi and Ben Keating in the pink Porsche and the yellow uh, Corvette. I nearly said Aston Martin there, managed to save myself. Well done. Um, but yeah, uh, Luis had just moved up into third place actually ahead of uh, Michael Dynan in the Oman Racing TF Aston and uh, yeah and chasing the leaders you know everybody makes mistakes the, the great and the good they all make mistakes you know you think of montreal it's not called the wall of champions for nothing exactly you know, everybody can go into the wall but that's why we're under safety car here in sebring two things going on here first of all we got to rescue the car it was upside down drivers out Lewis Perez compact seems to be perfectly fine hugely annoyed with himself enormously frustrated and in fact the passenger side of the car not that you have a passenger looks perfectly fine but he did go in on the left drivers left the, the near side or offside is not whatever uh, so so that's where the damage was so that's the first thing cars now on a flatbed that will disappear the second thing is the safety setup so all of those tire walls have to be reinstated perfectly as they were before because the moment we go green everybody's on cold tires you're going to get another car possibly in there as well so you can't leave things exposed it has to be back to where it was three laps of the safety car pit lane is now open that's a new rule again for this year we talked about tire warmers in qualifying because that played in there but the safety car rules and actually that's something that teams are a little less convinced of because it can remove some of the potential uh, for strategy. Let's hear from the 51 Ferrari team. Okay, Ali, we're going to box this lap for fuel. We're going to box this lap for fuel. Keep an eye on the pit clip. The pit entry is open at the moment. Okay, I, I, that, that's a, that is an American racing way. You don't have track position, go with fuel. We're going for fuel, we're going for fuel, we're going for fuel. I mean, I mean you know, this is going to be a long, drawn out race. It's not going to go. Pit stop, pit stop, pit stop, pit stop, pit stop, uninterrupted. This is going to be a scramble, and both Ferraris are in. Now, I, I was not expecting them to bring the leader in, so they're surrendering track position for Antonio Fuoco. They are not splitting their strategy. That's very interesting. Keeps the cars out of the melee later in the race, maybe, but it is an interesting strategy. They are never going to be out no, of the melee. Right. What was I saying, really? OK, United come in as well. Who came in? That's the leader, LMP2. Ollie Jarvis is in, so too Alpine and the 22 United. There's half delay. a dozen it's cars. A delay. Rob. That's because there's a car pulled in in front of him. No, there was something. There was, there was a problem. Wow, GTEM almost whole field in for fuel. There's the Corvette of Ben Keating, Michael Dynan right up his chuff, as James Hunt used to say. There is a problem Still for the problem. Ferrari. He was blocked by a Ferrari. It was a car going in in front of him. No, it was something that this car, the car momentarily went up on the jack. There was a shake of the head uh, from the driver on board because something was going on. We need to get Louise down yeah. there, if you're listening, Louise, because uh, that was this something wasn't right in that pit stop. And then he got boxed in by other cars coming in. That's what's supposed to happen. That, that is a problem for AF Corsa. They brought in their, their hypercars and right next door their team also brought in a gt car to block it no stop no don't do that they must learn from that they must not allow themselves to block themselves in but don't have the problem in the first place that's the thing you know the other ferrari got out no problem at all it, that was the plan and something went wrong in that plan well let's get down to the ferrari pits louise beckett with miguel molina
Miguel Molina, the number 50 Ferrari coming in, uh, leading that sea of cars that then came in. Uh, what was going on then? Just a, a dash of fuel? Yeah, uh, it was a small refueling. So let's see how how it will be. Uh, the guys should have everything under control. So uh, we just uh, keep going and let's see. Uh, so far was the first lap were so uh, so good. So let's see. You were just you just had an eye on the 51 pit stop as well because they seem to have a bit of an issue. I didn't check. I I, I saw that the car was stopped, but I don't know. I don't know what happened. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Well, a couple of things out there. I'm, I'm slightly surprised that Ferrari didn't split their strategy and they must make sure they're not blocking themselves in as well. Uh, so, Toyota 1-2, Penske, Porsche 3rd of Lawrence Van Tour ahead of the Cadillac. So, the Caddy, the Porsches, the Penske stayed out, Floyd Van Wall stayed out, Glickenhaus stayed out, the one Peugeot that's still running stayed out. So. Ferrari going a, a different way on this, Graham. Yeah, also staying out was a 777 Aston Martin, which you can see ahead of the uh, Ferrari. The biggest problem, as they put the 94 back together for the 51 car, is he was delayed enough to be out in amongst the GTM traffic, so he's going to have substantially more traffic if it goes back to green relatively soon. It's still a win in terms of being able to put fuel in your car yep. uh, with the whole field traveling slowly, circulating slowly around the track. Uh, maybe Toyota qu will come in this lap. Uh, we don't know when it's ending. Safety car is definitely still out there as we I, look I, eyes on the Peugeot. I would think another three or four laps, there was a lot of tyre damage. A lot of tyre stacks need to be put back in. So if the Toyotas were to come in now, then they would obviously have used slightly more fuel. Yep. Uh, no, they're still staying out there. But um, interesting strategy because I get it from Ferrari's point. They're back in the queue. With the safety car, it means everyone can bunch back up again. So effectively, they've had a, a semi-free pit stop to put that extra fuel in their car. Now, D-Station did not stop. Uh, Tomonobu Fuji is in the car, and Tom Ferrier and his engineers saying, no, stay out, stay out, let's get your stint done, let's, get, let's give you track position, let's just let you run. And so that means that they have split strategy. I know they're not sister cars, or they're, they're not the same team because they've got different driver lineups they've got different sponsors and so on but the the oman racing team ort car and the uh d-station car have gone a different way each of them okay uh, you know <laughs> in seven hours and a half we'll probably find out that it didn't make any difference at all because this will not be the only interruption of, of green flag racing at least that safety car was some good fortune for the peugeot and that it was uh, it's lost fewer laps uh, whilst the rest of the fuel was under safety car. Also stopping, by the way, under that safety car, both United Autosports uh, and MP2s, the 36 Alpine uh, Elf team car, uh, Prima Racing 63 and the Interior Pole 34 all stopped under the safety car. Too. And again, WRT didn't stop either car, Jota didn't stop either car, Vector, one of the Premas, one of the Alpines didn't stop. So Prima and Alpine have split their strategy Jojo gone, we don't need to feel this early, whatever. Again, it's going to be, as always at Sebring, a race of interruption. It, you know, 12 hours to Sebring, 11 hours to survive, tw one hour to see who can win this thing. And this is going to be the same, you know, 1,000 miles or eight hours. It, it's going to be surviving seven hours and seeing if you can get yourself in the final hour into a position where, where you're actually able to finish on the podium or, or win the race. Repairs are done at Turn 1 with just the last vehicles making their way to a place of safety. Then race control can ensure that they're happy with the state of track and uh, if you like, trackside defences there. Uh, the, I was just wondering whether there was a gearbox issue on that big Peterbilt, but it does seem to be rolling now, so safety car remains out. Uh, and a new livery on the safety cars this year, again provided by Porsche, but with a new livery that is celebrating 75 years of Porsche. And we now have Toyota running 1-2. See if we can uh, get a little adjustment on that trackside microphone that is deafening you at home as well, as sure as, I, uh, as it is us. Uh, one of them is uh, definitely reading off the Richter scale. Yeah. 258 laps to go. We are 30 minutes in. 22 minutes uh, on pit road, or rather in the pits for that Peugeot. And it's lost them eight laps to the field. Yeah. So it's going to be a long afternoon and evening for the number 94 crew. All smiles down at Toyota car number seven at the moment. Mike Conway, a great move at the start of the race to uh, overtake the car 51 in turn five. And uh, both Toyotas, as you'd imagine and expect, 
putting the pressure on Ferrari straight away. I couldn't tell who looked like they had better pace, very, very evenly matched. Now things get interesting because they're out of sync in terms of their pit Ooh. stops. So the second Alpine comes in. Now, because in the pit lane they have the same pictures that we do in the box, they've seen everybody moving away. Right, we've got maybe one lap to go. Get him in now, get him back in the queue, give him time to build that heat into the tyres. Drivers are saying, out, and, and you'll probably relate to this, that once we're rolling, cold tyres less of an issue. Why? Because you've got a lot of heat in the brakes, and that will help to increase the speed at which you can warm the tyre to a degree. Yeah. So to a fraction less of an issue once we're racing, because the car's already hot, and that helps to build. And that's, that's part of what you do when you're building heat into the tyre, is on the throttle, on the brakes, on the throttle, on the brakes. Build the heat in the, in the brake rotors, transmit it through the wheel into the nitrogen I that fills the, the tyre. I think the biggest problem is out of the way for them all. That was in qualifying, yeah. uh, in terms of the tyre warm-up. But uh, yeah, like you say, the more laps that you do, all of that heat soak from your very hot brakes uh, are going to soak into the new wheels when you put them on and that from the wheel dissipates and gets into the actual tyre body itself. So it's still difficult, of course, and we've seen a lot of cars go off here so far this week because of that issue, yeah. uh, and then it will continue to be an issue through this, this race, but uh, probably more so towards the end of the race when the sun goes down. Uh, one thing to say, we're talking about whether or not the, the, the safety car lights are off, whether or not the other hypercars might take the opportunity to pit. There's one good reason why they wouldn't, which is because a lot of the cars behind them have already pitted, no they'd have the whole train ahead of them. The line. No overtaking before the line. And of course, that line is not in front of our pit lane, it is in front of the regular pit lane at the start-finish line, so they, they're not, not going to be able to overtake down the Ullman straight, so uh, just uh, a, a reminder there. It's not like in US racing, and actually that's important for some of the US racers and some of the US racing teams. It does not go green everywhere. You're only allowed to pass after the start-finish line because you are finishing a yellow flag lap and starting a green flag lap. So Very hard track to overtake on, of course, yeah. and uh, maybe that's why Toyota have gone for track position rather than the better strategy to pit uh, like the Ferraris have done. In my opinion, it's given them a bit of a free pit stop there, but now they have to work their way through the field Toyota don't. Right, now we're going to see how quick the Porsche and the Cadillac are because we've got the two Toyotas, then we got... What's happened to the clicker now? Porsche the Cadillac. Cadillac. Oh, it's pulled off. Now he's missed the pit entrance as well, so the clicking house is going very slowly. No overtaking before the line. So, green, 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 here's the call. Lights went out on that clicking house, didn't they? Yep, and that has peeled off somewhere gap. down the Ullman Strait. And that gap's there because of the Glickenhaus. Yep. And the, Ferraris they could... and the Ferraris in that second group. Yeah, and they yeah. couldn't overtake him. Let's hear from the Glickenhaus team. They've got Resources. an issue. It starts to pick up to speed again now. Guys, I lost drive. I lost drive on the engine. I lost drive on the engine, so that sounds like electronics rather than... Although they did have electronic gear shifter issues early in the development of the car, but Ryan Briscoe going again, you heard the Aussie on the radio, but you're absolutely right, you know, that's a little setback for the Porsche, uh, for the uh, Ferraris, which are further back in the queue. Laurent Van Tour, by the way, car number six, the Porsche, doing it again. He found his way past Alex Lynn on the last start. After this restart, he's uh, after the safety car. He's putting pressure on the uh, on the back end of the Toyota, car number seven. So uh, clearly finding speed and confidence with the colder tyres. Yeah, Graham. Lawrence has always been a feisty one, hasn't he? And uh, and always looking forward to the fights ahead this season. Big, big year for a lot of these drivers stepping up into hypercar. And for me, um, it does give the wider motorsport world a real opportunity to see the talents of drivers that perhaps some people have written off as just DGT drivers. Well, not, not any longer. Well, no, not really. But also, the thing that we have to consider is that the, the hypercars, they are heavier, they are a bit oh, yeah. slower than the LMP1 cars, and actually more akin in many ways to a GT car. So you speak to GT drivers driving these cars today, and they say, it's actually not that different. This is what Kevin Estra was saying when I spoke to him two days ago. He's saying, look, I, I feel quite familiar with these cars. In many ways, 
it's the, the drivers that, say like Andrew Lutterer, that remember the good old days of the LMP1 cars that were faster, lighter, more downforce, more powerful. And it's harder always. I've always found in, in, in my time behind the wheel, it was always harder to kind of drive a car with less performance than it was to drive a car with more performance, where the only mistake you could ever make was not to brake late enough and not to put your foot down on the throttle early well, enough. So well, long uh, enough, Richard Westbrook in the last couple of days, at one of the press conferences there, uh, talking about it being akin to one of the old GT1 cars, uh, the Cadillac uh, uh, hypercar. So that is uh, Westbrook's car, albeit in the hands of Alex Lynn. You can see from the rear view camera on the Porsche. This car is uh, back for the third place at the moment. So Boy, me, Mike Conway, Lawrence Van Tour and Alex Lynn, Michael Christensen, Paul DiResta and Tom Dillman make up the remaining seven uh, cars in the train as the two Ferraris begin to make their way through the traffic. And that was an absolute gift for Toyota, wasn't it? The Glickenhaus pulling over there momentarily, holding back the train of cars that couldn't overtake him. We heard Eduardo Freitas, the race director, saying yep. no overtaking before you get to the line. Well, they were nowhere near the line. Yep. But in that situation, you can overtake a car. If it's breaking down, that's when you need to know the rule book as a driver. But they don't know it's breaking down. They couldn't see the front lights going out like we could. They've, it's cost the chasing Ferrari the number 50 car about 10 seconds. And that look battle. at that. Sorry, it Graham. around the outside. Whoa, that was a real risky move there by Antonio Fuoco. He knows he's trying to make up for lost ground there with the Glickenhaus that pulled over after this corner in here, turn 16. And that really went against them. I would say anything they gained in terms of strategy there, they're definitely lost out with with the uh, with that Glickenhaus. So they're making up for, for lost ground here is the LMP2 car, the WRT, just showing you get this quite often in the cars that you're trying to overtake or lapping later on in the race that aren't in the same category as you. They just show you a bit of a a bit of a jink to the side, say, not here, buddy. Yeah. You weren't going to wait your turn because otherwise you're going to slow both of us down. The difference, by the way, that that uh, delay in the pits made to the two Ferraris, Fuoco now closing in on the LMP2 leader. Uh, Alessandro Perquidi is just getting on the back of the LMP2 train, so it's a significant loss on the track with this race going back to green. And again, when, when you see the race interrupted like this, it will happen lots and lots more times. There will always be winners and losers on the carousel of a full course yellows and, and safety cars. Here's the lead battle in GTE Am. Uh, not the lead battle. No longer the lead battle, no, because the D station car is still out front. So it is uh, the second place battle, Ben Keating ahead of Sarah Bovey. This um, is going to go on all race long, isn't it? Between oh, these yeah, <laughs> well, you, you would hope so, definitely. I mean, they will hope so, definitely. You know, Ben would love to win his first time out in yet another different kind of car. And for, for the Iron Dames, mixing their Lamborghini GT3 program in IMSA with the Porsche program now, not Ferrari in World Endurance. They're, yeah, they've got a busy year on their hands and, and Sarah Bovey again and Ben Keating, you know, they've been so entertaining all last year and a change of car has made no difference at all. No, the dynamic between the pair last season, particularly qualifying, was absolutely joyful. Yeah. And the, the change, the Porsche for the Iron Dames and the Corvette for Ben Keating, you're completely right, no difference whatsoever. Worth pointing out, by the way, the D-Station car that leads this pair by dint of not having stopped uh, under the safety car. Tomo Bifucci bought that car, their silver driver. Yep. Sarah Bovey, definitely the more feisty of the two, I'd say, though, with Ben Keating. Um, it's always interesting watching them battle. Our race director summoning the team manager of car number 50. That is our pole sitting Ferrari. I wonder why that might be. I can take a guess that whether or not he was a little trigger happy on the restart. I didn't well, we... see much wrong aside from that, unless something happened on pit lane. We have, we'll wait and see. Yeah, we have onboard camera, as you can see there with the 50 Ferrari. It's now clear of the LMP2 leaders, which are the WRT cars of Sean Galeel, who is the one who shut the door into sunset, and you would, and Robert Kubitzer, who leads in LMP2 now. And the gap is 20 seconds to race leader Sebastian Buemi. Uh, seven seconds, by the way, for his next target, which is the number four van wall, as Alessandro Pierre Guidi has still got a further ten seconds back, but what is that? Six cars between the two Ferraris. 
So the fight back starts here. This will potentially swing back a little bit to the Ferrari's way when the other cars have to stop if they have to do so under green. Glickenhaus picked up a penalty last year for overtaking before the line at the restart. And so Corvette we'll pit stop. See. Corvette pit stop under investigation, we're hearing. That's the Ben Keating car. It is, the 33. Oh dear, oh dear. So there was a little bit of a tussle getting out of the pits between that car and the uh, the Iron Dames car. I don't know if that's something we could see again. They came very close. Whether or not that's an unsafe release call, couldn't call it without seeing it again, to be honest with you. But it was very close indeed as they came out. Robert Kubica leads the field in LMP2 after that uh, round of pit stops in the WRT team. So he drove for the Prema team last year. A change of teams for him and Louis Delatraz uh, was his teammate last year as well at Prema. But, but as you said in the interview with Louise at the beginning, started his journey in the European Le Mans series with WRT. So that's, you know, it, it's back to, to where he started. He got himself some education in WEC last year with Prema, now back with WRT. Six laps to go after this one. Good job, Sean. Come on. <laughs> yeah, he is doing a good job. Yes, he is. Sean Galeel is the silver driver in WRT, so Kubica obviously a platinum grade driver, three different grades of driver in LMP2, like in the um, GTM category, um, not necessary in the uh, hypercar, of course, you can run uh, all platinums if you wish, and that's pretty much what they do. So Sean Galeel doing a good job there to hang on as this is a Ferrari blasting its way past the Prema car towards turn 10. You can really see the power difference between the hypercar and the LMP2 there. Just a, a mark of the uh, the quality of the LMP2 uh, grid. Four X Formula One drivers currently on track and the reigning IMSA champion. The should have six more laps. Pace is good. When the fuel load comes off, they'll come to us. And that was, of course, a message to the IMSA champion, reigning champion, Oli Jarvis. <laughs> Yeah, United were saying that uh, they everybody everybody in LMP2 LMP feels that Jota have just got a little edge with this new tyre rule, and that particularly I think showed in, in, in qualifying that that it was it was a, a, not everybody had the same performance across their two tyres, and actually the United guys were saying, and, and actually uh, also Robert Price was saying, you know. Over the last couple of years, we've really worked to get ourselves very, very close to the front, to be right on the front running pace. And now, taking the tyre warmers out has has changed the balance a little bit. We, we, we're maybe not quite where we want to be, and I think United feel the same. But again, of course, that's just qualifying. That's just free practice. When he gets to enter the race, and here we go, Alpine versus United. Nice-looking battle. Gearbox emergency off. Gearbox emergency off. Now then. emergency off. So Does that, I think that sounds. Turn off the warning light. I said so. Yeah, I think it yeah. sounds good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I think we know what it, you mean. <laughs> less, yeah, less bad. I, I read that as a, as a good yeah. message. I don't yes. know why. Um, as this battle rages on between. Now she's got to be careful here because there's no point getting involved too much and damaging your car or, or going off track, trying to overtake a car that is under investigation, don't forget, yep. from that pit stop. So I'm sure the team have relayed that information to her. And so, uh, yeah, long old race today, obviously, 1,000 miles. Just isn't, you're, you're right there with, effectively, the lead of the race because the others haven't stopped yet. That's why yep. this isn't the lead battle, but the others, yeah, yet to stop. So don't do anything silly here. Keep your nose clean. You're going to be changing drivers anyway. Your platinum and gold driver is going to be getting in at the car after you, and the race will carry on. That's a really difficult mentality to yep. get into as a driver. You see the car in front. You are desperate to get in front, but you know, as I always said, something always happens in endurance racing. And the, and the other thing is, don't spend too much time tucked right into a slipstream, overheating your tyres, overheating your yeah. engine, overheating your brakes, because you're going to need those for the next seven and a half hours. So, yeah, just give the car, move it around a little bit. It's a relay. A bit of you know, this is a relay race. It's a, well, it's a marathon it relay race. That's what endurance racing is all about. And you see the car number seven closing up. Mike Conway to Buemi through the traffic. Car 50 under investigation for overtaking under a safety car. That's got to be a slam dunk. But 
is it overtaking the Glickenhaus? If so, I would argue it's OK to overtake a car that's got a mechanical problem. Well, wait and see. Uh, that could be a significant moment for the 50, which, by the way, um, is on the tail of the Van Wall right now. That is seven. tight. Oh, don't do yeah. it, Mike. That's it. He slots into position in between Paul Dallalana yeah. and the 98, and that's what you need to do, but that and looked again, risky for a moment. And again, Christian Reed there doing what he should do, which is protecting his car and his line and his life by making sure that the Toyota didn't force him offline. Here, being offline can have a much more detrimental effect than a lot of other racetracks, because out there lurk, lurk bumps that you've not allowed for. Well, look what we saw yeah. just a few laps ago, which caused exactly. that safety car exactly. in turn one. And, but, you know, you, you have to sometimes just let it go and admit defeat when you see going through the traffic like these Cars on now. <laughs> it's just a yeah, to like it. oh. <laughs> but that's that's endurance rate. That's what you have to do. You, it's it's a risk and reward process as a driver, cutting your way through the traffic. Yeah, Paul Dallalana in the uh, blue, green, and black Aston Martin there, a long way out wide in 17. He will just have breathed off the throttle a little. What you don't want to do is run out of luck on the outside. He was having a look down the inside, Dallalana and Christian Reed. We'll wait and see if that move took place. The little battle we saw a lap ago, by the way, was United's Frederick Lubin getting ahead of Danny Kvyat, ahead of Julian Canal. In fact, Julian Canal's dropped his spot to Danny Kvyat in the Premier Racing car as well. So um, that Alpine going backwards. Julian Canal, of course, is uh, their goal driver. Uh, switch for position for seventh as Antonio Fuoco catches the train of hypercars has gone by them before in the hands of Tom Dillman. Uh, the Kessel Racing car guys, Ferrari again. And so, you know, this is all about self-preservation and never mind yeah. preserving your race. It's about oh, oh, preserving yourself and the Project One AO cars. Is that PJ Wyatt started that? It is. Again, just... Oh. Well, like I said before, 34% of the grid never raced here and it's a tough track to try and work your way through slower cars, lapped cars and, you know, let alone fighting for true position. And um, looking at the LMP2 battle here, don't forget that most of them pitted during that safe car. Yeah. I think the front runners there in this battle didn't. So these, that's why these guys front. didn't. Yeah, these front five did not stop. So Robert Kubica leads and is pulling away because Sean Galeo is really under the cost from the first of the gold. Um, I was going to say WRT, but I mean Jota cars. First gold car, that's Pietro Filipaldi, Will Stevens right behind him. And then the Prema car behind him, that's Ben Fiscal. Those five did not stop under safety cars. So they're on a different strategy to the cars behind, led by the 23 United car. In fact, I don't think Vector stopped either. They didn't. It's the top they six. So, so yeah, Gabby Aubrey is in touch with those cars. Yeah, he's back up to the miss me. The kind of darker maroon car, which prefaces the colour scheme they're hoping we're going to see later this season when they add the Isotta Fraschini car, they hope, to their efforts and the LMP2 car will continue, oh, I'm told. Dallalana having another look down the inside of Christian Reed. Hold it, hold it, hold it, hold that shot, gets through, did get through, yes, and Christian Reed, uh, they can see Fuoco. Um, there you can see the uh, green nose of the Floyd Van Wall car. But what you also see was Fuoco closing in on Paul De Resta yep. for sixth position in this recovery drive. 20 seconds back from the leading Toyota at the moment, the early leader of this race. Remember, losing that lead as they opted to pit under the safety car for recovery of the number 83 car, crashed out in turn one, side by side. Stefano Constantini in the red and yellow AF Corsa car. The other one, Lewis Perez Compact crashed, is red, but white highlights where this car has yellow, so that makes them a little easier to separate out. And 77, the only Proton entered car, or Dempsey Proton car that is here, the 88 Proton car didn't get through. We just saw the Ferrari That's showing its nose on Pierre the Greedy. inside. This is Alessandro Piergrini looking to get through GTM traffic. Yep. His next target is going to be Mr. Ever Preston, the man that has started every FI World Endurance Championship race since 2012. Christian Reed. Well, Ale relatively quickly got by the Ferrari, but not quite so much. So this is Sean Galeo here in the car 31 with the two Jota cars right behind and the Prema as well. And all of them, I think, do believe, haven't stopped no, yet. So, so this is right. a genuine fight going on for track position. Now Jota cars looking for a way to get by because they can see what we can see, which is the first of the cars. It comes a second Jota car yep. and Galeo. 
Right, so interesting. Oh, damage bodywork there. I don't know if you'd already spotted that. On the Vector car, uh, yeah. yeah. OK. So here we go, all down to the pit stops. I'm guessing drivers will stay in. As uh, the car 50, Fuoco. So Sean Galeo and past. Will Stevens on the pits. Uh, and yes, the, uh, the pass. Ferrari already up to sixth position. Shows, though, where the pace is in this race. The next gap for Antonio Fuoco to uh, address is the gap to Michael Christensen. He's 13 seconds up the road. So uh, Fuoco's last no lap driver time. change. Fuoco's last lap times are one fifty point five, and uh, Buemi forty eight nine. So uh, yeah, a bit of traffic perhaps for the Ferrari driver. Looking here in traffic at the Ferrari making the pass on the surviving healthy Peugeot. So Antonio Fuoco going by Paul De Resta. The rest has had uh, a few Ooh. times last year Sorry, where the Martin. car the, slowed under him. Yeah, just saw De Resta, the, the rear of the car, which has been a common problem for the Persia all week so far, the rear just slipping out a bit too much mid-corner through the final corner. And, uh, yeah, that's what allowed Fuoco to get the run on him down the uh, the main straight. We've seen as well that car really struggling, particularly through turn, turn 17 and turn 1 is where visibly the 93 has been sort of really struggling for grip. And, it, and part of that is the ground effect. Ground effect works if you keep that gap below the bottom of the car and the ground as even as possible at, at the perfect distance to, to generate maximum downforce. Hence why the active Williams was so sensationally good, because it managed to keep that gap, even with flat floors. But when you're bouncing up and down, that, you know, Clap your hands, that's that's the, the road and the bottom of the car. Well, as I say, it's like a vacuum cleaner. Doesn't really work when you lift it off the ground, does it? So it's at its best no, no, no. when it's at the right position. And, and the bumps here are inducing porpoising that the team have, have eradicated from the chassis. So this is their worst case scenario. The, remi the remainder of the group of cars that didn't pit now pit. Ollie Jarvis back to the lead in LMP2. Remember, he stopped for fuel under that safety car. He powers down is through. Here? That's right, with the HRX yeah. branding on the nose of the 23 car. And so Christian Reed still in that battle with Stefano Constantini behind. Constantini keeps his nose in front. So you can really see the benefits of having stopped under the safety Absolutely. car. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. That was a, the moment, the correct call from United Autosports. They did it with both cars. Well, that, that is the American way because they're used to cautions. They're used to that affecting, the, you know, the way the, the track works. And so go for fuel. Always. Uh, there's two things. Either track position if you're leading and you're getting close to the nitty gritty or fuel, always take fuel. It, it will never be a hindrance that you've got more options. Ben Keating will be asking the Corvette team after this stint whether or not there's a pink tint to the mirrors in the Corvette. Because <laughs> it's been so close all the while. Up the inside goes the Peugeot. Here is our leader, meanwhile, yeah. lest we forget. Coming up with Fuji. In is the that the first car. time that Fuji-san has started? No, he, 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 they often do start him to try to get track position to I'm, hand over to uh, Satoshi yeah, Hoshino. Yeah. It, it may be that, that Hoshino gets in now, because Ben Keating habitually starts, does three hours, and then hands the car over to the rest of the guys. And Sara Bovi does the same, runs out very wide, really veeing off turn 17 there. Big group of cars behind this Cadillac, uh, battling away. It's the cars just out of pit lane from Ellen P2 and the chasing Porsche. Uh, I'll correct myself, by the way. I did say that Tomano Bufucci was the silver driver for Triple Seven. He was. He's now gold. Gold. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a sign up clearly that uh, the performance was there last year. Indeed. He's moved up a, a driver ranking. You know, and the, and the danger is always there for somebody like Sarah Bovi and Ben Keating and, uh, you know, Paul Dallalana, that actually they're so good as bronze rated drivers that the danger is that you then get recategorized and so you're you're suddenly your own silver and you have to find a bronze to join you in the car and that's that's not going to be fun the fastest lap of the race goes to race leader sebastian boy meets a 148.346 for him on lap 23 and this battle gentlemen between the six and the uh, the number two the porsche and the cadillac is beginning to get close again Pergrini, meanwhile has made his way past the van wall and uh, is up into seventh place. It was a 49. Place. So, yeah, like you say, Graham, a 48 3 for Buemi and a 49 2 that last lap for Fuoco. So, still quite hasn't, hasn't got the pace of the Toyota, but don't forget, carrying more fuel. 
compared to what the Toyota are at this stage. So a little bit of a loss of performance there. But at this point in the race, in the, in the hot conditions, as Toyota suspected, they've got the performance over the Ferraris. Things get interesting in the cooler conditions of 48.3 this time around for Mike Conway, and that's a personal best. Let's look at the gap, the lead gap here to the chasing Ferrari, remember our early writ leader, 26.2 seconds. The Ferrari is catching Marcos Christensen. Uh, that gap was 13 seconds, now down under 10. So that gap is coming down. Robert Kapitza, so they did. The, out. Yeah, they did a driver change during that uh, round of pit stops. So, so yeah. out single of stint. Yeah, so single stint out of sequence, therefore, compared to the rest of the LMP2s around them. It looks like hot work, doesn't it? Well, and, and do you know what? That's why, you know, yeah, sure, you can leave him in there for two stints, but he'll be as worn out and degraded as the tyres, so keep everything as fresh as you can. Stop it overheating. It's what engineers do with every single element of the car, except the human element. Oh, mate, just go to the gym more often. That's not an answer. Tell me that's about a, it. <laughs> that's a cop-out. Louise, oh, back in. Oh, hang on, Louise, back in. Oh. Right, we'll get to Louise. Louise, what do you have? Don't as worry. PJ Hyatt goes backwards into the tyres at 17. Go ahead, Louise. Uh, I was just going to say that uh, Kubica on the grid before I spoke to him had been saying how hot it was even then before he'd got into the car. So clearly struggling with the heat, maybe. Yeah. Well, PJ Hyatt rotating relatively harmlessly in 70. And again, that's, Anthony, there, every single one of these blocks of concrete, you can see them in the foreground. They're about two metres by two metres, which means every two metres, there is a step where one has sunk more or less than the next one or its neighbours. There are bumps everywhere. And every time you come round offline, there are more bumps you haven't allowed for. And that's why PJ ended up backwards in the tyres. Not because he ran out of, of luck or talent but because he hit the wrong bump in the wrong place and ran out of grip yeah exactly uh, you know it's one it's one of those corners on the track it is high speed and if you do get off the wrong on the wrong line a bit like turn one this track is really going to bite you meanwhile ben keating in the yellow corvette being chased by sarah Bovi in the pink porsche not that pink Porsche, the, the, the pink Porsche that we've got here, not, not, the, uh, the, not the pink pig version that was uh, raced at Le Mans a few years ago by the factory. And again, this is a, I, I'm loving the colour scheme on, on this year's Porsche 963. It's got all of those echoes of the Salzburg Porsche Centre 917. Oh, yes. You know, it's, and, it, and actually, if you put the full Salzburg livery on it, it's not unlike the frontal look of a 917 it's got some sort of family familiarity and the v-series any v-series cadillac owner will again see echoes of that in the in the shape of the caddy here same way that any peugeot owner will see echoes of peugeot's current road cars in its hypercar well let's hear from the toyota team okay mike feel free to adjust anti-roll bar front if you need for balance it looks like we're using a bit more rear tires than sub close the driver is to the steering wheel. I mean, that really exaggerates it. It's almost like on his chest. Mike's always had that style. It's just, uh, yeah, it's like the NASCAR style. You want to yeah. be bite the steering wheel. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he's clearly comfortable driving in that position. Um, but also his head's a long way from the headrest behind. And I, I always hated that. I always want my head to be on the headrest. I could feel the car better that way. And also your the front neck muscles um, that are struggling to keep your head up under acceleration. Prepare for becomes quite full wearing. course yellow at 12.58.45. Full course yellow at 12.58.45 in 30 seconds. Tire stack. Tire walk, tire stack. Yeah. I was going to say, I think they would, they would take a look at that and make a determination as to whether or not they're happy it can take a second impact. Yeah, the, the, the delay there is Eduardo has asked the on-site yes. flag marshals, where, what's the situation? Or is there more? Whoa, uh, there's one of the Alpine, that's the 36 car. Just having a sand. little moment, Juju Canal. Yeah, the reason why they have to do that, obviously, is because the circuit is homologated Correct. with the tyre barriers in that position. As soon as they're out of position, you're racing on an unhomologated circuit. Now, you see the lights come on, the pit lane speed limiter has been engaged, everybody, ooh, down to, you have... I don't think I've seen that before. You have five, I think it is new on the Toyota. I, I don't recall seeing those, those... Yellow indicators. Yes. Oh, no, exactly right, yeah. 
Well, maybe they're like BMW drivers. They've never had uh, indicated oh, fluid. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Who joined the championship yeah. next year? By yes, the way. indeed. Yeah, well, well, welcome to yeah. well, you. Take yourself out of that one. <laughs> and, and actually, again, you know, exciting for us here is that. The BMW is here. The BMW is racing oh, yes. in the weather sector. Looks system, great. So we can see it and hear it before we even get it. It's like knowing what you're going to get for, for Christmas, except more exciting. Well, here's the reason we're under full course yellow. PJ Hyatt just getting the wrong bump in the wrong place, sticking where he should have zagged. And he's pushed the tyre wall back. Watch the tyres here. You know, that's where they're supposed to be, not there. So it won't take long to push them back, no. but we do need to push them back back under full course yellow then at Sebring. Little incident that doesn't seem to have done anything more than move the tyres for PJ Hyatt. But I tell you what, you know the energy there. You try moving those with your, just your own body, they're not moving. Let's hear from Lawrence Van Tour at Porsche. And Lawrence, we have to assume the car behind is going to double, OK? We have to assume that, so we will react accordingly. They're talking about the driver staying in, of course, when they talk about double. Oh, and or tyres. Now, you don't have to double stint your tyres every stint, but you are going to have to double stint them a lot. So they may decide on whether to go for a new driver and new tyres or not. The 12 hours, uh, the eight hours, a thousand miles of Sebring getting underway to start the season. Roger Penske bringing his team and Porsche to the World Endurance Championship. And Toyota with Peugeot, the uh, incumbents in the hypercar class, facing a whole host of new challenges with Ferrari joining the field as well. And Ferrari claiming pole position after two formation laps to warm the tyres because there are no longer tyre heaters allowed in the World Endurance Championship. Antonio Foco, the man who claimed a sensational for pole for Ferrari on their first day of top flight sports car racing in 50 years, led the field away. And as the second Ferrari, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, was shuffled back from moving up into third place by some robust defence of the Toyota Mike Conway. Further back, at the tail of the GT Anfield, Claudio Schiavone having a harmless spin into turn one. The Peugeot didn't make it that far. The 94 car needed a gearbox, uh, some gearbox work, possibly replacement. Meanwhile, those who battle for pole position in GTM, Sarabovi in the pink Porsche ahead of Ben Keating, and behind them, Luis Perez Compank, who had just moved up into third, went off. That was within five laps of the start. Safety car came out to repair the barriers and to recover the Argentine driver's but inverted car. With extreme he was A-OK. -okay. The car is out of the race. Problems in the pit lane delaying the 51 car. There was a sea of pit stops very early on in the race after that safety car. And then as we went back to green, Toyota, who had not stopped picking up the pace at the front of the field, running 1-2. Sebastian Bermier ahead of Mike Conway. No stoppers in the uh, LMP2 field as well were WRT and Prema, as well as Jota, and they led the battle as Antonio Fuoco moved his way back through the field. It is D-Station who lead in GTEM. United leading in LMP2 and Toyota run 1-2 in hypercar. We're still under full course yellow and trouble by the look of it for Fred Lubin in the number 22 uh, United Autosports car. Pitted as it went to yellow and it's still there with back green flag racing. Yes, we've gone back to green. There was two or three cars there momentarily being shown as stopped who had not stopped. So some little glitch in the software, but you're right. Yes, Frederick Lubin uh, spoke to him this morning. How many times have, uh, have you been to Sebring? None. Never been to Florida before in my life. Zero miles. I said, so you're starting then, jokingly. Yes. OK. All right. <laughs> in at the deep end, off the high board, Frederick Lupin. Uh, so whatever the drama was, the car is rolling once more, comes back in front of the Kessel Racing car guys, Ferrari and uh, 93 for a Porsche. Peugeot, Martin, you idiot, going slowly. That is not full racing speed. That's nothing like full racing speed. Now, it's not pit limiter speed. That's not 80 k's. 
but Paul de Resta has got a problem on his hands. One car has already had to go back behind the wall for gearbox work. Let's hear what the 93 car has got to say for itself. No gears, no gears. Copy, I can see, stand by. Stuck in fourth. That was stuck in fourth. Uh, for those of you who aren't uh, too good on the on the Scots accent, not anything else. Alex Lynn under pressure here from the charging Michael Christensen. All of a sudden, from a position where it was the Cadillac pressuring the the uh, the Porsche that's ahead, it's the Cadillac defending for the Porsche that's behind. Louise Beckett in the pit lane. What do you know? News from the 22 United. It was just a bit of confusion. Obviously, Freddie's new to the championship. He came in before the pit lane was open, I believe, so they sat it out until he could go back out again. Thank you very much. Um, if you can have a little wander as well to Peugeot and find out exactly what happened to the first broken car. Car 15, drive through penalty for overtaking another car before the end of the safety car procedure. Car 50, drive through penalty for overtaking another car before, before the end of the safety car procedure. All right, that looks like the replay of what happened there. Went past the D-Station car inches before the white line. And it, it is, you know, it's an, it's an error. It's understandable that he's eager to get by. And, of course, he'll have been having a run at the car out of turn 17. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things. It's, it does happen. But as a professional driver, driving for a top manufacturer like Ferrari is inexcusable. You need, yep. Like I said before, Graham, you need to read the rule book. You need to know where you're at. The race director, we all heard it. No overtaking before the line. And that's uh, it's, you're in a car that's got much more performance than the GT. You have to respect that line. And uh, a, a bit of a silly mistake there. Great job yesterday in qualifying. De Resta complaining no gears in that car yeah the the uh, the hand movements there did not look entirely positive did they car number 50 with that penalty let's hear the team relay it to their driver antonio fuoco okay mate we overtook 10 meters before the line at the safety car restart so we get a drive through penalty i'll let you know when we proceed stay out well, sooner rather than later is the way, you know, you can argue the toss, but they, they've been looking at it for half an hour in race control. Yeah. That's the decision. There's no point arguing it. Just I'm take the penalty, it. get in, get out. I'm surprised it took as long as it did, yeah. uh, really, because it, it was, was clear. so clear as day, wasn't it, yeah, overtaking yeah. before that, that checkered line. Paul de Resta sits patiently, but, I mean, once again, so it wasn't a problem that was unique to the 94 car. It's, it seems to have struck both of them. It rarely is, is it? If, if one car's got an Achilles heel, it tends not to be just the one. I wonder if it's all the bumps, the way that car's been Maybe. riding the bumps, it's savaging its way through the gearbox. But we didn't see it in testing so much. Uh, it's it, reliability. Yeah, it, it, and it's not that it's damaging the box bouncing on the ground, it's the transmission yeah. shunt, it's the snatch every time the wheel spins and grabs again. That just puts so much strain through the drive shafts. Yeah, it could be a drive shaft issue, it could be an input shaft in, you know, in, in the gearbox or an output shaft in the gearbox. The differential just, just taking so... And, you know, that is why IndyCar, one of the reasons why IndyCar comes and tests so frequently here in Sebring pre-season is it breaks stuff. There was, you say, that the, the 12 hours of Sebring uh, race was like the equivalent of doing the 24 hours of Le Mans. Yeah, mechanically, absolutely, yeah. and physically on the drivers as well. Half as long, twice as hard. Mikkel Jensen saying, uh, Louise tells me that Peugeot are looking at the same problem with the 93 as with the 94. Drive through for 50 being served. Well, look again, you know, it's all part of learning how to use the car, learning how to race the car. For Antonio, he's been in the GT category, blowing by people at the start-finish line has not been a thing up until now. That, I, know, I mean, yeah. I know he's a professional racing driver at the highest level and all of that, but it all it is all part of the learning experience. That's a very good point you make there, Martin. Yeah, he's been used to, obviously, driving in the GT cars, which, you, you mean, you're the one that's getting overtaken. It can yeah, take, and it can take you half an hour to get by another car. But still, you know, he was a professional getting paid very well as a GT driver, <laughs> and he's a professional getting paid very well to drive at the top in the top ranks of the hypercar. Car, but I did say before coming into this race that is where Toyota are going to beat Ferrari if at all yep. in the, operationally that's where the drivers are included in that as well you need to know the rule book and this is what Toyota have been doing 
year after year after year alone, pretty much alone. But now they've got a competition. It's for the competition to meet them in every single standard, and that's definitely one of them. Graham Goodwin was pointing at the screen, Graham, that because... LMP2 lead on each of this on pit road, as is the, uh, the 36 Alpine from second of the hands of Julian Kamal. They're the cars, two of the cars that stopped under the safety car when they could. Meantime, the 50 car of Antonio Fuoco has dropped back a couple of places with that drive-through penalty, dropped back behind the team car, and has also dropped back behind the van wall. He now runs eighth. Jakub Srimovsky, by the way, now up to, oh, the lead in LMP2. I was going to say third, and even as I looked at the screen to confirm, the two cars in front of him stopped. So our early stoppers are now stopping again, and back up. Ooh. Oh, trouble. Trouble for two of the cars there. Seven. Uh, the 51. Was, yeah, it was the 51 car trying to work his way through, and again, both of them at sixes and sevens in that little 15-16 um, sequence called Le Mans. Yeah, right, left, right, it, yeah, but just, just a little bit of missed communication between them. No drama done, no harm, no contact, no foul, no penalty, and uh, heart rate on, on, on respected pit walls coming back down again. New fastest lap of the race, it's our first under 1 minute 48 seconds, it's a 1.47.885 for the leader as the fuel load comes down, said Boemi going quicker. Is that faster than the car qualified? No. No, they did a uh, low 45, yeah. They but did 45 too. But it's way faster than they were showing in free practice. They were in the 49s, 48s in free practice, so 47. Well, well, what has happened since Saturday and Sunday's prologue? More cars have run on track, not just our cars. You arrived here? <laughs> That's something that happened. <laughs> well, quite a long after Saturday and Sunday's prologue. No, more cars have run here. We've had the Michelin Pilot Series. We have had uh, Porsche Carrera North America. Hordes of Porsches. We've had the entire IMSA WeatherTech field. We've had the entire World Endurance Championship field. The track has been silent from about 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. But apart from that, it's been non-stop cars so the track is getting quicker and quicker less and less dusty more and more rubbered in it should if it's if they're not quicker now what the hell are you doing wrong and a whole load of sandbags as well somehow appeared <laughs> uh, around the side of the yeah, circuit do, do, do you know that what? sand I wasn't here when we arrived i'm sure i i don't think sandbags are happening uh, I, th I think the stakes are much too high now that looks yeah pretty forceful from the ferrari what do you think Anthony? here we go riding on board so you try to go around the outside he's found a space gone to the inside he's i think drifted. it was just yeah he's he's, he's gone too hot he's found a bump hasn't he and gone in too hot and I just think, uh, yeah, he went in a bit too hot, got onto the, the dusty part, and uh, look, you could argue force another car off track. I think it, the move was on when he went for it. Yeah. He, he was in the right position on track. He just couldn't slow the car down quite enough as he launched into the corner on I, the inside. I thought he'd actually got it done, yeah. but I don't think he thought he had. And, and you know, when you're in the LMP2 car on the outside there, you're going to give him space. You're going to just breathe off the throttle and let him get in front of you so he doesn't interrupt your race and come across and swipe you. I think if the LMP2 car had lost a position there, did he lose a position there to the no. he was racing? No, so, no, yeah, you so. could have argued you were forced off track. Well, there is the 51 Ferrari continues uh, on its merry way. Both Peugeots now right down at the tail of the timing screen. So our LMP2 battle led by United Autosports 23 car still. Josh Pearson at the wheel. And then this battle, Sean Gillale, head of Pietro Filippaldi and Will Stevens in the two gold cars and squeezing through Rui Antrad, right, uh, beg your pardon, um, uh, Ben Viscal right behind them. Mark Conway on pit lane now, yeah. the number seven car. Interesting, by the way, that uh, stop for United Auto Sports 23, their second stop, uh, driver switch to Josh Pearson, but they go back to the lead. So despite the fact that they have stopped twice, they retain the lead over the cars that didn't choose to stop under the safety car. Mike, Mike Conway, Conway, staying in for a double and. Yes. I mean, you, yeah, know. you stole the words from my mouth, Martin. Yeah, you can just see how the drinks bottle comes into the cockpit, and that's a sure sign that the driver's staying in. Well, and also the door's not open, and he's not bailing yeah. out in a hurry, because that, the driver can still be the slowest part of the pit stop. Absolutely. His Cadillac comes in now for yep. their pit stop. So Chip Ganassi Racing's first pit stop in the World Endurance Championship. Double as well for the... Uh, Phoenix Lynn aboard that car. 
and of course I tell a lie because Ford. Jim Canassi Racing Ford. Yes, you idiot, Martin. <laughs> and that's so long ago, you know, that's fully five years ago. I'm, 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 I it, does see, it does seem like a completely different era. I it can't remember remarkable. breakfast. It does, actually. But, you know, that era, and you think about particularly the race at Le Mans in the GT field in, in, in uh, 2015, wasn't it? That, that battle with all of those manufacturers, when we get to GT3 next year, there'll be more. Absolutely There'll right. be more of them, and there'll be more teams running them, and it'll be, I mean, how, how you get an entry, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you deal with that. You know, the, the, the ACO and the World Endurance Championship management are going to be flooded with potential cars. Yeah. Flooded. And Josh Pearson here with mirrors increasingly full of this chasing quartet of Oricas. The two, it's a WRT 31, both of the Jota run cars, and then the first of the Prima cars. There is young Josh Pearson. Yeah, he's, like you say, Graham, they are slowly edging closer to him. And uh, Sean Galeo still doing a remarkably good job, I have to say, soaking up all that pressure from the two Jotas behind. There was a lock up there. I don't know who dropped the second of the two Jotas, actually, into turn 10. It's Will Stevens in the second of those two gold cars. Again, you see, look at the way the cars are riding all these bumps. They're great pictures, aren't they? And it's a rough ride in the LMP2s. They're, they're oh, yeah. quite a, they're, it's a good car, but it's a basic car. By that, I mean the suspension isn't as sophisticated as what you'd see from the hypercar category, for example. So, Toyota have made their stop, Glickenhaus and Porsche now both in the pits. Ryan Briscoe stays in the Glickenhaus, the door closes, no driver change either in the number six Porsche. Lawrence Van Tor takes a tank full of fuel and heads on his merry way. They're clearing out those ducks at the front of the Glickenhaus. And look at the... <laughs> Look at the hydrocarbon stains all the way down the back from that twin turbo engine in that Glickenhaus. Again, one of the joys here is that it's it's not a prescribed set engine. The only controlled factor in hypercar is the tyre. Everybody uses the same tyres from Michelin. Beyond that, whatever you like. And you'd have to say that it has to suit one car better than another. Um, you know, who's it developed around? Predominantly, you'd have to say it was more Toyota in the past. They were the only team out there doing that development work. So it is the architecture. But it is a brand new set of tyres this year. Every tyre is different. And also, tyre rules are different now. It's not going to matter here. He says that overconfidently. It might matter here later, because we have not had a dry finish to a race yet here. Um, there are two types of tyre. You can have a slick or you can have a wet. There is no intermediate. It does not exist anymore. So when we get to Spa and we wake up on race morning and there's snow on the ground, you're on wet. You know, talking to Antonio the other day about it, uh, Felix de Costa, he said, you know, you go from a, a wet, which, which burns out quite quickly on a drying track, especially somewhere quick like Spa, and then you're on an unheated slick trying to build speed on a wet racetrack. Yeah, good luck with that one. Um, but what I was going to say is that the Peugeot runs obviously different diameter, uh, different yes. width of tyres compared yeah. to yeah. everybody else in hypercar. Third leader of the race, as Alessandro Pierguidi, on a different strategy here from the Totas, goes to the lead. So both Ferraris have led this race, plus the number eight Tota. Yeah, so the, I, I, I should, sorry, I should elaborate on for, for people new to this category. Yeah, so the Toyota run, uh, Toyota and all of the others run a narrower uh, front tyre compared to the wider rear. The Peugeot is the same all round. Yeah. Um, they work out, if you take uh, the mean average of all four tyres, they work out to be the same. Yep. But the Peugeot runs the same width on the front as the rear. And that's interesting, isn't it? Because you've got cars like the Ferrari, which has a hybrid drive to the front axle, and the Peugeot, uh, the, the uh, Toyota as well. Uh, and, and yet they can survive with, with that. Now, I mean, it just works better for them in, in the wind tunnel and everything. PJ Hyatt went off into the tyres earlier, and now one of the door mirrors is hold on only by the cable for the electronic control. 
So like your road car, Do you reckon it's still adjustable works? from yeah. the inside. Yeah, he's probably getting quite a good view. And that's how he took the mirror off the car. And if that's all the damage that happened, then that's a real get out of jail free card. You don't get many off track excursions here at Sebring where all that happens is you bing the ding, uh, a, a door mirror a bit. And you could he didn't even come into the pits. Now, here's the 93 Peugeot in the tent behind the garage, uh, behind the pit wall. We don't have garages in the pits here because we're in North America. They have a hot pit lane. You bring your trolleys in and your pit counter, but there are no garages attached. Everybody works out of, well, here a tent, but, but predominantly a truck awning. Let's hear from Oli Jarvis, fresh out of this car, the race leader in LMP2. Louise Beckett is with him. Oli Jarvis, you put in some great work yesterday to get pole, and uh, it was a great start for you. That strategy has paid off as well. Yeah, I think the team made the, the right call. Um, it's never easy with a safety car that early, but you know, I think that hopefully will work in our favor as the race progresses. Uh, we've got a fabulous race car, so we've just got to do our jobs and try and stay out of trouble and just keep putting in consistent lap times. How is it out there now with the hyper cars and everything? You know, the championship is changing. Yeah, it's changed a lot. Um, it's definitely more difficult. Uh, the first four or five laps with the hyper car is, is not easy. It looks like they take longer to get the tyres up to temperature. At that point in the race, we're quicker, but they have so much more straight line speed. They pass us back or it's, it's difficult to overtake them. So what that does is all the P2s bunch up in the corner and it is just trying to sort of not trip over each other. But, um, you know, hopefully as the year progresses, we all get used to that and we can manage it a bit better. But no, it, it's not easy, but uh, it's a lot of fun. You've been holding out to get your lunch, so thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. A great start of the race from Oli Jarvis. And trouble. Puncture here. Puncture trouble. on the right front. Yeah, just see it flapping around there. Ben, unfortunately, he's going to make his whole way around the circuit ah. back to the pit lane. The, the, the IMSA pit lane, he's just passed, uh, but no joy for the WEC. How did this happen? Was it, a, was it contact? It was. Was it with the car seven? Yep. I know, or has it just put him off and he's got the puncture when he's gone off onto the, uh, onto the grass here? Mm, I need to see another shot of that one. Maybe he's picked up the puncture. He, yeah, was he going slowly? Because he was... But then he would have pulled into pit lane. Both Ferraris on pit lane. Well, both uh, hypercar Ferraris on pit lane. 51 from the 50. 1-2. <laughs> that puts Sabrami back into the lead of this race. Yeah, so that looks like a more uh, yeah, scheduled stop. Not as flustered as it was under the, uh, the safety car. Still, by the way, the... Battle between the Corvettes and the Iron Dames. Now, of course, for the lead. Let's listen in to Lloyd Duval. Debris on the race line, T15. Debris on the race. So, Debris being called. And I wonder if that. Oh, it's, it's the, the mirror. mirror. I was going to say, it's either the, uh, some bodywork from the puncture of the, the Aston we were looking at before, or it's that mirror. That could call for intervention here. That's a substantial piece of debris. If you go put in a human on the racetrack, usually that is at least a full course yellow. So Eduardo Freitas and his team will be very aware of that. How come the two 499Ps? Yeah, the trouble is it's such a high speed part of the track as well. You see them just coming around onto that back straight from the complex where the mirror is stricken on the racetrack. So, oh. oh, and now you're going to see a bit more bodywork potentially. Yeah, the driver's gone too quick here. And uh, machining the wheel now. Yeah, that's, that's the problem when you carry too much speed with a flat tire and you see it sort of flapping around and it starts to do damage to the rest of the car. And you have to drive uh, unbelievably slowly when you're in a racing car. It feels like you could just step foot outside of the thing when you go in that slow, but it's necessary to stop this happening. He's just out of turn 13 on his way back to pit lanes. So in fact, presently, but with what damage? Hopefully just the wheel. Still want to see, uh, I can't believe it was contact between the Toyota as Conway made his way past. I, I don't believe it was. I, just I don't think, think it was. was. I think you're right. I think it's a slow puncture yeah. over, going over the grass and that's why it took a while for it, for it to develop. Full course shadow is coming in 30 seconds. That will be principally for that debris. Mirror from the number 56 car on pit lane. The Iron Dames, by the way, from second place. 
This is going to be an anticipation of this full course shot, I'm sure. Oh, look at that. That's a, almost a pass there on Sean Galeo. It's edgy seat stuff through turn one. Always has been, always will be. One of the, I just think one of the most entertaining corners. <laughs> Will, Stevens, Will Stevens clearly Three, with a bit between his teeth. One. Full course yellow. Full course yellow. And he wanted to get that uh, move done before the full course yellow, but uh, it wasn't to be. He now sits right behind on the full course yellow speed limit button that you have in the cars activated. Yep, throttling bit on the front right corner. And damage to the uh, the front right as well, I think, from that uh, flailing tyre. So as, here we go. The uh, <laughs> the mirror gets finally picked. I. I Personally, I think that should have been a black and orange flag, mechanical flag. You yep. can't have a bit like that. It's, it's heavy. It's yep. flapping around on the car. I don't know what uh, what was going on there, but that that should have been uh, called in to repair. And also dangerous. You can't see the cars coming yep. up behind, particularly in the GT car. So I and think that was a, a bit of a, a missed uh, call there. So the IMSA safety team, of course, on duty here. Hugely professional bunch. So what happens is under a full course yellow, when you're inside the car, you hear the countdown, just like we do from Eduardo. You hear that via your race team engineer. And so they're given that five, four, three, two, one, zero at zero. Quite often, a lot of the teams will activate that full course yellow button. But some other teams know that there's a little bit of a discrepancy in there, a little bit of play with three seconds worth. Uh, of allowance because they don't expect everybody to, as the 93 comes back in here, they don't expect everybody to be able to digitally meet the speed limit straight away. So there's a little bit of allowance. The teams play with that. So uh, some other teams will start counting up from yep. zero afterwards. And when it gets to three, after they've counted down zero, then it would be one, two, three. That's your cue as a driver to press the full gear. <laughs> and you see the difference between teams that are much more on it and willing to take that risk to right to the nth degree compared to other teams that play it absolutely by the rule book. Well, let's have a listen to what's going on with the 51 Ferrari of Alessandra Pierguidi. But they're packing girls trying to overtake me outside. It's in the Fuku Cello. They are going to overtake me in Fuku Cello. Out of the pit. I was recording that this at the car line too. Not okay, okay. There. We will let the race director know. We will let the race director know. You hear exactly it was something something oh, was going on out of full uh, into full course out of the pits. So first of all, apologies to any listeners that uh, heard some foul language there. I think there might have been, um, but yeah, that's clearly frustration there uh, by the feeling that he was overtaken under the, the full course yellow, which obviously is a no-no. Twenty no. seconds to remove full course yellow. So going back to green, he might have a valid point, but we need to see a replay of that. But he clearly felt he was overtaken uh, Ten, as nine, he came out of the pits, eight, or she came out of the pits. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. So away we go. Sebastian Boemi leads the race. 230 laps uh, scored to go. He leads in the number eight Tota. Giro 10 from teammate Mike Conway, the number seven. Then it's the two Porsches now um, with the Cadillac, I think, on the restart, getting by and between the two Porsches. I think we've just seen Alex Lynn retake fourth position. So Sean Galeo still holding on. No, time for glitch. He's not. <laughs> yes, yeah, Galeo still holding uh, Will Stevens at bay. And I was really enjoying that little scrap before the full course yellow. So that uh, that uh, carries on. And uh, Josh Pearson still out in front. So he, that, uh, oh, two Porsches getting very close together. Number six and five as they enter turn one. But uh, yeah, Josh Pearson in front of that LMP2 field still. Oli Jarvis saying that his teammates saying that the car is feeling great today. They know they've got a, a fast car under under their hands and, and they've just got to keep their nose clean. And uh, well, it's a long old race obviously here today in Sebring. Anything can happen. But so far, young Josh Pearson, what is he, 18 years old? I think he's 18 now. Um, be 18 now. I'll double check it. You know, he was too young to race the first two yeah. races of the Asian Le Mans series two years ago, and had to only do half the season. His birthday was between the two weekends at the UAE. I think he may be 17. 
Long pit stop for the Omar Racing Aston Martin. That was the, uh, yep. the puncture and the repair to the front wheel. Well, I was just taking the wheel off and throwing it in the bin and putting a new one on, but it's it, still it, it is still there. So a number of cars, in fact, Vector Sport in the midst of quite a long pit stop as well for the number 10 car. I wonder That's if there's a down the bit order. of suspension damage to the Aston. It goes back up in the air. In comes the uh, 60 Iron Links Ferrari. Pit stop for number 50. This is another investigation for the number 50 car. Already had a drive through Antonio Fuoco. That was for passing a car before the restart. So maybe it's uh, a speeding in the pit lane deal. This battle continues. Will Stevens got ahead of the second of the gold Jota cars, didn't he? He got ahead of Sean Galel. He's back behind him. Uh, or he got ahead rather of his teammate Pietro Filipaldi. Sean Galeo stuck behind the GR Asia Porsche and right behind Galeo now is the Prima car of uh, Ben Viscal. So Sean Galeo going back behind Will Stevens, which is probably not a surprise. Second stint on the tyres for the LMP2 car, so they'll be starting to feel the pace of the early race going. Yeah, 94 Porsche on pit road. Both these cars pretty heavily delayed now. Not been a good afternoon. A good afternoon. It is afternoon now uh, for the Peugeot Sport Team, Peugeot Total Energies. Cadillac closing back in on the two Porsches. Does seem to me, on a restart, those Porsches just seem to have a little bit more of an edge, briefly, over the Cadillac. And then the sledgehammer on wheels, there's a Cadillac. I adore it, more than words can say, by the way. Just gets back rolling and seems to be able to close that gap again. So he's, uh, yeah, twice now he's lost out positions as Alex Lynn to both Porsches on those restarts. Well, once for the actual start of the race, and uh, now once again, oh, what's happened there through turn 10? A very different line yeah. um, from car number five. Is it Exeter? I think just trying to line himself up to overtake the Porsche into turn 13, but that wasn't to be. Alex has got a good lead. run here, but I don't think he's going to be able to uh, achieve anything before they get to turn 15. Oh, squeezes through on the inside of what is still Christian Reed. I think, no, it's uh, Michael Peterson in the Dempsey Proton. 77 car. Yeah, Alex knows this circuit well, has won the Sebring 12 hours in the past, of course. And um, it'll be an interesting one to look back at the history books to see who, if anybody, has scored wins in both these great races here. Still such, such an accomplished international racer, Alex Lynn. You know, a little bit like Ollie Jarvis, when they come over to IMSA, then they sort of disappear a little bit off European radars. Um, but, yeah, hugely experienced, of course, like a, a number of drivers in the field, lots of experience as well in Formula E, as well as his junior single-seater racing. So plenty of experience and mileage under his belt in all sorts of categories. Michael Christensen, uh, he and Kevin Escher were looking an awful lot more relaxed this morning than they have been uh, for the last few months of last season in the GT category. Of course, you know, they'll end up potentially going head to head again with the same Ferrari drivers in the same Ferraris as they did last year in the GTE class. That may well uh, play out again once more in hypercar. Just a, a few more added rivals for, for good value. 11 hypercars in the field and a whole bunch more still to come. Some of which we've seen, some of which are racing here in IMSA, some of which are still on the drawing board and, and yet to turn a wheel. And we talked about the cars, we talked a little bit about the drivers, the depth of talent in this hypercar class, absolutely amazing. Trouble, oh. trouble for Vector Sport, that car is going behind the wall. Now it's talking of new hypercars, look at the two words there on the back of that uh, fin, Isotta Fraschini. It's a name from the 1930s. Uh, uh, and earlier. Yeah, a, 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 a real high caliber automaker from the early days of automobile manufacture, a little bit, little bit like Hispano Suiza, who were also at one stage reputed to have a program coming. Uh, but uh, with the Isotta efforts, uh, car built up at Michelotto, previously responsible for the build of the Ferrari GT cars. That's uh, Baton passes to Orica now for the new cars, but uh, that car they're hoping to have ready to race later this season. And were Mich Michelotto not responsible for the 333 SP as well? The so they have that prototype experience as well in, in Ferrari's history. They do, they do, when we've got Sauber involved with the uh, with the uh, the 
wind tunnel area of it, the aerodynamics from the team at Williams Advanced Engineering, as was. Uh, so there are some big names involved with this effort. It will be Vector Sports that bring that car to the track when they're ready. But it doesn't mean we'll see the end of the LMP2. Um, that car will continue as well. Just ahead of this LMP2 battle, American on American action. PJ Hyatt in that red, white and blue Porsche being chased down Ben Keating in the yellow Corvette. Through, though, goes the WRT car. That's Ooh, the that second place car, Sean Galeo. Very late from Sean Galeo there. And uh, the Porsche the driver had to yeah. really make room there as he was on the correct racing line and had to just dart out to the left. Oh. Bit of a naughty move, you'd have to say, from Sean Galeo. He thought about it and then backed out of it, then went again, and that was that was the problem. It is no further action, though, on the Corvette. That's good news. That good. wasn't the last pit stop. It was the one before. One other quick pit point to here. make. Pit stop here, surely, for uh, Will Stevens. Both of the cars. Oh, and Galeo, yeah. Go, go to uh, pit lane. The other point to make is in comes PJ Hart. That car will have to replace that mirror, remember, uh, on this pit stop. We saw Sarah Bovey pit the Iron Dames car just before the full course yellow came out. We wondered whether or not that might play out in her favour. One minute and 30 uh, seconds on pit lane for the Iron Dames, quicker on pit lane for uh, the Corvette, but it's lost position because part of it was served under caution. Louis Beckett. Just speaking to Gary Holland from Vector, he said they have an elect uh, electronics issue. The water bottle has leaked in the cockpit and they're just investigating that now. Excellent. You can't make this stuff up, can you? Well, there's a, yeah, an awful lot of cars in there. My driving history have had ECUs that have been fried by water leaks, but they, you don't expect that in a racing car in a hot climate like this. Alex Lynn all over the back of the second of the Penske Porsches and Michael Christensen. As uh, you saw in the, the pit lane, Sean Galella, Will Stevens for LMP uh, in LMP2. PJ Hyatt is in, and then, as you said, that may be a slow stop. Gabby Aubrey being pushed away by the Vector team to go into their awning, where all work other than regular routine servicing must happen. We talked a little earlier about uh, the, w the way to win these races is not just speed, but it's no fault. With the rather frenetic race that they've had in the Ferrari F Corsa uh, race. At the moment, Antonio Fuoco, still with something hanging over them, is over a minute back from the lead. Let's hear from the 51 car then. This is not Antonio Fuoco, it's the sister car. OK, Ali, you're doing good. You're doing good. The sister car had an issue at the pit stop and didn't get all the fuel in, so they are light and they are pushing. They will be stopping in just a few laps. It's these kind of moments it's that we talked about before, wasn't it? The Ferrari so. versus Toyota didn't get all the fuel on board on, on one of the Ferraris in that last pit stop. Got to be error-free. Got to be error-free yeah. whether or not that's the driver on track or what's going on with the pit equipment and personnel. And that's what's done the damage here to the attack from Ferrari from, from, uh, from pole position. Already a minute back and still with trouble ahead for Antonio. Here we go. Look victory. at this, guys. Look at this. You've got Alex Lynn all over the back of Michael Christensen as they come towards the final corner. Outside, inside, going to force Christensen to try and defend late. But I don't think you can no. cross the line. It's, a too, it's too high a speed, this corner. Alex would have known that, but he's given himself a nice run onto the main straight. Tucks in to the back of that Porsche slipstream. Is he going to dart out? Christensen knows it. He defends in anticipation. But has he carried too much speed in the mid corner? And Lin's going to get the run on the exit. He does. He's played that beautifully. Has Lin stick it in there, Alex? Come on, you can do it. Yes, he does. It's brilliant stuff there between Cadillac. Two really good experience races. Cadillac and Porsche, brilliant stuff. Christensen really trying to hang on to it in turn one. You saw the back of the Porsche dancing around and there's the traction gone. They gave Alex Lynn, you know, that half a step that he needed to get alongside and once he was on the inside down to turn two, it was indefensible. Also, Christensen knew the game was up. Okay. Well, but he had to be brave. This one. You, of course, you get That's what I say, kind of stick it down Absolutely. the inside because it, it, he could have backed out of it. It's tricky, you know. You're on the dusty part on the inside line going down towards turn four yeah. and you don't know how late the car beside you is going to break they're on the racing line of course so they can take it deeper into the corner so really tactful stuff 
Yeah. From got... both drivers, yeah, excellent. That is, that's how it's done. And you've, Great got to, stuff. you've got to respect the driver you're racing against yeah. and his abilities when you know it's a calibre of that kind of car and you know who's in it, the team will have told you. So, yeah, you've got to back yourself in that situation, put it on the inside, make him work hard. Now, look, look at the speed. Yeah, the carry has gone by the Corvette for free at the right place at the right time. Meanwhile, back in our LMP2 battle again, the two Jota cars, Hard at it. This is David Heinemeyer Hansen and David Beckman. David, take it easy. Which one? Both of you. <laughs> and the Toyotas in between. Drive through penalty, by the way, for the 35 Alpine for speeding in the pit lane. Ollie Caldwell is the man at the wheel who will have to serve that. So there have been all sorts of driver changes in LMP2. Uh, Julian Canal in 36 has not stopped, so he's doing a double stint. Kubis Mohovsky at Inter Europol doing a double as well, but just about everybody else. So Ben Fiscal at Prema uh, doing a double, but just about everybody else single this. stinting. Here we go down Move the down inside. Ferdy Habsburg does not leave a gap untested, does he? He does love an overtake. Brilliant move there by uh, Ferdinand Habsburg in the number 31, getting past Beckman. I and think the family family motto might be if there is a gap and you no longer go for it <laughs> yeah, he, great stuff he, yeah he does he's, he's on a mission he, he is a super aggressive racer i mean so relaxed and laconic out of the car he just grows horns behind the wheel that was david armour handsome is the other david we confused our david's there uh, it's, it's it's high my hands that got passed there i think by uh, by Habsburg, is it not? Yes. Yeah, and it's David Beckman next up for third. So you're right. Uh, I'm going to look forward again to Heinemeyer Hansen's analysis of driver, a particularly lower graded driver in LMP2, uh, silver driver uh, analysis that, that he, I mean, he the, he's a, a data whiz and he loves all that stuff. And by the way, he's not alone in uh, reflecting the abilities of drivers in LMP2 because Goodyear have introduced a new Wingfoot uh, prize that be awarded at every race for the driver who has the best double stint, which is going to be quite entertaining as well to see where that ends up. Um, David's always been very good on the analysis of who's produced the speed when and how in LMP2. Yep, we have triple stint, by the way, at Le Mans for that to reflect the additional challenges of the world's greatest race. That, that will be um, Cast Iron Buttocks Award, I think that will, won't it? Three, three stints in an in a LMP2 car at Le Mans. So good to see Goodyear, the, of course, the Soltar supplier for the LMP2 class, pushing hard to recognise the talents of the drivers in what's been a fabulous class with these Gibson engine cars. Aboard now the number eight car. You see the graphic on the right hand side throttle trace in green brake in red so no brakes through this corner but you can see on and off the throttle <laughs> as he works his way through Wemi unsure of uh, what the slower car was going to do I think it's throttle trace there yes no yes no yes <laughs> exactly we've all been there we've all been there <laughs> should mention that the light blue on the left hand side NRG is energy that's the energy they're permitted to use in our stint yep measured in megajoules but uh, that blue bar will gradually come down towards the end of the stint. Yeah, and, and, and it's not the amount of fuel left, no. or it, it's the total energy. However you generate the energy, you have an amount per car, per stint, per class, you know, so it's, yeah. And, and particularly for the hypercar regulations, you know, with some cars being hybrid, some not, some being uh, more aggressive hybrids, some being less. It's, uh, it's about the total consumption in a stint. Toyota leading in Sebring, 1-2 here, with the Porsche right behind in third place, car number six, the Cadillac now up to fourth, the number two machine. And as over the last couple of seasons, one of the things that we will be undoubtedly looking at is how the two Toyotas compare to each other. And now, it may not always be that they are the front runners, but we will, we've been used to doing that between sister cars, We'll now be looking at doing that with Peugeot, with Porsche as well, oh, and big especially with Ferrari, from, yeah. Apologies, big run wide there for the Prima car. You're talking about the two Toyotas, it, it strikes me that with the addition of Ant to this, uh, this, this team, it brought something new in terms of our understanding of what's going on within that team dynamic. 
We saw yesterday Ferrari take the headlines with the uh, the pole position, but everybody knew coming here that the high, if you like, the, the bar was going to be set by Toyota. They're the team with the experience. They've got the most stable uh, car platform here, having had two seasons, two championship winning seasons with that car. And what we're seeing here is not only they've got, they've got the pace, they've got the discipline and they've got the reliability. And we've not seen that yet. <laughs> Uh, all those three from any of the other runners here. Well, that will come. Well, they're a race team. The, the Penske Porsche crew are not yet a race team. The Ferrari team are not yet a race team. They've been, you know, some of the Ferrari AF Corsa team have been racing, running the GTE cars. Some of them have been doing the testing. Some of them have been in Formula One. So it's not yet a cohesive unit. Apart from, really apart from Toyota, we're looking at what are essentially a group of test teams who now have to learn all the rules, learn all the regulations, work out all the wrinkles in the car, work out all the wrinkles in the strategy, and Toyota are still the benchmark. And, and, and Anthony, you know, somebody always is, because motor racing's been around for a while now, there's, there's nothing that's brand new. Somebody always has to be the one that's got the knowledge and the ability, and Toyota are the benchmark because they are so well rehearsed at everything they do, and that's before you even look at how well developed the car is. Well, and they haven't always been. You know, I was there at the beginning of their program in 2012, um, at the birth of the World or the rebirth of World Endurance Championship, and, um, and and they weren't a very slick operation back then. And like you say, they're more of a test team than a race team, Martin. So time goes on. They've stayed it. They've they've stayed with the WEC all the way through through the dry years of competition after Audi and Porsche left. And Audi used to be that formidable force when yep. Toyota first arrived on the scene in WEC. And, um, and once those two teams departed, it left Toyota to run with it. So, of course, they, basically their biggest strength is they never left. Yeah. Uh, so what you're saying is they basically got better after you left? No, I made them better. <laughs> <laughs> what well, there's actually is a parallel here. You were talking about Porsche and the test team, and of course, with the withdrawal just before the, the original 2012 championship of Peugeot from the competition, Toyota picked up that baton and brought a car to competition that was not intended yeah. initially to compete in that season. They are to the test team. Let's hear from Lawrence Van Tour and the number six Porsche team. We're working on a plan. We, we understand the situation. We are working on a plan. You just do your best. Track position at the moment is priority. He's complaining about rear tyre grip, Anthony, and we saw it on that last lap. The Porsche is starting to look a bit like an overdriven scale electric car. The rear end does not look at all comfortable. And maybe that's why number five has just vanished up the road and Alex Lynn is all over the back of this machine. Uh, number five has vanished backwards and Alex Lynn is all over the back of this machine. Uh, Vector Sport, by the way, back on pit road. OK. Let's just watch this Porsche. I mean, Lawrence, I, it, I, I did particularly on the last you know, few shots, it just looks like the back is a bit wayward, like it's still on cold tyres. Well, I mean, the car's at its strongest, really, isn't it, when, it, when it's on cold tyres? Mm -hmm. Got the uh, right. team radio from car 51, the Ferrari with Pierre Guidi here. OK, Ali, lift and coast for 17 to let the sister car by. Lift and coast, 17, let the sister car by, please. OK, stop break my board, I let you by. Feisty old Pierre Guidi, as usual. Uh, yeah, yeah. Love it. Nobody uh, likes being told to let anybody by, let them all their sister car, you know. And this is the first rule of teammates, Anthony. If you don't beat your teammate, you're not going to win the race. Woco is faster than you. Uh, <laughs> both Ferraris, by the way, are catching this trio of cars yes. and doing so quite rapidly. Let's take a look here. What are we seeing? Uh, this is that lift and coast. The yellow highlights is the 50 car. So again, again uh, last year, 51 had the white highlights, 52 as it was then with Antonio Fuoco had the yellow highlights. So, you know, again, that helps us, you know, those of us who are simple of, of mind with the recognition. Um, yeah, Fuoco and Molina in that yellow highlights car. It's just a different number this year, that's, that's fine. But Alex Lynn really pushing hard against the Porsche for third place. I'm sure we, we didn't hear what the team were talking about, what the problem was. Uh, you know, just keep it going. 
I do think they're struggling for rear end grip. And the Porsche's faster on the on the warm-ups, isn't it? Faster on colder tyres. That's where the car's at its, at its strongest compared to the Cadillac, but the Cadillac seems to be looking after its tyres better, or at least Alex Lynn's doing a better job of looking after his tyres. Driver change at Prema in the inset. Danny Kvyat out of the car that was in second place, wasn't it, for Prema 63 cars? And it was the car that we saw kick up all of that dust on the exit yeah. of Turn 1, right on the ragged edge. And, yeah, on the right-hand side of the picture there, the split screen, car number six, really lighting up the rear tyres. It, it's really squirming seven. off the corners, isn't it? It, it looks like a right royal handful. Six, I should have said. And maybe a slight lock-up there as oh, well, it was. Oh, and that's allowed Alex now to... Oh, 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 off the track. And there's a big, there's a big squirm there from the yeah. Porsche. Yeah, just desperate to get on power there. And another sign that he's just eating through those rear tyres. But that was a lock-up, a mistake. I just saw the telltale puff of smoke yeah. on the way into Turn 7. He's really starting to struggle here. And that's what his engineer was saying. We're working on it. Track position. That's they shall not pass. This is close, though, Ant. Here we go. So we're going to see it. It might just get out of shot. but uh, So he defends a little bit on the inside. Just misses his breaking point ever so slightly. There's the puff of smoke. And then, yeah, that gives Alex the chance. But not quite enough room on the kinks that follow turn seven. He did the right thing and backed out of it. Don't go damaging your car with 217 laps still to go <laughs> of this race. And this is developing to be one of the battles of the race. It's sort of the battle underway at the moment. Right, what's he gonna what's he gonna do to play it here? They get past the Vector Sport coming out the pits now. They've got a GT in front of them, and Alex is gonna see that. He's gonna maybe hold back slightly here to make sure he can get a good run onto oh, the straight. Squirm. And that's gonna give him the run he needs, definitely. Yeah. In the slipstream, here we go. We're gonna work our way past some slower cars as well. In the meantime, they split side by side, and as they come back, no, Alex hasn't got the chance to go down the inside. He's gonna have to wait for it until the exit of this corner. Don't think he's got the run on Van Tor. No. He makes a pass himself as well, so... Oh, it wasn't seen by the car guy car. That's compromised his line through there. Still, the Ferraris ahead of these two. A Kessel Racing Ferraro. The Ferrari is the car guy, Takeshi Kimura. There he is. He whistles backwards from our viewpoint as we look back at Alex Lynn. Uh, Vantor really under the cosh here. And this, this is what we're going to see in the 12 hours tomorrow because these are the front-running contenders, aren't they? Cadillac Racing and Penske Porsche. So, and, and these are both the IMSA variety of hypercar with their hybrid power as well. So they've both got the same hybrid powertrain. Even oh, he's struggling, he's really struggling here. Yeah, it his sweats have gone off, haven't they? It surely <laughs> cannot be long before there's uh, the, the, the squirming almost in every corner on the power. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say the tyres have completely gone off yeah. the cliff now, and both drivers are trying their best just to keep the car pointing in the right direction. You can see on the exit of turn seven and go through the, the right hand of turn eight. Oh, and, Alex. Uh, they're fine there. <laughs> uh, through the right hand of turn eight. It's, it's usually easily flat out, but that's causing dark lines to appear yeah. when they're trying to do that right now, how the tire, the tire life. Graham. It's got to get by because look, I'm just looking back here. Uh, Michael Christens is six seconds behind and now under pressure from the Ferraris. You can see it at the other yeah. end of the straight yep. as out comes the Alpine. But Alex Lee desperate to get by. It must be so frustrating because you can see that Lawrence Vanta is like sliding all over the place in every corner. Here's maybe, here may be the opportunity. He's in the slipstream here. It goes right to the inside. Now goes to the outside. Great I think stuff. it's going to be the cut back here if he can possibly make it. No. He's One got more squirm. And he's now got marbles on the tyre because Vantor he eased him right out there to the to the wall under the flag post. He's playing it uh, slightly more aggressively, isn't he, Vantor, than Christensen <laughs> was. We can hear from, let's hear from him now. I am absolutely so tired. Hang I'm, in there, mate. Hang in there. Defend. I'm absolutely soaked. Is that what he said? Or I'm absolutely so tired. I think that's what he said. I think that's what he said. I mean, look at here. That, 
Alex comes down the inside. Lawrence is driving, I have to say, absolutely as Lawrence Van Tor has always driven GT cars. Arms and elbows, no prisoners. Oh, listen to the weird. widest Porsche on the was circuit. Was it so tired or was it no tyres left? Yeah, no tyres left. Yeah. He said my tyres are absolutely gone. I have absolutely no tyres. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, by the way, uh, it's clear to see. Josh Pearson in and out retains the lead in uh, LMP2. That early pit stop for United <laughs> yeah. at the moment was the genius move. It really was. It's, it's paid dividends, isn't it? And they've swapped, obviously, to Josh Pearson. 17 years old, by the way. Yep. yep. When's his birthday? 14th of February 2006. <laughs> I mean, that makes me so old, doesn't it? So in fact, he's only just turned 17. Here are the Ferraris, 51 um, and 50. Uh, that was that them going by Michael Christensen? Yep. It was indeed. No, that was Michael Christensen reversing back past the two <laughs> Ferraris. But that's what it must feel like when you're in those cars. He's got no... I mean, look at him. He, he can barely make it out of, out of 16. And here comes Alex Lynn at the end of that straight. Can't drive around the outside. He knows that, but he's trying to cross the line to make sure he can get himself a really good run onto the main straight. He's proven that the two cars are so equal, evenly matched in straight line speed. Yeah. Doubt there's anything he can do on the way into and this corner. And he's got corner. so oh, much grip to give away. Throw it down the inside, oh, lick the stamp, it. send it. But watch, watch the Porsche now. The Porsche gets really squirrely out of turn one. He's done it. He's got him. He's done it. No, he Hang hasn't. on in there. Yeah, he has. Yeah, he's done it. Because as soon as he was on the inside there, on the exit of turn one, same as how he <laughs> overtook Christensen, he knew he yeah, couldn't get squeezed anymore. Yeah, but, but Vantor's the GT3 driver. He'll shut the door on anybody. He's, he's, he's all over the place <laughs> in the rear of that car. Look at the gap now to the Ferraris from Vantor. 4.6 seconds as they cross the line. Watch how quickly that gap is going to close. Right. Trouble for another Peugeot. Yeah, it's at pit out, but it's not going it's out of pit. Now that is going into uh, the uh, safety area. Yeah, into the safety area. Listen. Now that might be prior to going back into the pit lane, but it is heading into towards area 51, which is where cars with unsolvable uh, high high tension issues go. Oh, it's I mean that's ugly. That's really ugly. It's been a long time since I've seen a sports car squirm around like that on the rear end. It's, yeah. it, it's rarely seen, actually, to take now a tyre this late into its life. Let's hear from the Peugeot team. It is going behind the wall. The car is unsafe so far. Stay in the car. OK, so it's going all the way down past the HVMA to Area 51. I love, I mean, I love running in America. Area 51 is the area right at the very end where cars that are a red vehicle that may not be touched go. That's, that's not... That's, that's now that's, going back into that's, the paddock. That's, that's going, not the right area. Uh, it's got into the paddock, the IMSA paddock there. Yeah. That's not the height. That, uh, that's not where you want a, no. an electrical issue to be. Here are the two area Prema 55. cars battling for sixth position, right? Now. Vantor on the pits. Vantor was pitted. Yeah. And that was pretty inevitable, wasn't it? But it, it's not because he's been passed, it's because now they've got to the end of the fuel as well as to the end of the tyres. This is a routine stop. It's a driver change as well. So, OK, just get to the end of the fuel. Just get it done. It doesn't matter what, you, what happens. All right, hold on, you know. It was his in-lap. He got passed on his in-lap. OK, great. Quite interesting there. So, so the person on the right uh, front that's just run around now to the left front, the peak of his helmet caught as the car went up. Yeah. It caught the, the wheel arch. Oh, right. There's little details like that. I can't believe it. Yeah, so it's yeah. just, and it knocked his head slightly back yeah. and it momentarily lost sight of where the wheel was. So they got motocross helmets on rather yeah. than racing helmets. And, and, and that's to allow airflow and stuff. And in, in these temperatures, that, that's quite usual. It's probably what... Got, got to be able to see what you're doing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, I can remember back in the day, I think it was an, IMS, uh, an ALMS race back in the day, Dino Capello with his balaclava got loose. There. Yeah, and it was going down in front of his eyes. <laughs> Why are you blindfolding? It's a, it's a serious, dangerous situation. Yeah, you're laughing. <laughs> <laughs> you're just... <laughs> I'm smiling. I'm not you can't see it. <laughs> David Beckman for the Jota team ahead of Ferdy Habsburg. Uh, Ferdy dispensed with the other Jota car some 15 minutes ago. David Beckman really keeping the pace up here. Habsburg has taken a long time to get to him. It's going to be a drive-through penalty coming, gentlemen, for Alex Lynn. Here comes the 50 car, by the way. Uh, Alex Lynn and for the number 94 Peugeot that's in, currently in trouble for full course yellow infringement. What I was saying about the button and how close you yes. sell to the to the to the wind with 
Look at the big door opening on this car. Look how quickly he just jumped in. Yeah, I mean, that. you know, none of this, you know, old LMP1, you have to be inserted yeah. with a syringe. You know, it's, it's got a big door opening. That's, you know, in terms like of safety and, and, and driver, you know, usability, look how far the door cutout comes over the top there. That's really great for ingress and egress and driver changes. You know, it just anything that can make life easier for a racing car. Serviceability is such an important part of it. Usability, such an important part of it. See the gunman keeping his head further back this time. Fool me, what? No, genuinely. No, it happens once. I'm not going to get, you know, probably just give him a bit of a snap there. Right, let's hear it again from the Peugeot oh. team. Louis, can you jump out of the car? Jump out of the car, please. Do not touch the car, it is unsafe. You need to jump out of the car. Yep. Okay, if I die, guys, you have to pay attention to my kids and family, huh? <laughs> oh, there is a driver who has been around the block once or twice, but genuinely... Gallows humour. You know, it is, it is absolutely right. Onto the side pod and jump clear of the car. Do not touch the car and the ground at the same time, because that you will get a hell of a belt. Ryan Briscoe hands over the Glingen House to Roma Duma as the caddy is on pit road. Alex Lynn is in for service, not penalty, I think. I think this is the penalty. Is this the penalty? Oh, the well, no, he, if the Porsches have needed fuel, surely he does too. I've actually, not, they've just called the drive through penalty on the screen here. But so the team will already have been alerted. By the time we see it on our timing yeah. screen, the team have already been alerted. So Glicken House comes back out. What's it unsafe release by for the Porsche, by the way, just ahead of the Glicken House. Right. So that's his drive through. It is. It'll be back around again and yeah. back in, I'm sure. So the two American hypercars. Uh, yes. All that hard work of Whoops. making his way past, all that excitement making his way past the Porsche. But look how easy it was for him to get past the Glicken House. Not because his car's much faster, but because he's got hot tyres and the Glicken House has got fresh yeah. tyres and you dare not try and risk anything. Even into turn 17, dare not try and risk anything. But the second penalty that's going to come the way of the 50 car is five seconds added to the next pit stop for pit stop infringement. So they're, they're doing, they didn't have an earthing strap, there wasn't a fire bottle there, there were visors open, there were I mean, you know, all of those rules, you know, they're, they're no, really basic stuff. More than four people over the wall yeah. or whatever. Didn't do enough kinesthetics beforehand. And look at this. Yeah. This is the level that Toyota are at, you know, yeah. doing the warm-ups before they even do their pit stop. That's, that's such a well-oiled machine. That's formalised chortling at the penalties that Ferrari <laughs> are incurring. Let's hear from Lawrence Van Tor at the end of what was pretty tough stint for the Belgian. Porsche joining us for Sebring here at WEC. That was tough for you. I've imagined my first stint in a uh, hypercar a bit easier than that. <laughs> it's not like I have a ton of experience with it. So, yeah, well, it was incredibly tough. Um, we decided on the strategy uh, to try and cover the Cadillac. Because at the moment, that's our main component. Uh, and we wanted to keep track position, but I mean, we had literally no tire left in the end, and even I was. I knew it from the first laps and I was saving, but uh, it was it was tough and I tried to hang in there as long as I could. Uh, but yeah, eventually it was over. So I hope it will be a bit more easy uh, on my next day. Well, you gave us a great battle to watch. Well, at least that then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. I actually saw somebody walking down the pit lane earlier on in the driver autograph sessions with the BAM Tour t-shirt on. I thought, they're both here, but actually they could well end up going head to head. Oh, let's hope not. <laughs> no, no, let's hope so. <laughs> oh, Bamber, of course, racing for Cadillac. Lawrence Van Tour, as you just saw in the title. Ah. The, si the sounds and the shapes of Hypercar, and it really is the dawn of a fantastic new era. And we're here. I, 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 and we're here, and that, that's, that's genuinely Fantastic. I hope, I hope people are enjoying this. Um, it is the start of something very, very special. I know it's year three of Hypercar, but it really properly starts here. And this is where Hypercar goes to big school. Yes. Not wearing shorts anymore. Too cold in the booth. Sorry, Lou. It's the start of a new season. 
Everybody, of course, is, a, is the, you know, pre-season champion. There's everything to contend with. But it is generally exciting. I, I was at Silverstone at six hours. The first race a Group C car was ever at. Porsche brought the 956. It was beaten out of sight by the Group 5 Lanciers. But it was the dawn of a new, new era. And, and I, I genuinely believe we are really at the proper birth of what is going to be a huge year look at the porsche that's a that is a uh, change for fifth place by the way but that was a fresh tired porsche and that was not looking comfortable at all through 17. jacques villeneuve is here that's why villeneuve corner banners are out jack is racing in this car the number four uh, Floyd Van Wall, they're up to sixth place. How are they up to sixth place? Because the car has not done anything silly, hasn't hit anything, hasn't had a problem, has gone out at the start, has lapped, has made regular routine fuel stops. They are doing a really stand-up job with, with a car as brand new, probably more brand new than the Porsche and the Ferrari, and probably with a lot less development. Tom Dillman at the wheel now, actually turning really good laps and having just a a completely below the radar, almost from almost from the grid roll. This is the first time we mentioned that car because they've done nothing to draw attention. Yeah, exactly. It's a good point, well made, Martin. Because you know they have just gone about their business, no heroics, no drama. They're running the car to the pace that it can be driven at. And Tom Dillman, I have to say, is, is just driving a, a really clean, really nice race so far, doing the best he can in the equipment he's got. And, they weren't even here for the prologue. Yeah. I mean, they turned up late anyway. No, they were. Oh, they were. They were here for the prologue. Were okay. the prologue. They, they, were, they definitely ran the prologue. Oh, OK. So yeah. they, they weren't very quick at the prologue. Um, minimal running time compared to the others, oh, though. Yeah, they, they had their from problems. From what I gather there was their a, testing programme. Yeah, there was a bit of a dink uh, for Jacques Villeneuve. Jacques Villeneuve's pace was giving some cause for concern, but the car was, uh, was definitely here for both days with limited running. Uh, talked about lots of new names and new faces. There's, there's a great battle here. In the WRT car, the first of that trio, Angola driver, Rui Andrade. Now, he raced with us last year, but how many Angolan races do you know? I can think of one other. Right behind him, Philip Urga. Now, Philip is brand new to the championship Romania. this year, yep. and I have never, ever commentated on him racing anything before now, the Belgian driver. And behind him, this car, Diane Power, one of the Iron Dames uh, crew of drivers over the last couple of seasons. Uh, Richard Mill racing team driver as well, and she is giving chase to those two. So that's a great little battle. WRT and the two Prama cars knocking spots off each other, but but young drivers definitely on the way up the ladder. Yeah, Ugran, Romanian driver, and that's another Indeed, nation sorry, yes, not we've not had yeah. terribly many of in uh, World Endurance Championship uh, competition. I'd have to check, but I think he may be the first. And, uh, Yes, I would, in, in WC, yes. I'm, uh, I'm he, thinking I've, I've seen a couple in junior single-seaters, but... Uh, I've seen him racing in the European Le Mans series with, I think it was the Algarve Pro racing team, but uh, good to see him getting stuck in here. And uh, young Dorian Pat in the number 63 car in his wheel tracks, and that's another young lady that you will want to watch because I think she's going to be pretty special. Another great battle here. D station Satoshi Hashino being caught by Stefano Constantini in the 21. AF Corsa Ferrari, the one with the yellow highlights. And right behind Northwest AMR, last minute addition to the team to join Nikki Team and Paul Dallalana, who is Mr. Northwest. Oh, oh that was a dig. Oh, Constantini trying to get by. Satoshi Hashino loses a place as a result to Axel Jeffries. Now, tell us the story about Jeffries getting this drive. Well, number one. He is the first full season Zimbabwean driver uh, in the oh, FI yeah. World Endurance Championship. So, yet another new nation to add to it. It's pretty clumsy, that I thought, for Costantini um, on the 777 car. Let's watch this again, I'm sure. <laughs> this was not so much a hip check, but uh, I think an attempt to just ruffle through the glove box uh, by the Italian driver well, of the I 21. Think, I think what it was, Graham, was that the, the 777 driver just didn't turn in where he was expecting him to. I think he was just a little bit too late on the brakes, and that's why he turned in. Yep. Where the racing line should have been, but it wasn't that time around. But the he, uh, Axel Jeffries, the final addition to the running order for the full season uh, here. There was a bit of a shootout between Axel and uh, Thomas Merrill, American driver, for the final seat at the prologue. And 
and uh, Axel came up on top, although and, and timing, they were almost identically timed, but clearly um, seemed very happy with their new addition, and it's great to see him here. Watched him in a variety of machinery, both uh, prototype and GT machinery in recent years, managed by another name from the past and for the group's era, Franz Conrad looks after Axel Jeffries, and I'm sure we'll see Franz at, uh, in, possibly in France. But uh, we'll, we'll see him later, I'm sure, uh, looking after his young charge. But uh, here they go. It is bronze-ranked driver in the 777, silver-ranked driver in the 98, and bronze-ranked driver in the 21. And yet another group of cars together on track and tussling for a meaningful position. This is the battle for fourth place. That Iron Dames pit stop we talked about a little earlier, by the way, has really paid off 30 seconds the good uh, the Iron Dames after spending much of the first uh, session, the first uh, hour rather, uh, in the wheel tracks of the Corvette, opting to pit the number 85 just as the team were expecting the, the race to go to full course yellow, served part of that stop under full course yellow, were not quite as quick as the Corvette team on pit lane, but that pit stop was served under full green, and that's made the difference. So Sarah Bovi leads GTM from Ben Keating by 34 seconds. The bright pink Porsche from the bright yellow Corvette. Still back though, gentlemen, with what has been a really engaging LMP2 battle all the way up and down the field from the very start of this race, Anne. So yeah, you've got um, three silver drivers here as we're running on board with uh, Dorian Pan. And so she's closing in on the two in front. So yeah, silver drivers at the wheel at the moment. And really, like I always felt when I was racing in LMP2, the silver driver is the backbone of the team. They're the one that makes the difference. The pro drivers, you're only talking a few tenths of a second, but there's such a big difference quite often between silver drivers. It covers quite a broad spectrum of talent and experience. And uh, yeah, Dorian clearly uh, the faster of the, that trio at the moment. And it, the situation is very similar in the GTM battles that we're looking at here. You know, you've got the bronze driver filling that. That is traditionally the gentleman driver who who funds the, most of the operation, if not amateur all the driver. operation. I just step in, amateur yeah, driver, exactly. not yeah. gentlemen, because no. we have females here as well. Exactly. Um, and, yeah, so Satoshi Hoshino, uh, he is the bronze there. Axel Jeffries, a silver. Stefano Constantini, a bronze driver. And a Peugeot trying to squeeze through. There was contact there with the curbs. Was there contact with the Ferrari? I'm guessing from the Ferrari's body language, no, because he didn't seem like it was putting him off his stride in any way. That's a 93 yeah. Peugeot, isn't so, it? Because yeah, that's uh, the Paul only Duresta. one that's still going. <laughs> yeah, Duresta slung it down the inside there with the Ferrari, but wasn't seen. And I think we might have a bit of a replay of this. Yeah, so riding on board with Duresta here, Ferrari on the right-hand side. Paul's placed the car in the right area and um, just doing the right thing, taking his line, but then gets the shot. And there was contact. There was. Uh, I mean... It's well, funny, because in American rules, they always blame the overtaking car. That, w without question, in IMSA, it's the, the, the hypercar, the faster car always gets the blame. But in that uh, situation, I, I just think he wasn't seen. Vector Sport being handed a penalty for speeding in the pit lane. And a change in this battle uh, in LMP2. Rui Andrad has just been passed by Philip Ogran, so the Romanian ahead of the Angolan with uh, French driver Dorian Pan right behind in the second of those Prema cars, red, white and green, as with the Italian flag. And in the pit lane, in the inset, is the caddy. And the, and seven the number Toyota. seven Toyota. Uh, you just mentioned that uh, the, the drive-through penalty for car 10. I wonder if a message I've just got ha uh, about that car might have had something to do with that, uh, because Matthias Kaiser, the new bronze driver for that car, reported to the team he had a seat problem, something under his left shoulder, and it turned out that the top corner of the seat had folded down uh, and was behind his left shoulder, so that discomfort might just have distracted him. Yeah, yeah, it can easily do. I mean, uh, the, these seats, uh, always we're just seeing the, the Whoa, pass there and the outside. Brave. Very brave. And a move that you'd have to say can only really happen between silver drivers around the outside like that. Um, you know, they, with all due respect, they're not pushing the car right to the same kind of limits quite often uh, as the, the pro drivers would do. 
and caught up in traffic as well at the same time. So you, you get to see a bit of a different race going on and different moves on the track sometimes between the, the lower graded drivers because they're not right at, well, they're at their, their limit, they're at their ragged edge, but not at necessarily the car's ragged edge. And um, so with the cars going, it's a fast corner turn one, creates a lot of dirty air from the car in front. Quite often it's a follow me leader affair like we've seen in the, in the hypercars. James Collado taking over from Alessandro Pierre Guidi, the reigning GTE Pro, last ever GTE Pro World Champions, unless you know differently. Uh, so Collado takes over. Alessandro Pierre Guidi qualified the car. So to James, that's typical Ale, you just can't get him out. He said, no, no, it'll be my turn in Portimao. It's just the way that it worked. And uh, away goes the 51 car, stopped from third place. So they're still very much in the hunt, the Ferraris. Uh, Toyota running one, two. Kevin S just Porsche in fourth, and there is the Cadillac. Now well, they've had their drive-through penalty served, and the Cadley, uh, Caddy has also just come in for its regular stop. So Cadillac and the Ferrari stopping at about the same time. Alex Lynn just running a little deep there. In fact, is Alex Lynn still at the wheel of the Cadillac? No, it is Earl Bamber. So Lawrence Vantor is off the track, and Bamber is on it. Yeah, and I think the Cadillac has been lapped now by the Toyota, well, both Toyotas, 7 and 8. And, um, and again, that's because they didn't stop for yeah. fuel for a, in the first safety car period. So, again, we've got two different fuel strategies running between the Toyotas and just about everybody else. I hate to say it, but unfortunately, at this stage in the race, we are... We're looking for a, a, another safety car to bring the Ferraris back into this. We can hear from Buemi now. OK, so continue. The plan is two more laps. Car seven in the pits. Car seven in the pits now. We plan two more laps. We'll have driver change for Brendan. Driver change for Brendan. So right, that, was a, that was a lap here. ago because number yeah. eight car is in the pit lane right now. So that was uh, at the beginning of the previous lap. So what happens is, is the radio message gets heard, then it gets recorded, then it gets played out. So that takes about a minute to happen, which is about a lap. Yeah, it's just uh, two hours, 16 minutes at the wheel for Sebastian Buemi there in that yep. stint. Long old stint. So, yeah, so you see, as a driver gets into the car there, Brendan Hartley, the, the, the seat takes a bit of a knock from the shoulders. And if it's not quite solid enough in its construction, it can easily fold over itself. Well, and also, if you're tall and the seat insert is really thin, it's more likely to bend. If you're at Davidson height, you're going to be, you know, your seat insert is going to be quite a lot thicker because your smaller, narrower, narrower shoulders maybe even might make the difference. And so there's more substance to it. It's got thicker bolsters Absolutely. and it's not going to, it's not going to move so much. And, and sometimes you do see seats cut away just to, to, you know, for ease of putting it into the car and so on. So you see the teams doing a lot of driver change practice over the course of the week, yeah. the weekend, and there's a good reason for that. And you want to try and replicate the heat of the moment as much as you can. And I was always a believer in trying to make it as representative as possible. Some drivers, you know, they don't even put the balaclava on, they don't put the earpieces in, might not even be wearing the hands device yeah. to do the driver change practice, might not do the seat belts up properly uh, in the process. And it's in, by doing it as properly as you can, treating it like the race. So I would always, in the days when you had the, the foot clutch of the Toyota, it's not the case now, I would always make sure I even had my foot on the clutch as yeah. well and on the brake pedal to replicate exactly the driver change. I've just come into the pits and I've stopped. I wouldn't just sit there with the belts half loose, yeah. no earpieces in, you know, and it's those moments when in the heat at the moment, things go wrong. And that's why, you know, there's, there's a good way, there's a right way to practice. Ooh. Position change coming up for the two Toyotas. One on fresh tyres, one not. This is Brendan Hartley on cold tyres. And right behind him in hunter killer mode is the boss. So this is what I thought might happen, Martin. Yep. The overcut yes. now is king yeah, in, in sports car racing. So this is what is playing out before our eyes right now. The overcut, car seven came in uh, early and got the got the uh, the tyres on and it's got them up to temperature. When that uh, Toyota number eight's come in, yep. it's uh, out there on cold tyres, really suffering. There's a yellow flag there really? in the final corner. Really vulnerable. There's the Glickenhaus. Kamui Kobayashi looking. What a document, by the way. There is the Glickenhaus stationery. What a document, by the way, that Dorian Pan, who we were riding on board with, was at that stage our LMP2 leader. 
No, she wasn't. She moved up into second place. In fact, as the cars around uh, had pitted, because uh, it is still Josh Pearson that leads. Uh, I think the time has gone now. He's not going to get by Kamu Kobayashi, is he? Sebastian Bremi yeah. hanging on there, and there's probably a little bit more gentlemanly driving between teammates. If one had been a Porsche and the other one had been, or one had been a Ferrari and the other one had been a, a Toyota, I don't think there'd have been quite the amount of room left by the attacker. Maybe not. Yeah, no, sorry, I got my overcuts and undercuts the wrong way round. Of course, no, 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 you're right. No, no, you're right. It is an overcut because Kobayashi stopped the lap before, and and uh, and so Brendan came out cold tired. So it is the over. Well, it's not. No, it's, I know it's it is. It's the case. He stopped uh, yeah, earlier, yeah, so yeah. you get you come in early and you get more heat into your tires. And yeah. um, I think that's if what you're chasing, playing, yeah. if you're chasing, that's what you want. In fact, if you're leading, almost that's what you want more, isn't it? There was 1.7 seconds between Conway and Buemi yep. when uh, Conway came into the pits yep. before the number eight Toyota, and maybe Buemi just had a bit of a bad inlap with traffic. But clearly, you could see how he was, uh, how Brendan was struggling to get those tyres back and the, in. And the other side of it is Kamui seems to have had almost nothing in front of him no. on his outlap, which and, and certainly nothing harassing him from behind, which is equally as important because when they're on cold tyres, the hypercars are vulnerable to a well-driven GTE car, never mind an LMP2 car coming up right, at speed. The now, the Clickenhaus is still stationary. Martin's had a shot. 15 seconds. <laughs> and just uh, just in time, the full Ten, course yellow is about to come nine, out. Eight, seven, six. Yeah, full course yellow five, for Martin Haven tripping over his three, microphone lead. Two, one, full course yellow. We Doesn't are happen under when you're full short, course you see. yellow. We are going to recover a car with a money two at T17. We're going to send recovery on track at T17. Off. <laughs> Even off. <laughs> not not <laughs> off long enough, obviously, for most of the audience, but there we go. Well, there's the recovery truck arriving. And again, the clicking house. Uh, and it's just rolled to a halt there, hasn't it? That's going to be a transmission issue, I think, possibly. Right, let's get down to the Toyota team. Louise Beckett hanging around, and she's found a Conway to chat to. So while we go to full course yellow at 202 laps, let's hear from the Toyota driver. Mike Conway, you're watching this intently. You've only just got out of the car, and it's still all going on. Yeah, yeah, it seems a bit tight at the moment between the two cars. Um, yeah, they've not been out of the pits long, so... Uh, yeah, maybe early in the day to be this close, but um, yeah, it's different right now. I mean, we know that the Ferrari pitted earlier, so they're kind of off strategy a little bit. We'll see what they do now with this focus yellow and stuff, but yeah, it's still open, still 200 laps to go. So uh, early days, but I think both uh, cars seem quick. Uh, we maybe weren't quite there at the beginning, but um, yeah, I think slowly with tire wear and stuff, we were not too bad in the end, but that's a key factor for the double stints is tire wear. And then once we get a few of those out of the way, we can then single stint tyres with the more tyres we have available. So, but yeah, okay so far. There's been a fair few incidents this race, not with you guys, but um, just tell us what that means for you to have to reset. Yeah, it's yeah. Every corner is a bit of a lottery sometimes, um, but it's just one of those tracks as well. It's very hard, very bumpy, easy to make a mistake, so you can easily get it wrong. And yeah, unfortunately, yeah, a few cars have already. So. And it's still early. Um, there's a bit more racing to go. All right, thank you. Cheers, thanks. Yeah, they seem pretty relaxed, don't they? Andre Lotterer there, says hello. Who uh, gave Louis Beckett a chair? Yes, yeah, two, two Andre Lotterers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it's interesting, isn't it? He's saying, yeah, I'm back home. Yeah, Andre's Not just back home at Porsche, but just back home in the World Endurance Championship. That's not a data screen, by the way. That's just Andre, just, just like to look at himself in the mirror. Uh, <laughs> the car. He's a good looking boy, Andre Lotterer. There you go. Yeah. It's, uh, 201 laps to go. We're still under full course course, and let's hear from the Glickenhaus team. Not only I lost like electricity, but the dash still on. Nothing. I try uh, crank two. Now the engine is on or not? Uh, if you look at the data, you will see that it's off. Spare, try a spare fuel pump. A spare fuel pump. <laughs> somewhat, somewhat pointed from her. If you man. look at the data, you'll see that. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's like an exchange that we were privy to the other day between a driver and an engineer. No, but, uh, Sebastian Buemi, no, but you can't compare that. 
And the engineer says, Sebastian, that's literally what we do all day, every day. You literally can compare that. Come in here and I'll show you. <laughs> so. Can't, sir. Can't. I do like that, though. Yeah, no. I'm telling you, the engine is off and I've yeah. lost electronics. Yeah. But, but, but have engine? you still got the engine? Yeah. How can I make this any clearer? Look at the data. Look at your laptop and yeah. you'll see I've got no engine turned on. Uh, sometimes drivers sound like me and engineers sound like me, and that's I, never I, a good I, thing. I, I think we could describe that tone from Roman Dumas as world weary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Green flag. Dear, oh dear. All, All right. right. So, the glitch in house, whatever ailed it, is uh, is back out. And and, and, and Sebastian and ben, Brendan Hartley, big part in number eight Toyota, taking over from Sebastian Webby, holding on under pressure where he needed to, and they remain then in the lead of the race. It is Toyota 1 2 with 200 laps to go as they cross the line. Now, uh, Porsche in third, Ferrari fourth, Porsche in fifth. Ferrari 6, Cadillac in 7th, and the United Autosports number 23 car of Josh Pearson leading in LMP2 in 8th place overall. Hello, everybody. Uh, just a just a, a bit of a, an aside here as to just how badly Peugeot's day is going. That was the Van Wall unlapping itself from the Peugeot. And the Van Wall with touring car ace Esteban Guerrieri in his first prototype drive of any kind so but my apologies again. putting another lap on the boat yes. is way further down <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah, it yeah. so yeah no, it's, it's, uh, it's been not, a terrible afternoon for yeah, Peugeot. Give, giving Peugeot another kicking, because, you know, if he's down, you give him plenty of kicks, because you never know when. So one of the two Peugeots is still running. That's the 93 car. It is our last running car. I oh, know it's not. The Vector Sport car is back out of the pit lane, Correct. isn't it? But only one lap behind the Peugeot, so it'll probably get past Paul de Resta at some stage in the race. And here, yellow on yellow. That's always a tricky place to try and overtake on the inside of 13. It's... Uh, the problem in the GT car, it's one constant corner from yeah. 12 into 13, so they're braking and turning at the same time. Ooh, race leader in uh, GTE Am, Sarah Bovey, handing over to, I would think, Michelle Gatting. That tends to be the way that works. That's two and a half hours for Sarah Bovey in that car. Two hours, 27, don't exaggerate. <laughs> no, so 200 lap mark to go from the leaders. And yeah, so she has done her entire driving stint in one hit. Ben Keating has done the same, always does. And he will be in very shortly. He's now the race leader for the uh, Corvette team. And there with that bright green nose again. Thank you very much indeed, whoever designed the Van Wall livery. It's not Van Wall's traditional color. I don't care, I love it. Uh, it makes it very easy to spot that car. Esteban Guerrieri with his mirrors full of LMP2 cars. So he's working his way up this train. And behind, is that 22 or 23? 23 is one of the HRX branding on. So that yeah. is the leader. Uh, is that, is that Josh, Josh Pearson, he's eighth overall. So Josh Pearson is ahead of the van wall that is just ahead of him on the track. Driver change in the 93 Peugeot. So Paul DeResta is out, and that may give the Vector Sport team, they're only a lap behind, that might move Matthias Kaiser back up ahead of the 93 machine. But that is Josh Pearson, by the way, trying to put a lap on the sixth place car. Yeah. Yeah, in LMP2. Oh, and here he comes down the inside. He's selling it early, just out of shot. Tire change for the Peugeot's full service. And that will be a driver change, as we saw Paul DeResta out. Didn't quite see who was getting in. But that really goes to show the strength of the number 23 United Autosports car today, doesn't it? Lapping sixth place already in this race. Yep. The strength of their car crew yep. as well, because Josh Pearson is the silver yep. in that car crew, yep. and he's absolutely flying round at this point. Now, interesting that the uh, Peugeot there with a new nose. Now, whether that is a tuning nose change or a damage-related nose change, with all the rubber here, there are big lumps that come out. And yeah, a little bit of contact, of course, in that last stint with the uh, with the GT car as he got chopped by the Ferrari in a in a way that a Formula Ford racer would be entirely proud of. On board with 
Uh, Ferdy Habsburg still behind David Beckman again. We've seen Habsburg in the World Endurance Championship before that European Le Mans series for a number of seasons. David Beckman a much less well-known quantity, but doing a really solid job hanging on there in what is fourth place in our LMP2 category. So it's Toyota Toyota, uh, 199 laps to go from Porsche, Ferrari, Porsche, Ferrari, Cadillac is the order, and it's the top six cars on the lead lap right now. Some differences in strategy here to come into play, but no doubt at all it's Toyota that are dominating this for the fault-free run. Kevin yeah. Estra not giving uh, <laughs> number 31 much room at all into turn seven. Kevin Estra didn't give anybody room in a GT car. He's definitely not going to start now. One of the things when you're racing in a multi-class field, whether you're in the middle, in LMP2, in the slower cars in GTM, or in the faster cars in hypercar, is traffic dictates everything about your race and how well you run, your rhythm, how much muck you pick up on your tires, how much you gain or lose to your rivals. And you have to be absolutely incisive in traffic and you can't question your own judgment. You have to back your judgment. Sometimes you're wrong and, and then it's a bit catastrophic, but you have to judge the gaps and you have to be committed and you have to show the driver that you are coming. That's exactly what Kevin was doing. It's brilliant. You know, it's like a high speed game of chess, really, where you place your car. Look here into turn 16. It's risky business, but the, the distance you cover by overtaking a slower car, a GT car, when you're in one of the P2s or the hypercar in a corner light 16, really pays dividends. You have to get the job done. You, it's, you've got to take always a calculated risk. Sometimes it goes wrong, uh, like Di Resto with the Ferrari in, in turn four. Sometimes it doesn't quite go the way that you're anticipating, but it's a real hard art to get right. And if you're too cautious, you lose so much lap time. Um, especially when you're fighting, say, like the sister car, for example, that the two Toyotas have been doing all race long. And it's one of those things that you, you have to, like Kevin Estra showed, take it right to the limit in terms of how close you dare get to the car to open up your line when you're making a, a move. And even here, the 31 WRT car, really having to work to get by what is a very well-driven GT car. Ben Keating still at the wheel of that car. It must be his in-lap almost uh, Yeah, it, it, it's about, about right time. Dorian Pan, by the way, into pit lane from second in LMP2. Another great stint there. She'll stay in. I think that is just a, a drinks bottle going in. Yeah, she's doubling. I mean, you know, this is it's part of the physical routine that you just have to be able to do, do a double stint pretty much no matter how hot it is. And she's staying in for another full stint. Fuel goes in, tires do not. You don't have enough tires that you can change them every single time the car stops. Ooh. So that is PJ Hyatt offline and coming back up to speed. He has been off somewhere. I just have a question as to whether or not they had the, the right number of pit workers over the, the line there. Well, the <laughs> luckily, everybody in the pit lane on the uh, official side will be watching that and counting, so we don't need to worry, because it will come up. We'll find out in due course, Graham. We will. Because, yeah, will. like Martin said, if, uh, if there was an infringement, definitely it would have been noted. I think PJ Hart was a bit at sixes and sevens out of turn 10 into 11 there. That's where he was, we picked him up 12 to 13. He was sort of recovering his composure. I, uh, I think he'd had a little bit of a grassy I moment. Have, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Okay, there is our race leader in GTE. It is still Ben Keating, but not for long. And the 33 car due in eminently from the lead will lose that lead again to the Iron Dames this time, the 85 in the hands of uh, Ralph Frey. Frey. I it missed my guess, it was not Michel Gatting. Yeah, it will be Nico Veroni, the Argentinian driver, already with some success in GTE, took the win first race out in the European Le Mans series aboard a Ferrari last year, and what a shootout, oddly enough, with Axel Jeffries um, at the rookie test. Uh, at the end of the 2022 season to earn the right to do that. David Beckman ahead of Ferdy Habsburg. This is the battle for third now in LMP2. 
Yeah, Habsburg getting all crossed up on the exit of turn 10, carried too much minimum speed and compromised uh, turn 11. So he lost a little bit of ground there to Beckman. But um, yeah, I'm really enjoying watching this fight between two great drivers in LMP2. So one of three Argentine drivers in the field. Luis Perez Compang crashed out very early on, uh, within five laps of the start in his GT Ferrari. Uh, Esteban Guerrieri is at the wheel of the uh, Floyd Van Wall car. And the third of our Argentine drivers, Nico Veroni, about to get into the four. Four? Who have I missed? Lopez. Oh, Pachita Lopez, yeah, you're right, four. Uh, not quite the most numerous uh, nation, but certainly the most numerous South American nation in terms of entries here. And of course, Argentina with such a, a phenomenal racing heritage, both in Europe and on the world stage, and also a hugely competitive uh, home homegrown uh, motorsport history as well. So well, great to see these drivers coming across to Europe and, and making their mark. Well, it's not lacking for talking points, is it, uh, as we get into the meat of this race? It is, at the moment, all about staying out of trouble and finding and keeping that pace. Porsche have found the pace, they couldn't keep the pace. We've had multiple cars in trouble, principally in hypercar, the two Porsches, two Porsches, the two Peugeots and the Glickenhaus, and a number of other cars, most dramatically, of course, the 83 Rushard Mill, a of course a car. Cars five and 93, possible four course yellow infringements we're hearing, that's uh, yeah. the Porsche, and again, Peugeot, they're just having, I think we would describe it in UK parlance, a mare. Yeah, they really are. If, exactly. if you're French, that's not your mother. No. Uh, 36, one of the two Alpine LMP2 cars into the pit lane. And this is from second place. Charles Malaysi at the wheel was chasing um, Josh Pearson. Sort of thinking that in the battle behind them, David Beckman in third, Ferdy Habsburg in fourth, spent a lot of time on board with Ferdy Habsburg. He has made no impression at all on Beckman in 25 minutes. I think that car has definitely run out of fresh tyre advantage, whatever it might have had early on. Now, we should mention David Beckman, this is his LMP2 debut. This yeah. is his first race there. Freddie Habsburg has got a couple of seasons under his belt, so that's impressive stuff from Beckman. And Ben Keating still at the wheel of this Corvette is about a minute, so two-thirds of a lap, a little bit under two-thirds of a lap ahead of Rahel Frey in the Iron Dames car that started on pole and has led much of the race. But they took fuel early on in the first full course yellow, in the first safety car, in fact, after that uh, Luis Perez compact crash. And that's what has sort of staggered the difference between the Iron Dames and the Corvette racing team. And so when the uh, car changes hands from Ben Keating to Nico Veroni, then that will reinstate itself for somewhere around 30 to 40 seconds advantage, probably, for the Iron Dames pink car. Uh, LMP2 leader in the pit lane, Josh Pearson, the number 23 United car, as Oli Caldwell in that 35 Alpine team now in the pits, and he drops a couple more spaces down. Pearson. Pitts, by the way, almost a minute and 30 seconds ahead of the second place car. Yep. And a goodly chunk of that advantage was drawn with that strategic call right at the start of the race. And all of a sudden, the rest of this field are looking for the opportunity to get that rebalance done. Well, that means that by dint of good fortune and reaction quickly to something that was somebody else's bad fortune, that 23 United car has got a little jump ahead of the field and has completed a pit stop without being caught or passed, or even as you look at the shot, the second placed Hertz Team Jota car, even in shot. Yep. But the impressive thing about um, Pearson is being the silver driver, he, he not just managed to hold the gap to uh, Beckman and Ferdinand Habsburg, yep. the more established drivers out there, he extended the gap considerably over those two yeah. during that stint. So a remarkable stint. So here he is, for, he's, for he's already at turn two as they get into turn 17 at the end of the lap, the 48 car in second place. And then- That's the 28. Yeah, the, well, yeah, the 48 car we're looking at in second place is is more than the length of the Ullman straight back. So oh, he's never had the Jotas confused not even, before. 
not even numbers. given not it's even given visuals. 48 is the car, by the way, with the Hertz branding on the side. It is entered by Hertz team jokes, and that car will be replaced by the hybrid cars. You've got cars <laughs> side by side here <laughs> through tricky turn 17. Well, the Toyota with an LMP2 car alongside is the 28 Jota car. Did not want to give any ground there, rightly so, because. If he, you know, if you allow somebody to come up the inside in 17, you're out wide on the bumps. Ben Keating, his race as a driver would be done now. He has completed two hours and 39 minutes of stint. I think he deserves a Louise Beckett style sit down there. Here is now the car that will move through into the lead. That car will take the lead as the I was going to say again, Aston Martin, but just about avoided it. Corvette sits on the pit road. So uh, Rahel Fry had closed that gap towards the end of Hurston. 52 seconds as the cars crossed the line the last time. Ben Keating assisting Nico Veroni into the seat of DCAR. This car, by the way, is not last year's car from GT Pro. This is a brand new Corvette for this programme this year. Now, it's interesting that Ben Keating has done two hours and 40 minutes in the car. Normally, a stint would be hovering around two hours and one, two hours and two minutes, maybe. But we've had a safety car and two full course yellows. Now, of course, you say, well, he's not being beaten up by the car at that stage. No, he's not. But it doesn't allow him much time to recover. All that happens behind the safety car, and Ant, you can bear this out, especially when you've been working hard, is you just sit there getting hotter and hotter and more and more fatigued as there's no flowing air through the car, the heat sink starts to build up in you, and your adrenaline goes away. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it, you know, you've just described it perfectly well, you know, that heat soak in the car, um, especially in the car like a, an LMP2, for example, <laughs> you've got air conditioning, so once that's turned off as well in the pit stop, it gets even hotter. What are yeah. you that was, pointing your fingers at, Graham? That was the change for second place as the Corvette oh, came up. Side yeah. by yeah. No, side by side, the GTE's been in the back of the shot here, 54 going by 33 for second place. All right, that okay. is Francesco Castellacci going by Nico Veroni on his outlet. So outlet. where did the 33 lose so much time to the 85 Iron Dames car? Um, and that was because the Iron Dames stopped with part of their stop under yeah. caution. Just as just as there was a, a, a full course caution being counted 30 seconds beforehand, they were in a position to come into the pit lane. So half of their stop, everybody else was only doing 80 k's when they were stationary. 20 plus seconds the there. Yeah. 20 yeah. Yeah. plus seconds there. That's that was the and they clearly caught that. They didn't need to stop there. That might play out towards the end of this race, yeah. but they came in off strategy take advantage and get the track position. So they've got, there, there may be three laps or four laps different on fuel, can't be much more than that. The real question is, where's 54 come from? Because we have not talked about that Vista Jet car, they apart need a from- stop. They need a stop. They need a stop, okay, so they're running even longer. Um, so yeah, Thomas Floor, his birthday uh, today, and that car now up to second place in the GTE AM class. Again, no GTE Pro, so I, I will resolve to call it GTE, because that's what it is. Um, they are all classified as GTE um, teams and driver lineups, but it is uh, GTE. So uh, there we go, there's the Hertz car, just ahead of WRT, Ferdy Habsburg still trying to get by David Beckman, still not having much luck. And uh, you think, OK, now somewhere on the pit wall they're going, OK, can we somehow squeeze an extra lap out on fuel to try and get by them? And, and But then the problem is you come out on cold tyres going dead slow and they've just come out of the pits full of fuel but on fresh tyres. By the time they come up behind you, their tyres are hot. Yeah, while you're watching this LMP2 battle, just another quick point, a couple of points on GTE. Uh, with the two leading cars now up to speed, the gap, the lead gap, and not, of course, to Nico Ferroni, but to Francesco Castellacci, has gone up from 32 to 40 seconds. Um, and the other thing to say is, you talked about the, the variety we've got here, all four makes represented in the field in the top six. Yeah. And overall, Toyota 1-2, but in LMP2, United's number 23 car, as you see there, 18 seconds nearly ahead of the Hertz Jota car, and the WRT machine that you're looking at, uh, third place 
Then the two Prema cars, fourth and fifth, WRT and Jota's second efforts in sixth and seventh. And if you take a lesson or two from Toyota, that's never a bad thing, is it? You can see the WRT team starting to limber up ready for their driver changes to come through as well. Yeah, it's Fans on Forces, Belgian dance class going to work there with the WRT. The, you know, WRT, in everything they have brought to competition, setting the standard in terms of uh, the way they, they effectively were so good in GT3, they changed the rule book to equalise uh, the field behind them. Still a big battle here in GT8 for second place. Oh. Great stuff from Nico Verone, sent it through Le Mans, past Francesco Castellacci. Come to the pits. Castellacci has gone into the pits, that's why the move looked a little easy. The 54 AF Corsa car coming into the pit lane. Well, the Corvette now with Nico Veroni at the wheel. That means Ben Keating is in the pit lane and has got his breath back to speak to Louise Beckett. We're sitting down for this interview because I think you need it. You're just getting a drink there, uh, Ben. That was incredible. Two hours and 40 minutes you were in that car. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, I really enjoyed racing with Sarah uh, in the 85. We went back and forth a few times. You know, uh, ironically, uh, you know, uh, she made a mistake in turn one and I got uh, capitalized on it. And then I made a mistake in 17 and she capitalized on it. We got her in the pit stop and uh, it was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, uh, uh, they made the right call uh, uh, on going to full course yellow. I didn't think we would go to full course yellow because of the uh, uh, the blown tire, but uh, they called it right, and so good, good on them. But uh, yeah, really good. It's it's interesting. The track has changed quite a bit since any time in practice, because so many cars are running for such a long period of time that there is a there's getting to be a single line. There's getting to be a lot of uh, trash or marbles or gray on the on the off line. And sometimes with all the traffic, you get offline, it can really mess you up. And so uh, I had a few moments where I went offline and you know, I, my tires would get all dirty and it would take about a lap to clean them up. But without the traffic, if you can have a clean lap, it sure does feel good. Thanks very much for holding out and talking to us. You need to go and get rested up now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. I love Ben Keating, he's such an enthusiast and yet another, he's, I mean, thank goodness GT3 is coming along because he's running out of cars in the GTE category that he's not yet driven. In fact, is there a car he's not yet driven? Has, to, has he raced a Ferrari now? Has he raced a Ferrari? I think he has raced a Ferrari, but not in WC. I'll have to double check well, I, that. Um, uh, I, so I, I made myself a little list. I know he's driven GT3 Mercedes. I'm not sure he's driven well, maybe it's the a GT3 Ferrari. I think but, Ferrari yeah, is the one that's eluded him. But there's so much in that little interview there with Ben Keating and, uh, you know, explaining beautifully just the way the track is evolving. Absolutely able, despite his fatigue, to relay the action from two and a half hours mm. on track in a, in a battle that he's clearly thoroughly enjoyed. Let's have a listen to what's going on at Glickenhaus uh, with the 708 Roman Dumas. Hey guys, we are out. Uh, well, that's uh, pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> the answer there is not much then. Pack up and uh, start to think about heading back to Europe. And, and the next challenge, which is going to be new for almost all of these teams, is going to be Portimao, isn't it? Because yeah. it's, I mean, that's, that's where, you know, we brought Glickenhaus as a brand new team. But uh, there's not a lot of knowledge of that track. Brendan Hartley leading from Kamui Kobayashi. Two hours, 48 minutes in the books. And we still have 189 uh, laps to go. I was going to say miles to go, laps to go. But it, this will be a time-determined race. We're not going to get to 1,000 kilometers. That is going to be very tough indeed ever to do, I think, potentially 1,000 miles rather here in Sebring, just because we tend not to run green all the way through. Yeah, so a tough race and uh, finishes, I'm afraid, all too early for Clickenhouse Racing. A long season ahead for them. Good to see, though, that they are planning for their two-car effort at the Le Mans 24 Hours. Um, the 2021 DTM champion, Maxi Gertz, here, and 
looking for the deal to join the team in their second car for about 24 hours. May well be that we see them earlier than that. Yeah, uh, that would be fun. opportunity to race the 708 before the 709 comes on stream for France. I tell you what, you know, trying to replicate last year's Le Mans result for Jim Glickenhouse, the team is going to be a massive challenge, isn't it? With, an, just. with an even deeper overall field. Now, again, of course, you know, the Porsche has never raced and compete, competed at Le Mans, nor has the Ferrari. So effectively, he's against the same cars that he was against last year going for overall victory that are proven to be able to survive the distance. And that's the Toyotas. Yeah, absolutely. So Toyota 1-2, uh, Brendan Hartley with Kamimi Kopiashi right behind. Then it's Kevin Estra in the number six Porsche Prince. Uh, Motorsport 963, then the 50 Ferrari. It's the car that set pole position, but they've had a troubled run so far in this race. And there they are. That's yeah. the other pair, actually. That's the 51 That's Ferrari. That's the five yeah. and the 51, uh, which are the next two cars up in fifth and sixth. The Cadillac of El Bamba getting back onto it now, 15 seconds back from this pair. Yeah, yeah the they... the, sorry, Martin. The Ferrari is not able to match the Toyota's lap times, despite losing out on infringements here and there, and maybe you know a few problems in the pit lane themselves. But despite that, the speed hasn't been there compared to that of the Toyota that I'm seeing so far. But they are definitely still faster than the Cadillac and the Porsche. So if they just keep their nose clean now and have a trouble-free race from this point on, with 187 laps to go then they can get themselves, I believe, back into their rightful position before the end of this race today. Well, they will see their rightful position as being on the top step of the podium, so... Mm, in terms of speed, <laughs> as well, no. no it's going to be the, tough. They've got the data as, as well as I can see, and the lap times aren't there to match these two out in front. True enough. The gap is evident flowing quite a lot between the two Toyotas. Uh, Kobe actually can bring it back down just eight tenths now, as you can see. But it was up at something like three seconds a few laps ago. It's just, to, just how they get through the traffic. Well, so far, after nearly three hours of racing, I haven't had a single message on the radio saying, I'm faster than him, can you let me by? Oh. That's the Iron James. It is the Iron damage. James. That is one. That's a What's right rear fender. There? That could be. Just, that's the. Is that over the? Oh, oh big one! Oh, that's the entire rear uh, bodywork with the diffuser. Is I that think. the lower? It is the lower bodywork. That is going to be a long that's stop, that. and that is right, their race so gone. And that is a very troublesome car right now, I imagine. Without that diffuser, it will have lost a lot of the rear downforce. Looking a bit more like a 935 now. Moby Dick. So, that's yeah, what that's it should look like. There's the sister car going by. Right, now let's have a look at what the speeds are here. That's that's going to require an intervention. Yeah, another full yeah. course yellow coming up probably with that. Yeah, here it we go. Deep, literally, and, literally as you said it. I mean, just, it was all going their way, wasn't it? it? Was. And that's what this circuit does to you. If you get it just wrong in that first corner, like Ben Keaton was saying, oh, so it's nine to oh. be off again. Ben Keaton was saying, Smoking. look, there's, there's so much gravel marbles outside the track yeah. now from that yeah. constant line that the driver's being running round on. One mistake and you're off the circuit. And again, it's not just our drivers, it's all the other cars. I mean, there's been hundreds of cars here this weekend going round and round and round and round and round and round and it just keeps keeps cleaning up and gripping up the line. She can't put... She couldn't come in because of the full course yellow. Yeah. She could, that's force majeure, surely. Well, let's hear from Roman Duma. Van Wall. Yeah, puncture on the Van Wall. Roman Duma, this is not what we want to see, and I'm sorry that we're having to do this interview. Um, we're going to have to retire from the race. Well, uh, yes, that's right. Uh, we really don't know what happened. Suddenly on the straight, just uh, the car stopped, you know, without any alarm, without any noise, like an uh, electric issue somehow. But the uh, funny thing is, Everything stay on the dashboard and everything, so it's very difficult to to find the issue actually, because we have really no no sign and indication of the problem. I don't even know what to say to you from that really. Like, is it, it's so hard to see the team here working so hard and and you know it end in this way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, at the end, for sure, Sebring, We all know it's very difficult, but um, normally <laughs> reliability is always a good point of our car. So uh, yeah, it's like that, you know. It's racing at the end of the day. It's a, it's a big shame for everybody. We all want to 
to compete to the end and to enjoy it, but uh, that's a part of racing, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. So I was speaking to Sebastian Buemi uh, a few days ago, and he said, look, one advantage that the Clickenhaus has is that it isn't a hybrid. It is a normally aspirated engine, and so it's an advantage in many ways uh, f in terms of reliability. There's a fewer parts on the car to go wrong. So what's happened here to the Van Wall? Was this a clash with the Peugeot? It's the Peugeot, then, I think. I had to touch the brake, touch it slightly in front. Is it a clash with the Peugeot? No, no. Yes. Well, it is, yes, yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. Ooh. So, yeah, I, there's the full course yellow board. See, yeah. on the left-hand side, so full course yellow board's just come out. So, what did I say? Drivers. What's happened is the van wall has slowed down, and whoever was behind it didn't, and the, we now know who the whoever was behind it Michael is. Michael Jensen. He was caught out by the driver in front. And now, you, you talked about the fact earlier that you have three seconds beyond zero in the countdown to get down to the 80 kilometers an hour. The van wall driver, Tom Dillman, clearly went right down to 80 at zero, and behind the Peugeot was not. It's Esteban Guerrieri is aboard. Guerrieri, all right. It it's is. a green flag. Uh, we're back to uh, the to full green flag running again. Yeah. So, so what you often see, yeah, is that the that amateur drivers respond faster to the full course yellow signals from yeah. their team. Yeah. And the team, I, I guess, have to give them more warning as well because yeah. they can't take it yeah. right to the limit like the pro drivers can. Well, and the other thing is sometimes where you are on the circuit makes a big difference because if you're on a straight, no drama in breaking really hard and really late to get down to that. And you're in the middle of a sequence of corners, you're going to have a huge crash trying to do it. Look at the pickup on the, on the front of the Ferrari there on that inner shoulder. Look at it now being thrown off as it comes up to speed. Also, did you notice, by the way, on the Allman straight, as we went back to green, the two Toyotas tracking dead straight behind the Cadillac weaving from hard shoulder to central reservation, trying to either clean the yeah. tyres or build up some, some temperature before he, he really dropped the hammer. So, they, again, the way the cars have been built and designed over the years. There's the nose of the Toyota with the da of what? the Peugeot with the damage. You know, they, they're, they're, they're still very different, even though they all sort of fit into the same window of performance, yeah. yeah. Well, we've got the Iron Dames on pit lane with the rear end effectively missing for that car. We've got the actually recently fitted replacement nose for the Peugeot with damage. Yes. We've got the Van Wall with <laughs> rear end damage. It's yeah. all happening again, isn't it? Yes, well, you know, what do they say in America? Cautions breed cautions. On board with the Ferrari, carving our way through. That is the number five Penske Porsche in front of us. So this is the battle for fifth place. Sister car for Sister Ferrari on pit lane, by the way. Yep. So this pair just uh, moved so forward. To that is now the fifth. battle for fourth, yeah. Well, there goes the rear of the car. It's, I'm worried about the fasteners underneath that hold the back of that diffuser under the axle. I mean, you know, it is built for serviceability, but if, if stuff gets ripped off like that, you worry about there being a mounting point to screw it all back in. 51 is going to move forward here to fourth place. That's because the car in front of it is just going to drive through penalty for a full course yellow infringement. The number five car in the hands of Fred Makovicki is going to be coming down pit lane shortly. Well, very few times when you when you see a pit lane speeding in front, or pit lane infringement or a drive through infringement, uh, I mean, a, a, a full course yellow infringement, is there no action. You normally only see they're being investigated when there is hard evidence that they have transgressed, so almost always the penalty comes. I thought this might be the case. That's a replacement nose for the 94 car. Yes. Well, I was, I was about to make the point that with only one car moving, they've got plenty of spare bits, but they have to stick the sticky number on. <laughs> they've gone through too much bodywork, and... Um, There's going to yeah. be... A, the, the, the debrief for uh, the majority of these teams is going to be extensive. Oh, it's, it's, uh, well, honestly, it's got to the point it's painful to watch. The rules are simple, aren't they? Stay out of the bits, don't hit stuff. And they have broken both those cars. I mean, that, that's it. That's, that's racing. Stay out of the pits, don't hit stuff. Assuming that your car is quick enough, and in most cases, predominantly it is, because that's the way modern racing works. Around the outside. Outside, inside, outside. Uh, I think the Porsche was coming into the pits, probably to yeah. drive through. Yeah, I think you're right. Through. Uh, I think you're right. Sister car is on pit lane, by the way. Yeah, so they're this both is, in. So this is the 51 moving forward into third place again. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, by the way, if you're wondering why they're taking the time to put a number on the front of that car, not just sending it, it's because it is by regulation. They have to have it on there. Them's the rules. I don't make the rules. Ah, now they no pink gaffer. Car, there's a, there's a gap in the market. I can say how we, we're going to make our fortune. Only from one team, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they've got two cars. Oh, we did, there's, there's some margin there, isn't there? Well, the, 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 the sadness here is they were looking very strong for a yes. potential first World Championship yeah. win until that moment. Now, it was Anthony, just a scheduled pit stop from the Porsche, by the way. Actually pointing at the screen as well. Number six car there, slewing out of the pit box. Normally, that would be a drive-through penalty in previous years, but because there are no tyre warmers, spinning the wheels in the, in the pits is no longer for both. I, I'm not sure quite why. I don't think it makes wheel spin and cars going sideways in a crowded Le Mans pit lane any safer than it was when it was banned years ago. But I understand the reason that, yeah. That has cost the Iron Dames a position. I'm just looking where the 98 car is in that order. Uh, they are down in 10th place now. Yeah. It, it's going to. I, mean, I, I would go as far as to say, Martin, uh, uh, Graham, I think this has cost them the race. Oh, oh absolutely. 100%. Absolutely. And, 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 and probably any right chance there. of a podium. And it happens. And it happens. And, and Rahel is their most experienced driver. I was going to say she was flying. And, she was, and their top rated driver. But yeah. it happens. And, and, you know, God knows this place is tough enough without the bumps. And it is the bumps that get you. Yep. We'll it's see always the bumps that get you. Yeah, Will Stevens, who has. His future plans nailed in as part of the hypercar program for Hertz Team Jota, alongside teammate here Ife Ye and Antonio Felix da Costa, who will join the team later in the season. Well, I did think seeing these two Toyotas on screen, I, I was so hopeful we were going to see the Ferraris take the fight to them today. And they did for about the first three or four laps of the race. Oh, but well, uh, they did okay. until they started making yeah, mistakes the and they started making new team mistakes. Ferrari have not had. Uh, I, I can't believe I even started that sentence. Ferrari have not had a new car problem yet. What they have had is a test team trying to become a race team problem yeah. and, and actually a, a number of them. And, and it's not just the engineers and the mechanics, it's been the drivers as well. It's sort of worse than that because there have been repeated issues. So even if we get a safety car, we're down to, at the moment, three cars on the lead lap. Yeah. And it's, it's problems from everybody other than Toyota. That, that's penalties. It's all Absolutely. penalties. It's penalties. all penalties. Ferrari penalties and caddy penalties. Yeah. You I mean, just have to... You have to have a clean race in that's any endurance race that is the priority number one you can cruise around almost i've finished so many endurance races before where you've got to the end you thought if only we just drove at 90 percent even or eight even 50 percent of thought, our ability I, and stayed out of trouble we would have been on the podium i guaranteed. thought that was the secret of your success being slower than most of oh. the others oh, <laughs> That was like a kick in the oh, back of the, yeah. a kick in the back of the no, Let's just not forget who <laughs> fell over in the commentary box on their cables. All right? <laughs> You're not. No matter what you say, I didn't fall over. over. I was still stood up. I just managed to pull the headset off my head. I don't know how I did that, but there you go. Uh, yes, you no, sent that poor man to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> not the first, won't be the last. Absolutely. <laughs> the the only team in hypercar that have not had penalties and are still not a factor is Porsche. Not quite true. Neither was the van wall. They have had damage, but yeah. not penalties. Yeah. Oh, actually, um, did the five car have a penalty? It's just had one, hasn't yes. it? Yeah, it's just had a penalty. But, but I mean, you know, it, it, in in any form of racing, it is the silly things that get you. The silly penalties, especially. You know, it, it's, I mean, it's not racing, is it? You know, it's football. It's rugby. Don't concede penalties. I mean, the rules are the same. Yeah, everyone has to pull their weight, you know? Yeah. Everybody in the team. It is really, truly a team sport, and the drivers very much were included in that as well. Um, we saw there under the, yeah. the, the full course yellow, as it just happened, yeah. the driver caught out by the car in front. And uh, I mean, I, I, honestly, I don't think I've ever seen that situation before. During a high-speed corner, the car in front slamming the brakes on because at that very moment, you've entered the full course yellow. Well, the, the thing there with with, with Guerrieri in in the in the bike is, is that he was coming off the turn, and then saw the flag signs, and was also getting the count on the radio. The real problem for the Peugeot 
was that he was fully committed in the middle of 17 and and needed more room. If he just stood on the brakes, he would have been in the wall on the outside. What's happened here? Well, this is live. Oh, We're team. back live on air with this never-ending battle between the Jota and uh, the, WRT. the WRT car behind it, yeah. Uh, when the annals of WC history are written, um, there's going to be a great quiz question. What cost Peugeot a minute in the pits changing the number sticker? Well, but, but it's like when your your light goes out on the door of your GT car and you have to change the door yeah. or on the side panel of your... You know, all of those things. It's... I was going to say, it's not always, you know, it's never an engine blow-up. It is an engine blow-up. We've seen some of those. But it's, it's the, the more and more sophisticated and, and well-rehearsed you get, the smaller are, are the grains of sand that, that, you know, bring the whole thing crashing down. We just had the multi-million euro international sports car version of trying to find the end of the sticky tape. Really, <laughs> <didn't we? laughs> At Christmas, yeah. Uh, in the pit lane is one of our LMP2 battles. Rui Andrade and David Heinemeyer Hansen both together. Andrade handing over the 41 car to Robert Kubica. And David Heinemeyer Hansen may well be handing over the 28 Jota car. Let's catch up with WRT's Ferdy Habsburg and admire his new season beard. Ferdy Habsburg just telling me it's not that hot. Uh, we're just having to move out of the way of body parts coming past us. <laughs> body work, I should say. Uh, Ferdy, that was um, that was a hard hard run for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we uh, finished the car. There's no damage. Uh, we are still behind the United and the Jota, I think, on strategy. Yeah, I, it would have been nice to get past the Jota because I was in his gearbox for all two stints, but... I didn't want to be too aggressive early in the race, and I didn't quite get the opportunity. He did a really good job. I, I think it's his first WEC race, and I think he made one mistake in front of me. I couldn't capitalize, so respect to him. But the race is now still 180 laps to go, so and that's the mindset we're having, is uh, we're waiting for the end to uh, go full attack. Well, yeah, we have still got a long way to go, and it looks like this battle is just going to keep continuing. Sorry? The battle is just going to keep continuing between you. Yeah, I mean, it's quite hot. There's a lot of things going on. I mean, a lot of focus yellows, a lot of safety cars. So everything's still in the air. I think we're in the game. I think more than we expected, actually. So that's a positive. But now Sean's in. He's going to knock out his last double. And then Robin is going to crack on and uh, try to get back up into the, yeah, possibly winning position. That'll be difficult, but we stay optimistic. Thank you. Cheers. Just a quick catch up with another one of the cars that we had with a delay. We saw the damage to the 93 cars impact to the rear right of the number four car made. The uh, Floyd Van Wall team turned that car around on pit lane in just under four minutes, but it's dropped now to the, if you like, the bottom end of the LMP2. Paul Dallalana just been passed by Alessio Picariello in the Iron Links Ferrari. That's a change for sixth position now in the GTE class. And Dallalana, a pretty stellar job there, handing a, holding off uh, young Alessio Picariello, who, despite his hugely Italian name, Belgian. Know, yeah, is Belgian. Yeah, I was going to say, like Paul De Resta, who also sounds Italian, or Dario Franchitti, who isn't Italian either. Battle Toyotas. between the two Toyotas. This could be a chance for the number seven car of Kamui Kobayashi to get by Brendan Hartley. Didn't quite have the opportunity, but that's the problem with dropping back in traffic to three seconds back, is those little moments never present themselves. And Anthony, that's why the driver behind will always try to be as far up the exhaust of the car in front as humanly possible, so well, yeah, that one moment in traffic can spin the balance. It's because it's such a hard circuit to overtake. Even working way through the lapped cars, the slower cars out there, you still find it hard to mount a challenge on the car that you're actually fighting. And that's what we saw with uh, Kobayashi there. He was going to go one way, Brendan went the other, and as it all panned out, it was status quo by the exit of turn 13. As they're halfway down the Ullman straight, the back straight, the Ferrari of James Collado that is in fourth was turning into turn 17. Third now, uh, the Ferrari, uh, and actually being caught by El Bamba, yeah. who is pushing on now in the Cadillac in fourth place. So that car coming back into it, and I thought 
But that does mean that the Toyotas have put a lap on the pole-sitting Ferrari of Miguel Molina because of their issue. Correct. But James well, Collado in third. Plural. Yeah, issues in third. Issues plural. But James Collado may be about to go a lap down as well, which would leave Toyota as the only team on the lead lap. Unbelievable. Yeah, with only, I, I, with only 91 laps completed. I expected much more competition, not just in terms of speed of other cars out there, but in terms of the operational side. I did expect Toyota to have the upper hand in that, in that side of things, but my goodness, there's a void, isn't there? at this yeah. point uh, of the season compared to uh, where the teams need to get up to. Toyota have set the bar very, very high. We knew that, but um, it's, it's amazing to see it all play out. What a difference it makes in terms of uh, lap times and, and distance covered on circuit through those errors and penalties. So here is the Cadillac yep. working his way through the slower cars to the top chicane there. Davide Rigon, by the way, in the 54 car. That's a different uh, driver lineup this year. Francesco Castellacci and Thomas Floor raced together last year. Davide Rigon, who was Sam Bird, was in the 52 Ferrari for a number of years uh, with Al Alessandro Pierguini and James Collado in the 51 car in the GTE Pro class. And Sam Bird must be sort of ruining the fact that because what looked like a lot of uh, Formula E clashes meant that he stepped back from Ferrari's GTE program three seasons ago. Now, of course, if he'd still been part of it, and it turned out those, those Formula E clashes moved away and it wasn't such of a drama, if he'd still been, you know, in there again with Davide Rigon, then they might well be in those Ferrari hypercars as well, instead of which Davide is picking up drives here, there and everywhere in GTs, and, and Sam hasn't raced a, a, a sports car for several seasons. Right place, right time, that's what it's yeah, all about yeah. in racing. And um, yeah, just talking back to El Bamba, for those that you don't know, it's... We were just uh, talking about uh, El Bamba before in the, uh, in the Cadillac, and uh, two-time Le Mans winner, of course, 2015, 2017, and uh, World Drivers' Champion in, uh, in WEC in his Porsche days. So now he's, he's kind of ironic fighting the Porsches in his Cadillac. And also the 2019 IMSA GTLM champion, 2020 Spa 24 hour winner. So yeah, very accomplished driver is Earl. Of prototypes and of GTs, and that's, that's yeah. the BAM Tour thing. Uh, you know, BAMDA and, and uh, Van Tour. And, and, and the two of them, you know, hugely experienced and, and not just great drivers but great fun together. Louise Beckett in the pit lane. But also to remember that Earl Bamba along with Alex Lynn won here at the 12 hours of Sebring last year in the Cadillac for the IMSA race. Yeah absolutely and when our race was was lightning stormed off uh, they had a hugely dramatic finish to their race a big mistake there from the Northwest AMR Aston Martin Paul Dallalana uh, probably driver and tyre starting to get towards the end of their stint and uh, drops the car a little bit. Uh, did he lose a place? Not a place. Oh, yeah, Davide Regon went by him, so that was a change for sixth. A beautiful spring, sunny Friday in Sebring. St. Patrick's Day and the captain on hand with Wolfgang Ulrich and the president of the OCO Pierre Fion with the boss of Peugeot and the Centenary Le Mans Trophy on its world tour. It's sort of like a, an Olympic torch relay with that trophy that everybody will battle for in June. Ferrari opening a new big school era of hypercar with pole position ahead of the Toyotas. The second Ferrari going the long way around the outside at turn one, looking for third, only to be rebuffed a little. Brendan Hartley and Jose Maria Lopez enjoying the early going from the pit lane as the Toyotas hung on to second and third as they had in qualifying. First stoppage of the race in the battle for GTE honours. Uh, the Ferrari there of Luis Perez uh, Compact, uh, Luis Compa Perez Compact uh, in third place. And then 
Five laps in, losing it in turn one, hitting the tyre wall, rolling over, bringing out the first but and so far only safety car of caution. the race. He was A-OK, -okay, but it was the first sign that Ferrari not yet a fully up to speed race team with their hypercar. The 51 car lost time in the pit lane. And the 50 car then out front on its own ahead of the two Toyotas at the restart. Problems had seen the 94 Peugeot slowing down and finally driving behind the wall to retire from the race. Drama as well for the Oman Racing Aston Martin, a qualified third, running out of road with what turned out then to be a puncture. And that would cost them positions as they crawled slowly back to the pits. More full course yellows for debris. Uh, IMSA variant hybrids, the Porsche and Cadillac racing each other door handle to door handle. Alex Lynn trying to find a way past the Porsche that had no tyres left. And eventually just managing to squeeze by a Lawrence Van Tor by dint of some fairly insistent knocking on the door. Van Tor's car barely able to face straight out of any corners. Another slew of pit stops and another of our American teams heading out with the Glickenhaus. Meanwhile, in the, G in the LMP2 class, plenty of action between WRT and Prema. They have been off the front running pace of United Autosports. And then our most recent full course yellow as the Glickenhaus stopped, it ran out of road and ran out of go. And then the leader in GTE, bouncing across the grass, shedding its bodywork, bringing out a full course yellow, which caused a collision between a fast approaching Peugeot and the uh, van wall. So the van wall sent to the pits as the Peugeot was for bodywork repairs. They both dropped back down the order. Toyota go one, two after three and a quarter hours. Car number eight, Brendan Hartley ahead of Kamui Kobayashi, and he's opened up the margin again over the number seven car to something like a couple of uh, three seconds. It's not a minute and 31. Unless the number seven car has just pitted while we were showing you those highlights. I think, I think it has, because exactly Earl happened. Bamba is in the pits from third place. Then the best of the Porsches in fourth, ahead of the two Ferraris and the second Porsche. The delayed Floyd Van Hul car in 13th place. And then neither and one of the Peugeots is still going, the 93 car. It is the last running car behind the similarly delayed Vector Sport car that is now less delayed than the Peugeot. And one Peugeot and one Glickenhaus or de Compa, as well as that 83 uh, AF Corsa car of Lewis Perez Compank, which uh, crashed on lap five of the race. Martin Hayden, Graham Goodwin in the booth and Louise Beckett in the pit lane. Graham, it's been a disappointing race for the new kids. Oh, oh and trouble, that's the leader. 23. That is the leader. Has he gone past the pits once too often? No, it's it's sitting down. It's got a puncture, hasn't it, Josh Pearson? Last year's winner here in Sebring in LMP2. That doesn't look like it's got, it's got a puncture, unless it's... No, it's a, no, it's a shadow. Yeah, they're, they're craning this, Richard Dean, they're looking at the screen. I, you're, I think you're right. I don't think it was. Dismay. I think it was just a shadow. Dismay. It's just stopped. It's just stopped. Well, that was a dominant run to that point. That's a second class leading car with drama in the last, what, 20 minutes after the, uh, the Iron Dames 85, which was dominant leader, turned between turn six yep. and seven for Josh Pearson after what was a fantastic... Full course yellow coming. They're going to need it because yep. not a great place to be. He's a long way from anywhere. There's a gap in the wall just not too far away from him, but it will require a tow, I think. So, yellow flags are out, but if they need a vehicle, it will go full course yellow. Who needs fuel now? Who might this help? Well, I'm sure the Iron Dames don't, because that pink Porsche in for the bodywork repairs will have been topped up as well. No point in not filling the car when it's in the pit lane. Will we go full course yellow? It, I mean, as, as, as we often see, the car probably cycling through the restart strategies to try and get it to go again. But for Josh Pearson, this must be very depressing. He is still the leader. He has not been passed by Prepare the Alpine of Charmilacy. 15 17 0, 0. Prepare for full course yellow. 
15, 17, 0, 0 in 36 seconds. Yep, so that's the voice of Eduardo Freitas, and that is the very distressing sight to go full course yellow. for United Auto Sport of the LMP2 leader stopped at the side of the road. He is no longer the LMP2 leader. Charles Malesi has gone 20 by. 20 seconds to go full course yellow. Alpine lead in LMP2. And Will Stevens has gone by, and Sean Galeo will. They all will. Eight of the pits. Eight of the pits. Oh, Seven, good reaction six, from the number eight five, Toyota. Four, and three, that two, puts the pressure on one, number seven. Full course yellow. We are under full course yellow. So, Jeff, there goes the 23 yeah. car to driver's right. Oh, there was a second slowing down there from the Ferrari. That's not good. So why is that important? It's important because they got to pit lane before full course yellow was called because they're not allowed to pit for the yep. first three laps of that. Yep. The vast majority of their pit stop served under full course yellow, so they will gain the advantage. But critically, the when they come out on cold tyres, nobody is coming heaving up behind them at Correct. speed. So he will have full course yellow for the heat of those brakes to gradually build some speed into the tyre, and it will be at least a couple of laps. And when the seven car comes in, which it will do... No, the seven car just came in. That's the other part to this. The seven car had pitted yeah. under full green. It so has that's to. a massive call for the, for the eight car. It has to, and the eight had to come in as well, because otherwise they'd be totally vulnerable. Tom Blomqvist ready to take over at United not going to get the chance. Did they miscalculate? Has he run out of fuel? I, I don't think so. Why is Blomqvist suited and booted in the, in the pit apron? Well, the team is saying it's an electrical issue. It wouldn't be the first time that it's happened in, uh, in these cars. Um, I've had, had a fair share of uh, electrical issues my time at Jota, but well, um, Blomqvist was ready. Cars, of course, as well. Look at Philip Albuquerque. He's looking shell shocked. You're not suited and booted unless the car is due in within a couple of laps. Well, what looked like th the team that were doing all the right things and catching all the right brakes and riding those waves, the 23 United car, fate has just flipped that around on them. I d if, if Blomqvist was there in civvies. I, OK, Blomqvist was ready to take over the car. Yeah, but how many laps have they, had, had they done? Um, if I, if I think they were coming in for a scheduled pit stop anyway. Yeah, and exactly. the fact that there aren't any lights on the car at all, I know they'd probably turned it off and everything, but, you know, I, no, like I say, no. it wouldn't be the first time that electrical issues have um, completely just stopped the car dead in its tracks. The car's going to be under tow very, very shortly. And it's going to be a long full course. A team like United or Jota or WRT, any of the good teams in LMP2 know exactly the fuel that's left in the car. And you would see the car limping around very, very slowly uh, if it was a fuel issue. That thing hasn't run out of fuel. It's, no, a, it's it, electrical. Yeah, it's... Oh, dear me. So the 85 car, what, half an hour ago, out of a dominant lead with... Uh, a run off the track which destroyed the rear bodywork for the Iron Dames and now the other dominant leader, uh, the number 23 car in LMP2 in the hands of Josh Pearson who to that point had done a stellar job, I think the best thing we've seen from young Josh Pearson uh, in the WEC and the car just dying underneath him and that car looks to be done. Yep. Well, it's being towed away so it is done, it's that's that. It's external assistance isn't yeah. it? Yeah, in, in uh, yeah. So we wait to see what the gap is going to be between the two cars leading this race, the eight uh, and the seven, but it's certainly going to be a much bigger lead for the eight. Why? Seven had pitted just before the full course yellow, the lap before. We then got the car stopped on track. They had time to have a good long look. Full course yellow almost inevitable, and Toyota played it right and called the number eight in before full course yellow. That's the way that feels. We'll go green in 15 seconds. Yeah, that is really tough for the 23 crew. And again, sometimes, That's Greg as, Pearson, by uh, the way. That's as, Josh's dad. As, as Roman Dumas said, sometimes, sell a course. That is just racing. Green, green, green. Here we go. Back to green flag racing and back up to speed immediately goes the Ferrari. Brendan Hartley leads in Toyota number eight with an extended advantage over Kamui Kobayashi, now shown on the timing screens as two minutes, 50 seconds. That's the time on uh, full course yellow, so that yep. will come down, but 
it's it's going to be a big gap. It sure is. So on screen, just looking to pick up where the lead car is on the tracker. Seven had not come in and could well, that's come eight in. again. That's eight again. Is that eight again? That is eight again. Why are they back in? They're not. They didn't get fuel. Don't understand that. Now, is there a? If the pits are closed, no. bingo fuel rule? No. Right, number eight Toyota back in the pit lane, and that means number seven. Number seven at the moment. Will or should really take the lead. Door is open on the passenger side. That's not good. Is there trouble here for this car? Is this a battery? Is this still an fueling ECU? It. Still, still fueling it. Right, door is closed and away it goes. So did it not have fuel? I don't understand that at all. Was the pit closed light on and he came in anyway and only took fuel because he needed to? So there was the rule where if you needed to come in and do a, have a pit stop for uh, fuel. Under a safety yeah, car when the pits are closed. And, and if you close the pit lane, you have to have the same under full course yellow. Still There's leads. the number seven. Still yeah, but, but by nothing again. Yeah, it's, so it's on as even. So what was lost is regained for number seven. And by the way, possibly equally significant was just unlapped by the Cadillac. Oh, OK, well, there we go. So we're now back to uh, five yep. cars on the lead. So I've lap. had the information. He was on his last lap of the stint when the full course yellow came out. He was about to run out of fuel. So he's come in. You're allowed to put a splash in just enough to get around again, to get the car back out there. Then he's come back in to do his the rest of the fuel that would have gone in. Am I imagining the fact that we saw him on pit lane while they were counting us down to a full course yellow? He was on pit lane before they counted the full course yellow. Oh, trouble for the 98 now. Had it confirmed, the Toyota did stop for an emergency splash and then continued. Completed service after the full course yellow. They may have thought it was too close to call. He may have seen a yellow no entry sign. Now, Paul Dallalana, I beg your pardon, uh, Axel Jeffries, ran off wide a few laps ago and the 54 Ferrari got through. I wonder if that was the beginning of a softening tyre or where or whether he's cut it running wide again. But whichever, North, it is Paul Dallalan at Northwest AMR, Aston Martin. Paul's back in then, so because yes. yeah. it was, was it? Yeah, he did get out and now yeah. he's back in. Yeah, yeah. and actually, well, uh, and, nice. and, and often that's what happens with Paul is he'll do a single stint out, single stint out. And, and if, he's, if he needs to drive more time, we'll go in for a third time. But usually that's that's not the way. So with the cars back up to full speed for the moment, at least, while Paul Dallalana creeps back to the pit. It's past. not creeping. Sorry, Greg. It's not creeping. You've got to go slower than that. You can see the tire, the smoke all pluming out the back of it. That tire is going to shed itself to bits and rip the bodywork to bits as well. Yeah. The team should be onto him right now saying slower, slower. I know it feels like you're creeping along in a racing car at that kind of speed, but you need to go slower. He's just past the point where Josh Pearson uh, uh, ground to a halt. It is toe to 1-2. Gap 1.3 seconds between Brendan Hartley and Kamui Kobayashi. Yeah. And Miguel Molina is minute 24 seconds further back in the number 50 Ferrari. Then Kevin Estra in the six Porsche. Just two seconds back to the Ferrari now. Earl Bamba in fifth, 21 seconds further back. Those five cars still on the lead lap. And so things are progressing well again for that 50 Ferrari, the, the car that started the race from pole position. It's half a lap back. Paul Dallalana is really now creeping back at 40 miles an hour. Or not, not got my message. <laughs> yeah, because uh, you've seen how the tyre smoke stopped as yeah, well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's because there's I mean, no tyre left on the rim. In the car, you feel like... <laughs> yeah, in the car, you feel like, uh, I've got a race to get back to the pits, I'm losing time. And if you damage the bodywork, that's going to cost you even more time than it would have done just to creep round and only change the tyre on your and car. And the real drama isn't the bodywork, because all those bits come off and go back on really easily, if not cheaply. The real drama is when you rip off the brake cooling ducts or you yeah. pull off a brake line or a fuel line from the tank at the rear or damage your suspension arm. 
That got a bit tasty, by the way, didn't it? <laughs> we were talking about uh, Dadalana's puncture, but um, that was very, very tight between the two LMP2 cars. They worked their way past the 54 car. 54 is in third, uh, fourth place in LMP2. Davide Rigon. See, that's Rigon. You know, top class GTE driver giving away nothing in terms of pace because yeah. that car is actually quicker and more modern than the last one he raced in the FIA uh, WEC. So, you know, he's got a very quick car, and in, in the medium speed parts of this track, the LMP2 cars have got nothing because they've got little of their downforce to help them. And they've, they've got tyres predominantly the same size as the Ferrari. The Ferrari rolls and puts its power down better. So it's Rasmussen. He was one of the drivers at Jota last year in yeah. car 28. So he continues with the team this year. And he's going to have a chance here, I think, in towards turn seven yeah. against Caldarelli in the uh, Prema car. He's got the inside guarded and he's going to try and cross his line on the exit. But he's on the dusty, like we heard earlier on from Ben Keating. If you get onto the outside, you're now really confined to that one single line making your job even harder to overtake on this circuit. There's such a hard track to overtake on in the first place. Quite an interesting battle here because Calderelli has got a decade plus of top flight GT experience under his belt, much less so in LMP2s. Probably actually not much more, if more at all, than Ollie Rasmussen. So the young Dane, you know, up against Somebody who may have not much more experience in prototypes, but is hugely experienced racer. Yeah, you can see those sh shredded bits of tyres there hanging off the wheel arch. And the real danger there is when it starts to delaminate, it just becomes this flail, yeah. you know, like a minesweeper tank so that just rips things apart. Hopefully, they can only they can just get on with changing that wheel off the, yeah. the right rear there. It seems like it's okay. Doesn't damage the bodywork around it, so uh, yeah, I think just they got have away not with that put one. a new wheel on though. Not yet. And they ran round to the other side. Hmm. Mm. Somebody's felt something up there in the wheel arch, like the lack of a brake cooling duct or a, a diff cooling duct or something. Here we go. Here we go. Rasmussen's poised. Throws it up the inside. Calderelli counters. He's going to run out of road on the exit. His exit will be compromised. No. Too bad though. That uh, did well. And they're still you know, relatively you, fresh tyres, you yeah. can tell, can't you? Because they're, they're sort of changing their line mid-corner. Yeah, there's all the wire. That's what takes the time. Even if it's done no damage, you've got to... I've, I've had a puncture like that on the motorway, and, and where the inside shoulder has gone, all of that wire has wrapped itself around everything. You know, you're there for an hour in the driving rain, trying to pull it all off with your bare hands. And they're, they're still going low. Yeah, they've got the mole grips, they're just like, ri trying to rip it out of the car. I think it has damaged more than what we first yeah. thought. It wasn't just the strands from the, the carcass of the tyres, more there. Confirmation from Simon Strang yeah. at Toyota that the pit lane closed light was illuminated when he came in. So it may have been on early yeah. before the zero, but because it was on, and, and that's a professionalism of Toyota, not we're going to argue later about the fact that it was or wasn't down to zero after we've been hit with a penalty, we are going to make damn sure and we're going to go with the bingo fuel rule, we're going to take on whatever it is, 10 litres to do the three laps that the pit lane must remain closed and then we're going to come back in after that or when it opens. Yeah, so. I'd, be, I'd be really interested to hear the take from race control on that. I'm, I'm absolutely no doubt that's completely correct. Yep. But it, it's not something I've heard done before that you close the pits before a full course yellow yeah, is you can. Yeah, definitely, you definitely can. If you know a full course yellow is coming, you close the pit lane before it. But it, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be closed until zero. They can do the. Direct but, but you can't be penalised for not being down to speed before zero. So you shouldn't be able to be penalised for not being in the pit lane before zero. It depends about. It depends of the uh, the distance that it came on. So once I came into the pits of Le Mans before with just a. I think a second before, uh, just after the pit lane close light had come on. Yeah. So there's no way to react to it. Um, and by that time, you're on a pit entry road in, anyway. Yeah, you're coming in anyway. Yeah. So for that moment, it was close. Yeah. But they, they see sense, and well, there's and, that rule in place. Within a second, you're OK. And that's why the pit, pit closed has to be before the start of the pit entry road. Yeah. Because otherwise, there's no time to wave off. But. But, but, I but think I mean, Toyota, yeah, they've, they've done yeah. it by the rules. Heads up. Uh, there's nothing they can do. Absolutely. Done. 
Well, let's get down to Northwest AMR. Paul Dallalana has handed the car over to his co-driver, Nicky Team. So the proud sporter of the best beard in the business is at the wheel. Paul Dallalana, well, he's not even having a sit down with Louise Beckett. Paul Dallalana just catching up with the team. You did well to get that car back, and it seems that it was more damaged than just the tire. Yeah, yeah, super unfortunate. Just had contact with 86. I'm not sure. You know, I think I left them enough room there. So, <laughs> anyways, but that was right on pit lane. So it was a full lap, you know, with the tire completely destroyed. So, yeah, I had to get it back. It's unfortunate. I think we had really good pace today, and we were roughly in the top three most of the time. So, you know, it's a shame to lose all that. Uh, all that but uh, that's racing it sure is thank you cheers thanks 86 is the gr racing porsche of ben barker their pro so uh, ben obviously decided there was a porsche shaped hole paul thought he'd left a porsche shaped hole and maybe and again here anthony as so often is the case your line can vary by half a meter not because you're rubbish at positioning the car but because there's a bump where you weren't expecting it to be and it moves you yeah, look, we saw with the, the clash between De Resta and the Ferrari earlier on in, into turn four, you know, the move looked like it was on, but if you're unsighted, you're not seen by the car that you're trying to overtake. And it's a very narrow line that they're all restricted to around this track. So, um, like I said before the start of this race, I was expecting a lot of safety cars and full course yellows today. Yeah, we've had them. Well, gee, <laughs> <laughs> we really have had them. Freshing Lubin holding off Robert Kubica, the young Brit in the United Auto Sports car, with the veteran pole right behind him. But the the, the inset shot you just saw there, uh, the significance of that was that was 23 being pushed along the pit lane past the team and behind the wall. So yeah. 23 is it's gone done. and done. Yeah, Frederick Lubin, of course, that mistake uh, with the pit call earlier in the race, but fighting back now. A really interesting battle going on as we see the number 23 car uh, going back behind the pit wall finally. Uh, it's for the number two and the number eight. We'll come back to that in just a moment because that could play a part. So the lead car, the number eight, followed by the number seven. Those two cars separated by just 1.7 seconds. But just ahead of the two Toyotas is the number two Cadillac, having unlapped itself. And that is Earl Bamba, desperately trying to stay on the lead lap ahead of the two Toyotas. He is the fifth of five on that lead lap, but has the lead car right behind him. So they came through turn 17 last time. Meanwhile, cameras following the battle as Robert Kubica tries to catch young uh, Freddy Lupin. Lupin. Lubin. Lubin. That bit, <laughs> because, <laughs> because, it, because <laughs> Lubbins, thank you, Louise. <laughs> Where did the S um, come from? <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's, it's Louise Beckett's. What can you do? Uh, <laughs> she said it sounds better. Uh, yeah, Freddie Lubin doing a, a really good job here battling with uh, Robert Kubica, giving nothing away. And uh, Kubica's, you know, we, we heard. Pulling away. We heard from. Um, well, Ferdy Hapsler, didn't we? You know, spent two full stints behind the car in front because you dared take a big risk early in the race. And although, you know, we're three and a half hours in, it, it can be a, a, an eight hour race. It will be an eight hour race. So, yeah, we're some way even from half distance, never mind into right now it's time to get the elbow sharp and distance. It's a lot of minding your own business, keeping your nose clean not hitting stuff and not incurring penalties still to go before we start fighting for a win. Oh, yeah, this race is still yet to get tough, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did, did we not mention that? Yeah, no, absolutely yeah. When, right. When the sun goes down uh, and you can't Ooh. see where those bumps are anymore, things get very exciting. Miguel Molina and Kevin Estra right behind the battle behind uh, of the uh, ORF... Uh, Michael Dynan, the blue Aston, and Matteo Cairoli, the young Porsche junior driver in a Project One car, the white car with the red and blue highlights. And that's a battle for not very high up, 10th place in GTE, bearing in mind that their Oman racing car started in third place in the class. It's down to 10th position without major dramas. They had one shot we saw of it running out wide. 
Meanwhile, with the number six Porsche still weaving its way through traffic. Behind that Ferrari, there's the 50 car, our pole sitter, and a Porsche is right with it. Now, so many times over the last couple of seasons, and with you being with us, and the years before that with Alan, all we've heard from the GT Porsches is, you're doing really well, look after your tyres, because you're on a limited tyre strategy. And, it, and, and we've seen, I mean, last year particularly, we saw in the second stint their GT performance just fall away dramatically versus the Ferraris. Right now, is this Estra on a, this is a first stint, I think, for Kevin Estra. So he's right in position to attack the Ferrari. But as, as it goes on, is he going to start to lose that balance in the car? Because at the end, a couple of hours ago, we saw them screwing all over the track where they had no grip at all. Uh, just a quick update before I know Ant's got a point to make about the tyres, is the, ca uh, the Cadillac has now dropped behind both of the Toyotas, uh, so it's off the lead lap again. OK. Yes, just so eight hour race, you get uh, 26 tires for hypercar and LMP2. You get 34 individual tires this year. So six and a half sets for hypercar and, G and LMP2. The GTs get eight and a half sets. So that's why it's important to look after them. That's why it's important. And that's why that we see the teams forcing their drivers to stay out there to elongate the, st the, the stints as much as they can. You can't just throw tires at them these days. That Porsche really starting to squirm around once again. It seems to be pretty good in tie warm up, and uh, it's on the attack from you know exiting a full course yellow period or when they slap a new set of tyres on the thing or, or the start of the race. It seems to be pretty pretty quick in those moments. But then I think that's what's doing the damage to the longevity and the degradation. Uh, of the tyres throughout the race, and you see it now start. It's almost like the driver is doing the complete opposite of what you were saying earlier on, Martin. Where the, the Porsche uh, in the old 911s I used to race in the GTs were always told just you know do it well, conserve, conserve, conserve. Yeah. It's like they're doing a the complete opposite job, just thrashing them at the rear of the car, especially for all their work. Now the, the, the difference, but the fundamental difference in design aspect between the two of them. Both are hybrid, both have got turbocharged V8s. The Ferrari's hybrid drives the front axle. It's a mild hybrid, it's not, you know, Ooh. another 150 horsepower. But the Porsche's hybrid adds power to the rear wheels. And so if you've got a problem where you're starting to burn up your rear tires, the hybrid exacerbates that, whereas in the Ferrari, it helps to reduce that and to prolong the life. So let's say they've both got approximately 750 horsepower, which for argument is where we are. Seven horsepower, 700 or so internal combustion engine horsepower. Whenever the front drive comes in in the Ferrari, the rears don't get punished anymore. The fronts start to do a bit of work. When the hybrid comes in on the Porsche, it just adds to the torture of those rear tyres. So that's possibly part of the balance between the two of them. Some of it will be familiarity, some of it will be set up, some of it will have been happened on the right setup, fortunately, because neither team have got experience of racing this car here. So, so to a degree, some of it will just be you managed to have found the right window or have, have, have second-guessed yourself correctly into the right window. But in, in a given circumstance, the Porsche hybrid rear drive is going to deteriorate the tyres worse than the hybrid front drive Toyota. It's uh, interesting. Uh, is it the, yeah, well, Ferrari. and the Toyota. And, and Toyota, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the Toyota, so the hybrid uh, mechanism, the system kicks in at 190 kilometres an hour on the uh, both the Toyota yes. and, and the uh, the Ferrari as well. Um, well, all of them. Uh, apart from the Peugeot, yep. that is 150 kilometres an hour. Because it's got narrow, because um, it hasn't got narrower front tyres, it's uh, got narrow rear, it, it's got equal front and rear tyres, and there's yeah. a, an equivalency there. So, what you're saying is, so the, the hybrid, the way it works today, it doesn't add on top of the power. The ICE, the internal combustion engine, reduces its Correct. power yeah. when the hybrid kicks yes. in. Yes. So it's not like the old days of the LMP1, where it's an additional X amount of horsepower from the hybrid system on top of uh, the ICE combustion power. No yeah. boost. Uh, so there's no 
there's well it's boosting but it's not on top of the ICE yeah. power anymore so that is a reduction so it's it stays completely the same power so the Porsche's delivery constantly is through the rear axle, yeah. whereas over 190 kilometers an hour, the Ferrari starts to claw away those front tires. Yeah. Um, so it's relieving momentarily. Yeah, it becomes a true four-wheel drive car in those moments. O only over 190 kilometers an hour. Which here is is much less of the lap. When you get to somewhere like Spa and at Le Mans, it will be more of the lap that that yeah. power is. He's in it's real trouble here, by the way. So, yeah. Sorry to butt in yeah, there. Yeah. Uh, Molina really is in struggling. absolute trouble. Yeah. He's been on the marbles yeah. trying to defend, and he's got dirt all over his tyres. Well, and, it's, and it's not just like blocking down the inside. It's every time you go around a GT car that is on the racing line, by, def by default, you are not. Yeah. You are picking up the mark. And so, yeah, he's squirming. He's struggling at the front. <laughs> Porsche was struggling at the back. You know, both of them have got evil devices that are trying to spit them off the road. But if you can, oh, things oh, were just a bit oh, really limited on entry there for the Porsche. But if you could go on the onboard at some point and you listen to where the Ferrari starts to use the hybrid power, you get to hear it only kicking in over 190 kilometers an hour. And it's yeah. kind of like exit of turn one. Uh, through turn eight, I don't think you're going to make a move on the inside here because he's going to chop you off. You're going to try around the outside. He's got it covered as well, so you're going to have to set him up for, and which he's done beautifully. He's oh. ran out wide. Oops. He pressured him there. He's got, he's got him on the inside for 16. Great yeah. driving there from both drivers. That yeah. is bold the stuff again. Ties Kevin, gone for Molina. Kevin Escher. Kevin Escher. You know, he, he and Michael Christensen <laughs> have got a, a lot of axes to grind against the Ferraris. And all right, it's, it's, it's not the 51 team of last year. It's the 52 team of last year. So it's not quite the guys that they feel, quote, robbed them of the title and blah, blah, blah in Bahrain three years ago. But yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, and he'll feel more satisfied having touched up a Ferrari like that than if it was anything else. So here we go, this is going to be a replay. So he tried on the inside, the Destro, but Molina had it blocked. So he goes for the outside, but he gets defended there. Now Molina's in trouble, runs out wide. So Kevin tucks it in tighter and goes around the outside of uh, 14 into 15. I yeah. don't think he quite expected to get the run around the outside of 14, but he went for it anyway once the opportunity was and, there. And, and that's the racer, isn't it? If something yeah. uh, you know, offers itself up, boom, you go. And look at the gap he's opened up. You know, We talked about how the, the rear of that Porsche was moving around, the front of the Ferrari. Looks like he actually had more speed. 41 WRT in the pit lane, and so too is the 28 Jota. So this is Kubica Rasmussen. The battle continues in the pit lane. Kubica stays in. Guessing Rasmussen does as well. I mean, I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed for the 23 car crew. You know, they, yeah. in my opinion, thoroughly deserve to win this race today. They had the speed, the consistency, cruelly robbed to a victory, in my opinion. But from an entertainment point of view, <laughs> sitting in our position, yeah. it's absolutely opened up the race. And here back to the top of the pile, Dorian Pan, yeah. again the race leader. Now this time, she is the race leader. I said she was before. She wasn't, because I'd not noticed that the 23 car was so far ahead in amongst the hypercars. She is now in amongst the hypercars. In fact, our LMP2 leader is eighth overall. The Floyd Van Wall car of Esteban Guerrieri, ninth overall. This is coming towards the end of a double stint for Dorian Pan. She's just been passed on track by Miguel Melida in the 50 Ferrari, who's now in fourth place overall. She's having a really, really good stint. Yeah, watched her with her first LMP2 test at Portimao last year after the ULMS final round, and then, of course, carried on to test the Bahrain rookie test. Um, I think we've got another young star in the making here, and it's double good news that it is a very talented young female driver. Think we can class her as a super silver? Uh, at this point, she's definitely getting that way. She's she's going to struggle to be a silver by the end of the year. Yep. If this is how she's going to drive, well, it doesn't matter, does it? No, I know, by no. Because LMP2 has gone at the end. Yeah, of the yeah, year. yeah, yeah. Yeah, but then she's trying to find a drive somewhere, anywhere, well, and it's harder as a gold, as you know, Ant. What we don't know, what we don't know, uh, yet know, is what the full plan is with Lamborghini. We know there's going to be one factory car for the WEC and one factory car for the endurance races of the. Uh, it's about the Tech Sports Car Championship, but we don't know what might happen should they release another car 
to either the same team, which is the Prem Ryan Lynx squad, or another team. Could there be a plan for an Iron Dames car? Well, look, you know, she's she's still in the family. You know, Prem and Iron Lynx are very much the same organisation. So she's they, they've made sure that she's where they need her to be, racing the fastest prototypes they can get their hands on. And, and she's doing a really good job. Now, look, if you look at the rear wing of that Prem car, it is branded with the Iron Dame. She yeah. is very much part of that. Yeah. Was part of the crew that took the race win in the final round of the European Le Mans series in dominant form in the last race in Europe with the Ferrari and there'll be I think a lot of people within that organization the wider organization keeping a very close eye on literally everything that happens with Dorian in this car through the full 2023 FI World Endurance Championship hundreds hundred percent and here is Andre Negrao now closing in on Robert Kubica from behind into the pits is our GTE AM leader, Nicolas Verone, with uh, Davide Regon about 90 seconds behind. So they should get through that fuel stop. I don't think it's going to be a driver change uh, ahead of Regon. This is Andre Negrao uh, yeah. versus Robert Kubica there in the number 41 WRT. Negrao on the Alpine. So he's, the gap seems to be staying pretty consistent over the last few laps at least, but traffic dependent so I just want to see on pure pace and this free air they've got at the moment just trying to see this circuit map yeah they've got a they've got a GT just on the approach to uh, turn 14 now and they're just approaching 13 and then after that a small gaggle of cars in front heading down towards turn 17 so yeah a bit of bit of free air coming up for uh, for these two and I want to see if Negrao's got the speed to close in on Kubica. That would be a good fight. Two seasoned pros at the wheel of these LMP2 cars, very evenly matched. In the inset, tyres going on to the Corvette now. Eight and a half sets of tyres for qualifying and the race if you're a GTE AM. And in an eight hour race, you should do seven stops no more for tyres and fuel. So they have plenty to be able to change tyres on every stop. So the GR racing car come out in front of them. There's the 50 into the pits, out of fourth place. And pass goes to Cadillac right in the background. It's going to come just under the camera. So the Cadillac picks up a place immediately, even before the Ferrari hits its marks, and a driver change. Nick Nilsson getting on board, the number 50. Yet another talented young Danish driver. Yeah. Lots he was pole position here last year, wasn't he, in LMP2, or was that his teammate? Oh, that? He did get pole position. We had pole position for the first three first races to that team. AF one, at, one in ELMS and two in uh, I'll double check I'll double check because it was Rivera as well wasn't it yeah. uh, he was the other star driver in the LMP2 cars shared the, the car with it oh either way it's quick I mean Nick Nielsen's <laughs> quick Nick Nick, yeah. Nick Nielsen's uh, road through sports car racing is absolutely oh, oh that that had all the sounds of a wheel nut no, not going off properly and all the sparks coming off as well. Looked like the gunman was happy with it. That didn't look great though. So this is eight catching car yeah. seven. Here's Hartley's radio now. Wow, okay. I'm at the bridge, just drove at half speed in front of me. No problem. Yeah, he's the boss. Don't criticize him. Just drove at half speed in front of me, no problem. So Brendan, uh, expressing a, a degree of concern, I I managed to avoid him, but is he genuinely brake checking me? Or, or was he not talking about his teammate? Was he talking about another car? I'm not sure about that. I have to see if there's any more radio traffic between ship to shore in the Toyotas. Number seven leading, number eight was the dominant force here, but um, number seven stopped under green and then it went full course yellow and the number eight car came in just as we were going 
down to zero for full course yellow, but the pit entry light was already closed, or showing closed, so illuminated. So, so they went in, had a short splash, enough to get you through the three laps as Jacques Villeneuve in the background is about to get into the uh, Floyd Van Wall. And uh, the 22 United Autosport car about to take on Philippe Albuquerque. So, Philippe Albuquerque versus Jacques Villeneuve. Okay, that's an interesting Well, it's always battle. unfortunate when you're the car that comes in front of another one. You've got to go in, like you saw, the 22 at an angle. Yeah. And uh, you have to stay in the car as the driver till the car goes on the on, on the dollies and then they can move it into position, Just then onto the jacks. That's when you can get out as a driver. You see so many times the driver comes in at that angle and then jumps out. And uh, that's going to give you a, a penalty and obviously slow down your pit stop as well. Oh, the Ferrari <laughs> really <laughs> see this at the end of the stints. And the only car that's not doing that is the Toyota yep. through that, that very corner of turn eight. Yep. So. Um, yeah, they, well, they seem to be a bit more patient and, on the and power. And part of this is that thing in front, that Bamba in the caddy, and that's what Collado's target is. That's why James Collado is throwing listen it to this, through every gap. Just listen, listen. Did yeah, you hear the high pitch? Yeah, that's and, the 190. And, and you saw it. the ometer there going up to Whoa. 195. Yeah, no, this is Collado in full hunter killer mode, isn't it? <laughs> Absolutely hauling in Bamba for all he's worth. And he is pulling him in as well. He's reeling him in, you know, length by length, corner by corner. Yeah, half a second closer on the last lap. We're about to finish their lap. What is this? 112, 113 rather, with traffic for both of them. And so comes the number 22 United car. Back up, by the way, before that pit stop, the second in class. Yep. They'll drop back uh, somewhat, uh, in fact, drop back quite significantly with that stop. Just point out, David Beckman now second for Hertz Team Jota. Doing a really good job in this stint or this double stint for for that Jota car. Let's listen again. This hybrid boost. So just through turn one, you yeah. hear it start to kick in. Yeah. So that's just going to relieve the rear tyres. Yeah. Let's listen again. That's on the brakes. And that's, oh, ooh, and that's off. MGU, that's Generator. What happened there to Collado? All crossed up on the entry to turn five. It just yeah. spat him off, didn't on it? The, on the dirt, he's, he's on the grey and in the wall where he would have been if it was Indy. Uh, Paul, it was your mate, you, you saw the, uh, the slightly fluffed stop because the car was in the way for the 22 United car. It was about 20 seconds. Yeah, maybe you see the offboard of this one. Was it a car there in his way? No, so that's turn four. Then he oh, goes curb to, on the inside. Then he goes to brake. No, no, it happened no. on the brake. Oh, no, he oh, just lost the just, rear on entry. Just offline, wasn't it? But he was in the middle of the road. He, would, he, would, he was not in the same postcode as the Apex. Yeah, but that's, that's the so, line through that yeah. corner. He's, this was on board again. Yeah, he was, he was on the right line and then just, whee, the rear just goes around. Here's his radio. I'm just struggling. There's just no grip. I don't know what's going on. So I think traditionally, traditionally these cars have always been the hype cars have always been harder on their tyres than the GT cars, yep. and um, I think some lessons are being learned here from, uh, from the drivers. And also, there is a stiffer construction of tyres, so when you get onto the marbles and the dust, you're in much more trouble. There's less freedom in many ways than what I could see at least the GT cars able to do. Uh, on a track like this one. So it, you're on that, like Keating was saying, it's such a fine line between grip and no grip. And you go venturing off a little bit too far, too fast into the corner like he did there towards the end of the stint. It can be a real nightmare to control. Yeah, Andre Lotter now aboard the number six car. Pitts from third position drops immediately a couple of places. Cadillac in the hands of Will Bamba uh, up into third place. As Look at the LED lights that are illuminated in the cockpit when the car is stationary. Why? Because it's dark at night. <laughs> and things like that will matter at Le Mans, that you can see stuff inside that's not just the illuminated dash. Final thought on the tyre, Pierre Al from uh, Michelin, when he was in yesterday, was explaining exactly that. Because of the greater downforce of the hypercars, they had to re-engineer the entire tyre from the ground up or from the rim down, if you prefer. So that, so that side, he spoke specifically about that stiffer sidewall construction to put up with the punishment that the, that the hypercars are going to put into it. Uh, and so, yeah, and that's that's exactly what what he was saying yesterday. Is and that's exactly the reason you, you're seeing these problems now. 
it's just this circuit, you know, it's just, you can see the dust everywhere. Yeah. And it's relentless. There's no let up. And it, as you're getting up to speed in the car and, and getting more polished in terms of where you place it, the track is getting hard. It's like it gets fighting you. It's getting harder and harder as the marbles build more and more. What's going on in the number five Porsche? This is Dane Cameron. Cameron sitting at the wheel doing air drumming. I'm not sure what's going on. That looks like a long stop. Let's hear from Porsche's Kevin Estra. Kevin Estra just handing the car over to Andre Lotterer. You put in a great drive there. There were some great moments. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it was tough. It's in the heat of the day. Tire degradation, tire degradation is pretty high. Um, I think we, we made the right call to stop Lawrence a little early, earlier because he was, he was dropping a lot and, uh, and we changed, changed, a bit, changed a bit our strategy. And then um, uh, the Ferrari was quicker than me on the first stint and then on a full course yellow restart, I don't know why, there was a hiccup and uh, so I lost the position on the restart, he could pass me on the straight and then uh, I think he used more his tires so he was struggling a bit and um, but it's very tough to pass with his yeah, same type of car and the cars are quite big on this small track so, uh, so I'm happy that I made it and, and then could pull a gap but it's a uh, yeah, tough day so far but we are, we are still on it to, to do a good position with the, the pace we have at the moment. Same GT names, different cars uh, but they're still great battles. It's good. It felt like last year, you know, the us fighting with, fighting with the Reds. Um, it was fair from both sides. Uh, I have to say, so, for, so far for me, the race has been clean, no contact at all. Everything went smooth. But uh, but these bumps are sometimes uh, tough when you follow and then you lose a bit of downforce. You you land sometimes a few meters away from where you took off. Great, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful express. They're beautifully explained as to the challenge that this place uh, meets and. Uh, almost the best thing is the uniqueness of this. Whatever we're learning here, we can forget by the time we get to Portugal. Oh, completely different track to Portugal. <laughs> Up inside. Yeah. Oh. Going to make it stick, I think. Yeah. Oh, and onto the dust goes the Porsche. Yeah, and, and he knew it. He has yeah. to breathe off the throttle and just calm back, baby. <laughs> and, and I wonder whether they're now starting to learn that you can't single stint your tyres and have fresh tyres every time. So are they now learning... OK, in this heat, double stint in them is not working. Single stint, take them off, fresher tyres on, put the old ones back on later when they're not quite so hot and, and just bring another heat cycle through. You know, you're starting to, to feel your way around how your car individually wants its tyres to be. And, and, and the, I, you know, this is baby steps still. These are brand new race cars, never raced anywhere before now. And so this is learning a whole... Yeah, you no, know, no, this and, is and two race teams that haven't converted from LMP2 or something else, but have merged from GTs and elsewhere. So it, there's a lot going on. The masters of tyre preservation and understanding of how they work and how you need to get the best out of them is Formula One. Yeah. The data that they pull from those tyres is something else. It's incredible. And the, we hear the information given to the drivers lap after lap, corner by corner, lift off round this corner, turn 12 in Bahrain, lift and coast round that corner, the highest cornering energy on the circuit. How do they know that? Because of the data they pull from the cars. Less data is pulled from these cars, so therefore there's more reliance on the driver to do that job, and they're learning as they go. Correct. Kevin Estra saying, my teammate overdrove in the last in. He's learned a valuable lesson there. They're learning as they go, and it's down to the seat of the pants driving, much more so in the World Endurance Championship than it is in Formula One, because they don't have their hand being held for them every single step of the way. Correct. Obviously, look, once again, out yeah. wide there for Andre Lotter in turn one. So not only are you fighting that, you're fighting the tight. And every time you do that, that's another little chip just another taken away from them. Another yeah, little yeah. bit of energy taken yeah. from each other. And you learn this as you go. You have to feel your way. To be fair to somebody like Lewis Hamilton, for example, an amazing ability without having his hand held to feel what he needs to do from the very moment that brand new set of tyres goes on. It, it is an absolute skill. Um, treat, treat it like a lady. Well, just, you know? yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's the tyre has a life. Yep. And you feel like these new babies go on when they put them in the pit. And it's up to you to take great care of them. Um, sometimes you don't have to, but on a track like this today in cars like that, 
you definitely do. Yeah. Just watching actually a couple of the cars as you're talking about that tile, I think two cars, very different cars in hypercar, and the outlaps and the next lap for those two drivers. The first I'm going to talk to talk about is the guy we just saw running a little wide through turn one is Andre Lotterer, very experienced driver in top class sports car racing. 155 on his first flying lap uh, on cold tires, 152 on his second. Jacques Villeneuve, 204 and 157. Yeah, I mean, uh, but going, speaking about Lotterer, yes, you know, very experienced, but he's driven most of his time in LMP1. Yep. And back then, you could pretty much just abuse the tyres. You had so much downforce, the tyres were so hard, um, and you had more tyres to throw at it during the race as well. You could push. I mean, it was called endurance racing, but back then, you, it was like a long sprint. Sprint, sprint, sprint. You drove yeah. flat out from start to finish, and you can't really do that today with the heavier cars that they have. Single stint sprints, less power, less downforce, and less tyre. Uh, driver change, Rahel Frey out of the pink, Porsche and in gets Michelle Gatting, so driver change there at Iron Dames. That car this is now fight. down to ninth place, but here comes the United car. Oh, this is for position, sending out the inside. Also, by the way, uh, welcome to the, the World Endurance Championship. Antonio Giovinazzi now aboard in the number 51 car. That car back out in sixth. There's that place does go the way of the United car. That yep. long fight back for 22. On, on kind of the strategy cycle is cycling back up towards the top. Oh, Philip Albuquerque defending hard and Andrea Calderelli sending it back down the inside. Didn't quite have the room there, did he? But he was definitely shaping up to be a bit punchy there. And Albuquerque had to have a couple of big moves to close the door on him. So, and, that, and this is all for, what are we now? Seventh place in LMP. We're a long way from glory in this battle, aren't we? You're going to have to wake up earlier in the morning to uh, get one yeah. over on uh, <laughs> Philippe Albuquerque into turn one. We are, however, now into the second half. So we have done four hours and five minutes. We have three hours, 55 minutes left to go. And into the pit lane is the 36 Alpine from second place, Mathieu Vaxivier. A door opens, but not his door. Is this a double or is this going to be going on? I think this must be the second part of a double. Well, there are, there are tyres ready, they're not going on, are they? No, it all looks calm down at Alpine. Just the fuel going in. The last year course racing their grandfathered LMP1 in hypercar now back to where they've had so much success in the past at Le Mans and in world championships in LMP2 uh, again keeping the faith and keeping pace up until they come back with the Alpine hypercar in 2024. It's funny I was speaking to uh, James Collado two days ago and uh, he was saying now I know now I'm in the uh, in the top class now I know why it was always, and now I'm seeing it from the other side, yeah. overtaking GT cars. Yeah. It's not as easy as uh, I thought it's, it was when I was in the GT car. They, them buggers so, in them yeah. GT cars, they never get out of the way, do they? <laughs> and those Ferraris are the worst. <laughs> they were, actually. Yeah. I always put it down to the fact they had the le least visibility. But, uh, <laughs> or, yeah. Well, some big stints being put in in LMP2. None bigger, I don't think, so far in this race than that of Dorian Pan. Let's hear from her now. Dorian Pan, joining us here in WEC. You put in a great performance. Well done. Thank you very much. Yeah, I enjoy uh, a lot. I did triple stint uh, yeah, for my first race in LMP2 with, with the team. So, yeah, I, I felt really good in the car and uh, I enjoy a lot, honestly. So, yeah, pretty happy. Uh, the pace was was good, especially my my last stint, and uh, yeah, uh, let's see uh, how it goes. But we are pit three now, and I think we we did a good race so far. Yeah, yeah, you should be pretty happy. But this track is a tough old track on you. Yeah, it's a tough one, but honestly, I enjoy a lot. Same ring is just magical, especially the last corner and, and first corner is totally amazing, and um, and yeah. Thank you. What a joy it is to see a young driver coming through blossoming with really good stewardship with it through the uh, the Prima, the Iron Links family. 
And it is something, and we, we see this with lots of people coming into and through endurance racing, that somehow something just unlocks. They're putting her into LMP2, Dorian Pan. It is the first race here. It's a really tough one to get to grips with, but completely agree with what Louise was saying there. A really, really good stint for the first, first go there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you can clearly see and hear that she was enjoying it. Um, it is a track that you really have to get stuck into. And it, it, she definitely did that. So um, took the fight to the two cars in front of her when we saw it on camera and uh, got the better of them. So clearly had the speed out there, was happy with the speed she had in her stints. And um, yeah, I think this is, um, I think it's going to be a good year in, in LMP2 for her, definitely. Lots of storylines that we can bring to you this year with a very different look to the FI World Insurance Championship and a bundle more to come in 24 and 25. So three hours and 51 minutes on the clock to go now, and we are now counting down time and not laps. Some beautiful shots here. Great cars in this championship now. But you'd have to say the day has been plagued by penalties and misdemeanors that errors. errors 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 all that and it you cannot when you're fighting the likes of Toyota that we see on screen now I mean we're saying it all last year weren't we and it's the same it's the same again for this season but more competition at least the message for everybody else from the thousand miles of Sebring so far is to beat the best you've got to be better and so far, no one's quite there. The good news is we have seen speed from a number of these cars, and they are going to get better. They are going to get better drilled. They're going to learn from those mistakes. They're going to find more speed from these packages. They can understand the tyre wear better. All of those things will start to come, uh, come back, and in particular at Davidson, will come back at the circuits they understand more. Absolutely, Graham. You know, speaking to Jack Villeneuve yesterday, he was saying, look, we've tested at Portimao. I assure you we'll be better and more prepared when we go there. This was a really unfamiliar track to us, and it's been difficult in Peugeot as well. I mean, I know they've had their reliability problems on top of what, what's uh, been thrown their way this week, but it's the same issue for them in that the car just didn't look comfortable. Uh, from the moment I turned up here, compared to the ride that we see from the Toyota, the Peugeot is not on par at all. It's like a different category yep. that we're looking at. It does, at. it does, uh, you're absolutely and, right. And that won't be the, the case when we go to Portimao. Yep. A much smoother circuit, wasn't the case a few years ago, but it's been resurfaced, <laughs> unlike this place. And it's a smooth jack these days <laughs> in Portimao. So, you know, that's where these European teams are doing their testing mileage during the winter. And hopefully, I mean, I'm expecting it, but they'll have a much easier ride, quite literally, when they get to uh, back to Europe. And by the way, if you are listening in uh, from Europe, tickets are available for the Portimao race. It's a great circuit to go and watch motor racing at. You can see got great vantage points for the vast majority of that circuit. And as always, the BFI World Endurance Championship, the access to the circuit to come and see the cars and talk to the teams and drivers is absolutely excellent. And you will be phenomenally welcome. And it falls in the Easter half term as well, so bring the family along. Uh, I think my family. Because that'd be nice. Genuinely, to I think uh, I'm. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, 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 I'm actually I'm, trying I'm to bring my, my son, family along as well. Yeah. I'm told my son and his wife are coming, which is going to be absolutely brilliant to see them. So. Well, look, look it's, uh, let's be honest here. Not many families want to spend the entire day in any holidays sitting at a racetrack. You know, you might be able to take your, your lad along or whatever, or maybe your daughter along, but your wife's unlikely to really want to do that. But if you can parlay a week's holiday in the Algarve with you sneaking off for a... Oh, hello. No, no, a, a little bit of spicy a bit, uh, yes. a spicy side slip there from the caddy. If you, if you can parlay a week's holiday in the Algarve in the Easter half term with you sneaking off for a day or two to go to the track while the rest of the family are frolicking the beach and freezing in the North Atlantic, I, d I think it's a, yeah, it's a great opportunity. And of course, after that, for a real motorsport fan, quick weekend break across the, across the channel from the UK or across Europe from wherever you are to Spa-Francorchamps. Yeah, yeah. mate, I mean, the, the, you know, the, we go to such classic racetracks. A bit like the WCTV version of Through the Kilo <laughs> the Havens there. Through the Kilo. <laughs> He's so, through so the kilo. tall man in the middle. <laughs> 
Three hours, 47 minutes remaining of the 1,000 miles of Sebring. Eight-hour time-certain race, and the leader is in the pits. This is the number seven Toyota of Kamui Kobayashi. Uh, Anthony Davidson rubbing his hands because it's chilly in our commentary booth, uh, although it is hot down on pit lane. And that means the number eight car of Brendan Hartley goes through. Now, in Formula One, you try and get in and get out before your rival, so you're coming up behind them on hot tyres as they're on not quite so hot tyres. In this case, that's even more exaggerated. The undercut works even better because the guy coming out has got no chance at all of defending because he is, because he is on, not on what in Formula One parlance would be cold tyres, but actually cold tyres, tyres that are some probably here 70 degrees away from their operating temperature rather than four or five or six or seven as would be the case they come out of their tire blankets yeah to give you an idea it's where the where they stack the tires it's a three meter wide square in the back of the pit carriage where they've got to stack the tires and that's the area where the teams put their sandwiches to keep them cool well Ant anthony is pointing to his phone that tells us it's 28 degrees outside that won't be in the shade it'll be cooler in the shade and there'll be a bit of a breeze as well so it, yeah, you know, and what's the operating temperature? 98 degrees, 90, 98. So, you know, a, a long, long way. Side. And again, when, when they came out of the blankets and they went onto the car and they're going to bit, they're still, quote, cold tyres, they'd have been down to 85, not 90. Yeah. You know, now now it's, it's not even remotely close. It, it's going to take a lot of work to fight off somebody on hot tyres who's coming up hot, hot behind you. So, yeah, the tyres have to be ambient temperature these days. Yep. So, uh, com uh, it, what sounds like a relatively small tweak to the regulations, just banning tyre warmers, is the implications, the knock-on effects it's had, and that it will have as this race gets colder, as, as, the, as the sun starts to set. I mean, they're, and they're monitored every set that goes onto every car. They turn up with a, a heat gun and they take a quick read of the surface of the tire. And if it's over the ambient, they're not going on the car. That's what the rule is. So, um, yeah, 28 degrees, whether that's in the shade or not, it doesn't feel like 28 degrees out there, I must say, but uh, must rely on some better technology in the future. Uh, but yeah, whatever it is, ambient, outside, that's what the tyre has to be as well. So you can't go placing them in the sun before they slap them on the car. They have to stay, remain in the shade. Uh, Jacques Villeneuve, um, pretty solidly in about the 155s, 156s. I'd suggest that is struggling, gentlemen. Uh, he's at the back of the LMP2 field and not really making very much progress, if any at all, as the Cadillac hits pit lane and a driver change underway for the number two. That's Richard Westbrook climbing on board the Cadillac number two. El Bamba's time is done. Well, for now, he'll be back in later on in the race, of course. Interesting, they're clearing out those vents. You can see the long vent that's, that's channeling air through the front wheel tunnels and back out behind again. We talked about this last year that where you had to have cutouts over the wheels to allow air to blow out if the car gets sideways to stop it lifting off the ground or being lifted off the ground by, by going sideways through the air. You don't have to have wheel out cutouts anymore. You can, you don't have to. What you have to be able to prove aerodynamically is that you have done something to bleed that air that will stop your car flying. It turns out, it would seem, that actually having a wheel arch cut out does two things. First of all, helps to, to get you to that position, but also helps to disperse some of the rotated air from the tire. Ooh, that's the Ferrari, the Ooh, Toyota on. rather, on the dirt, coming down the inside of Villeneuve. I thought maybe he was off track when he did the overtake there, but he wasn't. He just had a wheel inside the white line. Yeah. Close. Well, and the problem there for the Toyota driver was that Jacques had moved over to leave room for him. Uh, but, yeah, that, that commitment had happened already. So Jota leading in LMP2 with David Beckman. And behind him, Mirko Bortolotti. Now, again, see, lots of names coming in to endurance racing who have been very, very... A spectacularly competent and, and successful GT races. Mirko Bortolotti, another one of them. He's in second, ahead of Sean Galel and Robert Kubica in the two WRT cars. 
Yeah, 48, by the way, important uh, as we get uh, deeper into this race to remember that that is effectively invisible for points. That is uh, not a full-season car. This is the fill-in car for Hertz Team Jota. This is entered as Hertz Team Jota. The other car entered just as the Jota car, the 28. So it will not score World Championship points. But, of course, we'll stand on top of the podium if the race finished as things stand now. Until they get a Rolex. Uh, no, because they don't get one anyway. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> they get the invisible Rolex. They could draw one on, I guess, if they like. <laughs> but... Well, here is the Prema car trying to make a move. Who is this? 63, as uh, the okay. leader in the pits, by the way. Yeah, so Mirko Bortolotti in that Prema car. That is a move to... That is Sean Galeal with Mirko Bortolotti, I think it yeah. is. It was uh, Mirko Bortolotti, a former Formula 2 champion. Uh, well, clearly wasn't Sean Gillespie, it must be Robert Kubica. It is Robert Kubica and, Sean, and uh, Mirko Bortolotti. Yeah, so Bortolotti. This is the eight car on pit road. So number seven is just coming in to turn seven. There's number eight's in the pit lane now, as we see. Okay. Hirakawa. Hirakawa takes over from Brendan Hartley. Yet another of our world champions. There are multiple world champions in this field in hypercar and beyond. Yeah, shouting outside, that's not good, is it? Yeah, was that a little bit of a slow right front? Number seven cars out of 13 on the stretch down to 14. Oh, hello. That's Gibson tool. Yeah, and what's going on at Alpine? And is that for 35 or 36? I think 36 is just... Number seven is coming out of the final... Uh, out of the final corner of our lap, 16. It's 36, it's a trouble. Yeah. Uh, I've been watching a couple of laps on that car, and I thought maybe he'd come out on cold tyres, but he's over two minutes, and he's still over two minutes after another three laps. He's got a problem. Mathieu Vazivier is, is not anywhere near leaders are in, full pace. Leaders are in turn 17, seven's got by. Eight didn't even stand a chance. There's a really good in-and-out lap sequence from the number seven team, and really Rio Hirakawa is in second place. Jose Maria Lopez is the leader. And now Hirakawa's got to go through the pain of getting his tyres up to temperature while, while trying to hang seven. on to the back yeah. of Lopez, who's gone. And Lopez, and again, we won't know for an hour or 40 minutes whether Lopez has over brought the tyres in too early and then they start to go off on him in the beginning of the second stint. Quick lap from Jose Maria Lopez there, 148.9 to nail that deal. Wow. It is the 36 on pit lane. Yep. I'm saying the last three or laps at least over two minutes for that car. Well, whatever that Gibson tool was, it wasn't a five pound lump hammer, so it suggests to me that it may not fix quickly. Yeah, well, let's uh, have a bit of a wait and see. I wonder whether or not it's going to misfire. D station, by the way, you're looking at the Dempsey Proton Porsche of Christian Reed. D station's Casper Stevenson was ahead of him, now behind, so that's a place change. So the Dempsey Dempsey Proton car up to third place. Corvette lead with Nicholas Verone. Scott Huffaker in the Kessel Racing car guy Ferrari is second there. And right behind is the battle third and the D station Aston. Where's Christian Reed gone? There he is. Okay, so that so that is, is changed back. So Casper Stevenson, I thought, had been dropped by Christian Reed, but Reed has obviously dropped back behind him or stayed behind him. Corvette don't just lead, they absolutely dominate. They're shush, a three shush, quarters shush, ahead. Shush. <laughs> the Iron Dames will have words to say about that. It's not just a cam cover going on, is it? That's what was in the truck. Ah, it's the plugs. It's the, um, uh, what do you call them? Uh, they don't have plugs these days. What do they, what do they have, Anthony? Yeah, no, You're a spark, man. They've got spark plugs. Do they have spark plugs yeah, or spark plug. do they have igniter coils? No, spark plug. Okay, and uh, something looks like what you'd find on your normal road car, but they're and, and, spark and, plugs. And you are in trouble. And they, they are spark plug spanners. Yeah. 21 in oh. trouble. Oh, in a lot of trouble. Simon Mann. Keep out the barriers, yeah. But that's just classic, getting on the power while still turning and... Combined yeah. with those bumps on the exit of Turn 10, we saw it with the hypercar Ferrari actually yesterday in free practice, I think. Yep. Uh, yeah, in FP3, and it just... It, it, the drive, who was it? Collado with the wheel at the time? I can't remember, but he caught the car as it went sideways, and then it lurched the other way and had a bit of a half-spin 
uh, to the left after losing it to the right. That one just went all the way around. So it's that bump on the exit is uh, it's, uh, pretty unforgiving. D-Station Aston in the pits this time round, drops out of third place. So Corvette leading from Kessel Racing and Dempsey Broton. Uh, that's the way to get a bit of bodywork attached. Give it a good old boot. <laughs> 36 is back and on its way, so they had a misfire. They they were de they definitely had proper spark plug spanners in there. I don't know whether there was a change of plugs. Louise Beckett is right there, loitering with, well, not within the tent, just outside the tent. Um, so, you see what I did there? Uh, so that was a play with words, Ant. Um, just to explain the uh, lack of joke there, the lack of humour. Uh, Robert Kubitz are in the pit lane for WRT. And they are ready for a tyre change. And the yeah. Jota comes in. Yeah. Oh, I like the little way the little light lights up there in the uh, in the in the visor, so that so the team can tell the difference between their cars. Funny that. <laughs> <laughs> Selfish, I call it. So it is the race leader, David Beckman. Their other David, Jota's other David, David Heinemeyer Hansen, remains at the wheel of their 38 car. My watch is buzzing. Have I been? Yeah, I've been told off by Jota for making yet another can't tell them apart gag. That's gonna, I think that... you'll find the wheel nuts are different colours. <laughs> yeah. That's got the red wheel nuts. Yeah, from last year. <laughs> Has it got the red wing in plates? And it says Singer on the fin and, you know, I mean, all the, all the other old twaddle. Uh, well, in fairness, the easy way to tell the Hertz team Jota car from the other one is that it's got Hertz written on the side in well, five foot high letters. One of them's invisible and the, <laughs> and the other one isn't, obviously. <laughs> as far as, as the WEC is concerned. And of course, that will become less of an issue, we hope, when one becomes a Porsche later in the season and yes. the other one doesn't. The 63 Prema car, by the way, has got the green wing mirrors. And, yes, uh, the number nine wing. has got the red wing yeah. mirrors. And that's so. it. So that, that's all you get, it's which is great when they're going away from you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's the view of the Jota car that doesn't let you tell, doesn't let you know anything, and then you you cover it in dust, and you're never sure and which then one got it those is. Italic numbers as well, yeah. uh, digitised italic numbers. Well, that, that's the seven that and eight. Even seven and eight on Toyota are almost indistinguishable, and yet they're such different numbers. Everyone's a critic. Uh, but, uh, it, before, lest we forget, by the way, what a trio of sponsors they've got aboard that hurts team Joe's round that hurts you know in uh, the car rental business of course Zinger the uh, reimagination of classic Porsches uh, being built in both the US and in uh, the UK and possibly the most famous name on any car here other than the badges on the front Tom Brady absolutely legendary American I, football quarterback. I was rather hoping there'd be some commotion on the grid and we would see the world's greatest footballer uh, on the grid. But I, 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 I believed... <laughs> I, now, now, there really is a man who deserves a knighthood. Uh, Sir, Garrett, Sir Gaza. Um, Sir Ga Sir but, Garrett. He, but he isn't getting one now. But no, but I, 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 no, I think he's much more likely to get one now. Uh, I do think that... Uh, I mean, I, I was sort of hoping, I, I'm sure I read somewhere on social media that Tom Brady was definitely going to be here, but uh, if, if we didn't see him, we didn't see him, I'm afraid. So you may well have spotted him in the crowd, I'm afraid we didn't. WRT with the, uh, hey, it's the Prima car, isn't it, of Mirko Botti that leads from Interiopol's Albert Costa. Now, there's another name that GT racing fans will know really well. He's actually got a lot of Lamborghini heritage as well, um, so we might see him possibly edging his way towards the Iron Lynx team later uh, in his uh, emergent career, but getting himself up to speed, as we saw a number of drivers do over the last two or three seasons, and teams in LMP2 in preparedness for the arrival of lots and lots of hypercar opportunities. Alba Costa lies second. Philippe Albuquerque up to third. Remember the last time we talked about him when he got into the car and he was a battle, having a battle, it was for ninth place. And 
that's what being off a pit stop strategy is doing for half the field at the moment. You're up and down like the Assyrian Empire. But it could all change, couldn't it? It could all change. It will adoption. all change because they're all on different fuel strategies. That yeah. was exactly yeah, look, we, it. Yeah. You know, we, we joke about meteorite strikes, but last year it was a, it was a lightning strike, and that was it. Yeah. You know, it was game over. Run away. Well, I think Philippe Albuquerque's uh, on a bit of a flyer in this stint uh, yep. at the moment. He, he's slowly catching uh, the two cars in front of him. There's a bit of a gap, it's over 10 seconds, but uh, I think if anyone can do it around this track, it'd be him in that car. We know the United Autosports car was flying, with at least with the car 23 crew. Yeah, Philippe Albuquerque and driving very quickly in this, in this car, never a surprise, but yeah. Yeah. I'll take your point, he, yeah. he's on a particular tear right now. It's the number five car with the Ferrari right in its wheel tracks, it's Nick Nielsen and Andre Lotterer. They deal with a bit of traffic by way of the 54. So number five car is Dane Cameron. So this is the Ferrari, uh, but the number five to, uh, Porsche is down in seventh place. Dane Cameron driving that, and his target immediately ahead is number two Cadillac of Richard Westbrook, but that is 70 seconds up the road. So this is not a battle for position. This is the Ferrari trying to put a lap on the Porsche. The Porsche using quite a lot of road at Davidson, quite a lot more than the Ferrari seems to be. It's yeah, it's, um, you know, it's, it's just driver preference, how much of that extra piece of uh, track you can use in between 14 or 15 and 16, that left and right sequence. And um, you don't want to go too wide because you can get onto the marbles, but the Ferrari is clearly, it seems to have the speed advance in a straight line. We can hear from David Beckman now. David Beckman, your first time with WEC and here at Sebring, I'm assuming. You put in a great run. There's been lots of people mentioning just how good that drive was from you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, overall, first time for me in the LMP2 and also in the uh, endurance race. So I was in general very happy that I could uh, even compete. So uh, I think we l I learned a lot over the prologue. Uh, Jota did a mega good job. They, they are, it's like a family, you know. They they helped me a lot and uh, got me into the rhythm. So I think we um, I did now the, all my runs. I think it was quite good. No mistakes. Uh, decent lap time. And I think uh, yeah, if if Yife and Will keep on, I think we have a, a good one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even your competitors from WRT were saying how good you were driving. Yeah, I don't know. It could be. I, I, I was I was driving. I couldn't hear. But you're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, David Beckman uh, last year racing in the FI Formula Two Championship for part set a half season, but uh, he is filling in here as the required silver rank driver in the 48 car for the first two races before the planned introduction of the Porsche 963 or similar from Earth. I tell you what, he's doing a heck of a fill in, isn't he? Isn't he just? Yeah, really having a obviously having a lot of fun. And why wouldn't you? Um, but yeah, no, doing a doing a very very good job. Yeah. Um, Antonio Felix da Costa, who will be in that Porsche, because he is a Porsche factory driver now, um, is here and uh, uh, as you know, spending about as much time doing social media as he would be if he was driving the car as well. So, yeah, always good to see Antonio around. Such an influencer. I know. Well, I was talking actually the other day about, uh, you know, the likes of him and Tom Blomqvist, Albert Costa, all in the same class coming up through junior single seaters in the GP3 era. Remember when GP3 was called GP3 and not Formula 3 and all that stuff? Uh, yeah, they, they, they were a, a whole group of drivers that came up together, a sort of generation behind Robert Kubica who didn't have that ladder, but worked himself up the single-seater ladder through the Renault uh, programs with two-litre Formula Renault Euro Cup and then into World Series by Renault and then, of course, up into Formula One. Yeah, it's basically the motorsport version of he was down the pit from being a lad. Hi. Nicholas Veroni leading 27 laps into these tyres. The Corvette still comfortably out front, but as we saw with the Iron Dames, uh, every bump 
again, we said, yeah, we heard who, who was it was saying, uh, every bump you can land a meter from where you took off. Extra. And he doesn't mean ahead, he means sideways. Um, yeah, they, they never, never count anything out here. The 36 car back out on track after the spark plug issue, we think, for that car. Mathieu Vassabier back now up to speed and close to 10 seconds quicker than he was managing before. Um, good, good to have Louise in the pit lane because she wasn't doing what a Joe Bradley would have done, which has told them they're changing the wrong plugs and how, and, and how to do it. But she is there with the Alpine team and she is with Charles Milesi. Let's find out what he knows about their travails. Charles Milesi, the 36 Alpine is back out on track now, but obviously we saw it in having some work done to it. Can you tell us what was happening? Yeah, we had an issue with the engine, uh, with the plugs, so we had to change it. So I think now the problem is solved, but yeah, we lost quite a lot of time. So we had a good, good pace for the moment and uh, yeah, we'll try to push until the end. But yeah, one lap down or two, I don't know exactly, but that's a bit of a shame. Are you due to get back in the car? Yeah, yeah, we'll go back. Thank you. Yeah, I think that uh, problem cost them the better part of a lap. Uh, by the time it actually dealt with, got to the stage where a problem diagnosed and dealt with, they're certainly losing something around or over 10 seconds a lap to the main competition before they dealt with it. Just as that was happening, by the way, top two cars in LMP2 in and out of the pits. That was Mirko Bortolotti, who rejoins in second place. Philippe Ablekirk, by the way, in and out, and instead of cycling back now to the bottom of the field, cycles back to fourth. That car back into contention. Is that full stint, or have they done a short stint and they're now starting no, to back I think time? I think, no, I think that is his first wow. stint done. Wow. Remember, they lost to something like 20 Whoa. seconds, having to reposition the car, and this is the battle. This is Bortolotti and Albuquerque. This is Freins and Albuquerque. I beg your pardon, it is Freins and Albuquerque. Now, this will be a proper battle. <laughs> yeah, Freins and Albuquerque, it, it doesn't get any more vicious than this. <laughs> it does, it does, it does. Philip and, uh, and Antonio Felix da Costa. Do you remember uh, in Bahrain shoving each other off? But let's just wait and see. <laughs> let's just wait and see. I mean, this, this, will be, uh, this is going to be a battle throughout this whole rest of the stint for yeah, these two. Yeah, neither of them have uh, any speed other than full. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. And Robin with fresher tyres on, only eight laps into his stint, whereas Philip has completed a full stint on his tyres, so he is at a grip disadvantage. Didn't stop him going round the outside, well, tucking think, him up. I was that Albuquerque had just come out of the pit? Yes, he was. Yeah, he, he has. Yeah, so he's struggling yeah, yeah, to get yeah. up to temperature, and yeah. that's why the attack was, well, that's why Albuquerque. Well, uh, less so because he's got already warm tyres on, so all he's done is stop and gone back out, so they're less cold, cold than. Uh, yeah, I think, he's, yeah. I think he may have two new tyres on that, two tyres on that car, because you look at the pit stop time for Philippe Albuquerque, so 1 minute 16. Uh, I thought the graphic said 21 laps on all to tyres, and at only 7 on... That's, that's mightily quick of changing all four tyres. I don't think well, it's all four, no, I think, no, it's, he, I think no, it's two. Albuquerque didn't change tyres. In which case it's slightly slow for a fuel stop. Could have just been the two tyres, well, if which it, they it, often do, because you have those six and a half sets. Yeah. Uh, I, wonder, I wonder which which way the car was pointing on the graphic because on the top of the graphic you had 21 21 so they've okay. done one side not fronts or rears it's pretty easy if he pulls away from robin frines then you know he, he's got uh, fresher tires on board <laughs> or he's portuguese no frines would stick um, frines is so quick in this car frines's tires have only done seven laps each yeah. so at best philip's got fresh tires on one side, one side. Now, what would you change here? Left sides only? Right sides only? Right, it must be right sides only, because I think the graphic... Clockwise track, you'd go usually for the outside. Yeah. I'd, I'd like tires. to see the graphic again. We won't, but I'd like to see the graphic again, because certainly two of his tyres, one front and one rear at least, have got 21 laps, because that was what I read on the top of the graphic. And Francis have got seven. So Robin has got fresher rubber all round than Philip has. Cumulatively, at least. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Oh, that going to go for that, but um, yeah, <laughs> it all—it's all breathing space, isn't it? And this car, Thomas Floor, the birthday boy, in the 54 car, uh, is fourth place in GTEM. So, going well. Yeah, having a really good run. 
And again, one of those cars that we have barely spoken about, other than the fact that it's been in traffic somewhere. Uh, so they're having a, a very good run. Alex Lynn from Cadillac is with Louise Beckett. Alex Lynn, this really has been an up and down race for everyone behind Toyota, really. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I think behind Toyota, there's a great race for the last step on the podium between us, Ferrari and the two Porsches. I think, um, yeah, honestly, it's really exciting. Very close between us all. And you've got a smile on your face, OK? Right now, it's not running great for the Cadillac, but you know that hopefully that's going to come back and, and the fight is here. Yeah, no, honestly, with the strategy, it's really interesting. I think Porsche and Ferrari are particularly hard on their tyres, so it's pushing them into a window of strategy um, on their last stop. So I think they're going to rely on some full course yellow at the end. Uh, we're now on course to not need another stop. So depending on how that plays out, which but to be honest, is exciting you know, for the overall category to, to see a race like this. Really interesting, thank you. Thanks. Now then, that suggests to me they're feeling quite comfortable about their tyre usage, that they've not had to single stint tyres. Is that what you were reading out of what he was saying? Yeah, I mean, we've seen all along that the Cadillac's been very kind on its tyres, and, and that's, that's why we saw Alex Lynn moving forward and overtaking the Porsches on track before he got that, that, uh, that penalty, of course. Um, which really scuppered their plans. But uh, I do think that the, the, at least the number 50 Ferrari has the genuine speed over the Porsche and the Cadillac. Yeah, but does uh, it have enough tyres left? If they've had to single stint some of their tyres... But it's more about this splash at the end, I think, that Alex was talking about, where yeah. he doesn't feel they need to. Yeah, well, let's hear from Louise Beckett. Louise, thoughts on that? Well, also remember that... Um, it didn't go their way, but for qualifying, Alex Lynn held back and he didn't go out till quite late, and I'm sure that was down to what they were doing with their tyres. Yeah, that's a really valid point. They will only have used one set, and it's only a couple of laps, but it puts a heat cycle, that might have been five or six laps, puts a heat cycle through the tyres, and then that might come back and haunt them. for Alex Lynn, he did that, uh, was it just one, two laps came in, changed the tyres and then went. Sat. 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 Sat a long while and waited for everybody else to, to have their go and then, yeah, went out on the attack. And it was, it was a good qualifying run from the Cadillac. It's, it's going to be a very interesting season, not just because we've got new things to look at, new people to talk about, but as we see the development of these new cars, particularly the new cars, all right, Toyota have kept their heads very much above water. Sure, they didn't get pole position, but in the race, and that's what they were talking about in, the, in their pole position debrief that we sort of earwigged on yesterday after qualifying, that we've, we've got a good race car, and, and you know, there's not a lot of worried faces there. Look at Alex Wurtz at the far end. He's got a blazer on there, he hasn't, he's, uh, it was just a shadow. But uh, ah, he's looking as, as, as sanguine as ever. He was chatting with the drivers, wasn't he? You know, six drivers and Alex just kind of having a bit of a think about it, a bit of a, you know, he's, he's very much the interface between, between the team and the drivers. And, and, and his mentality, his psychology straddles both camps really well. I, I, I kind of think that, that, that he's the cosseting element of the team as far as the drivers are concerned. Yeah, maybe. he's a, a very wise head, um, Alex Burtz, you know, in that team. And uh, I think that's what partly gives them their stability. Um, especially through all those years where they didn't have the competition and and it was really just that two-way fight. I say, well, it's, it's played out that way today again, of course, with other teams faltering of penalties, but competition in terms of lap time seems to be there a bit more uh, than, than it was last year, at least. So, but Alex is always there to bridge that gap between the drivers and the feistiness that the drivers have naturally as competitors, as, as athletes and the team management um, is quite a data-driven team and Alex is there to just sort of bridge that gap and nurse those relationships between driver and, and the engineering aspects of the team. Uh, 
uh, pretty well. It gets more interesting now, though, because you've got people like Kazuki Nakajima, who are in a managerial role. And, of course, Kamui Kobayashi, who is team principal. Mm. Still, I find it unbelievable. I mean, if you wrote this into a movie script, it, it just, you'd be laughed out of the room, surely. Yeah, I'm thinking of this movie. I'm going to make the race driver the team principal as well. Halfway through his stint at Toyota. How about it? Get out. <laughs> GTM leader Nicholas Veroni must be approaching the end of his double stint in the Corvette C8R. First time out for this car in the GTE AM class, run by the factory Corvette team, Corvette Racing, but not the car that raced last year by the team in the World Endurance Championship. Brand new chassis built up for Ben Keating and his crew. Keating has done yeah, the four and a half hours, the two hours, two hours, 38 minutes or two hours, 40 minutes in the car. Nicholas Veroni now only the second driver in and we've barely got three hours left to, to get him out, get his time done and then to put Nicky Katzberg in and he will be um, the anchor leg. That car at the moment in a really good position in uh, LMP and GTE. In LMP2, it is uh, Hertz team Joe to the lead with Yiffy Ye at the wheel. And then behind them, Mirko Bottolotti for Prima in second. Louis Delachance third for WRT. United Autosports' Philip Albuquerque is creeping away very slowly from Robin Freins. Not by much, but by enough just to make sure that Freins doesn't have any wise ideas about trying to close him down. Not too far behind them is Fabio Scherer, the Inter Europol car, is slightly off pit strategy with some of the cars in front of it. It's currently running six, but uh, habitually pops back up to second or third, or occasionally even the lead when everybody else in front stops. Yeah, a, a significant uh, caution could change everything yep. in, so, in, in all three of these classes as we've got the Ferrari now number 50 yeah. on pit lane it from could, third. It, it could serve to realign a lot of the strategy actually if we get a, a, a decent full course caution. The battle that's ebbing and flowing at the moment by the way is with the other Ferrari. It's for fifth place with Antonio Giovinazzi trading lap times with Richard Westbrook. That gap about five seconds and it co it's coming up and down lap by lap. Interesting, he just for those of you with the eagle eyes, you would have seen that uh, Nick Nielsen's seatbelt had actually come inside of his hands device on his right hand side. It often happens, it slips inside the hands device, but it's uh, obviously it's not where it's meant to be because um, in, a, in, a, in a crash, it needs to be holding that hands device in place. So um, yeah, interesting that that's happened. You can sometimes get little lips on the inside of, of the hands device to hold that seatbelt, but um, he would be maybe unaware of it. I saw him tightening them up, and maybe that's why, because he's felt it come a bit loose, but he, so it's hard to feel whether it's the hands over your shoulder or the seat belt. So um, I wonder if he'll uh, be a bit more uncomfortable with this stint because of that. Louis Beckett. Fuel and left side only for the 50 Ferrari. So that's interesting after what Alex Lynn said about the tyre game. Yeah, I, I think they are starting to get into into the into the deficit on tyres, uh, and and are having to work a little bit harder than they might have liked. I think they've had to use a few more tyres than they might have liked. But uh, yeah, it's it's all learning. They're learning about their new toy. They're learning how to race it, not just how to test it. 94 Peugeot into back the pit out. lane. Plus back out. <clears throat> that was the car that was we thought was out of the race. Uh, it was out of the race. Now, Luke Duval is back in now. I I'm not sure how much of a ground up restoration it's had, but uh, fairly significant, I think. Well, it didn't get external assistance, remember. It went to the safe zone. So as Loic we know jumps out the car, but if they manage to fix it there, that might still be within the rules. It was pushed. Uh, if it was, it was pushed back out of the paddock. We didn't see that. We saw it drive into the paddock from the safe zone where it shouldn't have been. Uh, that's true. That yeah, is true. it did under its own power make it yep. out of pit lane, didn't it? So the 94 is on pit lane. Is that its reintroduction here? Um, that would pretty much just sum up their race, though, wouldn't it? If they got out on track and then got black flagged. Well, we'll, we will soon see when that car leaves the pit lane, because if it's got a regular pit stop time against it, it's been out, we've not noticed. Yeah. If it's got something like three hours on its pit uh, stop. 
where it goes. Now, I think that's because you can't come back in from the bottom of the pit lane and come up the wrong way. It's come in from the top. So it's cut, that's it coming back from... And, and you saw all the gravel on the tyres as well when they came off. And there's, there's been a driver change as well. So that has that is not Loic Duval at the wheel. That's Menezes. Yeah. It is two hours and 51 minutes. Yeah. So the that pits. has had a comprehensive rebuild of something. Now, I have activated the uh, Beckett bot. So it's on its way down to find out what. So we will find out from Louise shortly, hopefully, what they have had to spend three hours fixing on this car. And and people at home might be thinking, well, what's the point? It's, three, it's spent three hours stationary. It's never going to get anywhere. No, it's not going to get anywhere. What it is going to do is acquire data. Data. What it is going to do is give drivers and, and engineers experience of having to work with the damn thing. Yeah, it's the, uh, it's the obviously it's the first time here at Sebring for Peugeot. They need that data from this circuit, and uh, it's better to do that with two cars than one. Absolutely right. Well, well, more importantly, it's things they're going to learn that will hopefully stop it breaking at Le Mans. What it also means, by the way, is of course we've got three cars out the race and not four. Uh huh. So what was out is now in. Great little battle here. Satoshi Hoshino, the bronze driver in D Station, 12 laps into his stint, so halfway through his stint. And Simon Mann in the 21 Ferrari, we just saw that in the pits a couple of minutes ago. Third. Uh, lap on these tyres so he stayed in the car he was in the car before we saw him have a half spin but he's got fresh tyres so he's in a double uh, Hoshino in a double but double stint or 16 no coming towards the end of the of this set of tyres so this should be probably the end of the D station drivers drive time the battle is for sixth position Simon Mann looking down the inside of the Japanese veteran who comes across and takes the racing line well, the American driver in his second year of the FIWC double Italian GT champion he's the silver rank driver in the 21 squad American double Italian champion born in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all international then. Cosmopolitan, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah, a bit of ice cream, that'd be lovely. So, in front of this queue is uh, Nico Veroni aboard the leading Corvette. He's put in a very good stint indeed as the young Argentinian. Very personable chap is going to be, I'm sure, a bit of a fan favourite through this year. Riding on board with Robin Freund, right back up behind Philippe Albuquerque. In front of them, or between them rather, is the Alpine. But Freund, Freund has not lost much ground, has he? Even though he's stuck in traffic, Al Philippe has not got away. It's Oli Colwell in the 35 car, which is the leading uh, of the pair of Alpines. They're uh, moment in ninth and tenth positions as we've got the number five yeah. Porsche 963 on pit lane. That's a driver change underway. In from seventh place, it's the last of our really healthy uh, cars. Yep, it's uh, Dane Cameron uh, out in, of the in car. In fact, I'm going to withdraw that because the Floyd Van Wall car is only delayed because somebody rammed it up the backside. So yeah. it is still a perfectly healthy car. Nothing wrong with it at all so far. It's had a very good debut. Um, and, and yeah, as we heard, on really limited testing so far, they, they're feeling very untested. But boy, they're going to have felt quite tested here. And again, in between that battle between Satoshi Hoshino and the 777 D-Station car, and Simon Mann gets the break in traffic. Hoshino had to just tidy up his line coming out there as the LMP2 battle came through. Simon Mann goes through on the straight, so he moves up a spot. And that's what you have to do, Ann Davidson, whether you're in an LMP2 car when the, when the faster P cars come through or when you get into traffic. If something happens, and often it's a quicker car coming past, it gives you an opportunity and you've got to get ready and Hoshino loses the spot there, and through comes the leader in GTE Am to put a lap on the D-Station car. Well, you know, it's all a compromise. You know, you've got the, the slower cars out there, and you've got to respect that fact, but also you've got drivers in the Am category in the GTE class that are of different caliber, at different speeds, and you have to take that all into account as the either the, the more accomplished, faster driver coming up or in a better car, uh, doing the, the, the lapping, so, you know, it, it's all a compromise. You've got to read the situation. It's a bit like coming up against a, or well, up against, it's like coming up to a learner driver on the road. Yeah. If you, if you were 
to accidentally hit into that learner drive is your fault. It doesn't matter whether they turned in and did yep. the wrong thing. You have to have the capacity as the more accomplished driver to not make mistakes and not make contact. So, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to judge from inside the car. And you don't know, actually, as a fast driver, who you're coming up against. I always felt that it would be safer to have a another lights. light yeah. on with, when you've got the bronze driver at the wheel. We can hear from uh, Hirakawa now. Yeah, I'm struggling with Sako. I'm struggling with Sako. Especially 17. 17. Yeah, Joe, both cars are on the same tango. Both cars on the same tango. Not much we can do. Maybe play with the line a little bit. Struggling with traction in turn 17, especially. I'm not sure what tango they're, they're both on. So That's rolling, uh, short black it, yeah, I, I, I would think so. Different other, terminology from yeah. back other, in my day. Other fizzy drinks are available. Uh, the uh, Ferrari Porsche battle for third on pit road. Uh, the Cadillac now up to third. Ooh, oh, look at that. Now, see, that's proper 1980s. Before there were speed limits in the pit lane, when you came in at full racing speed. So is this the end of Nick Avroni's time? We're going to see Nicky Katzberg now. That, by the way, was him putting a second lap on the triple seven. Yes, yeah, he's now lapped everybody up to fifth place. No, he's lapped everybody. Lapped everybody? Yes. Holy moly. No, Veroni stays in. So that was, I think that was the end of those tyres. So he's going to do a triple. I think Nicky's going to do a triple. I mean, basically, they've got eight hours dividing it three ways. Ben's done more than, you know, two and a half hours. It won't be a full triple for uh, this stage yeah. for Nicky Katzberg. Those cars can well, do a round an hour on fuel. I would think they're now going to start back timing it from the end. Oh, yes. Is that, uh, so Veroni will do a shorter stint and then they'll put Katzberg in maybe for two hours and then i don't know maybe nico for the final hour well until last year corvette had only ever won in the wc at the mark yeah and we had that extraordinary race where ferrari seemed to miscalculate on fuel at monza where the gt pro car took a yep. surprise win could this be um corvette with the c8r taking another win and a win in a second different class yeah that would be fantastic wouldn't it for the corvette racing guys he'll come Shea out adam down there in the pit lane easily uh, still in the lead. This is the second place car. That is the Dempsey Cross on racing car at the hands of Mr. Edward Presence, Christian Reed. And uh, the Proton competition squad about to take a massive leap forward post Le Mans with uh, the first of what looks to be a fleet of hypercars coming the way of the German squad. One car for later in this year in WC, another for later this season in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship. And the, the promise that if things go as they should, they should double up in both championships next year. And, you know, one of the things that made Group C so successful is Porsche's willingness to sell cars to anybody Absolutely. who had the requisite amount of money. And it didn't matter, you know, whether you beat them or not as a factory, because Porsche still won. It didn't have to be the Rothmans Porsches winning a Brum Porsche or a Joost Porsche. It's still got the same name above the door. It's well, still a Porsche. And so it, it helps to mitigate the cost for the manufacturer. And it, and it multiplies the chances that one of their cars will win. Yeah, and uh, not only that, so we're going to see some great names in that car. We know already, definitely, we're going to see uh, Jimmy Bruni aboard that car, the one winner in GT Pro, of course, last year. And I think, uh, almost completely confirmed now, we're going to see Mr. H. Tinkle Esquire aboard the Proton car later yeah. this year. That would be really good, and, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if Seb Prio is not part of that plan as well. Tom Dillman at the wheel of the Floyd Van Wall. And this car having a really good debut. Unfortunate to get thumped from behind by an errant Peugeot. Them's the brakes. But, you know, so far, mechanically, it's been absolutely flawless. Uh, short on testing, it's pretty uncomfortable, I think, the drivers are saying. Not confidence-inspiring, let's say. But they're driving around that. They're having a really good debut. So, yeah, Tom Dillman back aboard this, uh, this, this car after a single stint from the 1997 F1 world champion, Jacques Villeneuve. Just catching up with news from what happened to the United Autosports car. 
They're saying they yeah, had uh, electrics. A electrical failure not related to the car systems itself, so we'll wait and see exactly what transpires from that. 31 in the pit lane for Team WRT, Robin Frines. Now, yeah, such a bitter blow for that 23 car. They were, they were racing away. They had this race, but uh, yeah, racing rarely, rarely goes to plan. And um, particularly on a, on a bumpy track like this one, the car, you know, the thing is for the, for the LMP2 teams, they've all got the same car, they're all Oricas, and you cannot do any major tweaks as a, man, as a, as a team to that car. Yeah. You buy it and you run it. So, you know, when things go wrong on it, it's not, it's not a, the team that's at fault yeah. quite often especially when it comes to things like electronics. So uh, yeah. it, it does happen. Well, yeah, again, every, I, every car has fragility, but uh, yeah. It's you know, you, you, we, we saw that plug change, didn't we? You know, it happens. Things happen. Um, particularly here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. what, 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 are, what are the things that electronics do not like? NVH, noise, vibration, harshness. Oh, and heat, and especially heat. What do we get in Florida? Well, we get a lot of vibration and harshness and a lot of heat. It's things that electronics don't like. Don't leave your phone out in the sun, because it, it'll, de it'll be it, dead, it, absolutely. Okay. And, and cars are, are not dissimilar. It's, it is the heat. The other thing is the vibration. It's, it's, li it's like a, an old metal water tank being dragged across a plough field by a wild horse in one of those for, for eight or 12 hours, which, depending on which. Have you driven a Morris Minor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking, what a bizarre analogy. But it is. It is that just, it's the unpredictability of it. All of it. You You've know, you clearly know. seen that happen before. I've seen it, what, that? Oh, that was the, hilarious. The water tank being <laughs> yeah, dragged yeah. Okay, I've, yeah. watched, I've, I've watched that on any channel. <laughs> Thomas Floor remains in the 54 AF Corsa Ferrari, the Vista Jet car, the birthday boy. There are worse places to spend your birthday than racing a Ferrari, aren't there? More comfortable tracks to race it on, I'll grant you, but worse things to do. I mean, I, I hope he's enjoying it, because he's paying for the privilege. No? Mate, I, I, he was genuinely knocked out. I, I, I took a picture because I thought nobody else um, in our team would have seen it. They made up a cake. It was sitting on the front like his helmet. Oh, hang on, they got an Alpine, in trouble. an Alpine off. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bit of a deja vu for where the 708s ended up. Has that gone off? Ollie Caldwell with uh, no fire in the belly, has that gone off in a somewhat less controlled fashion? I'm not sure he's... I'm not sure the car's swapped ends to get no, into that position. I think like he's just rolled to a halt at the end of the Ullman straight. There's the 36 in car. the pit lane. Is it going to take advantage of a full course yellow and suddenly inject itself with a bit more pace? Or a bit more position. Let's catch up with what happened at Peugeot. Their drivetrain director, Francois Coudrin, is with Louise Beckett. Francois, we've seen all of the troubles with the 94 Peugeot. It's been back in the box. You've spent hours working on it. Can you talk us through what you've been working on? We had an electrical issue on the, on the car, high voltage, then on the ER system, hybrid system. Uh, for sure, uh, we detected on the, on the telemetry and the driver uh, had it on the dashboard. Then we decided to, to pit because it's a procedure. We apply exactly the FIA procedure. Then we do, do not have the opportunity to take the car here at the beginning. We had to go in the quarantine zone. The car went in the quarantine zone at the end of the pit lane. The guys went to the car, checked that everything was okay. Then FIA gave us the opportunity to take the car back on the on the box. Then at this stage, the, the race was finished for this car. Then we decided to take the right to take the time to analyze exactly what happened if the problem is coming from the MGU, from the inverter, or from the battery, or from the wiring loom. We analyze all the system, we fix it, and as the system was completely safe, we decided to go again on track. And now it's okay, the car is on track. For sure, the race is over for, for, for that car, but uh, it's a good opportunity for, 
for us is to continue the race, to take uh, information from the track for the other car and to, uh, to run uh, on the safety conditions. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. But well, great description of the way that it has to happen. And that's, you know, one of the factors is having these astonishing high voltage systems in the cars is that when the warning lights come on, when they're triggered, whether, whether rightly or wrongly, there is a very strict protocol for a red car in position. And you heard Loic being told to jump from the car and not touch the ground and being, OK, guys, but if I die, you've got a right to my, you know, family and so on. But and that gives you a great indication. Car is made safe, confirmed that it's safe, then you can take it back to the garage, work on it, work through the systems, learn, learn, learn. Full course yellow here in Sebring. Well, it was a beautiful way to start. Big school for our hypercar class with some of the big names in the sport on the grid here in Sebring in Florida in beautiful weather conditions. Hot and sunny, but not too hot and sunny. Ferrari leading the field away on their first sports car start at the top level since 1973 with Toyota giving chase. Ferraris and the Toyotas ahead of the Cadillac and the Porsches with Peugeot, Glickenhaus and Van Wall following on behind. An 11 car hypercar field and it was arms and elbows out right from the very first corner. Two formation laps to give them the warm tyres they needed to survive and just about everybody did. Only one car having a looping spin. Not at the start was the 94 Peugeot with a transmission problem. Sarah Bovi and Ben Keating, who contested pole, contested the lead of the race. And then on lap five, Luis Perez Compank of Argentina crashed out in turn one. Safety car was scrambled. He was A OK. -OK with extreme caution. But they had to recover the car and rebuild the tyres. A little delay in the pits for the 51 Ferrari. Dropped it a fraction behind its teammate. But Toyota's resilient in the pits and on track soon paid, and they were running 1-2. 94 Peugeot disappeared behind the wall as well with electronic issues. Little lock-up for the Oman Racing Aston Martin that had qualified so strongly in third place. It was running quick early on. Puncture for that car cost them plenty and brought out a full course yellow. Porsche and Cadillac, the Daytona hybrids, battling behind the Toyotas and struggling with tyres. The Porsche, Cadillac, eventually taking benefit from that. Glickenhaus at that stage still in the frame, but they would bring out another full course yellow as the car rolled dead stick out of the race. And then the end of the chance of glory for the Iron Dames. They were leading, ran off a little wide. Rahul Frey ripping the bottom out of the car. That held, handed the lead to the 33 Corvette. Another full course yellow and the 93 Peugeot slamming into the back of the Floyd Van Wall car, damaging its rear bodywork and costing it time in the pit lane. And then the runaway leader in LMP2, the number 23 United Autosports car rolled to a halt, handing the lead currently to the 48 Jota car, Yiffy Yi, way out front. Porsche and Ferrari battling behind the Toyotas for third place with the Cadillac. Two Ferrari still in it, two Porsche still in it, and the single Cadillac still healthy. GTE Am leader by overlap from anyone, Nicholas Veroni, currently in the Corvette, leading LMP2, Yiffy Yi for Hertz Team Jota, and the race leader, currently Jose Maria Lopez of Toyota. Just under three hours to go. Toyota 1 2, ahead of the ever changing pattern. Cadillac versus Ferrari versus Porsche. And then the best of the LMP2 cars, the Hertz Jota team, invisible for points. So they are leading, but Premier at the moment, best place to pick up points from the 22 United Autosports car. The reason that the Hertz Jota car is invisible is it won't be an LMP2 entry all year long as soon as they're. Uh, hypercar Porsche arrives that will move up into the top class. Floyd Van Wall still going strongly. The only issue they've had is being shunted by somebody else. Corvette leading and to say they're having a good race is to slightly understate it. They are a lap ahead of the entire GTE and field. 
and the 93 Peugeot is back and running and so is the 94 car so they have fixed their ailments they are a, a day and a half behind everybody else but they are racking up data and in the end a win in Sebring is one thing but everybody wants to be on the top step of the centenary Le Mans race podium and that is Peugeot's end game as it is for everybody else. Toyota would love to defend their championship, win another one, but if they win Le Mans, they will take that very much on the chip. Uh, with that last pit stop, by the way, from the Corvette, uh, it has put the number 77 car back on the lead lap, but still a minute and 15 seconds back for Christian Reed from Nico Ferroni. And it has been since the issue, and I'll describe that in just a moment, for the Iron Dames car, which led and led well. It has been a dominant performance since then from the Corvettes. The 48 car on pit lane. Yeah, the 85, the bright pink Porsche, uh, won that battle. Uh, had a great tussle um, at the start of the race between uh, Ben Keating and Sarah Bovey. Uh, the Iron Lynx Iron Dames team took the advantage through pit stops coming into a full course yellow uh, gained about a 30 second advantage Rahel Fry was extending that advantage uh, as she got into the car and then a run off track uh, dislodged the entire underbody and rear body work of the Porsche and that cost them time they are trying to fight back but still down in ninth position after being a dominant uh, performer at the front of GTE Am Race leader Toyota number seven from the number eight car. There's been a change in LMP2. Uh, we just saw the stop for the 28 Jota Sport car and the 38 Jota car. And Yiffy is now dropped down to fourth place in LMP2. Race is being led by Mirko Portolotti. There is the 28 car just coming into the pits in the hands of Oliver Rasmussen. Doors open. He stays in, I think. Yes, he does. So I think that's going to be a third stop for Rasmussen, or a third stint for Rasmussen. And the Floyd Van Wall car is actually starting to sag down the order a little bit. It's, now, it's still eighth in hypercar, but it's now down behind the top seven LMP2 cars. That came after the latest pit stop to hand the car back from Jacques Villeneuve to Tom Dillman. So Dillman is actually picking up time of the LMP2s, okay. but has dropped back in position because he's off strategy. Yeah. OK. And yes, and there's, there are a number of cars still, because of the safety car and full course yellows that we've had, that are quite a long way away from their others on where their fuel window opens and closes and so we see a number of cars zooming to the top on a ladder and then whistling all the way back down on the snake or the other way around so Toyota car comes out just in front of uh, Rio Hirakawa he's having a bit of a troubled stint I must say he's lost time hand over fist to Jose Maria Lopez now eight and a half seconds down on the sister car it's not his first time at this rodeo either. He raced here last year for the team, so it's not new boy issues. Yeah, Lopez having a rather better time this time at Sebring than they did last time. The dramatic accident that ended their race. It's been pretty Iron Man stuff here. Well, and, the and crash in FP3, don't forget as well. He, he did uh, yeah, spin yeah. it round and hit the barrier in turn 17, damaged the car just before qualifying. Uh, but the car luckily was repaired in time, but so hasn't been an absolute trouble-free weekend for Jose, but uh, he's now at least redeeming himself. Luckily there were five hours between the end of FP3 and the beginning of qualifying, so no, they had that good. window of opportunity. But you're right, I mean, you know, and, and actually scoring a big fat zero here put them on the back foot for the rest of the year and they never recovered, did they? You know, the number eight car failed to finish in Spa, but, but that wasn't enough to tip the balance back. And, and so number 17, who came here as the world champions last season, having won it in, in 2020, that, or 21 rather, then, you know, right from the beginning, found themselves on the back foot. And that's always a tough place to be, always hunting, always having to invent something to be better than your teammates. And to try and take that big tranche of points back it's always tough because you're all, you know, it was only they were always ever going to be first or second, pretty well, they, much. They didn't go to the Mon equal points uh, because of the two DNFs, yeah. because obviously this race is more points, it's a longer race than yeah. Spa. Yeah. Nevertheless, the number eight to crew coming out on top in Le Mans, and that sealed their season. 
in the pits, the number seven car, the race leader, Jose Maria Lopez. That means we're Hirokawa for the moment takes the lead as he comes down the front stretch into turn one. Our World Endurance pits are on the back straight before the final corner, the 180 degree turn 17 sunset bend. Yeah, interesting additional program for Jose Maria Lopez this year with cool racing in the LMS and LMP2 car. Cool. So driving with ex-Total teammate uh, Nick Lapio is the team principal, of course. Tires going on. Yeah, it sounds like they need to get Ant Davidson back in as well. I have lots of a Toyota old, the Toyota old boys team. Couldn't afford it. I wonder at what point they switch to the soft compound tire, because unlike the IMSA race that's going on this weekend, the hypercars in the WEC have the chance to run two different compounds. So yeah. as the temperature starts to fall, as the sun starts to set, at some point they're going to need to switch over. And so therefore, the last stint you do on a brand new set of medium compound tires, yep. that's going to be the trickiest one to fire up. And uh, so I wonder, I wonder how that's going to uh, feel for the drivers and when they know to have that crossover to go into the soft compound tire. And you don't want to go into the soft compound tire too early because yep. we've seen obvious reasons. We've seen all of the teams and drivers suffering with that second stint. It is really interesting. There's very few differences between what can be almost the entirely same set of cars this year into next year uh, for both championships. But the two major re uh, differences are, you're quite right, in the WC, uh, there are the two tyre choices to one in IMSA, and the other one is the certified wind tunnel is different. And that yeah. has, and it yeah. does have an effect yep. in terms of the way things work Seeing out. that uh, grip tape on the, uh, the steering wheel as Danny Kvyat gets in the Prima car. I'm not sure you're allowed to put grip tape on uh, an LMP2 steering wheel. Like we were talking about before, it's a spec car. Yeah. I'm sh I don't know if you're even allowed to do things like that. I might have just grasped them up there. What so. do you mean, might have? <laughs> <laughs> well, I might be wrong. You might be able to put yeah, the, yeah, the grip yeah. tape on, but I, I didn't think you could. Saying it on air is fine, but I think you should stop typing that back now. now. <laughs> <laughs> Dear stewards. <laughs> yeah, speaking of snitches. <laughs> so why would Jose Maria Lopez, Cool Racing and Nico Lapierre be working together in LMP2? It's not so that Pachito gets more racing. That oh, could be. Are, are Cool building up to a hypercar program? Uh, I, They're the sort of team that have that sort of ambition. Um, I'm not sure. I think that's that's joining too many dots at the, at the moment. And for okay. reasons I won't go into, I think it's some of the wrong dots. Uh, well, they, the, you, me the, getting the wrong end the, of the, the stick. There might be the be right so dot. Unlikely. There might be the right dots, but in complete, no. <laughs> <laughs> completely the wrong order. Uh, in as as the Prema car comes out, uh, in goes Philippe Albuquerque for United Autosports at the end of his second stint. So be interesting to see if he stays in or not. And he Kvyat as. Uh, as Ant said, is in, and in comes the number eight car. So again, we saw the number seven car stop a lap before number eight last time round, and the time before that, that meant the number seven car got an advantage. It was at that stage behind the number eight car, but stopped under green, and the number eight came into the pits just as they were closing for a full course yellow. They then took on uh, three laps worth of fuel, which is the minimum or maximum you're allowed in a closed pit lane. They were forced to come in. They could not go any further without stopping. They were on their in lap. Uh, and so then they had to come back in for a second stop. And that's what's made the difference between eight and seven. That gave eight the, uh, put, gave seven the advantage, put them ahead on the road. Near here, a car in the number eight car has not been able to keep pace with Jose Miriam Lopez. Tires at the ready. Car seven is at turn 10. Yeah. So it should go through comfortably back into the lead. Well, if the air hammers go on before car seven gets to turn 13, then it has lost ground. Can't see. Well, we can hear, I think, because I think we can still hear the pit stop in the background, but I, I sense not. And uh, seven is coming down towards uh, the uh, Le Mans sequence of corners as we go back to D station with Satoshi Yoshino still holding off Francesco Castellacci now in this 54 car that was driven by Thomas Floor. Having a good run, actually, both these cars. Mm. And Satoshi Yoshino again, you know, all season long last year, 
did a proper stand-up job as, as, as a, a bronze-rated driver. Barely put a wheel wrong. Had some really good races. And again, that D Station team, you know, it's the third year for that program with TF Sport and the Aston Martin. They're getting better and better and more and more comfortable. And it's bringing the speed of the drivers up. And that's what makes the difference in GTM. The inside of the Aston Martin and clearing away goes the 963. And uh, that leaves the Japanese gentleman driver to fend off the Swiss. Yeah, meanwhile, at the head of the field, Car 7 did indeed get past uh, Hirakawa in Car 8 as he came out of the pits. And Jose's getting his tyres up to temperature while Hirakawa's now going through that uh, painful process. Yeah. This is going to be close. Down the inside comes the Prema car. Now, that will affect the Ferrari worse, I think, probably, than the Aston. I think he's got it done, though. No, he's got Good it move. done. There was enough room. He was fortunate, I think, the Prema car came down the inside early enough on the straight into Sunset Bend, which is soon going to be living up to its name, out because the sun, the shadows are starting to lengthen, the sun is getting lower. It's As we saw in qualifying, which was sort of this time of day, or, or a little bit later... Yeah, it's blinding. Actually, uh, and it's not just into sunset, it's all the way pretty much from 13 up to 16 as well. You know, some key corners there, you can't see where you're going, and... And down into the hairpin as well. Yeah, oh, that's always a risky one. Sorry, Graham, to butt in there. When you follow another car through, a GT car, always a risky one. But luckily, uh, the Porsche was given the room by the uh, the D-Station 777 car. Yeah, and unfortunately, that has cost him ground. He's, he's lost that little battle to Francesco Castellacci, and it has lost him a little ground. Uh, the next car behind Matteo Cressoni in the Iron Lynx yellow Porsche is a further 30 seconds back, so it's not too much of a drama. And behind Cressoni is Michel Gatti in the Iron Dames car, a further 17 seconds behind him. So that, that gap, by the way, between the two Iron Lynx run cars has been closing, 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 closing over the last hour. Yeah. It's 45 seconds or so, it's under 20 seconds now. Yeah. So that is a change that looks likely to take place. And ahead of that, it's a further four seconds uh, to now Satoshi Yoshino. So there is progress that could still be made by the delayed Iron Dames car, but it's not going to be a podium finish. Yeah, no, he's four seconds behind uh, Castellacci My now. Apologies. He's 18 seconds 17, ahead. 18, but, but, but you're right, you're right. The, uh, as, as, a, as a driver lineup, the Iron Dames crew are definitely quicker than the, uh, their Iron Lynx teammates. There's no question, and, and they are always as a lineup quicker. And, and you know, racing is what it is, and unfortunately for them, this is one that they will definitely feel got away. And Rahel Frey will be, you know, okay, I, it, it's me that made the mistake, it but, but everybody makes mistakes. Absolutely, as always in the program, uh, formerly with racing, the biggest differences tend to be with the non professional drivers, and no doubt at all that team co owner Claudio Schiavone is not nearly as quick as Sarah Bofi yeah. in the sister car, yep, the yep. literal sister car. It's like I was saying, though, it's, it's the it's a bit unfair to say the weakest driver in your, in your crew, the less accomplished driver yes. in your crew. That dictates your performance, yep. that, and right. that in you as a trio or a duo, you have to dedicate your time, be selfless, and dedicate the time to the driver in that car crew that can give you the performance, that can gain the most by track time. Or lose so, the least. Exactly, but if, if so, if there's no room for selfishness in terms of developing the car uh, set up that week for your style, uh, if you feel like I can get another two tenths out of it by making the car more pointy, for example, uh, get the car more on the nose, sharper turn in, deal with the rear end moving all over the place because I'm a pro driver, I can deal with that, I'll definitely go faster. But meanwhile, your bronze driver's terrified to drive this car like that, and it's going to go two seconds a lap slower because it's a really pointy, uncomfortable car. Yep. Guess what? You're going to have to dedicate more time to spending driving more understeer into it, compromising a bit more your own performance and putting your ego aside for the benefit of the trio or duo car crew for that weekend. It's a really interesting point, a long conversation with a couple of people I know and trust in the racing business about professional drivers and that there are two sorts of professional drivers emerging in this marketplace that is um, talent marketplace is that is sports car racing one are those top pros capable of winning world-class races I'm, I'm gonna make you blush by saying like your good self okay it's simply that simply that you've got another level of professional driver that are 
more able to compromise and bring emerging less professional talent up with them. And actually, arguably, in the marketplace there's LMP2 and GTM, they might be the more valuable. They might be the more valuable. The guys who can compromise just a little bit more and employ their talent in bringing the performance of the less accomplished driver, I like that phrase, closer to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, can, I can pick you many superstar drivers in single-seaters. Yeah. That would I would never put into a sports car race. <laughs> Not because I think, feel like they might crash or be a no. bit of a liability. It's because, in many ways, you, you, it's a different requirement. You need to be, uh, you know, very selfish and have a huge ego Absolutely. to be successful, to be a successful single-seater driver. But there's no place for that in sports cars. You, yep. you have to work as a team, even if you're working with a team of uh, platinum or gold drivers. You need to be that compromising kind of character. And I, I mean, I always felt more comfortable in this environment than I did, say, in Formula One, yep. because it just fitted that. It just fitted my style and who I am more than the being work, that, the yeah, teamwork. the teamwork. And I think that's what, what made me a good test driver in F1 as well. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a strange thing when we get people coming in to sports car racing who've got perhaps a long career elsewhere. It is one of those questions I ask. And I ask in a kind of, kind of benign way, but I'm looking for that answer. That's when you know that if you've got someone with real talent, they're going to break through. They're going to make it. And it is astonishing how many do give you precisely the answer because they do enjoy in that phase of their career just a little less intense environment and are still able to enjoy their racing. Back to racing though, two hours and 36 minutes or 37 minutes remaining and uh, all three classes in the same late. Late. Oh, 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 That was really late. Was late. <laughs> Jose Maria Lopez, no real need for it into that corner, but he felt it was on. In the zone, isn't he? He is really in the zone and he is still under pressure. There's Rio Hirakawa, not he, far behind. He's closing, he's closing. Yeah. So, Toyota had do they have fresh tyres on Hirakawa? Well, it was eight seconds, wasn't it? It's now down to three and a half seconds. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe had that's why Pachito is feeling the need to lunge a little. Maybe, but Hirakawa had that um, that benefit, obviously, of running a, an extra. Yeah, that's been there for quite a while, that car yeah, in the background. That's it's the 35. Oh, so it is, yes. It's the 35. So it is. I uh, thought they'd moved it somewhere no, further away. It's it's in a place of safety because it's not on the line of a, uh, the angle of attack from the uh, the barrier. But yeah, it's, uh, I, I saw that too. Yeah, Hirakawa. Hirakawa just, uh, he had that benefit of one extra lap on low fuel and hot tyres as Jose was out there getting his tyres up to temperature. This is holding, this is holding him up, Lopez. He, yeah, the tables have turned now and, and Hirakawa looks like, I mean, this has been a, a terrible time, a terrible run through the traffic for Jose and he's clearly lost a lot of time. It now it's up to 1.8 seconds, just goes to show what can happen through the traffic. That's yeah, not, just, not just him driving slower. Um, now it's Hirokawa's turn, and yeah, easier place to overtake there, yeah? although a little lift through turn eight. He wasn't quite sure where the D station car was going to end up. Now he's in the traffic through 10. I wanted to stay that, with that battle, but it, here's the battle with Shearer it, versus Fright. If Lopez is going to continue losing, losing a second and a half of that, then we're going to see those Toyotas swapping places. The Ferrari down the middle of the battle. Get out of the way, I'm coming through. I'm in third place. Get out of my way. So that's Nick Nielsen threading his way through the battle. Fabio Scherer in the green and yellow of Inter Europol. And he's been hunting down Robin Fryant as yep. Scherer. We've seen a couple of times when Fabio Scherer just gets it right. We saw it at Fuji, if you recall. I think it's Fuji we saw with uh, Fabio Scherer. Absolutely stellar drive. It does seem to have a bit of a Marmite time in, um, in LMP2. Yeah, a little bit up and down, but yeah, driving a fantastic stint here is Scherer. And Robin Fry is all out of shape on the exit of 10 and lost a lot of momentum through 11 before 13. And, and again, you start to wonder then, what are the two different teams doing on tyre strategies? Robin just nursing this on the last of uh, the glowing embers of what might have been a set of tyres a couple of stints ago. You know, because he was losing ground early on to Philippe Albuquerque and he's been caught 
by Robin Scherer, uh, Fabio Scherer, and, and, and you know, no disrespect uh, to Fabio, but uh, you sense that Robin might not have the, the full weaponry to defend himself. And coming up behind is Phil Hansen in that 22 car. So, Oli Cornwall has not given up this fight with the 35 car. That's in the off, the, uh, the place of safety of the outside of turn 17. While we're watching that, by the way, um, I can tell you that uh, Rio Hirakawa has cleared that traffic. Uh, they crossed the line two and a half seconds back. So he's still taking time out the seven, having cleared the traffic. And this looks like it could be on here. So he's trying every kind of reset he possibly can, I'm sure. Yeah. But, uh, Exit at turn 17. Have you tried turning it off and on again, sir? Full uh, season for Ollie Caldwell. Not his first time in the WC. Did not do one off at Bahrain? Was it two years ago with ARC Pranislava? Uh, but just a one-off appearance there. Busy track. Oh, oh, very, very close there. Oh, and that's for position. That's Phil Hansen in the United Auto Sports car up the inside of Fabio Scherer. Still there. That still was, there. Oh, unfortunate still for Scherer because, yeah, he's got away with it. But that was unfortunate. He, he didn't over... He did the right thing by not overtaking the Porsche and following through Frines, who made the move. But then he got all crossed up and got yeah. onto the dirt on the outside. That gave the uh, United car of Hansen a chance to lunge. And, uh, but he couldn't quite make it stick. So, yeah, that was that was all because of the traffic situation. Damage on the rear of the 86. On the rear yeah, left corner. I, I don't know who's hit the back of the GR it's, car, but wind, wind back six hours or five hours and there's the Corvette chasing the pink Porsche <laughs> that was the leader now coming up to lap again oh. the pink Porsche that was the leader so Phil Hansen with Fabio Scherer and they're both trying to catch Robin Freins so Hansen in his first stint I think yeah, seven laps ago. Fabio Scherer only one lap longer in, though, so there's no tyre advantage there. That's sort of I, better run through 17 there, and he might well be on the back of the... Not quite yeah. close enough, I'm afraid. And look, despite that, Freins has not got away. No. In fact, they're closing. He's in trouble there, yeah. definitely. Well, Freins yeah. is definitely nursed. running at the very end of his tyres, isn't he? And they're on the very... the start of theirs. Great looking battle here in LMP2. Robin Fryens currently in fourth place in the green and yellow. Fabio Scherer fifth in the blue, white, and red. Phil Hansen in sixth place. And Fryens again, you know, Scherer almost lost that fifth place a lap ago, half a lap ago. And now he's still trying to get fourth back off Robin Fryens. It's the bit of elastic has snapped right back up and, uh, and hit Fryens in the backside. I uh, think Fabio uh, Scherer's right there. Hansen's got the equipment. He's, I think he's got the tyres under him as well. He's the fastest of this trio, but um, Scherer is also fast and frying. He's been hunting him down over the last couple of laps. But yeah, we all know that United car is uh, super quick this weekend. Yeah, that car, remember, uh, was running right up the, the 22. Then there was the mistake by Frederick Lupin coming to the pits. And then they uh, held the car to avoid the penalty. A pit exit. It cost them a chunk of time, but uh, they've battled back into this. They're currently running sixth. So three cars within a single second here and battling away for fourth place. I wonder how long before Robin Fryens is in the pit lane. Okay, another lap. Another face this battle, and Shearer drops back towards Phil Hansen this time. Kessel Racing Ferrari in the GTE class. So we haven't spoken much about it. The Car Guys machine currently in second place. Daniel Serres just set that car's fastest lap of the race. Yep. Here that we go. A, that was Here a really, really poor exit from uh, Scherer there through the final corner. And Hansen might capitalise on this one. No, is going to have to guard the inside slightly more. I'm not sure that uh, Hansen can cross the line and get a good run on the exit of one. No, I think Scherer is safe towards turn four. Hansen flashing the headlight to try and off-put the car in front. But you're going to have to try harder than that. Scherer got the experience, but he's uh, yeah, was a bit of a scruffy lap there last time around, and he's allowed Freins to just edge away. Now he's become the hunted. And yet, look how much further Freins was away exiting turn one to how he is now as they come up to the hairpin. So you know, they're right back with him yeah. again. So Hansen's going to have to think about this one. He kind of, yeah, he's got him under pressure now. And... Uh, yeah, I think Scherer is more focused in the mirrors than what's going on in front of him. 
So hands and right, what can we do here? Can't overtake on the inside of 10, too far away. Now you're looking for a good exit here. Pinch the car in slightly tighter to get a good run through 11. He just clipped the curb last time around, did Hansen and turn 11. And he's right there for 13. Line it up. He's gone out extra wide to try and get a good run out of that corner. But it's oh, carried too much speed and desperation to try and close the gap. So uh, that's going to hurt him the next time he turns right because you're carrying the dust. So this corner here, you're carrying still that dust on the left-hand tires of the car, and yeah, he's moving all around. It's not gonna be this, this time round for him. Great battle in LMP2, coming down towards us, the red nose, Robin Fries, green and yellow, Fabio Scherer, and then Phil Hansen hidden behind him. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you've got Porsche versus Ferrari in hypercar, and that is still the battle for what is now fifth, fourth place, fourth place. isn't it? Oh, it's uh, just gone the way of oh, the Ferrari. Oh, Andre Lotter going Lotter. into the pits, that's yeah. why. So Lotter, as he was saying to us earlier, back at home. Not at home at Porsche so much, although that's not an unfamiliar stomping ground, but in the World Here Championship. We Here we go, Hansen going the long way. Not quite, Not but he thought about it, he definitely, but he's it, going to take a move like that to really oh, top the chair, oh, he's all over the place. Really overdriving the guy, he's just mashing the throttle there, trying to get the drive. He's got to keep himself under control here, Phil, there's just a little impatience looks to be creeping in there, that was a good blocking move by the way from Scherer. Breathing space as well for Robin Freins, he's, he's breathing a sigh of relief that Hansen's got their driver change in the number six Porsche. Traffic coming here for them, and this could be always an opportunity, yeah. and they're both going to have to follow that Porsche through this sequence of turn 10, 11, now Scherer might pop it down the inside, he's going to have to. He's going to have to pop it down the inside of 13. Don't follow him, Phil. Yeah, he knows what to do. So he's lost a bit of ground. Oh, there. nearly. <laughs> so that about getting that so run. close. Yeah, he's, he knew he needed the run, but uh, he, he just caught him a bit too much mid-corner and almost clipped. I mean, there's such a fragile part of the car. Those the, That nose section, that could have lost him a yeah. hell of a lot of performance. Yeah. Uh, but he just... I mean, you can't see that part of the car when you're, when you're sitting in there. How that close, was a close one. How close was this? If he had followed him through, the Porsche has to turn in at some point. So he knew not to, but look at that. Oh, boys. Oh, and that was and too you close. see the drive, the, the pickup of speed of the P2 car off the mid corner there. The teammate of Shera is loving yeah. this. Oh, but that might have really compromised Shera there because he just had to get past the uh, the slow Porsche yeah. Yeah, the who's por just exited the pits on cold tyres. The this hyper is what we car about. is holding them up. The oh, car. this oh, has oh. That was down watch Hansen. Oh! oh. <laughs> The Porsche is, is desperately trying to stay on the road, Lawrence Van Tour. This is what we talked about. This time of the race, with the sun starting to set and the hypercars come out against an LMP2 car mid-battle with their hot tyres. Yep. He's got the wow. inside of him. Well, this is the outside of, uh, of, of six, isn't it? So he's on the bracing line now for the braking, but Scherer's got the inside. He's going to have to be late on the brakes, is Scherer. Not try and lock up. Hansen goes for the crossover, but the rear just steps out mid-corner. Beautifully done by Sharon. A nod of approval from his teammate. That is cracking Excellent. stuff, isn't it? It is really like a high-speed game of chess. You're yeah. just looking for that moment where you can pounce and uh, your, your opponent to just get a bit upset and a bit uh, off guard. Yeah, Here we go. Look, it was looking on yeah. and watching with approval, I think it's yeah, it, he's, he's definitely enjoying watching that Albert Costa, isn't he? But this is allowing France to get away. Yeah, no, no, I mean, and, yeah, the, France has been gifted some space by by the hypercar coming out of the pits and holding up his rivals in LMP2. And we talked about it, and it's exactly what we talked about. The hypercar is as slow as a slow GT car when it's got cold tyres. And meanwhile, by the way, two seconds is the gap for the lead, seven to eight. Hirakawa not letting Lopez get away and actually closing that gap tenth by tenth. Well, let's hear from the number eight Toyota team. Is this a request to be allowed to go by? The duo gap is 1.7. Car 7 is saving more than us. Car 7 has to save more than us. 
That's because they're stopping a lap earlier and the number eight car is stopping a lap later. And they're trying to get to the stage where they don't have to fill and have a splash at the end of the race. Now, of course, with two hours and 20 minutes plus remaining, um, I think we're still in for a, maybe another full course yellow or more. So things might change. It's Andre Lotter and the team watching the action. They also have to save the uh, the brakes as well around yeah. this track and the lift and coast. When they say saving, that's that's fuel, but it's lift and coast helps to keep the brakes cooler in those cars. And tyres and everything. The more, the less you stress it, the less you stress everything. Yeah, Phil Hansen just having a little breather now. Maybe his temperatures are starting to climb a little higher than would be optimal. I also suspect to those uh, with the hypercars that um, when they're talking about saving, they're talking about saving energy as well. And yep. I think they, I think they can play around with that energy storage by doing lift and coast. As soon as that Porsche is out of the equation, it's back on the rear end of Robin Trines. Yep. Yeah, now he's not being harassed from the car behind. He can get on with uh, getting back to business. Uh, what are we seeing here? Oh, oh, 16. A difficult corner to try and overtake. Not really an overtaking place, but felt he had the speed over the D-Station car. But, uh, yeah, you don't want to see contact. Now, here we go. What's happened to Shera? So, why is it? Why was he well, compromised Frines, through 16? Frines is in the pits, isn't Frines he? In the pits, Frines, yeah. Frines coming into the pits has yeah. compromised has. Shera's speed, and Hansen's capitalised on it. Yeah. Yeah, we didn't see the beginning of that, but we sure saw the end of it. Is that the same Porsche no, behind no, him? No, it's, it's the other it's, car. It's, right, okay. It's Christensen. Yeah, but, yeah uh, so I, I imagine that coming out of 16, suddenly, Frye's is like, really? So, and Sheriff's, whoa, off the throttle. Well, whoop, Hansen's gone by him. Yeah, it would have been, uh, it would have been, in, yeah, into 15, that tight yeah. right-hander. So, yeah. Frye's would have had to compromise the corner more to get into the pit lane entry, and here he is. It's yeah. an odd pit entry, isn't it? It really is. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's difficult. It's, 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 it's a compli complicate, it complicates things, doesn't it? And it's the third arrangement of pit entry we've had over the last two weeks. There was an initial pit entry, but then we had a further white line, further back, um, before the... the reverting to pit entry we used last year. Because there was a crash in the prologue. There was a crash in the prologue. Because of that. The f well, 54 trying to get to the pits. Thomas Fleur breaking on the racing line to try to get across the track. Misread uh, David Heimer Hansen coming from behind and was hit square in the back at high speed by the It's an old, a, awkward situation. A, a, a bit like entry. that pit entry in Mexico City. Which, which you often see cars running out very wide and they can cut it clear across the track to get into. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, because every every fraction of a second, never mind every second counts, every fraction counts. So Robin Fries, I'm sure, was on right on the ragged end of a very long stint on those tyres. And, and that cost them time, didn't cost them positions, but what it might have done is got them back to a place now where they've got fresh tyres for each of the remaining stops. I don't know, I mean, that's just a surmise. Or maybe they'd already dug that hole and they were trying to get themselves back out. Nick Wilson in from third place, the number 50 Ferrari 499P. Ferrari's third and fourth, by the way. Porsche are fading. Fuoco into the car, the pole setter, remember, yesterday in what was a fantastic qualifying session in all three classes. 51 in the hands of Antonio Vincivrazzi goes to through third. and into third. Is that the highest that car's been in the race so far? Um, it is. Maybe, yes. It briefly got around the outside of one of the Toyotas for third in corner one, and by corner two was back into fourth. And they're both, uh, yeah, both now on track once all the pit stops have, have played out ahead of the Porsches. Yeah. So their natural speed over the Porsches uh, is, is coming coming into play. And Richard Westbrook, by the way, pacing that 51 car in fourth in this sledgehammer of a car. I love this thing. This it, and. For reading between the lines, they didn't say so, so much, but Cadillac, I think, believe they're in a much better place with tyres yep. than either Porsche, and I think that's definitely playing out now with Porsche. Porsche are just dropping back from Ferrari. They're no longer a Ferrari contender. And Cadillac think they may have, I think they think they've got Ferrari covered on tyres as well. And, and actually, we, we kind of want to know because although they don't want to give everything away, if Ferrari have dug themselves a hole on tyres, it doesn't matter if they know that Cadillac have got more tyres or have got more tyres. You've only got left what you've got left. Now, what was this coming in? Oh, well saved, Lollipop Man. Well saved. Yeah, doing the job. 
that they're there to do. And again, that's a very experienced race team, a very well rehearsed team, the Iron Lynx team. Knew what the danger was. He's not looking at his car. He's looking at what's coming in at. Yes. Because looking at your own car tells you nothing. He saved them a, an absolute certain penalty. So tyres going on the Bremer car. This is the number nine car. Philip Ugram brought the car in. I think that was a driver change for them. Also in the 41 from WRT and the LP Charmelezi. That car. Well up in the order until spark plug issues for the LP and Jones team. Now let's listen to this. Where's he lifting off? Well, that's a big old lift off into uh, turn 15. A proper Formula E. Yeah, it was like that, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Apart from a bit more noisy. <laughs> and a bit prettier. <laughs> now let's listen to Hirakawa towards our we've just gone off for the uh, the onboard shot but uh, he's definitely keeping Jose Maria Lopez a bit more honest in but, this but he, but he is having to save as much because he's not making any ground now so maybe they've dug themselves a little bit into a into an energy hole that they need to kind of just Back it off a little bit. He's close enough to take advantage but if something a, happens. But that was a lot of lift and coasting that Jose yeah, yeah. Lopez was making. He's having to do into turn 15. So uh, I can only imagine when they, he's traveling at higher speed, say like into turn one or or into turn 17 after the long straights or seven, you'd be lifting even earlier. Fabio Scherer going by the Kessel Racing car guy, Ferrari, and that car is currently in fifth place. Scott Huffaker at the wheel of the Kessel Racing Ferrari, fifth place in GTM. Yeah, he's gone, isn't he? Scalded cat. Ooh, ice creams. What a good idea. Great shot there. What always, a, what a Toyota team get. Oh, me! Always a sign that things are under control when a member of the uh, the team's eating an ice lolly during the race. Yeah, absolutely. All the bit days of thunder. In, 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 into the pit lane comes 51. Let's hear from car number 50. I have a gearbox alarm. Let me know if it's okay. This is okay. You can carry on. This is okay. And it's it's gearbox shade, alarm. shades of Bahrain. Wasn't it the 52? Which of uh, the was, Ferraris was, last was, year had a was, gearbox alarm? No, ignore it. Was, it. Oh, Collado, wasn't it? It was Collado. That wasn't an alarm. That was the gearbox disintegrating. It was, it was <laughs> yeah, because the alarm came on, but was it had been rattling like a bag of spanners. Fourth first place the, yeah, the, the last hour. Yeah. The alarm was he couldn't change gear anymore. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Stuck it's in it. fourth gear. And it, it, fifth, it did it? sound like... poking through the floor. Just to say what we're watching, the pit stop for the number 50. What if you're enjoying the race coverage from here and why wouldn't you be? Um, there was a ton of other opportunities to catch up with what's going on with the FI World Endurance Championship. And there's going to be a brand new format for the WC Full Access behind the scenes program. Look out week and a half or so after the race on YouTube. It will be promoted on social media. A long form version of that this year. I know that will be cheered to the rafters by a lot of fans. And if you are a new fan to the FI World Endurance Championship, very many of, of you are because of this car, and you're very welcome, uh, do take a look and uh, see what goes on behind the scenes for an FI World Endurance Championship race. And the other thing to point out is if you have found us, congratulations, well done. We don't just show the race. We are also this year showing free practice three and qualifying live. So more coverage. We're going to try and expand that. Now, left sides only. Here we go. New left side tyres. Right side tyres were a set that have done qualifying and qualifying only. That's why they got five laps on. So it's effectively a new set all round because the harder work left-hand side has got slightly fresher rubber. Yeah, the, the new set, completely new set, would always give you more grip. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, a, a one lap or two lap qualifying tire, it takes a bit of the edge off the compound, but it's, you know, you've still got a good chunk of meat there on the tire. And, and of those five laps, two will have been bringing it, it up to speed, one will have been slowing down, so we'll have done fairly little work. It's, yeah. it's, it's too hard racing, you know, hard, hard. And 
on a light tank as well. So it's, yeah, he's not brand new, brand new, but it, it's getting that way. Gustavo uh, Menezes aboard the yeah. number 94 car that uh, was stricken with ERS uh, problems earlier in the race and has come back out to play for the remaining part of the race after almost three hours behind the wall. Leader in, Yifiye out. At Hertz Team Jota, so drive a change as we head towards the final two hours of the race here in Sebring. Well, drive a change means full service, fuel clean up, clear out all the ducts, remove bits of rubber that stick to everything and a fresh set of tyres as well, and that will promote the Prema car. Number 63 back into the lead, Danny Kvyat at the wheel, as Michael Christensen brings the number five Porsche into the pit lane as well, one of our 11 hypercars. And actually, of the entire hypercar field, it's only really Peugeot that is, uh, and Glickenhaus, of course, that, that, that retired with a, a total failure to proceed. Great to see uh, Danny Fiat here in the World Endurance Championship and uh, bumped him to him yesterday in the paddock and he had a massive smile on his face and he's absolutely loving his time driving with Prema here in the World Endurance Championship in the LMP2 car and out there in the lead at the moment. Uh, pretty clearly, by the way, that gearbox alarm isn't uh, hurting the pace of uh, Antonio Fuoco. 148.4 last time around. That's fastest lap I've seen for quite some time and quicker than the Totas at the moment, although obviously a lap down. Hot brakes on the on the point. By the way, if your Porsche smokes like that when you come to a halt, I would take it to an approved dealer, or, take, or, or, or at or least a good, easier. or at least a good specialist. Yeah, uh, this is <laughs> this is the number five Porsche, gone and done. That's because these racing brakes carbon on carbon work at extreme temperatures, and that, that your road car will hopefully never get to. And also, sometimes, as you come into the pit lane, you get bits of rubber, like you yeah. say, they go everywhere, and they get into the brakes, and it's actually the rubber that's... The marbles are just burning away. Well, you will quite quite occasionally see a fire in a wheel rim, and that is literally that, the rubber uh, on on 1,000-degree brake discs and calipers just catching light and, and then dripping down onto more rubber in the rim, and that part burns as well. So just in front of them is the Oman Racing Aston Martin. Qualified in third place, Charlie Eastwood now at the wheel of that car. Yeah, down in 11th place, I'm afraid. Remember, had that problem with the puncture. Cost them time yeah. on a very slow in-lap. And uh, it was also, if I remember rightly, there was damage uh, underneath the wheel arch that needed to be sorted as well yeah. for that car. So after a strong early run, has fallen quite a way back. In fact, the only two punctures we've seen have been for Aston Martins. That car had a front puncture, and it was Paul Dallalana who had the rear puncture. That was the one that had all the wire from the carcass of the car, uh, of the tyre all over the car. This Toyota's looking so much more planted and a uh, better ride than it was this time last year. Uh, it was like a bucking bronco, wasn't it? It, it was for proper porpoising yeah. last year, wasn't it? Really was. The drivers were saying their arms, they just had arm pump yeah. every time they got out of the car because like they were hanging on. Yeah, yeah, like motocross. Yeah. This year, they said, much happier with the car. Yeah. There's a lot less understeer in the car. I mean, I know that's a really bumpy corner and it looks horrific, but you should have seen last year. It was... Uh, it, it was, it was all doing, over the place. It was yeah. doing that on much smaller bumps. Yeah, absolutely. Th that's the big difference. And that is the big difference. And that's the big difference between having a brand new car, no matter how much testing you've done, to one that you've raced for two years and are developing now. Floyd Van Orl, Tom Dillman at the wheel. We've seen Esteban Guerrieri and Jacques Villeneuve also driving. So Tom handing back to Jacques. It looks like they're kind of single stinting now towards the end. I think it's single stinting Jacques Villeneuve is what they're doing. Um, so the 1997 F1 world champion, yet another one of our world champions in the hypercar class, about to rejoin. The sound of the 4.5 litre Gibson V8 engine. A relatively uncomplicated car, this. Yeah. Well, that's what you want when you're starting out. They haven't added anything that they don't need. They've got a proven engine in the car. Actually, I quite like the aero treatment at the front as well. It's, it's, they don't have to make it look like any road car, which Toyota have done and Peugeot have done and Cadillac have done and to a degree Porsche have done as well. So they've, they've plowed their own furrow. And that's, that's one of the joys of these hypercar rules is that nobody's car actually looks like anybody else's. 
Um, so Jacques Villeneuve, I know it's a, it's a long shot, but he's still in the chance to uh, to go for the triple crown, isn't he? Yeah, this he year? is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If the stars align, the who stars knows? Align. If Alonso, Alonso tried. If another I mean, 16 cars. Star, star, <laughs> star, <laughs> stars and a lot of snipers. Yes. <laughs> Look, the answer is he is in the right class. Yes. Okay. Yeah. He's yeah. in the right class. Yeah. And as we know at Le Mans, anything can happen. Now the Costa about to leap back in. He was enjoying this car in action. Now he's going to enjoy this car in action. Yep. Uh, now, we didn't talk about it much when Kubish Mihovsky was at the wheel. Um, so I'm assuming that he has done all of his stint. Again, our strategy uh, laptop is uh, not order open. Or to combat. Yes. Uh, so uh, they will know what they're doing. There's the Floyd Van Wall team. Again, you know, a small operation, uh, a, a ground up build for this car. And uh, Esteban Guerrieri on the right hand side, Tom Dillman now uh, with the Graham Goodwin uh, eyesight. He's <laughs> 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 got, his, got his bins up, mind you, it happens to us all, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. he certainly does. <laughs> got the bins on, but no, I mean, it's, you know, it, they know they know they are seriously underdeveloped. You know, they haven't had the testing budget, say, that Porsche have had. They haven't had the budget, say, that Ferrari have had, and the testing that Ferrari have had. And they haven't got the experience that Toyota have. They know they're coming in pitching against a, a really tough field. But so far, they've had no dramas on of their own accord. They've had a really good debut. I'm, I'm really impressed with it. Top two in LMP2 are on pit lane. Premier Racing comes in with Danny Kvyat. Here comes Phil Hansen in from second place after that epic three-car battle that we enjoyed for lap after lap. He's going to stay aboard the 22. 48 car is going to come through to take the lead. Mm. Yeah, Will Stevens back at the wheel of the uh, the 48 car. But again, because that's not a full season entry for Pence, uh, for, for Hertz team Jota, because they will have a hypercar later in the year, at least they're definitely assuming they will. Uh, I'm assuming they've been given a delivery date by Porsche. April 29th. There you go. Uh, so they will go back into the lead, but effectively they don't, because although they might be first to the chequered flag, in terms of points, in terms of the championship, it is Prema versus United. It's Kvyat versus Hansen. And here comes Phil Hansen, closing in on the two hours to go mark. We have completed 175 laps of... Uh, 268 eight. Eight. was it we're is not going to make the or lap 260 count. no uh, but it's you know what not bad no um, no no it's it's we it's we're getting very deep into it and thankfully after last year's disappointment no sort of thunderstorm oh, don't even start with all that <laughs> <laughs> so but, corvette dempsey proton they're the one, two, and then Kessel Racing, the car guys, Ferrari in third. So a lot of yellow cars at the front, but for a car that didn't qualify especially well, as ever, the Dempsey Proton team know how to run a race, and there are no weak links in that 77 lineup. So all of the, uh, the top five, top four LMP2 cars, have, uh, they're all pretty much on the same strategy now at least done the same amount of pit stops. And within, a minute, the... and within a minute of each other, 47 yeah. seconds to be precise. Yeah. And I, top four. I think it's because of the uh, the full course yellow, is it? Some decided to pit under the full course yellow, some didn't. And that really, it really separated a lot of the field. Yeah. And the reason uh, we've got one on eight pit stops, 41 is on eight pit stops compared to nine for the other three. And that's... Uh, Four car battle. Yeah, it's the Robert Kubica car, isn't it? I think it's the Kubica yeah, car. Yeah, it is. Yeah, so it's one pit stop down. That could be for strategic reasons they, for the other three. Well, they were the car, actually, that at least one of the cars that decided not to come into the pits. Under neither the Jota, zero. neither. Did, Prema, did WRT split or did Prema split? Uh, I think WRT split. United definitely pitted. Yes. And then we had the Frederick Lubin stop that was miscommunicated. I think Kubica's car stayed out. It did. That's why Kubica... And that's for it. why they... 
He they, was leading the race at one point. They didn't short stop. They didn't stop early, and so they're on a, oh yeah, on a full fuel strategy kind of. Right, in comes the Corvette from the lead, and uh, that car at the moment before this pit stop is again a lap ahead of the challenging number 77 car. Yeah. So. Overall, it is the Totas 1-2, the 7 from the 8. Uh, Jose Maria Lopez, two seconds clear of Ria Huakawa, with Richard Westbrook a lap down on those two, running third in the Cadillac number 2. In the GTM class, as you can see there, Corvette Racing, comfortable lead on this car, the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche. And then the Kessel Racing 57 car, the Car Guy livery car, uh, runs third. And it's just 18 seconds back, by the way, from the number 77. Still got Nicky Katzberg to come, and I suspect it's about now that we'll see Nicky the Cat Katzberg uh, out in the number 33 car. Been a tough race for Aston Martin, hasn't it? Okay. D-Station in ninth, the only Aston that has not had a problem. It is a driver change. Yeah. Good, good stint there from Nico Veroni, and they'll be very pleased indeed with their signing. There is Nicky Katzberg. Done a lot of Corvette racing, raced in yellow as well in the World Touring Car Championship as a factory Lada driver. He's been a factory BMW driver in GTs. He won the Asian Le Mans Series this year yeah. in a BMW M4 uh, GT3. He raced a Mercedes-Benz in uh, MG uh, GT3 at Bathurst this year. He'll be racing a Ferrari 296 GT3 in the Nürburgring this year. And just a couple of weeks ago, in the historic events uh, in his home country, raced an old BMW Z4 GT3 for good measure. There, uh, yeah, because he, he was part of the VDS BMW was. crew, wasn't he? I mean, and he, he loved that car. He loved that car so much. Here is our LMP2 leader, Will Stevens, back in the wheel of the 48 Hertz Team Jota car, ahead of Danny Kvyat, Robert Kubica, and Phil Hansen. And how far back from Hansen? 16 seconds back, Ferdy Habsburg not out of the equation. Ferdy Habsburg, quickest of the lot of them at the moment. And 10 track. seconds behind him, Albert Costa, and two seconds behind him, Pietro Fittipaldi. I have a feeling this is going to be that there's going finish. to be a House of Cards domino finish for LMP2. We might end up with a 48 car at the top of the pile, but all the others behind, look how close some of those gaps are. Yeah, top seven uh, are all in podium contention here, yeah. depending on how things work out. And who's got what tyres left, and who's got what fuel left, and, and how close we get to the end of the race, and, and, and. And if when we get a further caution, which we've not had for quite some time now. Oh, oh you said it. Now. I did. <laughs> um, so, all to play for in LMP2. GTE Am does look at the moment as if it's pretty safe for the Corvette Racing Crew if it goes to a race on pace. But behind that, there's all sorts of uh, uncertainty. And for the overall, with just a minute over two hours to go, it is a total one two, and they are the only two cars on the lead lap. That principally, we should remind people of joining us a little later in this race, is because of errors, mistakes, all sorts of shenanigans beyond the Toyotas. The Toyotas have effectively been error-free and quick. Just point out the most consistent car in the LMP2 at the moment being driven by Bent Viscal. That's the Prima car. Qualified ninth, currently ninth. There you go. Everybody else is either made. Oh, oh, yeah. oh well, that's, that's got damage, damage to the left rear. It's got to have been contact, isn't it, with another car? And that is going to be tricky. It's, it's the, the rear wheel yeah. is fouling. The he can't get it moving, can he? Uh, now he's missed. what's happened here. Broken suspension. Who's he? Who's he made contact with? Thomas Floor's car. Oh, he was a oh. long, long, long way off the road there and, and dug himself a huge hole out. Yeah, it looks like he's just... Uh, oh, he's made contact earlier. Yeah. So he's tried to go around the outside. Oh, he clipped the GAO racing car. It yeah. was a 56. The Project One car. He hit, got a Jeanette. So he's tried to go around the outside. It's a common move, but unfortunately, the, the, the GT car that he was trying to overtake, he's got to do a whole lap like this as well. He's missed the pit entry. The GT car he's trying to overtake just you know, naturally drifted out a bit wider. The move was a bit late, and he didn't see the warning signs coming, and contact was made. 
Now, did the 56 car get away? I'll keep an eye on that because that was quite a clunk. It was a bit of a kind of passing blow on the 54. And again, you know, Pierre Guidi, a, a legendary GT driver and, you know, current world champion, but not in hypercars. We can hear from him now, I think. Well, let's hear from Louise Beckett down into pit lane. Louise, what do you know? I could not see who it was, but a car staying on track just went past the pit lane with smoke all coming out the yeah, back of it. That will have been Maybe below the wall. The that was the Ferrari. <laughs> yeah, so that was the 51 car. Nobody came into the pits, though. So, oh, well, too fast. This is too fast. Stewards are investigating contact between 51 and 56. They will also have to investigate contact between 51 and 54 because he hit 54 going past before he spun back. Backwards into 56, Here take a look again. again. Let's have a look. So he goes around the outside, and yeah, this, the GT cars just drifted out. Oh, you know what? Was he trying to come into the pits? The, I think Who, the, Thomas Floor? Uh, yeah, I think he might have been very Maybe, talked about this pit. It's exactly it. the same car. No, no, but what, what, he, on, he, on, he goes on. out wide, and then he comes back in. I think the Ferrari was gearing up to come into the pits. I'm pretty sure that's what happened. You might well be yeah, right. Because there's no other reason why he would have drifted out so far. You might well be right. In which case, uh, this, oh, this it's going to too fast. This, this is what we talked about before. There's going to have to be a full course yellow because there's debris everywhere. All right, this will reset the field with two hours to go. It was Francesco Castellacci in the 54 car. Oh, he's no, doing his best Gilles Villeneuve no. impersonation. Yeah. Dear, oh dear. There uh, goes, that's the carcass. Full course yellow is coming at the top of the... 56 makes it back Miller. in, damage right rear quarter. Completely blameless. I I, and I tell you what, he's taken the back of the bumper off. If he'd hit the rim, yeah. that could have ripped the gearbox out of the car. Let's hear the 51, the team. All OK, Pat. All OK. I saw it. Who was in the car? Well, it's it's another well-respected and very experienced Ferrari driver, Francesco Castellacci. And I, I think you're right. I think the way you read that ad, I think the 54 car was coming into the pits. You have to pit and, into the pit lane at some point. And, and, at some, uh, and the 51 Ferrari there is so far committed. I mean, he was off track and coming back on committed. And then the 50 core, 54 moved across. As the 51 was coming left, 54 moved to the right. And if, yeah. if the car was coming into, if 54 was coming into the pits, I can't blame Pierre Guidi for that. Um, I think it's yeah. just one of it's a racing just incident. One of those it's, it's this yeah. pit lane entry. It's unfortunate that IMSA are here on the same weekend. We can't use the proper pit lane. It, it, it's, you know, the, the, we talked about this, didn't we? We were literally just a couple of minutes yeah, ago yeah, talking about yeah. a crash that happened in the prologue. Less than ideal. And you, you can see how much the rubber's flailed around because it's taken some of the tape off the rear wing, up the top surface of the rear wing. There's the 56. Now, have they got big damage at the back? It they might bystander. Not here. necessarily because there was an impact on the rear wing as well. Yeah. So the rear wing did take a clunk as well. Now, I, I was... Uh, yeah. 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 No, but you can see the tape there. Look, it's been flailed off. Uh, the, other, the other point I was about to make, uh, guys, is that you asked whether or not the 54 was on the way to the pits. The 54 has not pitted. So I think the answer yeah. is no, it isn't. Maybe, he, wasn't. Wow, Maybe okay. he moved out to try and give the faster car that was he coming might, up two corners ago a, 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 a way to get through. Um, that's a lot of damage. It may not be. It may be bolt on and offable. Yeah, but it's a lot of bolt on and offable. It's yeah. at least three major panels on that car. Yeah. It's the rear clip. It is the, the rear. Is this the engine cover? So watch. So he goes off the oh, track momentarily. He comes yeah. back, but I, I, I don't know why the 54 was so far out. It's well, not and normal and for them there to you go. But also, the... but I don't, so I, don't, I don't know why Pierre Guidi didn't stay right on the white line on the outside. Look, he's out there. He does lift. You listen. He but does then lift he comes up. left in. It's all under control, but he didn't expect the car to drift out into the middle of the track. And it is a really common move. It's not like he was doing something audacious yeah. and, and out of the ordinary. We see cars going in the outside there. All this, and he was aware, to be fair, because he was lifting off already. When he went, yeah. when he dipped wheels off the track, he was lifting off, waiting to see how it was going to unfold, and then felt more prepared to go for it afterwards. So. Um, 
Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't really blame Pierre Guidi for that one. It's uh, for me, it was a racing incident. In the pits, Louise Beckett. I've had confirmation from the 54 team that he was coming into the pits. Wow. All right, and he's not come in. That makes more sense. All right, much so more he's sense not coming because no, no, the pit lane was yeah, closed. He can't come in yeah. because the full well, no, if he day. needed pit, if he needed fuel, he was coming into the pits. I'm amazed he's made it round. How can he keep going if he had to come into it the could, pits? But it might not be fuel. It might be driver time. Driver time. Because yeah. we're in that bracket now, aren't we? That, that this we, we just gone past the top of the hour. Yeah. Those cars are about an hour on fuel. And yeah. It could be driver time. Yeah. So. Well, also don't forget under full course yellow, you're using less fuel, Correct. so you can continue to circulate even though you're getting low on fuel. So at some point, it, he might have to come in anyway when it gets. Low. So I think you can do two or three extra laps than a than under full course yellow, under a racing speed lap yeah. where you're burning an awful lot more fuel. Look yes, at that they get damage it's done. Well, one of the things we saw in slow-mo flying off was the entire brake cooling I have never done. seen a saw <laughs> used in a pit stop ever. That's because they're not <laughs> Brits and they haven't got a lump hammer. They are they are trying to carve off the mounting for that brake cooling duct Absolutely. that was all flying in the air. It's it's debris from the tower. Uh, yeah, the, and the, the tire, tire as well. As you were saying with the yeah. uh, the incident with the 98 car. <sighs> you know what? Now we know that the that the 54 was coming into the pits. I can't blame either driver. Yeah. Uh, I'm no, no, glad no. I didn't. It's, it, it's just yeah. one of those things. Yeah, that, look, there's the brake cooling The done. tubing's come up everything. Where's that, that gone? Oh, it's way done. too quick. <laughs> it was way too quick. It's, look, look at the extra damage you've yeah. caused and the time yeah. that you're sitting in the pits. It, and, it's, and, and around there, all the tires flaming around, it's the wiring loom, it's the fuel rails, it, it's the suspension, it's the brake ducting. You know, even if it had only been a bodywork, they also need to replace the brake duct. They're starting to put it back together, though. But it, it's all that wire gets wound around everything. That's you know, your your turn. If the wire, when the tire shreds itself, you've got all these bits of wire, and then you're spinning the wheel at several hundred RPM, several thousand RPM. It just tightens the wire up around everything. That's why you need a hacksaw to carve it and off. It, and it won't well, in that be the case, same. A tenon it, saw. I know it. It looks like aesthetically, it's it's kind of back to pretty much how it was. But yeah, it's in my experience, it will never handle the same once once you've gone through a, a kind of damage like that. Yeah. The key here is, will that go back together? Well, again, it's a learning process, isn't it? And, and you know, Eduardo Freitas getting through some of his shopping list of jobs to do, including getting the blowers out. And uh, does anybody brought Louise Beckett a cup of tea? That's what I want to know. Espresso in Ferrari, please. But um, uh, I was talking to the team earlier. These guys were working on the car until 3 o'clock this morning anyway before the race. And now they've got to deal with this. I mean, it's just... It's hard on the team, isn't it? Why were they working until 3 o'clock in the morning, Lou? I don't know. They said they got the car back late from qualifying, and I'm still trying to get an answer. Yeah, qualifying didn't really finish until sort of 7 p.m., and then it goes into scrutineering, and then you're the waiting for the scrutineering, yeah. and yada, yada, yada. Needs, needs that decalcification. Yeah, it's routine. a long process. Absolutely. Never known Louise drink espresso. It's always they a are cup going of tea. back to the tent. We are here for the 51 yeah. car. Yeah, uh, I'm. I'm not surprised, uh, and and I am disappointed, and and I'm sure they will be. But you you learn from your lessons. That was a big clunk, and yeah. came it's back quickly. But what uh, can you do? I mean, well, I mean, things. in one terms of, of driving back to the pits, yeah, you learn your lessons. You drive slower, but. Yeah, yeah. I just don't know how. What if I have tried to always put myself in the position of the driver, and you you get a. You get a feel for when you're on the onboard of where you would go, what you would do, and I didn't see him doing anything yeah. that I wouldn't have done, basically. I'll say one other thing, by the way. Francesco Castellacci, who's been a key part of the AF Corsa Spirit of Race effort, I hope there's nothing going his way there uh, after this, because there was that question asked in the open from Alessandro Pierre Guidi. Uh, it tended to point the finger. I'm not sure I agree with that at all. But he might not have known as well that he was trying to come into the pits. Yep. As soon as Pierre Guidi knows he was trying to come into the pits, he'll go, oh, I just, wrong place, wrong time. Yep. Yeah. It really was so. for both drivers. It, and it's happened in testing. They, they modified the pit lane entry to, to try to mitigate these kind of issues. It hasn't really worked, has it? No. It's, no. Not, it's not the usual pit lane. That's what we have to remember for this circuit. You know, the imps are, the imps a lot have got it this weekend as they had in years gone by. We're sharing the, the, the track with them. 
uh, this weekend, and uh, that's why we're racing on a Friday. Yeah. We've got pit, uh, pit stop car 25 under investigation. Yes, I'm assuming they've had to come in under well, the full course yellow. Uh, that's the IT car, isn't it? Of course. Might well be. Either way, they get yeah, but to work. It but it wasn't involved in that. That's, no, it wasn't. No, no, that's Charlie Eastwood in, in that Aston Martin. So uh, it wasn't involved in that incident. And in fact, uh, 54 has not been in yet. No. Nope. So why was he coming in? The only, and, the, and only thing, the only thing sometimes really helps when you're the overtaking car, and we see this at Le Mans in, in, the, in the kinks on the straight, especially in the night time, we ask in the driver's briefing for the cars that are being lapped to just flick the indicator switch on. Yep. And, you know, the, you, it, the GT cars, it is accessible yes. to, to, mm -hmm. to, to use that, and it's a, such an important tool. I used to speak to, actually, James Collado was one of them. I'd say, mate, it really helps when you do that. He said, does it? Is it, is it real big help for you? He said, yep. yeah, because we know where you're going to go. Yeah. And if you indicate, then say if the indicator, if the right-hand indicator was on before coming into the pit lane there, even before you got to the double left-hand kink, Pierre Guidi would know, ah, he's coming in. I better not go around the outside of him this yeah. time. Yeah. But you're asking a lot of, um, you're asking a lot from a, from a driver to do that. Yeah. It's, uh, it is the it's full capacity, you know. It is, yeah, the, it yeah. is the 51 car, which is the newest Ferrari 499P chassis of the lot in race terms, because this is the car that's had a replacement chassis after James Collado, who had a big incident in the prologue. Uh, day, day two of the prologue, missed most of the running. That uh, 3 a.m. was the race prep for that car. Uh, but, yeah, they, of course, uh, and Ferrari have had a long couple of weekends and it's a horrible way to finish the last couple of hours of running here at Sebring for them. Speaking of which, this is the battle for victory here. This is the lead car battle. Car number eight with car number seven. And you wow. talked, Anthony, about when they have to come down. There is a three-second grace period after we get down to zero in the countdown to full course yellow to be at 80 kilometers an hour. Looks as though Rio Hero Carl may have Take dug deep that. into that, yeah. Because uh, as, as the other car is slowing down, if you're not even for one second, you cover a lot of ground. Oh, yeah. But worth saying as well, it is the first round of the FI World Endurance Championship, and the World Championship is very important to these factory teams. Do not forget, as we look on at some nervous faces oh, there. No, 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 I'm just pointing out, somebody is suited and booted. They, they have okay. got a Buemi ready to go into number eight. They've loaded him, locked and loaded him. Um, but this is an eight-hour race. The points total here is greater. We've got two eight-hour races and a half. that bookend the season yep. uh, here in Bahrain. Six-hour races at Portimao, at Spa, at Monza, and at Fuji. And then the Le Mans 24 hours in the middle. This is a big point-scoring race to yep. start the season. If you want to go in in bragging rights, this race win battle is not done yet. No, absolutely So you got not. Mike Conway and Brendan Hartley there. Conway in the seven crew, Hartley in the eight crew, swapping notes, just sort of conflabbing with each other, and Sebastian Bremi sitting there. Now, what we didn't see is whether there's going to be a driver change for seven as well. So the two car is just on the lead lap. Yeah. So what I was going to, I was going to mention the two car as well. I wonder if it wasn't Hirokawa being a little bit more daring getting closer to that limit of the full course yellow button. Uh, 20 seconds to full course yellow. Yeah, if the seven had got uh, held up. Yeah, I wonder that's if a very yeah, good held point. up by the number two. Very so good I, point. I, I think they're... Could have been. I think their 80 kph Ten seconds, nine, speed limit is, is eight, a different seven, calibration. Six, yeah. Here we go then. Five, four, three, two, one. Full course yellow removed. Full course yellow removed. Back to green flag racing. The blue car is third, being chased by the leaders. Car number seven and car number eight. Toyota 1 2. The Cadillac is in third place. And it does look as though Jose Maria Lopez may have just been held up a fraction getting into full course yellow. Maybe the Cadillac was just a bit cautious or a bit less cavalier with slowing down to those 80 kilometers an hour. But now that gap is going to open right up because Rio Hirakawa could not get by Ant Davidson where he wanted to. Uh, he couldn't. That was, uh, that was a real get out of jail free card for Jose Maria Lopez, wasn't it? Getting past that uh, cat. Oh, but he's had a big old Whoa, buck up into seven. How far has he gone? Wide. No, Not he's enough. made it. Well, Not you quite know, enough. if Pachito had been held up going into the, the yellow, 
by the number two car coming out of it. He wasn't, and, and it swung the balance back, and, and so it's back to the status quo about two seconds apart. He's now carrying a little bit of a flat spot, though, isn't he? Is, yeah, but uh, it may not be for too much longer. Now then, don't forget, although we see Sebastian Buemi there, the number seven car has been stopping a lap early. Oh, it was a there big lock Yeah, that was the, uh, the onboard of Hirakawa. Yeah. Lucky for Jose that he got away with that one. Very easily done on cold tyres. And meanwhile, in LMP2, nothing is yet sorted. This is Inter Europol versus Jota. Pietro Fittipaldi all over the back of the yellow and green car of Albert Costa. Yep, two of the seven ferrets of the sack in LMP2. <laughs> the, the, the leading battle. Absolutely fantastic stuff. We're going to be joined, by the way, in the booth uh, very shortly by a guest and uh, someone who should have been racing here this uh, this weekend, but sadly wasn't for reasons completely out of his control. But uh, we'll be asking him why he's to blame in just a little <laughs> while. <laughs> There'll be a bus along, he'll be under it. Don't you worry, now. Number eight is in the pit. So Ria Hirakawa, that was... N now, this is interesting because the number seven car has stopped first. What did... <sighs> The number seven Toyota has been stopping a lap before the number eight car all the way through the last three hours. Suddenly, the number eight car is in the pit lane and the number seven is not. Now then, are they Catch doing a two-lap undercut they... to try and come out? What have they got on tyres? Oh, oh, trouble for the van wall. Oh, dear. Now then, this might... No, it looks like he's OK, Jacques he Villeneuve. Has he had a bit of a, yes, a, he had, a spin, maybe? Has he had damage on the right rear? Let's, Let's take a look. look. Ran out. Oh, oh yeah, he, he did. did. Oh, he's lucky not to be collected from behind there. Oh, that was so close. Cold, cold tyres. Well, Let's watch again. Doesn't look any better from this angle, I'm sure. Oh. Harry Tingle, you've got plenty of experience of DPI racing. Bringing tyres back up to temperature is pretty hard work sometimes, even in a track as hot as this. Yeah, it is, uh, especially around here as well. There's not much room for error, but I feel like that car is crabby. Left rear. So the like left rear seems to be... Up on him. Yeah. I, I think they've lost a, a, an upper suspension arm. The left rear had a lot of positive camber, then a lot of negative, then a lot of yeah, positive. Yeah, you've got that huge bump there on the yeah. sort of under the bridge, and maybe it's something just let go of uh, that I'm compression. giving Villeneuve a, a free hall pass on that one. I don't think that was Jack losing it. I think the car has had its first problem. Lopez on pit lane now from the lead. It's a minute and 28 seconds was the gap. We're watching for where the eight car is on track. It's in turn four right well, that, now. Well, that means that world champion Buemi, who doesn't want to lose this race, is coming steaming up behind oh, yes. him. And there is a driver change. And Buemi will have hot tyres. And Kaz, uh, Kamui Kobayashi will not. So driver change at Toyota. This is the car that was the leader. And Jose Maria Lopez handing it over to Kamui Kobayashi. But coming up behind him is turn nine at the Sebastian moment. Buemi. Turn nine, coming okay. into turn ten with traffic. If Buemi's out of 13 before the car goes up in the air, he will pass him. Car's up in the air. This is going to be close. But we saw before that the number seven car just managed to hold on. Or the number Where eight car go? managed to hold on. It's going to come out ahead here. Did he have tyres? Yes, uh, yes, he did. Full set or...? Oh, two, I think. OK. And, and this might be... Coming uh, through And again, to Harry 15. Tingle, what are the two key... There's two key elements of American racing. Track position, always take fuel. Yeah, absolutely. Watch the, watch wow. the right, watch the right. There is the the, yeah. uh, the brake car, but he's going to be Harry. slow, isn't he? He's going to be slow through 17. It's oh, like that risk there. reward now of like he's got to push to keep the the track position, but he's going to have cold tyres. It's going to be really tough for him. Left rear wheel is definitely not doing what it ought to on the uh, look. Uh, you look at it; it's, it's steering itself. It's definitely lost one of its suspension arms. Yeah. Villeneuve gets a, gets a free pass on that. That was not Jacques dropping the car. That car's going to need more work. Let's get down to the 51 Ferrari team and hear from James Collado. James Collado, I'm sorry to see you here. And I saw you going over to Ali and almost saying nothing you could do. No, I think it's just one of those things. I'm, I'm not sure entirely or understand exactly what happened, but it looked like the, uh, the other Ferrari GT 
maybe it was coming in the pits and uh, who knows, I don't know if he saw us or not, so uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, but it's not been an easy weekend, honestly, we've, we've been struggling a little bit on um, on getting up to speed, especially after missing uh, a whole day's testing in the prologue, so uh, it's a little bit of a knock-on effect. Um, I'm thinking positively though, honestly, I think uh, we know where we need to improve. The, the car's clear, clearly quick and it's got a lot of potential. We just need to refine everything uh, in the future to, to be able to compete with the Toyotas. So um, yeah, it's unfortunate, but you know, we're learning quickly. Um, let's hope the car can, you know, at least get back out and uh, cross the checkered flag. Yeah, there's definitely positives to take from it. Thank you. No problem. Yeah, they've got a uh, lot to learn, but they know where the gaps are here. And uh, they've been spotting some of the places. They've got some low-hanging fruit as well yeah. to close to those gaps. It is still seven from eight. They come round by the pits at the moment, but it is nose to tail. Seven car getting those tyres back up to speed. Uh, you'll be, I'm sure, following the Cadillac progress very well here, Harry. <laughs> Not a big fan this weekend. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's one of those things, but I think a lot, a lot of people have seen it now in, uh, in FP2, yeah. But uh, unfortunately, yeah, contact with with us and the GT. You know, the GTs and the prototypes they have to coexist, and uh, unfortunately, on that occasion they didn't. Um, and it came off worse for us. Car damaged and uh, tub tub needed repairing. Harry Tintle with us in the booth. Martin Ham, Graham Goodwin, and Harry. And Harry, you've been you've been in both positions. You've been a prototype driver. You've been a GT driver. And, and it, you're right, they, they do have to coexist, but, you know, it, it is, it's just as difficult being in the quick cars trying to get by as it is in, in the slower cars trying to still race your race, not put yourself in a, in, a, in a position of jeopardy and not get hit by quicker cars from behind. Yeah, and I, and I think ultimately if you can do both, if you can drive GT cars sometimes and also drive prototypes, it makes you better for both because you know what each other is going through. As you, as you correctly say, if you're in a prototype, you want to get past as quick as possible, you've yeah. got a race to win and you're being held up by a slower car. But if you're in the GT car, you've got a, a big beast there. It's a lot heavier, less downforce. You know, you're hustling it around and you've got your race to win as well. So the cars do have to coexist. In general, they always, if there is contact between the two, they generally sort of pin the blame more on the prototype than they do on the on, on the GT, as you see the Ferrari coming back onto yeah, the pit lane. Back here. into the pit lane. And, and with your fans hat on, just having these guys here, just having Ferrari in the field, do you think that gives it like an extra level of excitement yeah of course it does i mean it, 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 you know we all know the story of ford versus ferrari back in the day um you know in the 60s and the, amazing that ferrari is going for outright wins now we're so used to seeing them in the gt class we obviously still have them in the gt class as well but yeah fantastic not only for ferrari but you know all the manufacturers that are in this year and the ones that are coming next year and of course you think of the last time ferrari at the top fight in sports car racing steve queen was making movies yeah, he, he made Le Mans. It was Porsche 917 versus Ferrari. So you're going to be reliving that battle now, 50 years on. Let's hear from the number eight Toyota. Hey, we boxed earlier than them. They tell me why. We thought there would be a loss. Uh, stay behind for the time being, Seb. So keep a close gap. Now, they've, they've changed the engineer on the number eight car. He, you know, uh, the, we don't have that French voice going, Come, Come Seb. Seb. <laughs> but that's, that's so... And again, I was questioning that because the number seven car was stepping a lap earlier. Now the number eight car has stopped a lap earlier than seven, which means two laps earlier than it would have done. Why? Yeah, I mean, who, who, who knows? Some, a lot depends on the team. I'm, Ant might know more, but obviously, if the lead car usually gets the first call on the strategy, um, maybe they've maybe they decided that they wanted to, they could plan the fuel out for the rest of the race, and they just wanted to maintain that track well, position. We, we did hear a long while ago in the stint that the number seven car was saving more than us to the number eight team and they were closing up. I, I, have they found themselves two laps? I mean, that would be astonishing if they have somehow. That's a lot of lift and coast. Just to point out something else, by the way, the fan wall was sent. There was clearly a broken uh, element in the rear of that car and it was sent out with broken something yeah. in the left rear. So Esteban Guerrieri has come straight back in. I'm not surprising at that. But, <laughs> yeah. but that did not seem to be just a, p a puncture there. I was going to ask Harry, by the way, um, you talked about Ford versus Ferrari. We were involved in that battle in GT. How tough are these guys to beat? 
Yeah, of course. It's, it's um, you know, there's so much history there, and but you know, the, the teams are of a very high level, and you know, it's very exciting what Ferrari brought to the prototype class. But in the GT class this year, you know, I, we're, we're racing against um, you know some of the guys who've been in the pro class for many years, like you know Davide Rigion, etc. So um, a lot of those guys that we're used to seeing fighting for pro wins are now in the AM class and just bringing the whole level up. And <laughs> I think the whole level of the championship is just getting higher and higher. And, but it's what makes it so sweet when you do win because you know you're racing at such a high level. And I'm just laughing at that that, that uh, radio message from Seb there. I think sometimes engineers have to have incredibly <laughs> thick skin and, uh, you know, just take it on the chin in the car because sometimes we get a little bit hot-headed out there, but we don't really, really really mean it, you know. Just one final question I want to ask before uh, before Martin finishes up. We've seen you with Jota and success there with, with Nissan, with Ford. Uh, with Proton Multimatic and Mazda and success there. Are you ever going to hold down a job? <laughs> <laughs> the plan is to do it long enough that I never have to get a real one like you have, well, Graham. As, but, uh, uh, yeah. as Terry Wogan always used to say, it's harder to hit a moving target. Thank you. No, I mean, look, I've been very lucky. I've been in some great teams. And obviously, you know, my relationship with Multimatic started with the Ford in 2016. I'm still uh, very much involved with it now. We've got some incredible stuff coming in the future and uh, very much looking forward to a long relationship with them. Can you tell us anything about what's next for Harry Tignall? Uh, yet? I'm going to be doing the full season of WEC, so... Okay. Uh, but I can't promise it's all going to be in the same car. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> a, a moving target is harder to hit. Target, yeah. Well, I listen, it, you know, whenever it comes and however it comes, it, it's going to be great to see that progress. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for the team as well, you know, Proton's always been an ambitious team, always been an ambitious team, and, and they have been mainstays of FIA GT, GT1, World Endurance, and, and yada, 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 almost since the demise of Group C. Yeah. So it's so it's all coming around again, and you know we've, we've now almost got almost got the grandchildren of the original drivers racing. So it's going to be great to see that program start to yeah, start Pro to build. Proton's um, done an amazing job, and their relationship with Monimatic's great. And you know, running four cars this year is amazing. Yeah. Well, let's hear now from Jacques Villeneuve. See what he's got to say. Jacques Villeneuve, the number four, has gone round to the box. Uh, explain what's happened. Uh, we had an issue with, with the suspension. Uh, something gave up and I spun. Luckily, it didn't hit anything, but uh, we're going to try and repair now. Um, get to the end of the race. Is it those bumps? Uh, well, it's the same bumps for everyone. <laughs> so uh, we can't blame it on, on the bumps. Fair enough. Uh, OK, so how has your WEC debut been? Well, we didn't get all the mileage uh, we were wanting, but uh, at least I, I got up to speed and uh, now I understand the car a little bit better, so uh, we can work on, on the rest of the season. Thank you. He, he's becoming very much Happy Jack, isn't he, in, in his uh, maturity. I, I, I'm, I'm liking the 2023 Jacques Villeneuve a lot. You know, they're, they're working hard. They've They've, they've not come in with a, a, a lot of miles under the belt, a lot of preparation under the belt. He's been pretty pretty sanguine about the whole thing. I'm, I'm, I'm liking the attitude. Uh, the other troubles, by the way, to report, it is a 10-second stop and go for the number 51 of France, Andrea Piergridi's contact with the 56, which is the second impact, if you like. I don't know another thing to ask, ask That's Harry. harsh. Yeah. So a very small club that you're part of in a very positive way, which is tall racing drivers is that very few people have driven in every class of the world endurance championship but you've done that yeah it's great i mean um like i was saying earlier i think driving in both gts and prototypes makes you makes you better in both because you understand what each other's going through and when you're in that gt scenario that i'm in now i just feel like i can read the situation in the traffic a lot better and when i'm in the prototype it's a moving chess game at 200 mile an hour, and it, and I just see the pieces moving that little bit slower. Um, having had that experience of the GT, I think it's massively helped me. And Multimatic very keen for me to do as much as I can in both, and uh, and and yeah, it's paying off. You know, we won a couple of races last year with Seb Prio and Christian Reed, and and uh, we were looking really good this weekend. Um, the Porsche is going strong, and as I was saying, like with, with Proton now, we, with the, the the link with with uh, Iron Links, and having four cars, you know, that's four data points, there's four different setup uh, philosophies that we can try, and we've really seen the improvement. You know, the Iron Dames are going great, obviously, it was yeah. such a shame, the um, little mistake and big consequence of that, but uh, I think they would have been right there in the race. I think you know, the 88 car would have been the same, and as, as we can see, you know, the, 
the 77s right there. So uh, I think, um, yeah, that, that team has just got a high, high trajectory and it's going up and up. You're a huge student of the sport. You know, we, uh, all of us talk often about what's going on here and how fantastic this is this year and more to come. How keen are you to get into this top class? Yeah, very keen. I mean, uh, since I stepped out, uh, the car at Petit Le Mans in, in IMSA having, having won the race, you know, I've been looking towards LMDH and hypercar and, and, and which direction that's going in. It's amazing we're here this weekend. You know, I, I remember talking with everyone at Daytona when the announcement came and just to see now like all these manufacturers coming, all the customer cars that are coming and then more manufacturers coming next year as yeah. well. Just everyone actually here in the flesh, seeing this Ferrari, seeing the Porsches. Uh, it's incredible and, and obviously being uh, here on Super Seabring, so. Yeah. And it's great, it for the fans. it's great for both sets of fans, isn't it? Because the IMSA fans won't see this race, but they see it here. We don't get the BMW this year, but we see it here as well. So we get, we get to see like everything. Everything's out there. And, and, and as you say, yeah, more to come. So it, it's just, yeah, super exciting. And then GT becomes GT3. So suddenly, instead of two or three brands, you throw the door open to people that have never been part of WEC, like Mercedes, like Audi, you know, and, and it just, it, it, it's just going to be such an exciting Yeah, time. and I can tell on track as well in the GT car when watching these prototypes, it's a different type of prototype class now. It's not quite the same as it was where super light carrying huge speed through the high speed corners and um, gaining them the lap time that way. You know, these cars are incredible uh, acceleration and uh, but not quite as quick in the corner. So it's a different type of class again now. Yeah. OK, Ali, we have a really hot left rear caliper. I guess you know why. We need to do a lot of lift and coast. We need to do a lot of lift and coast, see if we can bring that down. And that is that left rear brake cooling duct that flew off. They obviously haven't had a chance to replace it properly. And, you know, when, when your car is carrying an injury, H, you know, you know that you've got a baby. At, you, you know, we've got an hour and a half to get through. They did it at the end of last year in Bahrain with a gearbox that only had one gear and sounded like a, a bag of spanners in a washing machine. So they, they know what they've got to do. And, and now it's just in the lap of the gods as to whether they can stop it exploding. Well, well you know what it's like bringing a top class car home with, with braking that's not working. <laughs> I mean, the, the Nissan GTR back in the day yeah, and that concept. Hearing, hearing big lifting coast is required is not really the radio uh, message you want to hear. It, but it's less than ideal. But, but again, it's, it's mileage. They, you know, you look learn these things and it, it makes you stronger. Absolutely, and I think, you know, for Alessandro now, you know, he's in a completely different, like, mental space. It's, it's bringing the car home. It's, yeah. you know, gain the mileage, you know. Um, I think they've had an incredible debut and, and for sure they're very happy where they are and they're going to get stronger. And, and, you know, unfortunately for him, it's a, it's a, it's a Friday afternoon for Rudy and Drive now, but uh, bring it home in one piece and go again in a couple of weeks and, in the Algarve. But the 50 car at the moment sitting in a podium position. We should yeah, 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 so absolutely. A, it is a good day uh, for anybody uh, that uh, follows Ferrari. It's not a great day. They would have preferred to be where they finished in qualifying. Uh, great stuff. So when are we going to hear some news, Harry? What's going to happen next? Yeah, well, um, maybe on Monday <laughs> we might see some stuff coming out, uh, be some pictures and stuff uh, hanging around. There's a reason I haven't uh, flown uh, flown home yet. Um, but uh, yeah, there's some, some stuff coming Monday and then some more stuff hopefully coming. I'm not exactly sure when, maybe May time. Um, but for right now, you know, focusing on the 88, uh, I think, you know, with myself, Ryan and uh, and Zach, you know, uh, we've got a really strong combination. I think we can we can get some wins and some podiums uh, for Proton, and obviously Le Mans is uh, going to be very exciting as well. Um, but yeah, there, there's plenty of stuff coming. Uh, in, in, a, in a few different cars, so very exciting. You're in a good place. We're not going to push smiling. you. Any, we're yeah. not going to push you any further. We're going to say thank you for the moment, uh, Harry Tinker. We're so sorry that you and Ryan and Zach didn't get to be part of this first chapter of seven in the FI World Endurance Championship for 2023. But there is much, much more to come from Harry Tinknell and the 88 crew uh, in all their various endeavours. Uh, we're going to switch around back now to uh, to Ab Davidson and say thank you very much to. Harry Tignall, thanks H. I run 25 minutes to go, and it's not lacked for action, has it? Not always of the welcome kind. No, really hasn't, but you know, that, that's one of the great things about racing is that is that 
just when you think, okay, everything's settled down, we're sort of, okay, this is sort of the way it's going to play out, then it, it unplays itself out in that direction. And for the number seven Toyota now, right up behind this car, the number six uh, Porsche, it's, it's important to get by. When you're Kamui Kobayashi, you're the race leader, your teammate is right up your chuff, you know, you've got to get by, you've got to make the moves, and therein lies just a teeny bit of jeopardy. Into the pit lane is our leader in LMP2, 48 Jota car. Yeah, it's been a good run from them, hasn't it? Since the we lost the 23 car, uh, it's been a great run for the 48 car, I'm sure. And Davidson, you know this team well, the Jota team. Strategy usually completely on point. This is an important part of the team building for this team to prepare for what comes later in hypercar. We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, but it's an important part for Jota, this 48 car coming for just these, we hope, just a couple of races. How important is this team building to prepare for what comes, they hope, in a couple of races' time with the Porsche 963? Well, I mean, to answer your earlier question, Graham, yes, strategy has always been a real strong point of Jota. Um, it's rare that they make mistakes in that department, and I think it's what really not gave them the win, but it was one of the, the points, one of the factors that uh, sent them on their way to that uh, brilliant win in Le Mans last year as well. It's just reading each situation properly under their full course yellows or even the slow zones that we have in Le Mans. And they capitalized on every single situation when it came to strategy. And they've done the same thing today, always made the right calls. And uh, yeah, I mean, the driver crew in the 48s um, with Yifei Ye there as well. He's going to be on board for the whole thing, both yes. in LMP2 and then when they switch to the hypercar later in the year um, with Antonio Felix da Costa, of course. Um, and Will Stevens. Felix and Will Stevens. So Felix da Costa not racing here, but he will be in, in Portimao. And uh, it will be Stevens that steps out for that one. This but I think it's really important to keep that, that car crew and more importantly, the team sharp racing we've spoken about this all day long the difference between a test team becoming a race team they very much are a race team and uh, they don't want to lose that edge at all by just treading water waiting for the hypercar delivery they're here racing lmp2 because they want to stay race sharp well the yep. impact that team's made over the decade and more that we've seen them in top class racing we've got you as an ex uh, Jota uh, driver and successful at it harry still sitting at the back uh, doing what their drivers and not driving do on instagram i've no doubt whatsoever uh, but of course with winning form with with jota as well what you know it, it is one of those teams with real potential to create another slice of history it's great it is fantastic to have these factory teams but what will make this fly moving forward is teams like jota finding a way in it's funny in, in modern day racing we've become accustomed to uh, privateer teams not really standing a chance against the the manufacturers and uh, i've got a feeling that jota's going to uh, going to turn the tables there they're going they're going to they're going to buck the trend, aren't they? Yeah, well, it, it was another J team that really started doing that, Yoast. Yeah. yeah. You know, Yoast beat the factory Porsches in the Group C era twice at Le Mans in consecutive years. Uh, not For the least. new viewers yeah, of yeah, the yeah. World Endurance Championship, do you want to explain who Yoast Well, Ro were Reinhold or? Yoast was a, a private team owner and, like, Franz Conrad, Walter Brun, like Obermeyer, uh, like a, a, a Richard Lloyd, like John Fitzpatrick. You could go to Porsche, as you can now with the GT car, and buy a race-winning car, because they were all race-winning cars, because 962s and 956s won races. In Group C, privateers could buy the same car that the Rothmans factory team was running. And when a new car came along, as soon as they were manufactured, they were available for purchase. So Conrad won ahead of the factory teams. Fitzpatrick won ahead of the factory teams. Richard Lloyd built his own aluminium monocoque chassis and won ahead of the factory teams. Uh, Reinhold Joost won ahead of the factory team. And, and that's what made, what made Group C great wasn't Rothmans Porsche, it was Porsche selling customer cars. Yes, there were all the other cars as well, you know, and Lancia particularly really took the battle to Porsche, but 
when you've got a dozen 956s or 962s on the grid, whether here in the US, in the, in the Cam Slim, Camel Imps or GTP, which, by the way, is why they don't call them hypercars, they call them GTPs, or whether it's in World Endurance, World Sports Car, WSPC, or whatever, it, the different names it had over the years. When you've got a dozen Porsches on the grid, Porsche are likely to win, whether it's factory entered or privateer. And that's the deal here. The more teams can sell a privateer car, and you're looking at places like like Porsche, like Lamborghini, I think will be I think very might, keen. I think they'll be second to the marketplace. I think they'll be very keen to sell customer cars. And, and you know, and, and people like Cadillac Racing would be, would love to see privately, I mean, like they have in, you know, <clears throat> the Wayne Taylors and, and, and all of those guys, they're all looking for deals for hypercar. They're all looking for deals for GTP cars, ongoing, and more teams that are currently running LMP2 or LMP3 machinery in a year or two have got that ambition to step up. I mean, we're looking at Proton doing exactly the same from a, 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 a near 30-year GT racing base. Yep. They've got the ambition to step up, and, and that's what it that's what it produces. I think there's, there's two things to say about this one. One is, there's no doubt in my mind, you look at the commercial package that Chotra pulled together, I think it's a genius piece of work Absolutely. from that team there and the people behind them. Um, they will be looking forward to two things, winning and being taken off the Christmas card list of Penske. Without a <laughs> a doubt. They, will want, they will see target one as beat Penske Porsche. Um, yeah. That's what they will see. The second thing is they're coming from a position that really does give us a very interesting platform. LMP2, we've seen some epic battles uh, this weekend, as we saw all through last year and all the way back. What makes those teams stand out? What makes those teams stand out is their standard of preparation, their standard of engineering, the standard of work and strategy, and the standard of work in pit stops. They are going head to head with their peers and winning. Yep. That's exactly where you want to be if you're coming into a hypercar class with cars that should be coming on a stable platform. There is something wrong. I'm sorry, something is not done. What was that? S something's wrong with the car. He didn't, yeah. he didn't specify what it was. Uh, but, uh, it's another calm said moment. Uh, and, and uh, you know, <sighs> nothing is ever over until it is over. And, and of all the teams, of course, you know, we always say this, Toyota have taught us that perhaps more than anybody else. United's leaders are in the pit lane. Phil Hansen is out. I think Philippe Albuquerque probably got back in. And that means that Will Stevens cycles back to the top in this car. This is now the LMP2 leader. And again, final thought on LMP2 becoming hypercar teams. You have got four teams in there who absolutely without question, and I defy anybody to argue it, Jota, Prema, WRT, United could absolutely 100% without question run a winning hypercar and without Signatech. question. And Signatech. Yeah, no, I, oh yes, of course, yeah, they're so back in there, there now, of course, yes. So, and, and of those, the only one of them that don't have a confirmed programme within the next year are United. That's the only one of those teams that doesn't have a confirmed programme. And by the way, there is another team that's in there that does have a confirmed programme. Yeah, that's Vector. Which is Vector. Yeah. So um, if the 11 full season cars we've got, we have teams representing three of them that don't yet have confirmed hypercar programmes. Uh, yeah. That's how quickly this marketplace is moving on. Yeah, and, and, and the faster people can build customer cars, the better for racing in all corners of the globe it's going to be. A, a rising tide floats all boats, and, and, and it will work on both sides of the Atlantic, across the globe. It will, it will boost the lower categories as well, because we'll see current LMP2 teams stepping up to hypercar, which will open up the ground for new LMP2 teams, and they will see what, you know, if they're running in LMP3 or GT, they'll see the ambitious moves of teams with a bit more experience uh, ahead of them, and they will start to move that. I mean, and you, then you start to think of teams like TF Sport. I mean, I know Tom Ferrier has made, made a lot of very successful seasons out of GT racing. Yeah. He's in the but, LMP2 but, market as well, remember? But, but so had WRT. Should and and you're right, he is in the LMP2 market with, with Racing Team Turkey. And there might be amb ambition there from the Turkish money that's going behind that. Why wouldn't there be? Um, two things to mention. That gap we heard uh, Seb 
uh, Boemi's tone on the radio, being unhappy with something. That gap is coming out. The gap that was coming down and is now getting a response from Antonio Fuoco as Earl Bamba was closing in <laughs> under five seconds to the third place Ferrari, but it's a fastest first se uh, second sector rather of the car's race for the 50 uh, in response to the attack from uh, from Cadillac. Yeah, we heard from uh, we heard from Cadillac earlier on, didn't we? Saying that their strength is the tyre preservation of that car, and as we get later into the race um, stints, you know they can they can afford to eat them out a bit longer and uh, you know those six and a half sets of tires you, you get to the point where you you've, you've burned through the tires in the hotter part of the day because they take you know they, they're, they're wearing quicker and you're, you're quite happy to throw tires at it to, to solve the problem but I think I feel like when it gets to this point of the race you're really trying to elongate some of those stints and what you do on your tyres so maybe the Cadillac's going to start coming into its own towards the end of this race today. We're starting to see some blue sector times and lap times appear back on the timing screen for the first time in a little wee while. Fastest lap of the race for that car for Mirko Bartolotti in the second place number 63 Prima Racing Gorica closing the gap under 30 seconds to the uh, lead car 48 from Hertz Team Jota. 93 Peugeot has now moved ahead of the Floyd Van Wall. Uh, and the Floyd Van Wall is in the back of the garage. Yeah, it's there in the garage because the number 93 car, although it had a delay, has had less of a delay than the Floyd Van Wall car now has. So that's actually the first place that this, this Peugeot has picked up. Yeah. But pretty much since the beginning of the race. First place in class. Um, with 93 now yes. up and amongst the lead cars in LMP, sorry, in GTE AM. That, um, that is low hanging fruit. That, yes. now the, the real question for them is do they, how far behind 15 laps, 16 laps behind no. the 51 Ferrari? Unless the, unless the 51 car has another major problem. And if it's got no left rear braking, you know, 90 minutes or 60, 72 minutes remaining, well. it might have another major problem. There's Carlos Tavares, uh, the head of Stellantis Group that is the owner of Peugeot, Automobile Peugeot, and a keen racer in his own oh, right yeah. as well. I'm pretty good as well. Raced at Le Mans, he's raced support he's races at Le Mans, hasn't he? I don't races. think he's raced in the overall Rated 24 hours. Sure, at the Le Mans Classic, he's raced the Nürburgring 24s, he's raced at Dubai 24 yes. hours. I've seen him at N24, definitely. He's a very keen endurance racer yeah. in his own right. And in fact, um, I think he, he raced with the brand manager of the Alfa Romeo brand at um, uh, the Nürburgring 24, I'm trying to think there's three <laughs> serious Stellantis executives in a car there. No problem for me to the second turn. Yeah, copy that, Paul. I was going to ask. So, plan would be that you stay in with four qualifiers. You confirm you're good? I think he, he'll be good with that. Four qualifiers, no dramas. Uh, and that's and that's Diresta offering up before they even get to that. You know, and, and that'll have been at the end of a conversation. There was, OK, Paul, we've got five laps to go. Then the plan is, uh, for, yeah, box and fuel and we're going to have tyres. Yeah, OK, I'm OK to stay in. Yeah, 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 I'm OK to stay yeah, in. Yeah, things get easier as well for the drivers uh, in this part of the race when the sun starts going down and the temperatures start going down and things get easier inside the cockpit. But uh, in saying that, there is air conditioning inside that Peugeot. Um, I was lucky enough to have a, a tour around the factory a couple of weeks ago. And uh, as the Vector Sport car peels off into the pits here. And yeah, <laughs> it was one of those things that's remained since their previous, um, the 908 project, yeah. uh, the previous time that they're in top line sports car racing. And uh, they decided to keep air conditioning as, as part of their package. Toyota don't have it, interestingly. So they see it's like another part of the car to go wrong. And you would, if it did go wrong, you'd just be carrying around extra weight. But uh, Peugeot, you know, thankfully, there is a, one team out there at least looking after the, uh, yeah. the nut that holds the steering wheel. Let's, let's quantify that a little bit. What that will do is it will bring the cockpit temperature down from well, what's the ambient now, sort of just below 30, let's say high 20s, let's say it's 25. It'll bring the cockpit temperature down from below, th from a 35 to maybe around 30. So, you know, it, it's not 
19 degrees like it would be if you were driving around downtown Miami. So it, it, it helps. I know, it's still no hot question. in there. Yeah, don't get yeah. me wrong, it's still hot in there. Actually, uh, funny, I was talking to Christian Reed and I said, what's it going to be like? And he said, ah, no problem for us. We just put on the air con to four, TC to seven, we are fine. <laughs> he was, you know, he, I, I, and obviously in the GT cars, there is that rule about temperature above ambient. Hello. Don't go so... Oh. Ah, trying to make way for the car coming down the inside. Yeah, so that was the number two and the number five Porsche putting a lap, the Corvette putting another lap on number five car and nearly bounced the GR Asia uh, Porsche. That, that would nearly have been a second car, a Porsche, off the road as a legacy of a move by a Cadillac. But in that case, it wouldn't have been the Cadillac that touched the Porsche. It would have been the, uh, the, the, the GT Porsche. It would have been a Porsche that touched well, the Porsche. Well, like Kevin Estra was saying in the in the uh, number six Porsche earlier on, you know, there's such wide cars in this narrow circuit. And in that yeah. corner, three into one doesn't go. Yeah. Well, Let's see if Sebastian Wemmy has calmed down any. I cannot even drive in the traffic like that. It's a uh, feedback uh, losing to Brendan everywhere. We don't have any specific places. We'll continue looking. Not the message you want to hear. You're losing <laughs> out to your te teammate. And obviously, Brendan shares the car with Buemi. And, uh, and Buemi had the speed earlier on in the race. He was comfortably in the lead when he was fighting Mike Conway. Yep. And uh, so it's not like he's forgotten how to drive. There must be something that's happened to that number eight Toyota and uh, they can't see it in the data. All they can see is that he's losing speed everywhere yeah. compared to the last time that Brendan was in the car. Weird that they're talking about Brendan because he, the last driver to drive that car was Hirokawa. And I would have thought you'd, as a compare, you, you'd be looking at the comparison between somebody in more relative conditions compared to when Brendan was in the car. Mm. It was much hotter, but strange one. Mike Conway looks uh, cool, calm and collected. Ready, ready for it, isn't he? Uh, Will Stevens, by the way, has responded to the pace of Mirko Bortolotti and puts in the fastest lap of the number 48 race, and it's a quick yeah. lap as well, 151.8. Quicker still, though, Oliver Rasmussen in the other Jota car, both the Jota cars, on a tear right now, 151.630, 28 car in sixth place. Could it be that Jota have been leading for four hours and still have a tyre advantage? That, you know, that, again, we go back to talking about why those LMP2 teams could so easily run hypercars, because they are good at what they understand racing. They get it. They know how to make the car work. And, and everybody is pointing fingers at Jota going, those guys are just better than us again, damn it. You know, United are saying it, WRT is saying it. Uh, you know, I doubt United are saying it. Uh, I think United will think themselves yeah, very, very, very unlucky. I, I, yeah. don't, I don't think United think they had a faster car. I think the 23 car was... Like it, no, it, I mean, it was, with this but race I today. don't think they thought they had a faster car than Jota were putting on the grid. You know, all the oh, way no, through free practice and all the way through qualifying, everybody was sort of going, so to just have a little something. But it didn't translate in the race, and it was no. clearly going the 23s well, way. And again, all of those early interruptions, and we expected a lot more through the race than we've, we've sort of actually had. Those early interruptions, it was, it's like at Le Mans last year, when the Jutta car got that little bit of a lead, and then suddenly there was the safety car, so they got a safety car ahead, and then they got another safety car ahead. Then suddenly it was like three quarters of a lap ahead, and they never lost it. And and part of that is, is, is Le Mans choosing you that the, the bad luck doesn't come your way that negates the good luck you got earlier. You know, one, one door shuts, another opens and all that stuff. But but part of that is is that they were, they were just relentless, absolutely relentless. And it was, you know, you you know what it uh, what it's like, and, and I don't, but when you have days that just work like that, well, you can see, you yeah, know. I mean, like Conway sitting there. I, I know that feeling, just getting ready. You're in the lead. The car looks good. The last time you were in it, it's feeling great. You, there's something wrong with your teammate's car. And then it's that moment when you can get in, you can just enjoy it because everything's yeah. flowing. Sure, you still have to concentrate, but it's just for those moments, you, you're just loving driving the car and you can drive in a relaxed way. Um, most of the time, it's, it's so tense. Notice, by the way, the right mirror is missing from that 54 after the clash with the 51. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, 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 you know, he's got a couple of tyre scuffs on it, but that's actually about the legacy of that of that clash. It didn't even have to come in for damage. We're looking at this car, uh, I'm, I'm sure, for several reasons, one of which is very pretty. Uh, but uh, there is a battle underway here, and that is Rahel Fry is taking chunks of time out of Francesco Castellacci. This is a battle now for fifth place in uh, GTE Am as the Iron Dames car continues to climb back up the order. And we're circling ourselves through GTE Am, sixth place, is that uh, is the Iron Dames car. Fifth place is the 54. We've just seen Daniel Serra th fourth place uh, for car guys in the Kessel Racing Ferrari. And then Ulis De Pau. Again, yep. now, not a name we've said this weekend, but again, a new name to the World Endurance Championship. Yeah, this is Mikkel Pedersen, now aboard the number 77 car. He's new addition this year for Proton Competition. Second place. And uh, a lap down at the moment on Nicky Katzberg is pushing on in the next car. I'm sure we'll see uh, once we've looked at the 77 with the two lights on the door there. Another good race from Dempsey Proton Racing. I know we were saying that the uh, number 51 Ferrari is carrying the damage. They're having to do lots of lift and coast and it, yeah, just make it through to the end of the race. His last lap time was a 1 minute 50.2. Yeah. So he's, yeah. he's not that much slower than the Toyotas out in front. 49.3 was the last lap from uh, that, Kobayashi. That's, that's Alessandro Pierre Guidi taking it easy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's a different level of taking it easy. Brendan Hartley uh, is suiting up as we just uh, shifted from an in car briefly with Nicky Katzberg leading GTM. 18th overall. Uh, that car with a reasonable amount of attrition elsewhere. The Van Wall, by the way, is back on track. Strange, I thought that uh, Buemi was just going to take it to the end in the car number eight. Strange to see Brendan getting ready to jump back in. Maybe they want it to go quicker. Ouch. Heading towards the final hour in Sebring. Eight hours is the maximum race duration of the 1,000 miles of Sebring. Will Stevens is our LMP2 leader. And behind him, Mirko Bortolotti and Ferdi Habsburg. And behind Habsburg, Philip Albuquerque on a fly. So this is Habsburg, Albuquerque just five seconds behind him. Then 10 seconds back to Albert Costa and another seven seconds back to Oliver Rasmussen. So there's still a few tight gaps in the LMP2 field. Yeah, and it's the fastest lap of the race so far for Felipe Albuquerque. He's now under five seconds back from Ferdi Habsburg. Took eight tenths out last time. It's the fastest lap of the race again for Oliver Rasmussen. And he's trying to close a seven second gap to Albert Costa for fifth position. So there's push going on here. Kevin Estra, by the way, on pit lane the number six uh, yeah uh, Porsche and Rasmussen going two tenths of a second quicker than Albuquerque so Oliver Rasmussen starting to really fly in that car here yeah. is our leader though Will Stevens circuits just getting to that nice sweet spot where it starts to where you can still see your visibility is still good enough but the temperature's dropping enough, so this track starts to get faster and faster. So I'm not surprised to see some of the uh, the blue sectors, that means the personal best sectors, popping up on our timing screens. There is the six car. It's not going to be Porsche Penske Motorsports day today. They're currently running fifth and sixth, yeah. but uh, they've had their troubles. That was uh, Christensen out and uh, Fred Makowicki in. Sorry, that's, uh, that was number five. No, so it's Kevin Astra that was in car six. I think he stayed aboard. Yeah. So but, but Fred McAwicki has changed with uh, Christensen. He oh, he has as well, yeah, yeah, yeah Fred yeah. Macca. So getting very low, low now, and you can see there right in his eyes as it goes down at sunset, just down the road. So he's got the dark tinted visor on, and he'll lower that like a sunshade, not all the way down like a single seater racer, because he doesn't need to keep the wind out. But uh, it will help. It, it, it's like an adjustable sunscreen that he can bring down, um, and, and just so it sometimes just so it casts a shadow out rather than actually looking through it, looking like the peak of a cab. I think I actually spotted that he's actually taped over the visor. He did. Yeah. Yes. So um, yeah. I hope he doesn't run it fully down because yeah. things will get very interesting. <laughs> well, uh, we we saw in qualifying, didn't we, that somebody was asking for a bit of extra tape, uh, Alessandro Pierre Guidi, yeah. and he had a strip of black tape. Yes, he has across the bottom of the visor so that he could, uh, you know, alter that. Lesson from a husky. That's what it is. The uh, the black rings around their eyes. Anti glare. 
You what? Oh, Black Ranger on the Isle of Husky. It's anti glare device. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Is that right? Yes, yeah, completely true. Exactly the same with the giant panda for when they're in the in the frozen north. <laughs> Hope you're listening, Oscar. Daddy misses you. <laughs> Into the final hour. <laughs> final hour in Sebring. After seven hours of racing, we have a Toyota 1-2 with Ferrari's pole sitting number 50 car in third place. But question marks possibly over the number eight car, which is now 10 seconds, not two seconds behind the sister car number seven that leads this race. You can see in the front of the car quite a lot of sand and rubber marks and all sorts of muck and debris all over the place. Actually, one of the things I've noticed about all the Cadillac pit stops is that, that they have somebody go in either side along just above the floor. There's, as you can see in the Toyota, the cutout there. It's not quite so obviously cut out in the, Ferrari, in the, uh, in the Cadillac, but it still drafts all the air out from underneath the front of the car. And they're constantly in there at every stop, pulling out bits of rubber debris which this circuit is uh, is very well known, although it's it's low abrasion, isn't it? It's a low energy circuit for tyres, but uh, there's a lot of tyres and a lot of, of cars racing on this track. So uh, it's there's a lot of pickup going around. Let's hear from Toyota's Jose Maria Lopez, one of the men leading this race. Jose Maria Lopez into the final hour and it's been running well for the seven. Uh, yeah, um, still one hour to go here. It's, uh, it's always tough, so it's going to be a long hour. But yeah, happy with the with the job. They did my teammates, the whole team. Um, I think we did a very solid race. Uh, putting behind what happened in qualifying and uh, doing a nearly until now a perfect race. So we'll see. It's uh, so far a great result for the team. Uh, and in my side, happy. Uh, was an easy to jump in the car after the the crash straight away. Uh, I have to say it took a few laps to, to get the confidence back, but I did a, a good job and I'm happy for that and uh, we'll see what happens. Well done. And um, one more pit stop with driver change coming up. Yeah, yeah, just uh, yeah, in five, five, four laps, yeah, should be the, the last pit stop for us. Thank you. And that'd be Mike Conway getting in the car. Thank you. Right, so we are getting into that, uh, that area where we can have to start wondering whether or not people can get to the end on the fuel they've got. Now, I was, I was... Remember, there's... 57 minutes in about another... Did you say another five minutes or another five laps? Five laps, that would make a bit, OK, so that's 10 minutes. So that brings them down to still nearly 50 minutes on a tank of fuel. Yeah, but remember, they were doing an hour and nine with the, the, um, at the start of the race with the cautions that we had. Yeah, I think it's getting close now for the hypercars, but the uh, the LMP2s will be doing around about 40 to 43 minutes of okay. fuel burn in this, okay. this track. Hour seven of the Sebring Thousand Miles that started in beautiful, sunny Florida sunshine. Roger Penske among those who've brought cars to this grid as Hypercar really starts to come of age. Carlos Tavares with the Peugeot crew and the tantalizing prospect of the Centenary Le Mans coming up just three months from now. Away they went with Ferrari leading the field on its first day in big school. The Ferrari Hypercar qualified on pole position and nearly went first and third. But the second of the Toyotas robust in its defense in the first couple of corners. Two formation laps because the lack of tire warm is now in the category. But early on, and not even completing the formation laps, the number 94 Peugeot in for gearbox problems. Safety car was scrambled after five laps. Big crash for Lewis Perez Compank in the Ferrari and third Blue in the P1 GT class. He was OK, but the car was destroyed. And that started a fuel schedule stagger among some of our categories. Toyota worked their way into first and second as the Peugeot headed back behind the wall. More dramas for Paul De Resta in the 94 car, and then a puncture for the Oman Racing Aston Martin, costed a couple of laps against his rivals. Porsche versus Cadillac was the story behind the front-running 
uh, hypercars of Toyota and Ferrari. Glickenhaus in the fray as well, an 11 car hypercar field was soon reduced as Glickenhaus were the first big retirement. Their engine crying enough. And then the runaway leader in GTM, the Iron Dames car, Rahul Frey at the wheel, running off the road, ripping the bottom out of the car and costing them the lead of the race. The 93 Peugeot ran into the back of the Floyd Van Wall number four car. On its debut, it was running flawlessly, but then got hit. And the 23 United Autosports LMP2 leader running away at the head of the class came to a grinding halt, handing the lead to number 48 Hertz Jota car. Porsche versus Ferrari, a battle that has been waiting 50 years to be rejoined, was as close as ever. Trouble for the 51 car, caught out by the 54 GT car, we think trying to come into the pits and then clattered into a GT Porsche. They had damage, lost time coming back to the pits, there was more full course yellows and a penalty to serve as well. Corvette leading in GT in GTE Am, in LMP2, it is the 48 Jota car, and it is a Toyota 1-2 with the number seven car, 12 seconds clear at the head of the field. So we're in the final hour here in Sebring. Toyota 1-2, just 11 and a half seconds between them last time round. Ferrari still on for a podium in third, unless Cadillac have a tyre battle winning card up their sleeve, and they think they might have. Then the Porsches in fifth and sixth, and then our LMP2 category. Hertz Team Joe to the 48, a long way clear of the Prema United and Inter Europol battle with the second Jota car. Our GT class is being led by the Corvette, the number 33 car that nearly came pole from Dempsey Proton and Kessel Racing. You've got Corvette, Porsche, Ferrari in the top three. And in the retirements is the Richard Mill Racing Team car, crashed by Lewis Perez Compact, is the Glickenhaus that had engine failure, and United Autosports had a total electrical failure. Both of our Peugeots are back running again, and it is the uh, number 35 Alpine that is the only other car that has not made it through so far. We have got a race in our hands for the podium, guys. Absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> you, I think yeah, you were just about, you looking at the street, yeah. the same as me. Three and a half seconds, El Bamba's been chipping away that time to Antonio Fuoco in the number 50 Ferrari. And so uh, things are going to get exciting towards the end of this race between those two hypercars. Yeah, 3.4 seconds played 5.7 about four or five laps ago as we get into the final hour and all the focus is on what's achievable in those last 52 minutes. The gap continues to hover around 11 to 10 seconds between Seb Buemi and Kamui Kobayashi now and the two Toyotas out in front so um, I don't know if the problems have, have gone away for Buemi but uh, that gap certainly stabilised. Absolutely. Looking now for GTE and in hypercar, final stops. Next stops will be final stops for those teams in routine terms. We've got another 10 minutes or so before we get that window for LMP2. But it's all coming together nicely. Stories of the race, gentlemen, have been faultless from the Totas once again. It shows, they've shown the incoming talent where the bar is. They really have, you know, we, we said it before the, the start of the race that yes, although they were beaten in qualifying and you know, we expected Ferrari to be fast, deliver good lap times, they certainly did that in qualifying, but we never had any doubt that Toyota operationally were gonna be the class of the field. I mean, if they weren't, there's no excuse. They've been here for 10 years now doing this. And, uh, you know, it's, there's no surprise to see them out in front with a completely trouble-free race. I am impressed by what has been the reliability of all the new field. No reliability dramas for the Cadillac, no reliability dramas for the Porsche, no reliability dramas for the Ferrari. They've, they've come from other places. Cadillac stopped first. They're the first to blink in the Ferrari Cadillac battle. I think they can get third. home from here. I think they can get home from here. They better be able to because the earlier they stop, the more 
likelihood there is that they might be at a disadvantage to Ferrari in that battle for third. Again, clearing all that gunk out of the air ducting there. Let's hear what the 50 team have got to say about it all. What's the state of your tires? Do you think you can triple? Gap behind is still the same, 5.8, 5.6. You think you can triple? If they don't change tires, we might want to keep these to keep track position. Oh, no way. Copy, copy. And that's why the Corvette team were looking quite re oh, Corvette, Cadillac team were looking quite relaxed because they knew that Ferrari had gone to the tire locker more frequently early in the race when it was really hot than they had. And so Caddy know that they've got a fresh tire advantage. So, so here even he comes into the know, pits. Now we didn't see whether Cadillac took four tires. We, we will have off. to watch this though it was to a, see if Ferrari do. It was a four tire stop time, 134. So one minute and 34 seconds on pit lane from the Cadillac. That is a four tire stop. Now then, Sebastian Buemi, is he going to get out? Yes, he is. Brendan Hartley is in for the final stint to try and win this for the number eight Toyota team. So Antonio Fuoco stays in. <laughs> Can you triple? Are you kidding me? Was, well, as soon as, was his answer, wasn't it? As soon as I heard that message from the engineer, I looked at you two in my band uh, <laughs> in, in sh absolute <laughs> shock <laughs> because I thought there's well, no way that can happen. Well, now, now, because they've not raced here before, because they don't have the knowledge of how the track is going to change, it's, an, it's not an informed decision. It's based on what's happened so far, can you? What they don't know is what the track does in the next hour. I mean, I don't, you do, but 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 people like Jota will and people like Toyota really will. Do That's they have left slow side stop. only? Yeah, slow, slow stop on the left rear of that uh, number 50 Ferrari there. So is that a full set? Or it, was one, left set? it was 1 minute 34 on pit lane for the Cadillac. They were about 2.7 seconds back before that pit stop. Where is the caddy now? Something's a bit smoky at uh, turn 16. Where is the Cadillac? It's that time of day. That's quite possibly barbecue. Uh, Cadillac is at turn 15 now. And so don't they've forget, picked up time. Don't forget the number eight car is on cold tyres and the Cadillac is not. Five seconds quicker on pit lane for the Ferrari. Cadillac goes by and number seven car is in the pit lane. So this is the race leader. Final stop now. And a driver change to Mike Conway. He was bouncing up and down on the balls of his feet a little earlier, ready to get into the car. Well, let's catch up with our race leaders in LMP2. It's Hertz Team Jota. Yiffy Ye is with Louise Beckett. Let's hear from him now. Yiffy Ye, your first time here with us in WEC, your first time in America. And it's been a great trip for you so far in the 48 Jota. Yeah, this truck is so challenging, so many bumps. You have to respect every corner. You can't just push hard and try to, you know, think there's a plan B with runoff area. This race so far has gone extremely well for us. My teammates have done a brilliant job. The team has executed very well. Right now we are a bit offset with strategy uh, compared to the second car Prima. So. Yeah, it's still exciting to know. We don't know where we'll finish in the race, but we just try to do give, give our best and see where we end up. How much are you liking driving the LMP2s? I think we all wanted to drive already the LMP8 this round, but uh, yeah, we don't have the car yet, so we try to stay still fit in the race, and yeah, we are leading LMP2, so everything is going well, and we are preparing ourselves uh, competitively for the LMP8 program later on this season. We look forward to it, thank you. Thank you so much. Porsche factory driver Yiffy Yi and Light Ann Davidson, <coughs> a man who knows to fear the last lap. Of, yeah, he was that driver, wasn't he, he a few was years ago? He was that driver. In WRT, wasn't yes. he? Broke down on the last lap yeah. at Le Mans when they were in the lead. When, when they were 1-2 on oh. their debut at Le Mans. And he had a comfortable margin. And behind him, Robin Frines was desperately, don't forget Frines, their air jacks had failed about two hours from the end of the race, and they were having to lift the car up with a, an inflatable bag, changing one or the other axle each of the times. They had 
an engine problem and a gearbox problem. The car was overheating, it was basically falling apart, and Tom Blomqvist was coming wailing up behind him for Jota, and they nearly hit the flag guy at the line as they won in LMP2. So, yeah, uh, Yiffy Yee and WRT have got quite some history there in, in uh, LMP2. A couple of things to note, by the way, about the two Toyotas. It is still the seventh of the eighth. The gap is now 23 seconds. Yeah. Why? Because the outlap for Brendan Hartley was a 3.25 compared to a 3.14 for Mike Conway. That's likely to be more to do with traffic than it is to do with any other factor. They also lost, what is that, nine seconds in the pits. So Brendan Hartley on pit lane for one minute and 37 seconds. Uh, Mike Conway on pit lane for one minute and 28. So that has been a big hit to the hopes of the number eight car. The only way that could possibly go the other way is whether or not they put four fresh tyres on. It's four tyres we're hearing from the Cadillac yeah. in their pursuit of, we know, because we heard it, a Ferrari effort that is short on tyre options. 28 is in and 48 is in. Both Jota cars in the pits at the same time. Of course, 48 came in about a minute and a bit ago, so it'll be, and it has already left before the 28 arrives, so that stacking works very nicely for them. On board with the 63 Leads. Prema racing car, it is now the race leader, but still owes us a stop. Indeed, so uh, Hurst team Jota's Will Stevens is out. I think they will need a splash, won't they? They will need a splash. Who, Jota? Yes. Yeah, OK, may well be. 51 is in, this should be its final stop for Ferrari. And this car still in seventh place in the hypercar class, although it is barely uh, in amongst the LMP2 field in terms of overall position. Yeah, and I think they're the sister car, the number 50 of Fuoco, is starting to pull away now quite comfortably from El Bamba. Uh, I think that Ferrari on fresh tyres has definitely got the pace over the Cadillac. So I think that uh, earlier threat from Bamba is not really going to materialise now that uh, they took new tyres as well for this final stint. Well, but how long do that, does that edge last? I think, <laughs> uh, I think at least for a stint. I think it's yeah. in the second stint on the Ferrari where they really start to uh, to lose performance, particularly at the rear of the car. Well, whatever else, this is their, this is their first prototype race. The Ferrari team are, are you can see that they've got experience. You know, it's it's not. Uh, it's not. It's their first race with this car. It's their first race here with this car. First race anywhere with this car. But they're drawing on a lot of experience. You know, they're running a good team strategy. They're running a good format. Okay, there's been a couple of driving errors, a couple of you know little new team errors. But again, it looks like they got a quick car. It actually looks like they got a reliable car as well. They just don't know how to race it yet. Uh, for anyone looking there, that number eight car of Brendan Hartley overtaking the Iron Dames car, and it was pretty much exactly where uh, Pierre Guidi had placed his car when there was contact, but the Iron Dames car was on the racing line the whole way through because they weren't planning on coming into the pits yeah, yeah. and the move was done successfully. So I, I think it's a harsh penalty for uh, for, for what the, the 51... Well, he didn't get penalised for hitting 54. Know, he got still... penalised for spinning backwards after being knocked off well, into was, the other yeah, car. So control. It's like there's nothing. Well, he didn't, uh, you know, no, why I, I, penalise yeah. someone? They spent such a long time in the pits anyway. I, I don't agree with that penalty. Um, uh, you mentioned a little while ago, just a moment ago, the pace of the 50 car, pace of the two car. Two car now is getting those tyres uh, uh, up to temperature yep. and is taking time out of the Ferrari again. Taking that, a second out of the Ferrari yeah, on the last lap. And it's it's it, that pace has come on that last lap. It's under seven seconds again. Next couple of laps are going to be really interesting. This is going to be interesting. We just saw Michelle Gatting watching from the pit lane. The Iron Dames car now with or within almost two seconds of the Iron Lynx car. Who's in the yellow machine? The Cariello. Picariello that's, that's versus Michelle Gatting. That this is, is going to be very interesting. That's quite a fight. 63 that comes is going to be a big battle. For uh, what will be, I would guess, this is going to be their final stop. They should be able to stretch it from here. So I 63 said, I, with the hands of Mirko Bertolotti comes in from the lead. Be a good, strong run from this squad. Yeah. Mirko Bertolotti with Dorian Pan and Danny Kvyat. Pretty fault free from them. 22 and goes to the to the lead, and it's like it's a pickup crew. None of them raced with with any of the other members of the team 
or indeed with Prema in LMP2 last year. So, I mean, it's a brand new lineup put together. They've, they've batted really well. 34 comes in from third place in LMP2. It's been a good run from into Europol here, you know. Yes, it really has. And, you know, if you'd looked down that, uh, that, that uh, entrance to start with, I'd be blunt, I don't think you'd have put them in the, uh, in the basket for a top five finish, but they've executed well. Again, two of the three drivers, the two pros, were not in that car last year. Yep. The only remaining driver from last year is Kubisch Mihovsky. Yeah. And, and actually, for Inter Europol, there's been no dramas, no incidents, and most importantly, no mistakes from the driver or from the crew. And, and, and that's part of it, isn't it? You know, you can have as fast a car as you like. If you're fumbling the ball in the pit lane, you're going to be back in to serve the penalty time after time. There will be people watching the race and thinking, oh, Toyota again. You can't mess with excellence. You can't. You can't look at what they're doing here and be see, see anything other than something to admire. And it, what it shows now is the utter excellence that's come in to challenge them now knows what they've got to well, do. I, I read comments before when Toyota are winning quite comfortably with no competition. It's first easy. First year. Is it, you wait, you watch, if Porsche were there, if Porsche were still well, there, they'd be, well, yeah. They are here, yeah. and look where they are. Well, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, and actually you, you summed it in perhaps the best way. Is they've been here for 10 straight years. That's why they're so good at what they're doing, because every year they've just got better and better and better. And sometimes they haven't had the best car, and sometimes they have. And they may not have the best car now, but it's right there in terms of overall performance, and they use it better. And I think... What really served them well is that they were there for a whole season running a hypercar they had made, they had manufactured, you know, the engine, the chassis, you name it, had a whole season to iron out all of the imperfections. This time last year, I said it before, the car was bouncing around all over yep. the place. It yes. had terminal one yep. steer. The drivers were bitterly unhappy with the car, arm pumped, wrestling with the steering wheel for all it was worth getting out sweating more than back in the LMP1 days, how they used to. And you come here now and the car is completely different. Yeah, and that's if, because they've had a whole year running it on every track that we revisit this year. If they brought that car here now, I'm not sure they'd be leading the race. No, no. I, I agree. I'm yeah. really not sure they'd be leading the race because it, because it was so much hard work. But again, you're right, you know, they were incumbents when the rules were formed and they went Right for it, straight away. Right, we're we're staying. We're we're going to do this. Thank God we can you know, we can move on from LMP1 where we are the you know last man standing, and we can be at the vanguard of the new dawn. And they have, and they were, and they they've won another world championship and another Le Mans and a bunch more races. But most importantly, again after a decade of racing, they've ironed out the mistakes and the balance imperfections of, of what the car had. Yep. So apparently they Correct. worked very hard with the front end performance of that car, particularly, yep. and it you can see it. it. You, you, you can. really can, yeah. It looks a more aggressive front end on that car. It just yep. does. And actually, it looks all the better for it, frankly. Uh, but it, 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 I still maintain it comes back to this. Back in the days when Audi were winning seemingly at will, they just raised the bar, and to, to take them on, you had to raise your game to another level. They now know, Porsche Penske Motorsport know, Ferrari AF Corsa know, Cadillac Racing know, they know what they've got to do. Peugeot, uh, uh, Total Energies know what they've got to do now to be considered on that same line, the same level. Well, and, and the other thing is, people in the other paddock here, the BMWs and so on of this world, and the people who are preparing cars, they too know where the benchmark lies. And, and so, for instance, you know, your Sam Hayden and the Jota team, you're getting one of these, yep. and you know now already where it is. And actually, do you know what? You may not have tested the car, but if you've got a better race team, you've got to back yourself, you've got to feel that we've got a good chance of being in the top six, probably on day one yep. of, of running these cars in a race, because of the knowledge and ability and confidence and cohesion of that team, the only new element will be the car.
So 35 minutes to go, that is the situation. 22 seconds is the gap. Number seven seems to have this one done. The Ferrari number 50 is pulling away again now for the number two Cadillac. 8.8 .8 seconds to the good for the final podium position. So seven from eight and 50 from two. Then the two Porsches uh, are lapped down on the chasing pair for the final podium position before we get into the other P2s and Hertz Team Jota cycle back to the front of the field 20 seconds the good at the moment uh, from the lead of the two WRT cars the 41 Will Stevens leads Louis Delatrans by 20.7 seconds a further 12 and a half seconds back to Mocha Bortolotti uh, in the Premier Racing car they've definitely made their final stop with Felipe Albuquerque 10 seconds back from the Italian racer in his number 22 United Autosports car and, and just look at the peak look at the color in the pictures look at the golden glow this is the sun is coming down and uh, you know you've raced here on this track this time of day here you know Le Mans any race that goes into the night time is is special isn't it, it it's there's a different feel in the air even it if special. it's the same car and the same race it's special and there's a good reason why it's special because it becomes blimmin difficult <laughs> <laughs> I was out there uh, the other night just watching what I think was one of the IMSA sessions and I just had that moment of thought Oh, I know. I can feel your pain, everyone out there. I can, it was completely dark. You see the headlights bouncing around over the bumps. You think, you have to be in such a higher state of consciousness to be to battle this circuit, or any circuit for that matter, when it's dark in one of these cars, traveling close to 200 miles an hour over all these bumps, and it's narrow, and the grass is there, and other cars on the infield that are driving around, and the smoke from the barbecues, and it... You are absolutely on edge. And you know at any wrong moment, you're in the wall, you're upside down, it's gonna hurt. It, it's honestly, it's frightening, it's intimidating, but, but at the same time, you love it. But it's special. It is, of course, but that's why it's special. And it's special. And the other thing about this place is it produces great racing. And I, I, I couldn't put my finger on why, but if I think about the number of times I've been here, whether or not it's for the 12 hours, obviously for the WC races we've had here, I struggle to think of a race that, that turned up and was a dud. Okay. This has been anything other than a dud. What this has been is development. This has been development with our cracking racing in P2, with our cracking racing in GTE. And we've had some great racing in hypercar as well, but really it will get better. really great racing in hypercar. Really great. And we're half an hour away from the end of it. So we have about 20 laps to go. Pay attention on these tires. We are super safe on pressures. They are quite high side at the moment. I'll keep updating you of the gap. 8.7 at the moment, 8.7. So P2 car going by the Ferrari? No, I think he went for the move and backed out of it last minute. That's okay. the number 41 WRT uh, in front of Antonio Fuoco there. So Fuoco absolutely did the right thing and now can safely pass around the outside using that uh, power advantage that the hypercars have over the LMP2s. And that little bit of front wheel traction as well in, in, the, in the quicker stuff just helps him sort of mid to exit. I love it on that car that you can really hear yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the hybrid, game. yeah, both re-energizing the battery yeah. under harvesting when they break and, and through the K element yeah. and also deploying, yeah. And here's another one of those moves around the outside, hoping that this time on a LMP2, it doesn't quite make it work. It's easier to do that on a GT car, but it is a really common move that you see on this track. Hats off, by the way, to Corvette Racing for yeah. the way that they've Hell yeah. delivered this, this uh, result to this point. And, uh, middle stint, and I think we're going to hear what a tough time Nico Veroni had. Going to hear the young Argentinian in addition to the Corvette racing team. He's down in pit lane at the moment with Luis. Nico, it's great to meet you. Uh, how has this Sebring been for you? I think I know the answer. Well, for the moment it's going pretty okay. I mean, we have a good advantage. We just had to manage it to the end. Uh, ben did a great job. Uh, then I jump in. Now Nick is doing a great job. So we're in a good position. And yeah, just we have to fingers crossed to the end. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.
Oh, I so know what his dad looks like immediately looking at him. He's, he's, oh, he hasn't got a young man's face, has he? He's got the features he's going to have when he's 50 or 60. But he's absolutely right. They, they've all done an absolutely outstanding job. Uh, he was asked, by the way, uh, at the end of his second stint while uh, coming to the end of that by the team whether or not he could go for a triple. He said he thought he could. Got out the car and said he was totally destroyed by this place with a triple stint. And that's three long stints, remember. Well, it's the adrenaline. It's, it's a difficult question. Yep. to answer truthfully when you're in the car you get asked you know can you go on for another one usually it's from a single to a double yep. uh, but to be asked to do a triple round here that's yeah that's a big question and uh, it's hard to answer from inside the car because you've got the adrenaline up you're sitting down and it's only sometimes when you stand up and get out of the car you suddenly feel all lightheaded and someone needs to grab onto you because you're completely spent and the other uh, thing of course is that it's not a 40 minute or 35 minute stint it's an hour long stint in a gte car so it's a it's a long extra ask uh, big lap time was coming at the moment in gte so 19 seconds is the gap at least about to julian Anzar. Uh, for the final podium position. That's the 77 Dempsey Proton car for Antar Depau in the number 21 AF Corsa car. Uh, but Depau on it right now, it's just taking a second out Julian Antar on that last lap. So this is a gap. You would have thought Antar had enough car underneath him to see off that challenge, but Glyn Depau thinks there's a battle to be won here, but the man ahead under pressure. Robin Frines now is finding pace, and he's taking time out of Oliver Rasmussen for fourth ahead. That's the number 28 Jota car, the World Championship Jota car, and the 31 Team WRT car. Uh, that gap six seconds, and last time around, Frines took 1.2 seconds out of the man ahead. Will Stevens in the uh, number 48. Hertz Joe Takar out in front. Now, it was intriguing listening to uh, his teammate, Ife saying, I'm not sure how it was going to pan out in terms of the strategy. It's exciting, the race that they've got going on with a Prema car behind them, but it's 36 seconds behind them. So I, I still feel like the LMP2 car category is shaken up from what happened way earlier in the race under that full course yellow period, the original one where some teams chose to pit, some some didn't. But it still feels like they've got this one sewn up for how it looks at the moment. My only concern is I didn't spot when they pitted. No. And I think they're right on the edge for fuel. Right on the edge. Well, as we know, minutes. yeah, as we know, they can do around about 40 to 45, uh, 40 to 45 minutes well, at, during a stint. I think the key at the moment is let's have a look at what happens with his lap times now, <laughs> if, because if we start to see those lap times coming out a little, he's got a bit to burn. He's got 35, 36 seconds to burn. Yeah. Then we're seeing a lot of fuel saving at the moment. His lap times are still well up there. The 53. Five, 52, four. Okay, 30 minutes left, that's 15 laps. If yep. he loses five seconds a lap... He can still get there. That five seconds a lap, that's not a drama. I've just heard Will Stevens pitted with 45 minutes to go. It's right okay. on the edge. Yeah, so but, but again, he's got a half minute lead. He can give away five seconds a lap. For, for three or four laps at th the end. They clearly think they can get to the end. Get to the end, yeah. Richard Westbrook, I'm talking to you, hoping you've got all the answers. What's going to happen here? I've got no idea. <laughs> Literally no idea. No, I mean, it's a good fight for third uh, with the Ferrari, and that's... All we could wish for on our first outing in work, it's uh, just so cool to be part of. The hypercars are quick though, really quick. Um, I think we need to get out of the way. Um, but, you know, it's so early days, we've got to get better. We've got a lot of data to go through after this race and, um, you know, see where we can improve. Um, obviously, we're not happy with the gap to Toyota, but that's, that's down to us. We need to improve in, in every way. And uh, this is invaluable doing eight hours here. We've got so much to go through. We'll, we'll come back uh, stronger in Portsmouth. Are you feeling the atmosphere in this paddock as much as everyone else? It's so cool. It really is. Just, just being like a fan, just watching the cars take off for qualifying yesterday. It was just so atmospheric. It's, uh, 
it's what everyone wanted and we've got it now so hopefully it can be a bit closer going forward but that's that's up to us to improve and uh, we will do great thank you thank you just say by the way richard west put two things about that one is the only man to have driven two different hyper cars in this class because he drove for clickenhouse yeah but of course the second thing is correct answer richard you know we've got to do better that's that's the key message oh, 100, 100%. From here. Yeah. and you know what we're not hearing and we're not seeing is anybody pointing to the rule book and saying that's not fair well i mean just like we were saying earlier on if you took last year's toyota and put it against this year's cadillac I think the Cadillac might even have beaten them in a straight fight. I think you yeah. may be right. I think you may be right. They were slightly, the Ferrari. They were certainly shaky in terms of the way the car behaved on track, and they were kind of flaky in terms of reliability as well. And I think if pressed, would have been even more flaky. So, you know, I mean, they're a year behind. Yeah. So it's to be expected in many I, ways. I don't expect anything different than two things to happen in the outcome of this race. The first is an awful lot of hard graft and thinking with the data they've got from here. Two is, will there be a little bit of moaning? I'm sure there will. And the impact that will have on the way these cars are presented at Portimao will be absolutely zero in terms of any change to the rule set. And absolutely right that it should be so. It's been a solid rule set for long enough that everybody knows what the game is. You've just got to do better. And if you look at what each of those teams behind Toyota have delivered today, start taking away from the time gap for the mistakes that have been made from the penalties that have been imp uh, imposed from the contact that they've had from the repairs that have been needed and you start to see the potential is actually there it's a, it's a well that's the key word there the potential and that's what the rules that's how they're written so they've got four potential parameters of, of where your car can be in, in this kind of balance of performance or where the, the window of your car sits. So the weight of the car, that's one target yep. to achieve. The drag of your car, that's another fine window to get into. The downforce of the car, yep. or CZ as they call it. Uh, that's a downforce created by the car, that's another one. Um, and then the power yep. of, the, of the total uh, energy that your power unit can produce, both hybrid and, and ICE, the internal combustion engine. So, four quite difficult windows to get into yep. if you can get into those it's like a natural balancing of performance in its own right you do have balance of performance on top of that but it's not the same kind of balance of performance we're used to seeing in the gt category so you just to get into that th those four areas those four criteria is difficult in its own right and um, just to maximize the true potential of your car in each one of those those departments and then there's the fifth isn't there which is what we've been talking about all day today which is you've got to maximize all of it operationally yeah you've got to maximize all of it you've got to be error free you've got to be as fast as you can in every circumstance make no mistakes on track on pit lane on strategy but i do think we'll see a different race in portobello in terms of performance between totally these guys and i i cannot tell you who's going to have the fastest car no. there i can't base it on this track this track i can't stress enough how unique it is in terms of its concrete surface yep. for the majority of the circuit, at least this part they're in at, at the moment isn't. But mostly it's a concrete. I mean, we don't go to any other tracks that have slabs of concrete from the 1950s or wherever it, whenever it was made. 30s. The 1930s. We don't get that with any other track we go to this year. And we don't have the bumps. This is the slowest track on the calendar as well. This is more a rally cross circuit yeah. than it is a racing circuit. Genuinely, it is. Uh, what, the other thing I took out of that, both from, from, from Westy and, and also from H when he was in here and from all the other drivers I'm talking to, is like us, they're all fanboying. Oh, yeah. they, they genuinely, everybody is genuinely excited to see these new cars coming. And you're, and, and you're right, you know, having knowledge of what works here is a big advantage. And it's been a big advantage for Toyota. Their fastest lap this race, 147.8, their fastest lap this race last year, the same car, 150 point something. They have got over two and a half seconds quicker on this track with that car and the same drivers and effectively and the same at the same time. Yeah, so, so that's the difference. And if you made them two and a half seconds a lap, every lap slow for the last six hours, they wouldn't have a two lap advantage. Yeah. So last year's Toyota, you're absolutely right, was no further forward than this year's new boys. It's just not the new boy.
El Bamba last night, speaking of lap times, it's El Bamba down. last night, 1.49.5. Yeah, it's under seven seconds now, that gap. There was a slow lap as well, by the way, for the leader, but that was traffic. Uh, that was a 1.53 uh, for the leader, uh, but with a bit of traffic. Standby also, uh, imminently, any second now, there will be a launch. Oh, will there? Yep. There's another launch going off from the car, and it's, and it's perfect weather for it, you know, no wind, no rain, it's, yeah. Cape Canaveral. Uh, so, we, so we may well see that coming over right at, towards, you know, the next five or ten minutes. I, I'm not so, sure how much we'll see. Some circuits have far more displays seeming <laughs> <Yeah>. differently. <laughs> why why you know? are you telling me this now? Because, <laughs> because we may see it any moment, but it, it's happening. Uh, you know, when you we're told me this morning, when yesterday, we're on the way back to the house. <laughs> no, no, it's now, a, you choose but, now. You know, because it's, it's going to happen, because when you're at Donington Park, you're on the flight path for East Midlands Airport, and, you know, you get jets coming in. Oh, here coppice. We get, here Always we get slippery at coppice. Rockets going over. I, c I, can remember, okay, I can remember in a Group C race, Hans Stuck complaining in the pits that his car radio was getting air traffic control. Genuinely, genuinely. He said, who's talking? Who's talking on the radio? And they had to get in the car, and they were listening to him. I'll like, tell you what would have yeah, been worse, uh, the pilot's Roger, getting his radio. Yes, exactly. Roger, Zulu, <laughs> 10 Bravo, blah, 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 and all this stuff. Yeah. Box, box, box. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Hello, Control. Uh, so, inside the final 20 minutes. There it goes. There you go. No there it goes. Why am I telling you? Because when you see it, you're going, oh, what's that in the sky? It's not the aliens. Uh, it's, it's just a weather balloon. Don't worry oh, too how much. How cool is that? I know, it's always very cool. And in fact, there was a, there was a launch about four days ago as well. Uh, there was. Uh, there, in yeah. fact, there was supposed to be three this week, and and Davidson quite right because he'd never seen it before. He's going to go have a look. But uh, in fact, the first 3D printed rocket was supposed to go up and yeah. failed, unfortunately. Uh, oh, yeah. C could they not link to the printer? No. Uh, no we, we've had that problem all line. week. Got to, get, got to get the iPhone to actually find the signal. <laughs> Right, let's get uh, back to uh, the action with Nick Nielsen from uh, Ferrari A of Corsa uh, on what has been really an impressive debut for this brand new team. Nicholas Nelson, can you just give us a reaction to this first outing for the 50, the hypercar for Ferrari? Yeah, I mean, uh, like we we said already yesterday, we were happy with the result, and I think you know um, we are also pleased with what we've been doing uh, throughout the race today. Obviously, now we have to finish the last 20 minutes, but. Uh, we knew that Toyota were going to be strong, but I think we've done everything we could so far, and uh, yeah, I think we can be really happy. All right, thank you. Nicholas Nielsen, a winner in GT Ferraris in LMP2, and he, I'm sure, certainly before this era is over, will be a multiple race winner in hypercar as well. I'm really, really impressed with all the new cars. All the testing they've done, you know, you know that Porsche are going to come well tested and well rehearsed. Cadillac also, you know, they've got great history in DPI, they've got great history in the IMSA sports car series. So we knew they were going to come on strong and, and you know, to, to see the Ferrari do so as well, it, it's, it's great. And actually, also very impressed with Floyd Van Roo. You know, they're getting an eighth place finish, but they're ahead of Persia, who are half a season of racing ahead of them. And you can see the first stage separation. Yep. We've now got the second stage uh, burn going ahead. It's very ahead. unprofessional of me, I'm sorry, but... Uh, no, not the slightest. Yeah. <laughs> so the rocket now 40 miles downrange, and we are within almost a quarter of an hour of the end of this adventure of Sebring. The hypercar class came about because of COVID, because of lockdown. It had been talked about, convergence had been talked about a lot, and very little had been done, because everybody had the business of trying to run and maintain and nurture and expand their championships. And it was made very clear to us, Graham, wasn't it, by, by both parties, by IMSA and the ACO, that it was having nothing else to do, literally nothing else to do during COVID that allowed them to spend all their time and effort on coming up with this all-encompassing blanket that is hypercar that has allowed both sides of the sporting firmament to come together and produce, I'm sure, 
race series that is going to be globally fascinating and fascinating for the for the domestic market here in the US. The planning in terms of getting the two organizations together was just before COVID. The yeah. deliverability Absolutely, because yeah. everything else was shut down. Yeah. So you're able to actually. And, and then when you, 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 I talked last night to Antonetta uh, 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 Coletta, the head of uh, the Ferrari program here, and he was saying it's seven months since this car hit the ground yeah. for the first time. Yeah. And seven months later, it's here on one of the toughest tracks we come to, setting pole position against a bar as high as the Toyotas. And that's the level of progress we've had in that seven months. Think about another six months, another 12 months. It's going to be mega. And as Anthony said about the Porsche program, more cars, more data, more experience, more feedback, all of that will come. There will inevitably be politics involved in this. There will inevitably be moaning involved in this. And you know what? I'll tune it out because what actually matters is what are they going to do on track? Well, and the other thing is we don't remember any of that from Group don't C. Care. It was all there, and don't we care. Don't, but we don't remember it because you, you blank out those bits and you remember the glorious bits. You, yep. you, you know, you remember all the high points and all the excitement and and the depth of field that it, that it brought. And that's what Hypercar is going to bring to the Premier class. It's going to bring a depth of field. Imagine if all 20 Formula One teams had a competitive chance of or cars had a competitive chance of winning the race you know that's what we're potentially going to be looking at we're going to see different cars with different strengths and weaknesses with the potential to win in different circumstances yeah, I mean, again we've said it there are 11 cars here there will be more by the end of this season there will be more at the Le Mans 24 hours there will be almost double this number at the, the opening round for 2024 if plans come together yeah. and it, th that's that's fabulous you know it's it's fantastic for the manufacturers it's fantastic for the world of motorsport the industry that surrounds it and by the way something we've not been able to say for a long time in the international sports car racing it's fantastic for talented professional drivers and most of all and, and absolutely most of all, it's fantastic for fans. There you and, go. It, and it is going to draw more people to the sport than at any time since the 1980s. And, and that can only be good for us and for them and for everybody who's here putting on the show. And look at the, I mean, look at the I know, <laughs> I know, it's just fabulous, isn't it? And, and again, you know, that's part of the, the joy of racing into the dark. And I was sort of thinking a little bit earlier when we saw those sunset shots, I thought, we should make every race finish in the dark. And then actually, no, we shouldn't, because it should be special. Different. It Everything, should be special. It, it should be. It is that thing about trying to find a way to make things, you know, unique. Sebring doesn't need any help to be unique. <laughs> you know, whatever else you do, it's still, it's Sebring. It was born unique. Absolutely. And the sun is just hitting the horizon, you know, just, uh, it, it, it's like the Middle East, isn't it? When it goes dark here, it goes dark fast. Uh, the sunsets are always spectacular when we've got uh, a cloudless sky like this or a relatively cloudless sky like this. And that's uh, down, by the way, in the WEC pit lane. Hello, wave, everybody. everybody. Give us a wave. No, they can't Come hear us. Yeah, they, they can, because I can hear us coming back on the fullback. So uh, they definitely can. Uh, and, a, and a great place to enjoy. And they're down there already in in position for the podium for the podium they are they are down there waiting already so they only they just need freaks with mayonnaise can you imagine bringing freaks with mayonnaise to a u.s audience <laughs> they were you know, Johnson, mayonnaise on lead your car on pit lane lead lmp2 oh, is on pit lane 12 to go 12 minutes to go their gap is 42 seconds to muka portolotti the they'll get out in car. front they will get out in front it's gonna be tight you know what's the pit lane delta it's where? got to be about 36. It's a long pit lane. 63 car. Where is it? He could okay. come in with 45 minutes. 13, to go. 30, turn 13, turn 14. Uh, they've gambled. But in the end, actually, it's not going to make any difference to the Prema team if the car turn comes 15. back out in front. 48 is rolling before yep. 63 reaches turn 16. Yep. This is going to be very tight indeed. It's thrown onto the almond straight now. It's going to be almost nose to tail. It is going to be very close indeed. And of course, it's just a glare of lights. There's Bortolotti. Goes by. Does he? He does. He does. He does. There's Bortolotti, takes the lead on the road wow. from the Jota team. They gambled. That is how you race in the US. We're going to need a stop. 
Well, hell no. We're going to wait for a yellow. We're going to need a yellow. They haven't got it. Now we see it. Berko Bortolotti, Lamborghini factory driver in the Prima car as this team preps for what comes next year for Lamborghini coming into Hypercar. Will Stevens aboard the number 48 Hertz team Jota car in one of his last two races. Oh, in fact, I think it's his last race in another P2 car for this season. Uh, he's got race winning form with Jota and with Panis Racing in the European Le Mans series. Now we're going to see something in the last 10 minutes and it's going to be LMP2 for the overall win. 63 leads 48 from 22 and Dorian Pan yeah. is going to have her eyes glued to that screen. How many female winners have there been in Sebring's history, do you reckon? Uh, I can think of at least one more. I think Denise McLug is uh, one, didn't she not? Oh, that's a very good shout. Was that overall? Uh, I'd have to go yeah, back yeah. and check. Okay. But either way, um, now not, we've got a battle. Not many. Not many. The United Autosports, by the way, just to put this into the mix, are only six seconds back from this pair. Yeah. So we've got the lead three under 10 seconds apart with 10 minutes to go. Right. And it is Mirko Bortolotti, one of the most talented guys in GT racing in uh, LMP2 car. Will Stevens, a massive talent with ex Formula One experience behind him, a multiple champion, Felipe Albuquerque. Well, I can tell by the way that Will's driving now that he's breaking very late into the corners. I can't see any fuel saving going on at all, and he wouldn't need to. They would have put enough fuel in that car to make sure he can drive absolutely flat out with no lift and coast towards the end of this race with nine and a half minutes to go. The big question is, is the Prema able to do that as well? Or are they lifting coasting towards the end of this race? Well, and, and that was going to be my question. Who's got what left? Yeah. How close are Prema to the brink? How close are United to the brink? Could Inter Europol inherit something here in terms of a podium? They're fourth at the moment. Of course, Inter Europol will go away here with third placed points and a half. Fantastic result for them, but they're being chased. That gap yeah. uh, is down to 3.3 seconds with Louis Delatraz in the number 41 WRT car. So fourth, fifth, and indeed sixth, under 10 seconds yeah, yeah. as well to Oliver Rasmussen. So there are big positions in LMP2 still up for grabs here. The lead gap, by the way, we know this is being sort of managed towards the end of this race, I presume it is, is down under se uh, under eight seconds. So Mike Conway now leads Brendan Hartley by seven and a half seconds. And Tony Fuoco, meanwhile, 9.6 seconds ahead of Earl Bamba uh, for third place and the, ov and the overall podium. Will be the f this will be the first time since 2012 that a World Endurance Championship race at Sebring goes the full distance. Fantastic. The full time, uh, at least if nothing happens in the, in the next eight minutes. Absolutely. Battles to the end, rocket launches, fabulous weather, and a full race distance. That's for much better than this, couldn't and it, really? And Hypercar! <laughs> yes. No, I, I mean, this has got it all. It has got it all. <laughs> <laughs> there are some excited faces. What's the gap down to now? The gap down to... What's the gap, Jim? Three Still three seconds. seconds. Portolotti is not lifting and coasting. He is giving it everything. If Will Stevens is going to win this, he's going to have to win it on pace and on aggression. In uh, GTE, Ooh, by the way. Battle for second. Was that Kessel ahead of Dempsey Proton? No, no. Uh, Kessel are ahead of Dempsey Proton. Julian Andler are 34 seconds back. At least to power 25 seconds back is not going to do that on right, pace. So that is the GR. So this is Ricardo Pera, Michelle Gatting. That's the battle we're looking at there. Yeah, the Iron Dames. I'm afraid, that, that is the battle for seventh place with GR Racing's Ricardo Pera and Michelle Gatting. Dangerous Day Smith just as assures us that no matter how quick the hypercars are, the rocket doing 2,200 miles an hour currently has left them in its wake. Well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but it can't pit, can it? So. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope they've got the fuel. It can so, dock, but it can't pit. Yeah, Michelle Gatting all over the back of Ricardo Pera now for seventh place. And uh, not what the race promised that Porsche team early on and not what they look like they were going to get. So there's Sarah Bovey. I, I said Michelle Gatting earlier, Sarah Bovey. Michelle Gatting in the car. And uh, Rahel Frey probably fairly disappointed with herself. She doesn't make many mistakes. And uh, unfortunately, that was quite a costly one. It's one of those mistakes that on a, on a normal track. Oh, second place car, Pitts. Yeah. Uh, Castle go. Racing Pitts. So the 57 car pits from second place. That will, should, mean that Julian Anlau, it, it's going to have to be a very quick dash of fuel here if the 77 car is, is already in turn 16. It's going to go through. The real problem is not how much 
fuel you're taking, it's how long the damn pit lane is. It, yeah, watch the 77 car, it's going to appear and it's going through into second Gone place. Through. Gone through. Gone through already, change for second. Dempsey Proton up to second. We still have a Corvette, a Porsche and a Ferrari in the top three. In fact, three Ferraris, third, fourth and fifth right now. So another change. Julian Andlauer, Christian Reed, Mikkel Pedersen. They have driven a really strong race, didn't qualify particularly well, doesn't matter. 79th consecutive WC race for Christian Reed, and it looks like he's going to score yet another podium. Yeah. The team principal for the Dempsey Proton Racing Team. His team set for hypercar later this season with another Porsche. Seven car, meanwhile, that gap still coming down. I'm sure that is being managed. Five and a half seconds now. Five and a half seconds, five minutes, which is possibly three laps. Brendan Hartley's going to have to find a lot more time over Mike Conway to be able to get to him, never mind get past him. Will Stevens is going to have to do more than he currently is doing to get onto yeah. terms with Mirko Bortolotti. It's 3.3 seconds for the win in LMP2 with under five minutes remaining. Gaps opened up. And uh, I don't think that is coming back down. So Ferrari right now, again, creeping away from the Cadillac, third to fourth. Antonio Fuoco doing enough to just continue to open up the margin, fractionally over Earl Bamba. Prema leading, and Jota not close enough. So unless suddenly the 63 Prema car starts to run dry and cough under Mirko Bortolotti, I think he's got enough right now, certainly in terms of pace. He's not being caught any by Will Stevenson again. That's a great indication of how good Bortolotti is, because as, as uh, Graham said, he's made his name. He's made. He's his... coming in. He's coming in. I'm sure he's coming in. He's coming in. He, he is. is coming in. All right. So it has coughed, and so Premier are back uh, into the pit lane, and Hertz Jota go back through. Uh, you know, it's almost like an old-fashioned Silverstone handicap where everybody starts at different times, and if the handicap wow. has got it right, they're all at the line at the same time at the end of the race. So what have United got? Because United will go through now into second, into Europol will not go through into third on the road, but don't forget the 48 Hertz Team Jota car, not a full season entry, will not score points. Look at that, Sky. Just look at that. I son. thought he was going. I thought Bottoli, I thought he was carrying on because the way he was driving, there was no lift and coast going on at all. And I thought, wow, he yeah. he's clearly must have this then. But no, uh, it was uh, it was all bust. Why were they not trying to save as much as they could? Because they only had three, three seconds. It, it, it's all or nothing. Wow. It, it was all or nothing. Interesting strategy. Yeah. Also, by the way, into and out of the pits, the 21 Ferrari, which had been third, now drops to fourth behind Daniel Ooh. Miller. Uh, so the 21 car also uh, was in trouble there for fuel. Just look and see what that no, leaves them. Uh, Lister Powell didn't get past Danny Serra. No, he didn't. You're right. No, he no. Didn't. So, so uh, uh, actually, the last lap by Lister Powell was the fastest of that car's race. But it wasn't close enough to Daniel Serra. Here is the car, guys, Ferrari. This is the seven, leading the race. 5.3 seconds, the good from the sister eight car goes past the number 57 car that sits third in GTM. Nervous, nervous faces. Well, it'll, it'll be the white flag, one to go at the line next time. So coming down towards 14, 15, and then down into corner 16. That sort of left-right flick-flack here named Le Mans. And then on to the Ullman straight for what will be the penultimate time in this year's Sebring 1,000 miles. It's big pressure here for Mike Conway. And whenever you're in the lead of the race and the, the dying minutes or dying laps of it, you feel the weight, the pressure of your teammates watching on. Look you can at feel those it inside the car. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it's way more nerve-wracking for them. Twilight's last gleaming, as it says in the American National Anthem. That's where we are now. One to go. White flag lap. One minute 32 on the clock. Takes them a minute 50 to get round. I didn't see the finger go up no, from the start to tower. Didn't see it. Doesn't matter. We're still going to run out of minutes. First race may be the third year of hypercar, but it is absolutely the first race for a brand new era 
Pereira, last lap comes up on the timing yeah. screen. The scene of the very first FIA World Endurance Championship race back in 2012 becomes the scene of the very first in what is a dazzling new era yeah. for the hypercar class as the cavalry finally arrives and it's <laughs> going to be Toyota 1-2 here, but they've shown the way to the rest here and now it becomes a chase for excellence. But look, the other newcomers, Ferrari, Cadillac, Porsche, they've got a car each in the top five. Yes, Toyota are one, two, but it's not, what, it's, it's that year's head start. You know, you give Usain Bolt a head start, you're always going to struggle to catch him up, and that's where Toyota are at the moment. Their car is good, it is sorted, the team are absolutely reliable, don't make silly errors. You know, they, they are the benchmark, and how long they remain depends entirely on what everybody else can do to bring themselves up to speed. And as Anthony has pointed out earlier on, this is a unique track in our calendar, as Le Mans is, uh, they're all slightly different, but this is different in, in every way from all of the others, and so that balance of power may change. Heading down into the sunset for the very final time in 2023. Toyota are going to win this one. They're going to go 1-2. The same result as they have produced over the last few years so many times. The checker is out. It is victory for Toyota number seven. Mike Conway brings the car across the line and Brendan Hartley will take second place. But Toyota know that they have a battle on their hands from all of the newcomers. Two seconds, the gap at the flag, and the, the Ferrari is home. Ferrari finish on the podium in their debut in hypercar. 50 years has been the, the last time since we saw them finish a World Championship race. Also home, the, the top two cars in LMP2. 48 Hertz Team Jota uh, Orica ahead of the number 22 United Autosports. That was down to under three seconds uh, at the flag as well and we wait for the Corvette to come home. Second and third place cars are already home uh, for the GTE AM class, but we wait for the Corvette racing car to come home. They're in turn 15 at the moment. What an excellent race it's been for them. So Toyota Group 2 Racing extend their record. Catch yeah. us if you can. That's the message Absolutely. from Toyota to the rest of the competition. They're here now. They're going to be working at it. And we've got some interesting circuits coming up in this championship. And, and Let alone four, the centenary at Le Mans. Four different makes in the top five. Yeah. You know, it's not not a white wash. It's it's not a white, red, and black wash. Corvette. 33 into the final corner. And for Ben Keating and his team again, another whole new adventure with a whole new car and a whole new team of engineers to work with. And they have crushed the opposition. They have taken every opportunity, nearly got pole position, battled really hard for the lead earlier on, Ben Keating and Sarah Bovey. And then when they handed the cars over to their pro teammates, luck favored the 33 car. There is Nicky Katzberg bringing the car across the line. Corvette factory driver has had so many GT races over his career. And uh, another victory here, a Sebring, 1,000 miles of Sebring victory. And a first time out for this combination. Uh, a first time out for Nicholas Veroni in the car, in the team. And for Ben Keating and Nicky Katzberg working together for the first time and for Keating the first time with Corvette Racing. It's a, it's a really great way to start that partnership. And there is Ben, as ever, the arch enthusiast and one of the best drivers in the GTE AM field. Absolutely right, but what they will know as well is they've got one hell of a fight for this season on their hands from a number of the cars that chase them home today. Not least, of course, the Iron Dames. One minor error cost them dear, cost what looked like a surefire win. And of course, the Iron Dames, back here tomorrow, racing again, because they'll be in the Lamborghini in the Sebring 12 hours. And by the way, another little piece of history, not the first time or the second time, but we will have a female driver on a World Championship podium with Dorian Pan in the number 63 car. They came yep. home in third place, and, and that, remember, on her LMP2 debut. Just two years ago, she was uh, racing in Ferrari Challenge cars. Yeah, yeah. Well, there, there's quite a number of the Iron Dames who have come up through the Ferrari Challenge ranks, uh, Michelle Gatting among them. So uh, it's, a, it's been a, a happy hunting ground, a happy training ground 
uh, for those drivers. But for Toyota Gazoo Racing, job done. And actually, especially for the number seven team, who didn't have the best of luck, but had plenty of pace. And you know, there's, there's an awful lot of drivers here very, very excited about where we are going, and so they should be. There's an awful lot of drivers very excited about the golden era of sports car racing in which they're participating. And if you're not excited about it yet, not sure what we need to do, but you can join us in Portimao in Portugal in early April, 16th of April. If you're in Europe, you can come to Portimao in Portugal. It is a fabulous venue to watch racing it at. It produces fantastic racing. He's had the Brucey bonus of being very close to Holiday Central in Portugal, the, the Algarve coast. So you can fly into Faro. It is very easy. It is the half-term holidays. There will still be plenty of accommodation. Get yourself to Portimao or get yourself to Spa-Francorchamps. You can no longer get yourself to the 24 hours that I'm on the centenary race sold out. But don't forget that we then move on to Monza. And if you're living further afield, we have the six hours of Fuji and the eight hours of Bahrain to round out our season. But all of that will transpire over the next six months or so right now. Four different brands in the top five cars. Toyota maybe one, two here in Sebring, but I don't think they're going to have an easy ride anywhere all season long. It will not have been easy here. Even when they only had their teammates to race against, it was always tough for both crews. It just got tougher. Yeah, this place makes it special for everybody that's going to come home with points, with a finish, and particularly with the three wins in the three classes. The other thing that makes it special here at Sebring International Raceway are the fans, always. And they're gathering down at the podium at the moment to welcome our winners. And it's going to be some very happy faces after a very tough evening. Well, as ever, Sebring started in beautiful Florida sunshine with the great and the good bringing cars and entertainment to the grid. A packed crowd here at Sebring International Raceway. There's been holding top flight sports car races since pretty much it was retired as a US Air Force bomber base. Ferrari led the field away from pole position on their debut in the hypercar class, on their debut in the World Endurance Championship, and on their debut in the top flight of sports car racing for the first time in half a century. Taking the battle to Toyota from the first corner in the GT classes Ferrari were taking the battle to their rivals as well the first of the Peugeots to strike trouble did so on the formation lap and he did gearbox work red flag was brought out early on for a dramatic crash five laps in for Lewis Perez Compank and that will but bring the field D1 to a standstill as he and his car were rescued Ferrari finding that racing and testing were different deals getting a little hung up in the pit lane and Toyota working themselves to the front of the field as the Peugeot went back behind the pit wall. Paul de Resta struggling to find gears in the car. Plenty more of entertainment. Glickenhaus, one of our American brands in hypercar. That car stopped after a couple of hours, racing in the front of the field. And then disaster for the Iron Dames, who dominated in GTE Am, running over the uh, grass and ripping the floor out of the car, cost them the lead. The 93 Peugeot then into full course yellow, running into the back of the Floyd Van Wool car on its debut that was otherwise flawless all the way through. Disaster for 23, United Autosports. Comfortable leaders in LMP2 till their car stopped dead on them, handing the advantage to the Hertz Jota team. Great battle on worn tyres between Ferrari and Porsche for a, pos a position in the top three behind the lead Toyotas. And then disaster for the 51 car, caught out by a GT car trying to go into the pit lane. It had an accident that also counted for another GT Porsche and to rip the back off the car. More full course yellows and bring us into the closing stages. At the flag, GTE won by the 33 Corvette. LMP2 won in a fuel race by the 48 
Jota car and Toyota's number seven winning overall, taking the hypercar class victory. Points and a half here in the eight hour race in the thousand miles of Sebring. Toyota go one, two. Ferrari on the podium, Cadillac and Porsche with a car each in the top five. Well, about to get uh, podium ceremonies underway and loads and loads of fans are going to be there to see it. Hope they've enjoyed their evening with us here. Yeah. Apparently so. Yeah, it's it's been a very busy paddock, you know, and tomorrow most of them are camping here. They'll Absolutely. be back for the IMSA WeatherTech 12 hours of Sebring. One of the standout sports car races, you know, in, in the, the Holy Trinity, now the Holy Quartet with, uh, with the... Uh, uh, Tielemon as well. Jose Maria Lopez, Kamui Kobayashi, Mike Conway, points and a half here, ahead of Brendan Hartley, Rio Hirokawa and Sebastian Buemi, and the Ferrari trio. Antonio Fuoco, Miguel Molina and Nick Nielsen are on 24 points. Yeah, the Cadillac uh, crew fourth in the standings with 18 points. Of course, an extra point for the Ferrari trio for that pole position yep. from Antonio Fuoco yesterday afternoon. So, yes, it is uh, Alex Lynn, Earl Bamber, Richard Westbrook, then Dane Cameron, Fred Makovicki and Michael Christensen in the Porsche with the second Porsche next up uh, before we get to the second Ferrari. Uh, then the Van Wall and then the first of the Peugeots as the crowd gathers down in the W. WC pit lane uh, for the podium ceremony here. In fact, only, beautiful evening. Only one of the Peugeots will be classified as a finish. The, the second car, the 94 car, has not, nor has the uh, 35 Elf Alpine, nor has the 23 United Autosports, the Glickenhaus, or that Ferrari that crashed right at the beginning of the race. But some very happy racers and some very happy fans down there. There's Jose Maria Lopez, undoubtedly some Argentine fans. Some also lot, awful lot of uh, Hispanic speakers, uh, Spanish speakers here in Florida, particularly close to Miami. So again, as always with the FI World Endurance Championship, true world championship, yeah. and uh, drivers and teams and fans from around the world gathering. Yeah, flags and nations aren't just an affectation here. They are very much a part of what this is all about. It's not just a championship that moves around the world. It has drivers from every continent, apart from Antarctica. Yes. Well, let's catch up with our winners. Kamui Kobayashi is one of the trio winning this race for Toyota in the number seven car. Louise Beckett is with him. Kamui Kobayashi celebrating with one of your teammates. Uh, that was a great run for the number seven Toyota. Yeah, I think first of all, thank you very much. They're from Japan, uh, from Toyota Gazoo Racing in Japan and uh, Mr. Toyota-san. And of course, uh, the Sato present. Uh, it's made, I think, a very tough time in the yesterday, but uh, we made the return pretty strong today. Uh, we obviously finished one, two. I think we made, uh, I think, best results. I think we, we can uh, uh, try. And, uh, you know, I think uh, today is just start of the big race coming for 2023 so for sure we need work we need to improve but definitely i'm looking forward this championship is going to be coming really really exciting yeah are you excited about what was going on behind you yeah I, well i mean i can see it and i'm already in honor myself to fight because you know like manufacturer and I, even the teammates it's so challenging but i think this is a, it has to be the endurance races and uh, we are all professional but uh, i think we are fighting for fury and I'm pretty happy to be here myself. Well done, thank you. Well, the endurance discipline is get to the end, beat your teammates, beat the rest. And they've done that tonight. Yep. And uh, they take a first step towards what they will hope will be a return towards championship form for that crew. And, and worth pointing out, of course, for those that, are, again, haven't been watching WEC for the last couple of years, and particularly in the last year, Kamu Kobayashi, not just a driver with Toyota Gazoo Racing, he's principal. also the team principal yeah. at Toyota Gazoo Racing. But he's absolutely right, you know, and he and all the others are super excited about more competition. You might think, you know, as a normal fan, 
surely they're happier if they can just win everything. No. No, they're actually happier if they win a tough race, if they win a hard race, if they win a close race. They want the fight. That's where the, the excitement fight. is. They, yeah. want to, they want to be pressured, they want the fight, and they're going to get it. So there's no doubt whatsoever about that. Antonio Fuoco here uh, talking to Richard Beale and Pierre Fion. Richard Beale, the president of the Insurance Commission of the FIA. Pierre Fion, the, uh, the president of the ACO, who, of course, uh, run Le Mans, run the FI World Endurance Championship and yeah. all the championships that support that around the world and get us to this point. It's, uh, yeah, it's been quite a day. I can remember years ago, Porsche and Mercedes racing head to head in the FIA uh, World Championship at that stage, the GT1 World Championship. And the Mercedes guy saying, we would rather lose this championship, if it is well respected, that win one that nobody cares about. Bingo. And, and I think that's still, that's still the overriding deal Welcome here. You know, why are Ferrari here? Because it's a championship that's got great value. Yep, and it's, and it's gonna again. have greater and more prestigious value as the year goes on. Our winners of the 1,000 miles of Sebring, it's the number seven Toyota Kazoo Racing. Please welcome Mike Conway, Kamui Kobayashi, and Jose Maria Lopez. The Dulcet turns of all of our tracks being at Dieu Bradley. Dieu Bradley. So congratulations to our three drivers. Please welcome Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley. Seb Buemi. Brendan Hartley and Rio Hirakawa. Defending champions, yeah. and they've got work to do and against their teammates and the rest. 50, Ferrari AF Corsa. Please welcome Antonio Fuoco, Miguel Molina and Nicholas Nielsen. There you go, a big cheer for the new boys. They'll know some of the gap they can make up. And, and you saw all the cameras going up in the air there to see the Ferrari drivers. It's a very, very big deal. Big round of applause for our winners of the In the white shirt course, Kazuki Nakajima. Yeah. Up until two seasons ago, driving to, for Toyota Gazoo Racing last year. He stepped back into management role with the team, and uh, Rio Hirakawa took his spot, presenting the prizes. Pierre Fion to Nick Nielsen, to Polman Antonio Fuoco, and to Miguel Molina. First day in the championship, pole position. Second day in the championship, podium. They're here. They've arrived. Well, let's not forget Ferrari to get to the podium. Had to be Cadillac, had to be Porsche, had to be Peugeot, had to be big factory teams yep. with big reputations. And as I said before, they will know some of the ground they can easily make up. There is some low-hanging fruit as well as the hard grass. Yeah, absolutely so. Absolutely so. Again, pointing out that last year, in their first year here, the Toyota team with their new hypercar were two and a half seconds a lap slower than they are this year. And that is where Ferrari, where Cadillac and where Porsche find themselves right now. Will it take them a year to catch up? I doubt it. I don't think so. And again, very different circuit next time out at the uh, Circuit do Algarve in Portimao, Portugal. It's a real roller coaster track, much higher tyre energy. Temperatures could be pretty decent as well. Maybe not in the 30s, but the track temperature could be pretty high, so that could be very entertaining. What we do know, though, Graham, is that the small acorns that grew as both parties in, in the sports car firmament, IMSA and the ACO, really formulated these rules. They've really taken root, they've sprouted, and now they are shooting up like the magic beanstalk. There are going to be cars coming at us left, right, and center. So third place from pole position. 
A great, great start to the campaign for Ferrari. And actually, this is really important because all of this will go back and play back into Marinello. And whoever now put their neck on the line with the board and pushed for the permission and pushed for the money can go back with pole position on their debut and a podium on their debut against the benchmarks. And that's important. Multiple world champions. Their st first step on that road again. The eight car coming home in second. The seven takes the win and the 38 points that go with it for this eight-hour race. Uh, they start their journey in the best way possible with a 1-2. Yep, a fantastic result for Toyota Gazoo Racing, and they lead the manufacturer standings. But look at that, seven different manufacturers. It's been a long while since we've had that in the top class of the World Endurance Championship. That is a number that will only increase not just in terms of numbers of actual physical cars but numbers of manufacturers arriving as well yeah tota from ferrari from cadillac and then porsche big guns and they will all want to come back and just do that little bit better and talking of new cars those gold and white overalls hertz team jota they won't be in LMP2 for long. Nope. Their new Porsche hypercar is on its way. It is in build, and it will be with them before the Centenary Le Mans race. Yeah, in build at Vysak with help from the Jota guys that would be tending well, to that 963 when well, it makes its planned debut at the moment at, uh, at Spa. That's it's Will Stevens, it's Yife Ye, Ye, and... Ye and Will Stevens. Wow. David Beckman. Yeah. He was a star today. Yeah, what a debut. So United Autosport taking second place. They're all confused because they're coming out first, second, third, not third, second, first. And Dorian Pat on the podium as well in third spot with the Premier team. And again, don't forget, in terms of the championship, United get top points because the Jota team that won on the road are not registered for the championship, so they do not take points. So United take top points, Prema for second, into Europol, take the points for third. So there is your LMP2 podium. Great race in LMP2 once yeah. again <laughs> continues to deliver. Richard Beal will present the trophies. Great stuff from Prima. Uh, and, and that final final fuel stop for WRT whipped the carpet out yep. from under them, didn't it? Danny Kvyat, uh, Duran Pan and Mirko Bortolotti. Team will be delighted with their new trio there. And again, the keys to the future, the presence of Mirko Bortolotti, factory Lamborghini driver in that lineup. You know, it's 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 no coincidence that the Iron Dames are running a, a Lamborghini in the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Series. And they would be running a Lamborghini here if there were a GT version of it, I'm sure of that. David Beckman, a win in the WC on his debut. Yeah. And Fred Lubin, a podium on his debut. Danny Kvyat, the same. Well, in, fact, in fact, of course, Fred Lubin gets an actual points win on his That's debut. It. Yes, because David Beckman does not. Uh, worth saying, by the way, that that does mean, as you said just in the closing minutes of the broadcast into Europol competition, get a podium uh, worth of points. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and a strong result for them, you know, top four finish with two brand new drivers in the I car. I think that might be their best in the WC, you know. I, I they, think you're right. They did have a record of repeated fifth places uh, in their first year in LMP2 in the WC, and I think this is their best ever. Yeah, they had plenty of podiums in the European Le Mans series, but I'm not sure in the WEC. So, yeah, Prema in third place. United in second, but they take top points because not registered for the championship are our winners. The uh, Hertz 
Jota team. Let's hear from them with Louise Beckett. Well, Will Stevens, you left us worrying at the end there with that stop, but the number 48, Jota Hertz, did it. Yeah, we knew it was going to be super close. Um, we had to change up our strategy a little bit at the start because um, we went to do a triple at the end because we knew it was going to be super tight. We wasn't actually sure if Bremer needed to stop or not, but we had to push as hard as we can to try and extend the gap, which we did. Um, when they called me in, I thought I didn't think Prima were going to have to stop. So when they did come in, I was obviously super happy. And then uh, and then we brought it home. But obviously for us as Hertz Team J, it's a great start for us. Uh, we came here to win. We have a super strong lineup and, and, we, and we've started the year as we mean to go on. And so much more from you guys to come for the rest of the season. Exactly. You know, we're, we're obviously waiting for our, for our Porsche and the H car to turn up. Uh, we're hoping to have that for Portimao. Um, Antonio will be subbing in for me in Portimao, but onwards to Spa. Um, Spa will be a big race for us and, and we'll see how we fare. But it's an exciting year and, it, and it's nice to, to get a win on the first one. Look forward to it. Thanks. There are the points in the endurance trophy for LMP2. United Old Sports with the Ladies top score there because the 48 is invisible for points of race by race efforts. Premier Racing 63 on 27 into Europol confirmed with 23 for the 41 TWRT car and the 28 Jota on the top five. And congratulations to them. Congratulations to to another new driving lineup. It is the number 33 Corvette crew that take the GTE and win another podium for Christian Reed in the 77 Dempsey Proton Porsche and Car Guys Kessel Racing Ferrari take the third spot in the GTE AM class. An inevitably popular anthem to follow. <laughs> it will be indeed. It's the national anthem of the winning team. Had plenty of success at Daytona before and winning here in, an Amer in America's sports car at home in oh. Sebring. It's him, Sir President John Doonan gets the honours yeah. for this one. Kessel Racing get their trophies from the IMSA president, another of the key architects of this convergence for the top class. And good to see that repeated here uh, in the podium ceremonies. As we said earlier in the broadcast, Martin, it is a second win in the FIWC for the Corvette C8R, but a win in both GTE Pro last year and now a win in its debut in GTE. -M. <laughs> well, these two know each other well because Ben does much more racing in the IMSA WeatherTech Series than he does in the World Endurance Championship, just from the sheer volume uh, of their races. That's where he started, and uh, from there he's jumped to the World Championship. So congratulations to Corvette Racing, uh, to Ben, to Fabio Scherer, and to uh, Nicky Katzberg. A fantastic start to that trio. And now yep. the champagne! So, yep, Nico Veroni, we uh, heard from him after... Nicholas Veroni, I beg your pardon. Uh, yes. Nico Veroni, a fabulous triple stint from him. Yeah. Uh, by then, the damage had been done, unfortunately, to the battle for the lead that we thought might carry on between this crew and the Iron Davis. They'll be back, no doubt about it, but yeah. here are the winning... Uh, the, tr the podium trio, the 57 car guy, Ferrari, Daniel Serra, Scott Hovica and Takeshi Kimura, the car guy, team based just outside the circuit gates at Fuji. 77, the Dempsey Proton Racing Porsche with Christian Reed, Julian Anvlar, and joined, of course, by Mikkel Pedersen from Denmark. And and there we have the number 33 Corvette Racing trio, and we're going to be hearing from the winning team with 
Louise Beckett right now. Well, Ben Keating, that was a long race, but you guys did it in your new Corvette. That's exactly right. Uh, so it's so special to, you know, I guess I would say defend the home turf, right? Uh, this is the only home race for uh, the United States, and so it's really special to perform well here. Uh, the, the guys, the team did a great job. All the drivers just pretty much just didn't make any mistakes, which is pretty tough to do in all that traffic out there. It's uh, like I said to you with, uh, I guess, five hours to go. I said it's mayhem. Uh, and so we just stayed out of it. And uh, pretty much everybody else ended up having some problem or another. Uh, and so it's a nice way to win also, uh, but uh, really special. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing the American national anthem and uh, being under an American flag. I'm sure all the fans will too. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Well, that's a great result for the new partnership, Corvette Racing, with Ben Keating and his new driver, co driver lineup. Dempsey Proton taking the second spot. Kessel Racing, big result for them as well in third place ahead of the two AF Corsa Ferraris with Iron Links in sixth position at the end. And the Iron Dames car dropping back to eighth behind the GR Racing. So Iron Dames must have had to have had a, a late pit stop. Qualified third, finished ninth. Uh, Oman Racing Team by TF and D Station rounding out the top 10. It was not a good day for Aston Martin. This track did not favor them very much in terms of luck. But it has been a great day for the World Endurance Championship. Hypercar has come of age. We have a battle on our hands in all of our three classes. And we now know that it is going to be tough, as we expected throughout the entire season. Thank you for joining us. We will be back for round two of the series, the six hours of Portimao in the 16th of April. Join us then for all the action from FP3, from qualifying and from the race. Until then, on behalf of all the crew here, on behalf of Louise Beckett, Anthony Davidson and Graham Goodwin, Martin Haven saying thank you for joining us. The golden era is with us. We are amongst it. We are living some of the greatest times of sports car racing on this planet. Don't miss the next instalment in Portimao. It will be epic. We'll see you there.